Web novel fanfiction TG the good. The latest of the latest. Chapter 193 At that very moment, when one of hellhounds at the forefront reached the lakeside in the middle of the garden, there came out the energy of life from everywhere. It was such an enormous power of life that Savnak and Frost, the undead monsters that belonged to death, almost lost their mind momentarily. When they came to their senses, the scenery was changed a little. A beautiful woman was standing in the middle of the empty lake. With blue, aquatic hair, she greeted them with a bright smile. Welcome to the Garden of the King of Greed. She just greeted them shortly, but it was enough to confuse them. The ten warriors were the King of Gluttony's right-hand men, so they were aware of the potential abilities that the King of the Southern Unclaimed Land might have. The woman with blue water-colored hair was radiating the enormous power of life. She mentioned the King of Greed a moment ago. At the moment, there was something that came to their mind. Pitch Black Arc Demon Siemens, one of them, screamed. She is Scathack, the immortal witch. She is also one of Mammon's twelve spirits. That was nonsense. All the twelve spirits were dead with Mammon. It's already been over a thousand years since they disappeared along with Mammon and the labyrinth of greed into the dustbin of history. But Sabnak could not immediately deny Siemens. Although he wanted to shout at him to shut up, he didn't. Rather he found himself agreeing with Siemens. Feeling eerie, he looked back at the woman. The woman with blue hair was still smiling. However, the meaning of her smile was different from before. It's rude for you to call a lady's name recklessly like that, you small fry. She fidgeted with her hand. The Garden of Life obeyed its gardener's order. Dozens of giant trees that sprang up at once blocked the ramp located behind the ten warriors. Sabnak cut his fingers in order to perform his best summoning skills. Frost lifted the scroll to open the door of space. The rest of them also prepared for the fight. Their response was perfect. But the House of Mammon's forces didn't sit idle. A violet darkness arose through the energy of life in the garden. It was death. The nasty smell of death was spreading like poison. But something strange happened. Life and death, diametrically opposed to each other, did not cancel each other. Rather, they began to care for each other. An unimaginable miracle distracted Sabnak and Frost even for a moment. In the middle of their gaze stood a skeleton knight like an incarnation of death. Riding on a pitch-black beast, he released the power of death. Like a dragon peer, it made even the skeleton warriors, who were already in the realm of death, tremble with fear. One after another, death lined up. Hundreds of skeleton corps suddenly appeared and besieged the forces of the King of Gluttony. Then they rushed toward the king's forces as if not to give them any time to counterattack. It was a scene reminiscent of the waves breaking down the sandcastle. Despite the fact that they were the same skeleton army, Frost's undead army could not withstand their attack at all. It was not a fight, but a one-sided massacre. As if he was struggling desperately, Sabnak barely activated his summoning skills. A huge dark red monster was summoned above his head. It was an eight-legged spider monster, Ungoliant. Frost, who came to his senses thanks to the brief lack of mana created by the appearance of the beast, hurriedly tore the scroll. Then he concentrated his consciousness again because the flow of mana interfering with the magic of the door of space was stronger than expected. One of Mammon's twelve spirits, Scathack, appeared. The skeleton knight and the undead army that sprinkled the energy of death were unusually strong and courageous. However, seven out of the ten warriors were gathered here. Each of them had more than five horns. So, Frost thought he could concentrate hard enough even for a few minutes to complete the door of space. But it was his mistake. The moment he tried to start concentrating again, he had to raise his head. He turned his eyes automatically at the storm of strong mana that occurred not far away as if it was exploding. Each of them was powerful enough to match the ten warriors. It wasn't just Mammon's twelve spirits alone. That was why they were shocked all the more. A red beast and a wild animal. Two red demons comprising a male and female pair. Two dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon, who were known well even before they fought Embryo. A dark elf lady knight with pure white hair, 
who was an escort knight for the defense of the master of the Mammon family from the very beginning. Normally, she was supposed to be the weakest spirit of them. Tigrius Randolt, a shabby master in the southern area, and the resistance commander of the House of Mammon. Except for the unknown woman with grey hair, everyone was already familiar with the ten warriors. And their strength was already clearly quantified and recorded in the King of Gluttony's intelligence diary. But, as if to make fun of it, they released a tremendous manna. The ten warriors could not believe it. It was incredible. This was impossible. No matter how strong the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon became along with their master, it was unreasonable for them to grow this fast. In this case, there was only one possibility. They must have hidden their mana. The House of Mammon deceived the whole demon world thoroughly. Frost. Concentrate. Sabnak shouted. The ten warriors rolled their eyes and stared at the dungeon spirits of the Mammon House who began to rush toward them fiercely. Frost considered Sabnak's point right. It was not the time for them to be in awe. So, it was urgent to open the door of space, so their master could join them. Surely, the growth of the House of Mammon was amazing. However, they were the ten warriors. Even if Mammon's dungeon spirits were strong, they were no match. Moreover, Sabnak was on their side. So, the ten warriors felt relieved. As long as Frost himself completed the door of space, the current situation would soon be reversed. But it was their misjudgment again this time. The battle had already begun. It was an urgent situation in which the undead army that Frost himself summoned and those summoned by Sabnak were being slaughtered helplessly. Nevertheless, they had to pay particular attention to someone from the House of Mammon. The man standing next to the woman with blue hair. The man to whom the immortal witch Skathak, one of Mammon's twelve spirits, bowed politely. He reached out into the air then grabbed the spear of flames burning with the flames of the Red Lotus. The Demon King of Flames, that was the nickname of the master of the House of Mammon until now. Now they knew who he was. If they were shocked to confirm the existence of Skathak, this time, their shock was rather close to despair. Amun, the Spear of the Red Lotus. How could Amun burn heaven and earth and evaporate the sea with one swing? Amun was the leader of Mammon's twelve spirits. If this man controlled Amun, there was only one thing they could think of. As to confirm Frost's bleak inference, a massive whirlpool of mana was raging. My master. Amun's low voice echoed throughout the Garden of Life. Without even thinking about completing the door of space, Frost let down his hands. His master, the King of Gluttony, completely missed one fact. The one in front of him was not simply a rookie born with the power of greed. He was already a complete man and a new king, who had inherited the previous master's status. Skathak was right. There was only one word to describe the man in front of him. Frost sighed out one word, King of Greed. The battle continued. The waves of the green flames covered the Garden of Life. Only. The King of Gluttony, who was standing at the entrance to the fortress-type dungeon on the border and watching the army of the King of Violence, turned. Hiding his impatience, he stepped forward while pretending to be calm as much as possible. Afsaras, bound by shackles and unable to leave the king, trembled with fear. Fortunately for them, the King of Gluttony didn't express raging anger like he did at the last auction house. Instead of killing and eating them, he ordered them to go back. Afsaras hurried back, grateful for their sheer luck this time. However, some of them already feared that the current situation might lead to their greater misfortune. Left alone in the heart of the dungeon, the King of Gluttony held his breath. Again, he let out a long breath and concentrated his consciousness. He repeatedly confirmed the incredible fact through the heart of the dungeon. All of your connections with your subordinate spirits have been cut off. He tried to reach out to them several times but failed repeatedly. The King of Gluttony closed his eyes. Then he clutched his heart that seemed to be vacant instantly. He howled like a beast. Chapter 194 The traces of fierce battle disappeared one by one. It was as if they turned time back. The burnt wheat field swayed with the waves of golden wheat again. The cracked and huge terrain was restored, and the wind-smelling blood regained its clearness. 
the water in the lake was the same. It was as clear and blue as before without any redness. It was the giant trees that completely blocked the ramp that had been destroyed, but not restored. These were broken, and even what was left behind disappeared into the ground again. This process was also natural, considering the aspect of returning the Garden of Life to its original condition. The Garden of Life had been completely restored, even its atmosphere, let alone its appearance. The wind was cool under the blue sky surrounding the artificial sun. However, it was only the Garden of Life itself that returned to its original condition before the fierce battle. Smashed members of the Skull Unit littered the Garden of Life here and there. All the undead core of Bifrost, which the Skull Unit first confronted, fell and became nutrients of the Garden of Life, but it was clear that the Skull Unit members also incurred considerable damage. Especially, the undead that could not be healed with the power of life was fatal. Because of this, there were quite a few skulls that perished forever during the battle this time. It was the King of Gluttony's subordinate spirits and the terrifying monster Ungoliant that damaged the Skull Unit whose combat power was well known in the demon world. Yong Ho, who sprawled to the ground, caught his breath several times. He was bothered by the body of the dead Ungoliant that lay on the ground as if staring at him. He could not afford to clean it up. It was literally a fierce battle. The King of Gluttony's subordinate spirits were never weak. It was certainly true that Yong Ho himself and the subordinate spirits of the House of Mammon continued to grow rapidly. Their mana was almost equal to that of the Ten Warriors, who Sabnak preferred to call like that. However, there was a clear difference between their years of experience. In martial arts, it was very important how to manipulate one's body perfectly. What did it take to master that control? First of all, it was important to know one's own body properly. For example, one needed to know how long one's arms were, or how strong one was physically. The same was true of mana. It was only the so-called geniuses who had complete control over the sudden increase in their power. I think I'm a genius in some way. Murmuring to himself jokingly, Yong Ho raised his upper body. Fortunately, there were a lot with good combat sense among the subordinate spirits of the Mammon family. Most of the time they would make good use of their power that grew rapidly. The ten warriors were all killed. On the other hand, none of the subordinate spirits of the House of Mammon were dead or seriously injured. Even though the battle was fierce, it wasn't Yong Ho's own power that brought about this outstanding victory. The Garden of Life it was the place that Yong Ho had been pondering over since he was first warned by Embryo about the King of Gluttony. Where would he fight if he were attacked by the forces of the King of Gluttony? The only place he could think of was the Garden of Life. Since then, he has secured several more floors of the Labyrinth of Greed, but he stuck with his original plan. It was not just the Garden of Life that Skathaka's power of life restored. Skathak healed the subordinate spirits in real time, who were injured in the battle. She's got the indefinite power to heal. It must have been a hellish battleground from the standpoint of the Ten Warriors. Their enemies were recovered from their wounds and weakened physical strength in real time. Moreover, it was not just one or two of them but everyone. Yong Ho, who had fought Embryo with super-regeneration power, knew well how much it could stress out the opponents. Although the Garden of Life's rate of recovering the wounded was not as speedy as Embryo who had super-speed regeneration power, the ten warriors must have been more than shocked. After catching his breath once again, Yong Ho stood up, making a sound that looked like groaning or grunting. When he stood up, he now saw what he had not seen before because of his eye level. While everyone was exhausted, Skull, who survived in one piece, ordered its surviving members to gather the bodies of the ten warriors in one place. Several skeleton warriors were seen carrying Opelia and Elagos, who were half fainted, to Skathaka's mansion. Skull Cull. Skull laughed as if it was telling Yong Ho not to worry about the post-battle cleanup. Even though Skull received little help from Skathak because of its undead attributes, Skull ended the battle with the Ten Warriors without any major injuries. Maybe Skull was a real combat genius. Dragon Bones are really good. Skull Skull. Skull laughed when Yong Ho cracked a joke then refocused on managing its unit members. Yong Ho stood in front of the corpses of the ten warriors collected by the skulls. To be honest, there was not much to eat. 
When it came to absorbing essence, it was usually inefficient for Yong Ho to take it unless the opponent was equal to or stronger than him. The average strength of the ten warriors was about five horns. In fact, it was a tremendous power, but it was still weaker than Yong Ho himself. Moreover, the subordinate spirits like them were big after they died. Their essence has weakened. It was common for the subordinate spirits to be disconnected from their master the moment they died. Their disconnection was not only fatal to their master. Rather, it was more fatal to their master in most cases. At the moment they died, the ten warriors lost the power of the king of gluttony. Their essence would still have been helpful to the old Yong Ho, but as he was reborn as the king of greed as the owner of Amun, it didn't help him much. Moreover, half of them are undead anyway. As many as seven of them were undead. At this point, he was wondering if the king of gluttony was an undead lover, but he thought it was plausible if the king of gluttony was rational and thoughtful. He did it intentionally. Essences with the attributes of death were generally difficult to absorb. Reckless absorption more often brought harm than benefits. It was evident that the king of gluttony considered the scenario where his subordinate spirits were defeated by the enemy. Yong Ho felt the king was determined not to do anything that was beneficial to the enemy. But. But Yong Ho was not one of the typical masters in the demon world. He was the king of greed. He was greedy, and he didn't waste anything he laid his hand on. When he opened his hands, he got greedy. He extracted the essence from the bodies of six of the ten warriors. The pile of light that emerged with different colors began to get entangled and rotated, and soon, they became one large ball of light and got sucked into his palms. His whole body shook for an instant, but only once. He clenched his fist hard then completely swallowed their essence completely. His possessiveness, which could be called the true nature of greed, made even their essence with the attributes of death his own. He put together their essences to make them bigger and more valuable. He then took a deep breath. He felt that his mana grew more than before. Considering that the growth of one's mana was very difficult, starting with the sixth horn, he achieved a lot by taking their essence. Is it because of the ten warriors rather than their essence? Only. The targets of his absorption had lots of things in their essence, including their experience. But he didn't think about it anymore. He looked aside and watched the body of Frost, a lich in the shape of a skeleton. That gives me a headache. As soon as he saw Frost first, he thought it would be a good idea to make him the target of the combination evolution for Skull. However, he ran into several problems when he tried to implement it. The first problem was that Frost's ego was strong. Until now, Yong Ho had carefully selected the spirits for the material of synthetic evolution in order to preserve Skull's ego whenever he evolved him. So, he chose only those that had no ego. Even if they had very little ego, he attempted Skull's synthetic evolution only after he removed their remaining ego with the help of Ophelia's mana. Chapter 195 However, Frost was different from the materials of synthetic evolution Yong Ho had used up to now. He was a powerful lich, so he had a proper self-consciousness. Moreover, in order to inflict enough damage to the king of food addiction, Yong Ho had to kill all of the ten warriors, for the master was weakened when his subordinate spirits were killed. Yong Ho was not sure, but probably, the king of gluttony suffered a significant loss from this battle. But there was a problem here. In fact, Yong Ho had never done a synthetic evolution with a dead spirit. He once again looked down at Frost's body. It was funny to use the expression dead for this undead who had already died, but Frost died anyway. Because of this, Yong Ho didn't have to worry about his first headache, namely Frost's strong ego. It was gone forever. Yong Ho also thought that the King of Gluttony must have been weakened as a result of the defeat, which naturally addressed his concern about it. Shall I try it? As Yong Ho's mana became stronger, his power of evolution also became stronger. As things stood now, he felt he could bring about synthetic evolution by using the materials of the dead spirits. It's possible, my master. Amun. Amun, who had been silent until now, suddenly spoke out. Somehow he spoke in an emotional tone. Amun was smiling happily, perhaps because he used his power properly after a long time, or he had some other reason. Amun continued, although you can use it just once for each spirit, 
you can have synthetic evolution of the dead spirits and magic equipment with the power of evolution. Yong Ho blinked his eyes blankly. Although he was surprised at the new potential of the synthetic evolution that Amun mentioned, he had some other reason when he blinked. No way. That's true, my master. The great king of greed, Mammon, also had the power of evolution. It was something Amun had never told him before. However, Yong Ho did not regret it. Rather, he noticed the fact that Amun finally started revealing about Mammon. Yong Ho recalled what Amun told him recently. Amun said he was almost fully qualified to hear the truth about Mammon. You don't have to be too impatient, master. Although you might have hoped for it, the king of gluttony might probably be in extreme confusion by now because he didn't know anything about the situation of the battle when his subordinate spirits were all killed. The king of gluttony won't be able to find out if his spirits were killed in action or if they were squeezed to death. And that kind of uncertainty will certainly grow into a monster in his head. Its existence itself will suppress him. I recommend you take a good rest right now. Your injuries are minor, but you have used mana enough to be equal to six horns. I think you need stability right now. Skull will also wait until you recover. Skull Skull. As if on cue, Skull shouted then carried Frost's body on its shoulder, roaring with laughter. Yong Ho nodded. He turned without regret and headed to Skathaka's mansion. Bark. Bark. Wall. Wall. Awesome. Terrific. As soon as Yong Ho entered Skathaka's mansion, he received a hero's welcome. Baduk was very excited, a little dungeon meerkat was mewing on its back, and Yuria was the most excited among them. Watching Yuria and Baduk shaking their hands and feet violently, turning red in excitement, and the little strange but cute baby meerkat, he raised his head. Then he asked a blue-haired beauty who was sprawling in a chair, exhausted. Have you shown them all your fighting skills? Hey, did you expect me to help you when I was struggling to fight them with all my might? You're so mean, my little master. Even Mammon didn't do this to me. Skathak spoke in a whiny tone, shedding crocodile tears. As she liked to play a prank on him, he didn't think her weird now, but she didn't seem to pretend illness. Actually, her arms and legs were trembling while she was talking to him. The woman that appeared on the lake was actually a replica of her that she created with magic. The real Skathak, sitting on her chair even before the battle began, was absorbed into pouring out the power of life on the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon until now. Suddenly feeling sorry for her, he just licked his lips, at a loss about what to say. Right at that moment, Yuria flapped her arms and legs again and raised her voice. Cool. Cool. You're awesome. I was impressed by this one, in particular. When Yong Ho turned his eyes at her, Yuria took a deep breath. After taking a few steps back, she pointed in the air with an air of conceit and shouted, I'm the king of greed. Meowing. Meowing. Baduk and the nameless baby dungeon meerkat shouted as if to respond. Yuria made a serious expression, but she was cute. But her imitation made him embarrassed momentarily. When did he shout like that? You really said that. As always, Amun's correction weighed on his conscience. When Yuria was about to tease him again, Kaiwan, who suddenly appeared, hugged his right arm and said, You're awesome. It's really cool. Then Catalina also appeared right after her and hugged his left arm, chiming in, I also think so. Actually, both of them were the least injured in this battle. Yong Ho alternately looked at Kaiwan and Catalina then turned his eyes at Skathak who was still sprawling on the sofa, exhausted. On both sides of her chair Ophelia, Elagos, and Tigrius were asleep with their heads sticking out of the blue water that helped heal their wounds. Yong Ho slightly moved his arms held by Kaiwan and Catalina and turned toward Kaiwan. Kaiwan, can you please take Yuria upstairs? When you go there, check the status of other dungeon spirits, too. When he pointed at her, Kaiwan moved her eyebrows once and smiled. Stretching out her hand, he grabbed Catalina's arm. Catalina, go with me. Taken aback by his sudden suggestion, Catalina quickly looked at him as if to see his help. Although Catalina struggled to get out of her domineering attitude in the name of her superior status, she could not. 
That's why I asked Kai Wan because I knew she would do it like this. Go together. Send my regards to Raikam, too. He must be concerned about me. Kai Wan giggled at that while Catalina let her ears and tail droop helplessly. When Yuria and her companions, Kai Wan and Catalina, who were making a big fuss over his victory in excitement, went out, Skathaka's mansion became quiet again. Yong Ho approached her, and she fidgeted with her difficult middle finger with an effort and made a new blue water spring from the floor. Take a good rest, young master. I'm going to hit the sack after making the bed for you. Yong Ho gently dismantled the silver dragon armor and put himself in the blue water. Skathak said again, you are not yet my official master yet. You are just my young master. Do you still remember your promise to me? Don't worry. If you're talking about Gus Ion, let me bring him here sooner or later. Okay, I'll look forward to it. Skathak corrected the way she sat. Yong Ho said lastly before he closed his eyes. Well, I want to thank you for what you have done today. You are welcome. Anytime you like it, just give me an order. He felt good about her cheerful response, so he closed his eyes pleasantly. And how many minutes passed? After watching him sleep for a minute, she smiled before she knew it and whispered, Have a good night, master. What did you say? At that moment, Yong Ho opened his eyes slightly. Looking at her face, it seemed that she was pretending not to have noticed his question. When she was caught by him unexpectedly, Skathak rested her chin on her hand. Then, she said slyly like Gus Ion used to do, You're my master. Time passed fairly to everyone everywhere. That was the same when Yong Ho and his party at the House of Mammon began to take a break after their battle with the Ten Warriors. There was something passing the sky over the southern area very rapidly. With red hair and wings, it was the fastest among the Garura clan. It was none other than Gardamundi, the faithful friend and servant of the King of Fury. Kurtamukha's comment about Gardamundi was always concise. She is frivolous, promiscuous, and too cocky. Although it was far from favorable, Gardamundi was not dissatisfied with Kurtamukha's comment, for what she said was true. However, it was also true that Gardamundi was both an excellent scout and a messenger. She was one of the only four subordinate spirits of the King of Fury and was the one that could fly fastest and farthest among the Garura clan. Chapter, 196 Just as Kurtamukha accurately assessed Gardamundi's personality, she also properly evaluated her abilities. Therefore, whenever she met Gardamundi, she did not make any radical arguments, such as relieving her of her position or removing her from the list of the king's subordinate spirits, even though she complained a lot about her behavior. Maybe she might just be soft. Recalling Kurtamukha's face all of a sudden, Gardamundi giggled, flying in the air. As always, Gardamundi was flying alone. It was such a long distance from the palace of the King of Fury to Encatro Pagnium, the farthest tip of the place where the House of Mammon was located, but it was no problem for Gardamundi at all, who had the wings of a rock. It was just a few hours of flying distance to her. Huh. What happened? Just like the one flying in the sky proudly, Gardamundi also possessed a very good vision. The dungeon meerkats of the House of Mammon uncharacteristically making a great fuss was reflected in her discerning green eyes. Did anybody arrive back home? Gardamundi narrowed his eyes to check if there were any signs of outsiders' intrusion. There was definitely nobody who could dare attack the House of Mammon that unified the whole unclaimed land in the south, but there was nothing like an absolute exception in everything. Although Gardamundi had extraordinary discernment, she could notice nothing except for the traces of a large creature's landing. Instead of landing right away, Gardamundi hovered in the air and agonized a bit. Since her own visit would be the first exchange between the King of Fury and the Master of the House of Mammon, she had to be careful. Dang it, I don't know. Let me land anyway. It looks like the dungeon meerkats seem to have seen me anyway. Kurtamukha's observation of her was once again verified. Gardamundi, scratching the back of her head as if she was annoyed, landed on the ground. Then she opened Sarasvati's pocket and pulled a flag that was dozens of times larger than the pocket. The flag with the coat of arms of the King of Fury, Drydarastra, was really huge. The length of the flagpole alone was over five meters long, and the flag mixed with black and green seemed to be large enough to cover lots of people. 
When combined, the flagpole and flag weighed more than a few hundred kilograms, but Gardamundi put the flag on the ground with one hand, as if it was a light stick. After inhaling as much as her chest with the red scale armor went up and down, she shouted in a confident and loud voice. As the messenger of Her Majesty Dhritarashtra, the King of Fury, I, Gardamundi of the Garura clan, would like to ask to meet the master of the Mammon family. Of course, she didn't get their reply to her request. Instead of shouting again, Gardamundi quietly waited for the Mammon family's response, despite Kurdamukha's comments. Since she was right in front of the dungeon entrance, not only the dungeon meerkats but also the dungeon souls must have seen her. Especially, she mentioned the name of the King of Fury, not anyone else, so if she waited a little more, they would respond, she expected. Gardamundi's expectation wasn't wrong again. Within a few minutes, the entrance door of the dungeon opened. It was four men and women with green skin and a group of a dozen wolves that appeared before her. Gardamundi immediately knew that she was familiar with some of the wolves. They looked like the wolves that Embryo used to command. What kind of clan do they belong to anyway? Gardamundi's green eyes now turned to a man and woman with green skin among the wolves, and the only woman at that. The woman neatly dressed in a white shirt and a black suit made it difficult for Gardamundi to guess. With her dark straight hair swaying, she was beautiful. Her ears were pointed as if they were those of a goblin or an orc, and her skin was green, the same as that of the goblin and orc clans. She was not an orc because she had no tusks peculiar to the orc clan. Besides, she was too slim for an orc. She is not a goblin, either. Several clans came to her mind, but she could not determine which it was. And it was the same for the other three among them. They were all different from each other except for the fact that their ears were pointed, their skin was green, and they were all humanoid. The one on the wagon's coach box was big enough to be comparable to an orc, and the tall guy standing behind the woman was thin and long like an elf. Again, the person standing next to her was just ordinary, but since he stood between the two, he seemed very weird. Gardamundi stopped thinking further. After storing all their images in her mind like an excellent scout, she moved on. Just as Gardamundi first expected, the woman in a black suit came out on behalf of the group. This is June, the assistant butler of the House of Mammon. My master said that he accepted your request to see him. Please get on the carriage. A couple of men standing right behind June, the woman in black, opened the carriage door. Even without entering it, Gardamundi easily found out that it was a wagon without a single window. That was the common practice when they accepted an outside guest into a dungeon. I appreciate your master's considerations. Gardamundi replied with a cool smile then took down the flag of the King of Fury and put it again in Sarasvati's pocket. While she was doing it, the rest of the group, except for June, were impressed by her adroit skills like magic with their mouths open. How naive they are! Gardamundi, smiling again, climbed right onto the carriage. She felt quite cozy inside, but as expected, it was a stuffy space without any window. Given the wall was also quite thick, it seemed that the carriage was soundproof. After Gardamundi sat down, June, the assistant butler, and the two men standing behind him climbed into the carriage together. Oh, they're doing better than I thought. Shortly after the carriage started, Gardamundi felt her sense of direction was wrong. The mana that she released naturally also hovered around the wagon but couldn't spread beyond it. It was because of the special magic field emitted by a group of wolves that now belonged to Yongho. The reason why the herd of wolves appeared with the wagon was not because they were dispatched to escort June and the four goblin rangers. But because their presence made it impossible for the guest to grasp what was happening outside the wagon like now. The carriage moved slowly to match the walking speed of the wolves. Since the House of Mammon expanded its defense area itself, it would take considerable time to lead Gardamundi to its residential area, which in turn, allowed Yongho to ponder over the purpose of her visit. Why did she come here? Kaiwan asked as if she was unhappy about the messenger. Ophelia, who woke up hurriedly, opined, given that she came here alone without leading an envoy, she looked like a secret envoy. In other words, she might have wanted to hide her secret visit here from other kings. Obviously, what she said made sense. Hum. What she said made sense. Tigrius also agreed with her. 
Probably, she is here to ask for an alliance with us. The House of Mammon is now the proud hegemon of the southern unclaimed area. Although we haven't yet united all the powers in the south, probably we look like a very attractive candidate for the alliance from the King of Fury's point of view. Only. The King of Fury is a pretty good alliance candidate for our Mammon family because she is currently fighting the King of Gluttony, said Ophelia with a smile. This was a situation that reconfirmed the fact that the enemy of one's enemy was one's ally. But at that moment, Scathack, who was just watching them, raised her hand. By the way, is there any possibility that this messenger will make any attempt to assassinate our master? It seemed Scathack was on edge because of the attack by the King of Gluttony, but such a possibility could not be ruled out in reality. But Ophelia said, shaking her head, I don't think the King of Fury will bother to make such an attempt. Besides, she is different from the King of Gluttony. And. After a brief pause, she concluded with a prideful look, especially, our current master doesn't have to worry about anything. It was the King of Greed who made the King of Gluttony's seven spirits tremble with fear. Although Garura, who identified herself as Gardamundi, seemed to be a woman of unusual abilities, it was just unthinkable for her to do anything harmful to Yongho. Chapter, 197 Of course, Ophelia did not say that complacently because she simply trusted Yongho's unrivaled power. Yongho had Amun, who could be said to be part of him, and when he was going to see Gardamundi, Catalina and Kaiwan would be accompanying him in the reception room. In other words, Ophelia didn't want to create a situation where Yong Ho would meet Gardamundi without any preparation. Even if the King of Fury really asks for an alliance with us, there is something for us to think about. In other words, we have to find out what kind of alliance she wants, said Tigrius, who changed the main topic back to the matter of alliance. Looking at the objective indicators alone, the power of the King of Fury is overwhelmingly superior to the House of Mammon. So, she might not want an equal alliance, but something like a tributary. It was an assumption that made them frown. But the possibility was still there. It could be found only in a fairy tale that the stronger country offered an equal alliance to the weaker country. The reality was much more severe and heartless. Tigrius continued, Currently, the House of Mammon has already begun an invisible war with the King of Gluttony. I think it's important to know whether the King of Fury is aware of that. Yong Ho, who closed his eyes for a moment, sorted out his thoughts and asked, What is the worst situation? It is when you become the enemy of the King of Fury, Ophelia replied immediately. Yong Ho nodded and said, Okay, that's enough. Let me listen to what the messenger has to say first before going further. Yong Ho stood up from his seat after devising his own response in his mind. Then he asked Eligos, who was about to get up as if he suddenly hit upon something. By the way, where are you taking me now? To the Demon King's room on the first floor. He asked because it was unreasonable for Eligos to escort the messenger to the first floor of the Labyrinth of Greed, not the House of Mammon. Tigrius replied quickly, usually, an outsider like her is led to a place like a reception room. But we don't have such a place here. Tigrius looked back at Eligos as if to double-check with him. Put on the spot at the moment, Eligos hurriedly bowed to Yongho and said, Sorry. I didn't know if we would need a reception room so quickly because we have enemies around us. Well, I'm not blaming you now so, where are you taking me now? Before answering immediately, Eligos made eye contact with Ophelia, who made an embarrassed expression like him, then awkwardly said, It's a VIP room at the gambling hall. The ten warriors, the royal bodyguards of the King of Gluttony, consisted of eight subordinate spirits and two general spirits. Abigor and Emdugias, who was watching the King of Envy's war with the King of Pride while leading their troops from the northern area, hurriedly leapt to a space after being summoned by the King of Gluttony. Since they passed through the facilities that the King of Gluttony had previously installed in his estate, they could actually cross the entire territory of the King of Gluttony in less than an hour. Since they were summoned so urgently, Abigor, the devil with the head of a leopard, and Amdugius, with the head of a pure white unicorn, were quite embarrassed. They were even more perplexed because they already knew that the ten warriors except for them had already been summoned. When they noticed that an Afsaras were more scared than usual, they felt that something big enough to anger the king happened. 
The closer they got to the reception room where the king was waiting for them, the more anxious and worried they became for no reason. However, Abigor and Amdugias were faithful enough to be included in the ten warriors. Paying more attention to the event that angered the king than the king's anger itself, they hurried to the reception room. I, Abigor, am honored to see your excellency. I, Amdugias, am honored to see your excellency. The king of gluttony was sitting at the end of the spacious room decorated with translucent fabrics with ceilings, walls, and floors. He was almost naked as if he just had sex, and there were several half-naked or naked afsaras lying all over the room. The king of gluttony threw one afsaras on the floor who was groaning as if she was about to die and gestured to Abigor and Amdugias. Come closer. The king's order was absolute. Suppressing a sense of uneasiness, Abigor and Amdugias approached the king. The king poured liquor into the cups for the two in person. As soon as they gulped it down, the king said, Abigor, Amdugias. I'm going to make you my subordinate spirits from now on. He made a bombshell announcement. Abigor and Amdugias couldn't open their mouths in amazement mixed with various meanings. The number of his subordinate spirits was limited. Nonetheless, the king just announced that they would make the two his subordinate spirits. Was there a vacancy now? If so, what happened? Although they had doubts, they were full of joy at the same time. How long have they earnestly coveted this position? Even though they were not his subordinate spirits, they rose to the status of the ten warriors. It was clear that if they could become his subordinate spirits and directly share the power of the king, they would be able to reach a much higher level than now in terms of power. But the king of gluttony didn't give Abigor and Amdugias time to think about it. As soon as he was done talking, the king put his big hands on the shoulders of the two to perform the ceremony. It took just one minute or so at most. Abigor and Amdugias felt they were reborn completely anew. They roared in great joy and pleasure and felt thrilled by the mighty manna that soared inside their body. The king of gluttony's voice was heard again in the ears of the two who were indulged in spiritual ecstasy. The king said calmly, I haven't given you all yet. There is a little more I can give you. Close your eyes and try to relax. Subdue your manna. Abigor and Amdugias immediately followed the king. They closed their eyes and suppressed their soaring manna. It took almost ten minutes or more for them to do it because they were just done reinforcing mana as a result of their transformation into his subordinate spirits. And finally, they managed to subdue all their mana. Abigor and Amdugias became calm and waited for the king's next words. The king of gluttony withdrew his hands from their shoulders then touched their chests. The king tore the hearts of the two and pulled out their hearts immediately. It happened so quickly. The moment they felt the pain, the king was done already. Oh, your excellency. Abigor barely managed to open his mouth. Amdugias collapsed, vomiting blood. Instead of looking at the two, the king stared at their beating hearts in his hands. He began to eat them full of essence entirely. Then he activated the power of gluttony. He still felt he was lacking. Although the mana he gained by eating the two after making them his subordinate spirits was greater than that of those who died, the king felt he was still lacking in mana. The loss of his eight subordinate spirits in succession was so devastating to him. The king of gluttony stretched out his hands. Then he chewed Abigor and Amdugias alive, who were still breathing because of their strong vitality. His newly aroused gluttony strengthened him by drawing every little power from what he had already eaten. The king of gluttony now lost all of the ten warriors. The king of violence and the king of fury were still healthy and active. And the war in the north would be finished within a few months, no matter how long it would take. It was a precarious situation. After sitting idle and passing time like this, there would unfold a situation in which the king of gluttony himself would be eaten as the weakest king, to his embarrassment. He had to avoid it by all means. So, he made the decision while crushing Amdugias's bones. Although they tended to forget it easily, overwhelmed by the seven deadly sins, each king had his own power as a demon king. With his current power as the king of gluttony, there was still a possibility for him to turn the tide. So, he had to recover even a little more power if he could. 
Although he hardly used his power after becoming one of the six kings, it didn't mean that his power was weakened or disappeared. He believed that the power that had sustained him from the time he was an insignificant demon would give him a chance to overtake again. Therefore, the king of gluttony did not hesitate. That was why he restored his strength by killing the remaining two of the ten warriors who barely survived until now. He continued to eat his loyal servants. Chapter 198 The five directors of Dungeon Market had different areas to take care of. It was the strongest power, Oroba, among them who was in charge of the territory of the King of Pride, north of the Demon World. Because of this, if the King of Pride wanted to make a secret deal with the Dungeon Market, just as the King of Gluttony made a secret deal with Samuel. The Lady with the Fastest Wing, who is in charge of the east of the Demon World, he had to face none other than the manager of the North, Oroba. But the one that the King of Pride was facing now was a completely different person. It was in a large, spacious room, but only two were facing each other now. As always, the King of Pride was dressed in white. The one sitting across from him wore colorful robes and boasted of his gorgeous look befitting his robes. His seven horns standing tall like his pride caught the king's eye first. His head shaped like a rooster's with coxcomb and his two legs made of a snake with different poisons also evoked a strange and mysterious feeling. He was one of the five directors of the dungeon market, namely Abrasax, the strongest mana holder. He was originally in charge of the west side of the demon world. The King of Fury and the King of Violence were supposed to be his clients. You were doing great. Congratulations. The most important thing in the demon world, which could be called a world where the strong preyed upon the weak, was the strength or weakness of one's mana. At least, Abrasax thought so. Abrasax's nickname, the strongest mana holder, was not a fake or exaggeration. He was truly the strongest mana holder that the dungeon market boasted of. There was nobody comparable to him in terms of pure mana among the five directors who stood shoulder to shoulder with him. This man with such a tremendous power talked politely to the other man. He never used honorific language when he was dealing with anybody who was weaker than himself. He used honorifics only when dealing with someone who was at least on par with him. The King of Pride was well aware of this. That was why he felt happy when Abrasax greeted him even briefly. The King of Envy is just a hysterical old man. In fact, what really matters is what happens next, the king said. He was talking about what to do after defeating the King of Envy, or to be precise, what would happen right before he defeated the king. Unfortunately, it seems difficult for me to help you openly at this point, sir. Abrasax, who had a rooster-shaped head, had nothing like facial expressions on his face. The only thing that could tell his feelings was his two eyes under his seven horns shaped like a crown. The King of Pride didn't bother to look into his eyes. As before, he responded leisurely, I don't care because the dungeon market is like that in the first place. It has been like that since it was first made. He twisted his voice at the end, suggesting he was very displeased at the moment. Not knowing whether he noticed a subtle change in the king's voice, Abrasax asked with a surprised look, do you know the beginning of the dungeon market? Oops. Sorry about my stupid question. If there is one place in this demon world that is older than this dungeon market, it is the royal family of the King of Pride. The king was not sure if he really made a mistake or if he deliberately tried to promote the royal family of the King of Pride. But the King of Pride didn't feel better. Just thinking about the start of the dungeon market or merely recalling the reason why the founder of the dungeon market established it made him even more displeased. In fact, even the five directors of the dungeon market did not know about its founder, let alone why he established the dungeon market. The founder was arrogance itself. And it was just absurd to know that the product of his arrogance had been continuing through thousands of years until this moment. The King of Greed The man who doesn't exist anymore, who had never shown himself for a thousand years. Therefore, the title King of Greed was used for only one person in the demon world. It was impossible to think of anyone else. The King of Pride tried to subdue his displeasure. After reading his intentions, Abrasax began to talk about the deal earnestly. A secret deal was struck between one of the six kings and one of the five directors. And the deal was a little more special than any other secret deal. It's very unusual. Gardamundi, 
who was led by June, the assistant butler, to a rather luxurious room, sat down and looked around. No matter how often she looked at the room, it was far from a typical reception room. When it came to the reception room of a demon king, it was supposed to have a wonderful royal throne, vassals of the king standing on his left and right, and a wonderful red carpet leading from the king's chair. But this room was different. First of all, it was small, and there were a sofa and a table. The sofa resembling a semicircle as if to hug a shiny table was soft and comfortable, but very suspicious. She felt like she was in a high-class bar room. Furthermore, Gardamundi rolled her eyes again. She fixed her eyes at the ventilation at the corner of the wall made of red and colorful wallpaper. She saw four glowing eyes through the lattice-patterned lid of the flat and long ventilation openings. One pair of them belonged to a little girl and the other pair was those of a baby dungeon meerkat. They didn't seem like a watcher. She felt like they were rather little kids who came out secretly out of curiosity. Is she the master's daughter? Maybe not. Gardamundi looked straight again, feeling rather complicated. Fortunately, she heard the voice of June, the assistant butler at that moment. Our master has arrived. The very door where Gardamundi entered was opened. Gardamundi once again had doubts about the authenticity of the reception room, but she hastily got it out of her mind. Now it was more important for her to welcome the master of the Mammon family. Gardamundi quickly got up from her seat and turned to the door. When she made eye contact with him naturally, she greeted him politely by putting her hands together. Gardamundi of the Garura clan, the messenger of Her Majesty the King of Fury, is honored to greet the master of the House of Mammon. Nice to meet you. You must be tired from your long journey here. Thanks for coming. Make yourself at home. At the moment, Yong Ho was torn between using honorific language and talking informally, but he chose the latter to be on the safe side. As if she didn't expect his honorifics, Gardamundi looked slightly surprised but sat down with a smile. Then Yong Ho sat in a one person chair across from Gardamundi. Catalina, Kaiwan, and Ophelia, who followed him, stood behind his back. Was the rumor true that he was a womanizer? She once heard rumors that he was accompanied by several women all the time. She felt the rumors might be true. Hum his sexual preference is unique. A dark elf with a sober expression, a sharp-looking beauty with gray hair, and a red demon woman who looks pretty mature. Gardamundi noticed that she was bothered by the gaze of the woman with gray hair, in particular. In a situation like this, Gardamundi would have taken issue with it and pick a fight, but she didn't. She was in the House of Mammon, and above all, she came here as the envoy of the King of Fury. After ignoring her sharp gaze, she got up again and presented the gift she had brought. It's Amrita that the King of Fury made herself. She didn't have to explain further because it was obviously a gift of friendship. Ophelia received a golden box containing Amrita gladly on behalf of Yongho. It seemed that they were going to have a successful talk. The King of Fury wants to build a good relationship with the Mammon family. I think her message in this letter is better than my voluminous words. She has written it in person. Here was a letter the king wrote herself, in addition to the precious liquor she made in person. Ophelia smiled more happily, unlike Kaiwan whose facial expressions became a little more ferocious. After handing over the golden box containing Amrita to Catalina, Ophelia walked again to the front and accepted the letter. After checking it out briefly, she gave it to Yongho. He took a big breath because the scent leaking out of the letter was really pleasant, as if to confirm the widespread rumors that Gondar was a clan with a good smell. He even felt his heart was pounding for no reason. He opened the envelope and took out the letter. Her soft, gentle handwriting that befitted her fresh and nice look caught his eyes. It took about a dozen seconds for him to read the letter. While everybody was waiting for his reply in a tense moment, Yongho folded the letter and asked Gardamundi, can you wait for a moment until I write a reply? Sure, please. I'm going to wait gladly. Then excuse me for a moment. Chapter, 199 He stood up from his seat and left the VIP room of the gambling house slowly. A VIP lounge located not far from the gambling VIP room. Kaiwan shook her head with the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon gathering there. 
she said, this is exactly what I expected. There was something special when they made eye contact with each other that day. Yong Ho wanted to ask about the reason why there was a VIP gambling room and restroom when there was no reception room, but now was not the time for him to dwell on it. After ignoring Kai Wan's reaction, he convened an emergency meeting with his aides. In the letter, the King of Fury expressed her wishes rather directly. In summary, the gist of the letter was as follows. Ophelia said, It is obvious that she is a kind person, contrary to the rumors that she is a warmonger. This time, Tigrius expressed his opinion. Looking at the letter, she is polite, and she is not making any unequal demands. I'm a bit bothered by the lack of details of her demands, but her proposal to start exchanges sounds very good. Alliance with the King of Fury was what the House of Mammon wanted, too. The current situation was different from when Yong Ho had to fight the enemies everywhere in the southern area. He needed more allies now because he rose to the same position as the six kings in the demon world. In fact, he was also quite excited because it was the first time somebody made a proposal for a military alliance to him after he became the master of the House of Mammon. So, he asked, recalling the King of Fury's face, do you think it's okay if I just write I welcome the king's proposal? Since he received her handwritten letter, it was polite for him to deliver his own letter, as well. Ophelia replied, it would be nice to let the King of Fury know that our war with the King of Gluttony has actually begun I think it's too early to tell her now. Tigrius added, the King of Gluttony lost almost all of his subordinate spirits because of the battle today. Since he suffered such big damage, he won't be able to do anything about the Hazu of Mammon for some time. We have enough time to build a good friendship with the King of Fury. Yong Ho nodded and said unwittingly, how fortunate. It looks like the King of Fury will be our ally, not an enemy. Now that Yong Ho started confronting the King of Gluttony, he had to avoid making a new enemy. However, another king, who happened to stand up against the King of Gluttony, reached out to him first. This was a situation where God helped Yong Ho. By the way, Master, shouldn't we prepare some gift for the King of Fury? Catalina asked, looking down at the golden box in her arms like the letter, the box also smelled extremely fragrant. As if she was right, Ophelia immediately chimed in, her gift, Amrita, is not an ordinary gift. It is an expensive item, also called the elixir of immortality. Moreover, if Gandharva's chieftain, King of Fury, has made it herself, its value is really tremendous. Hmm. He was happy to receive a great gift, but the problem was that he had to send an equivalent gift to her. If he sent a gift with much less value than hers, it could negatively affect the King of Fury's good intentions, who proposed starting exchanges. Ophelia said again with a smile, I'm going to select some of the good stuff from Stravati's collection. From the King of Fury's viewpoint, the House of Mammon is a prestigious family that has just restored their past glory, so if you can only show your sincerity in a gift, it will do. In other words, the King of Fury would not expect any expensive gift commensurate with hers. At that moment, however, Catalina raised her hand somewhat timidly and said, Uh, how about sending her some chicken, along with the gift? Uh. Yong Ho blinked, not knowing what she was talking about, but other spirits reacted differently. Eligo said first, It's not a bad idea. Chicken is also a special product of our Mammon family. Wait a minute. Special product? When was it established as a special product? Tigrius agreed with Eligos and said, If we use the magic of conservation, it won't take much time to send the chicken to the King of Fury. If you tell her you fried the chicken in person, I think it's a very good gift because it carries your respect for her. Hey, isn't it an open exchange between kings? Asked Ophelia, giggling loudly. Well, it's a secret exchange this time because the King of Fury doesn't know yet that our master is the King of Greed. It also means our intention that we want to start exchanges step by step as she wanted. So, I also agree with Eli Brother's opinion. I think it would be nice to include some chicken in the gift. Seeing them agreeing with her opinion, Catalina flapped her ears and tail, feeling proud. Kaiwan tapped Yong Ho, who was confused at the moment. Be proud. Your chicken is the best. Skull Skull, yelled Skull as if to agree. After all, Yong Ho accepted their suggestion and wore an apron to fry chickens. 
I think he is the best candidate as a groom, Kudamukha said with a confident expression. Gardamundi, sitting on the other side, shook her head while eating chicken legs in both hands. Gosh! I think you were lured by some delicious food. If not, how come you are trying to entice our king to get married to that guy? Yum, yum! Don't you think you're going too far? Kudamukha wanted to shout to her to eat the chicken in her mouth first before talking, but she narrowed her eyes because she was bothered by something. Looking at the chicken bones piled up in front of Gardamundi, she said, Is it okay for a chicken to eat chicken? It's not chicken, it's chicken powder. I know you like to eat pork, you bitch. Gardamundi snapped sharply, but Kurtamukha laughed it off because she was satisfied with the fact that she made Gardamundi provocative, who was relaxed and composed. Anyway, that's my overall evaluation of him. I'm not a person lured by delicious food. Having said it seriously, Kurtamukha turned her eyes at the King of Fury. There were four colored boxes in front of her, and each of them contained fried chicken that she had never seen before. Kurtamukha raised her finger when the King of Fury picked up what was called soy chicken. First of all, he is not under the control of any king. Tasting the savory soy sauce chicken, the King of Fury shrugged her shoulders slightly. In no time, she looked at the seasoned chicken. Second, he is a man. The seasoned chicken tasted sour. In particular, chicken skin with plenty of seasoning was fantastic. The crispy and oily taste of the skin stimulated her appetite. Third, he is the king of the southern unclaimed land, not anywhere else. Geographically, it's good to make him our ally. When the king of fury's gaze turned to Padak in the third box, Kurtamukha drew a picture with light in the air. After drawing the entire map of the demon world immediately, she made a lump with a new color. If our secret alliance with the king of violence works properly, we can confront the north by joining hands with him in the whole southern land. And that's not the only geographic advantage. The king of fury put some radish among the chicken in her mouth. The radish, cut into just the right size to eat, took away the greasy taste in her mouth. Besides, its crunchy texture was so good. Feeling satisfied, Gardamundi presented something called coke to her. Kurtamukha kept talking alone while the two were absorbed into enjoying the fried chicken and drinking coke. I heard that there are not many people in the southern area, given its vast area. Besides, the population there has decreased because of the current clash there. In other words, the situation in the south was a sharp contrast with that in the land of the King of Fury. The territory ruled by the King of Fury had lots of mountains, so there was not much land for the people to live. Besides, there were many countries sharing borders with it, so there occurred small disputes constantly. As a result, the population density was too high in the inland area where people could live stably. If our talks with the master of the House of Mammon goes very well and build a good relationship with them, we may be able to move some of our people to the south. Although the southern area is a bit barren, people still live there, so it would be nice for our people to live there, she said. Moreover, the southern land was much safer. Kurtamukha still had doubts about the King of Violence, but if the King of Violence could really be trusted as an ally, like the King of Fury said, the situation would be completely different from now. Chapter, 200 The southern area shared its border with the territories of the three kings the King of Violence, the King of Fury, and the King of Gluttony. If two of them were the King of Fury's allies, the only king left out was the King of Gluttony. Since there was only one hostile border and the King of Gluttony had to confront the other three, it was only natural that the King of Fury would see a greater stable area than now. The southern area was a land that none of the kings was supposed to occupy. But if somebody joins hands with the king of the southern land quickly, other kings won't dare to do anything. This was in line with what the king of gluttony had thought of initially. But he differed on the method of using the southern area. The king of gluttony intended to set up a puppet king and rule the southern area from behind the scenes, but Kurtamukha wanted the king of fury to obtain the whole southern land through a marriage alliance. Fourth, since he is an outsider, he doesn't have any interests in our eight race people. In other words, there is no chance he can cause any political conflict here. As the name suggests, eight race people consisted of eight different clans. They were the Deva, Dragon, Garura, Gandharv, Yacha, Azura, Kalavinka, Maharaga. 
With the clans as many as eight in one country, there were constant quarrels. Their fighting did not escalate because of bigger enemies surrounding them. But there were some clans pitted against each other, such as Dragon vs. Garura, and Kalavinka vs. Maharaga. That was one of the reasons why the King of Fury did not choose her groom until now. If the King of Fury, the head of Gondorf clan and the King of the Eight clans, chose a man from any particular clan as her groom, it was highly likely that her selection itself would disrupt the stable order within the Eight clans. So, she had to choose her groom from the outside, but she could not find the right candidate until now because those who were qualified to be her groom were under the control of another king without any exception. She continued, Fifth, he has a good personality. If he can make a delicious dish as a gift like this, he must be a fine character. Are you listening to me now? Kurtamukha narrowed her eyes. The King of Fury, who was enjoying original fried chicken with relish after dipping it in salt, nodded quickly, startled by her question. Of course, I am. I was listening, she hurriedly replied. The red seasoning on her left finger belied her reply, but Kurtamukha approached her a little closer instead of questioning her further. Then she said in a strong tone, Then, do you agree with me? The King of Fury was about to nod on impulse, while Gardamundi, watching her reaction quietly, clicked her tongue. She struck Kurtamukha in the back of the head with her hand full of chicken oil. Hey, Gardamundi! She shouted angrily, which was terrible enough to reveal her nature as a Yacha woman. However, Gardamundi took it leisurely and gave her a chicken leg. Even the enraged Yacha woman relented, enchanted again with the fantastic taste of the fried chicken that she just received before she knew it. I know you're pretty much impatient, but don't rush it too much, said Gardamundi. With a grumpy expression, Kurtamukha ate the chicken leg. Gardamundi grinned at her then put her ass close to the King of Fury. She asked in a gentle voice, What do you think of him? Do you like him? I really like it. Especially, I love this seasoned chicken goodham. Blushing a bit after she knew she gave the wrong answer, the King of Fury tried to hide her embarrassment by clearing her throat. After catching her breath once, she said calmly, since the current situation in the border area is not unusual, we can't stay relaxed forever. I think it is necessary to properly build an alliance with the House of Mammon in the southern area. If we can build a coalition with the King of Violence and the Master of the House of Mammon, we can not only effectively pressure the King of Gluttony, but also keep the King of the Northern Area at bay. She didn't yet know the fact that Yongho literally had smashed the ten warriors, who could be called the core of the King of Gluttony's forces. If she had known it, even Kurtamukha would have wanted an alliance with the House of Mammon more. After listening to the King of Fury seriously, Garda Mundi nodded as if she expected it. Then she took her face closer to the King of Fury and said, Then I have a clever scheme. Clever scheme? A bit anxious, the King of Fury asked back, pulling her body slightly back. Gardamundi said, getting closer to her more even after the King of Fury stepped back, Yes, it is. Why don't you propose to meet him? Whether you want an alliance or more than that, you need to meet the master of the Mammon family anyway. The King of Fury could not respond readily. Gardamundi put her face much closer to her and said, Yes, you meet him. Normally, the King of Fury would have ignored her words, calling her crazy, but for some reason, the king rolled her eyes shyly before nodding quietly. A bright smile was on Kurtamukha's face, and Gardamundi was satisfied. She suddenly stood up and said, Tomorrow, I will visit the House of Mammon again to convey your message. Please give me your handwritten letter oh, no, please make a video. Video? Yes, video. The King of Fury blinked then gulped before she knew it. Chicken in peace. Everyone seems to be happy. Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits were floating in the blue water prepared by Skathak at her mansion. He was rather tired at the chicken party held to celebrate the war victory right after seeing off Gardamundi, but he felt fully satisfied with the results. I think I have to go back home soon and bring some more ingredients, especially coke. He closed his eyes, thinking of his trip back to the human world. He wanted to have a good and sound sleep right away, but he couldn't, for he had to devise some plan to deal with the new proposal from the King of Fury. The key is how the King of Gluttony moves forward, said Ophelia, who was in the blue water like Elagos. 
The ten warriors he lost this time were not only his subordinate spirits but also generals who led their own army. Although there are still many powerful demon kings under his command, it's certain that his main force has been weakened considerably. That was what Tigrius had already pointed out. However, the situation now was somewhat different from when he mentioned it first, for an envoy sent by the King of Fury visited the House of Mammon. The King of Gluttony is now engaged in a war of nerves with the forces of the two kings, the King of Violence and the King of Fury, at the borders. It is very likely that the King of Gluttony was trying to hide the fact that his ten warrior group was annihilated because the current crisis facing him is a golden chance for the other two kings. Then, would it be better to leak the tips about this to the King of Fury? Yong Ho asked. The fact that the House of Mammon defeated the ten warriors was significant in various ways. It could reveal the power of the Mammon family to the King of Fury, but at the same time, it had the symbolic meaning in that he gave the King of Fury a gift with sensitive intelligence about the King of Gluttony. Generally, both sides should be roughly equal in power for a strong alliance. In other words, a unilateral alliance with one dependent on the other would not last long. Tigrius, who was silent, answered Yongho's question, I don't think it's a bad idea. The more aggressive the King of Fury becomes, the more difficult it will be for the King of Food to pay attention to us. In the meantime, we will be able to gain more time. Time. As it was important to everybody, time was especially a valuable resource to the House of Mammon. Being strong in a short time was only possible for a beginner. So, it was common for those who had already reached a certain level to go through ups and downs while growing stronger. However, there was still enough room for growth on the part of the Mammon family. Yong Ho had yet to occupy half the labyrinth of greed, and there were many floors for him to challenge in the arena. Crucially, Yong Ho had the power of evolution. He could gain more evolution EXP through hard struggles. Having gained considerable EXP during their fight with the Ten Warriors, he could use the power of evolution once again if all of his subordinate spirits strived a little more effort in the arena. Mammon, the King of Greed, also had the power of evolution. And Yong Ho understood why the Twelve Spirits of Mammon could become so strong. It was because of the power of evolution. That power led their power to the highest level. Come to think of it, even synthetic evolution could combine other items, right? As if he suddenly remembered it, Yong Ho asked, looking at his right arm. Amon answered immediately. Chapter, 201 Yes, my master. But like I said before, you can use it only once per spirit. Please consider it carefully. Hmm. Yong Ho alternately looked at Catalina and Kai Wan, who were in the blue water like him. Catalina just flapped her ears, but Kai Wan strongly signaled to him that he should not take any item blindly. It seemed that Kai Wan wanted him to bring at least a dragon heart. Okay, let me give you my guideline. All the eyes of his subordinate spirits were fixed on him. The same was true of Skathak, who was seated on a chair and was eating chicken alone. He said, tomorrow let me meet Citri first. I need to pick up something I asked her for, and I also have to get her advice about the current situation. Next, let's challenge the arena together. He had to find out the magic circle and materials necessary to install a magic field to detect or interfere with flying magic. In order to defend the entire southern land, he had to block the threat of the King of Gluttony first, so not only Yong Ho himself, but also his subordinate spirits needed to be much stronger than now. It's a long day today. Let's go and take some good rest. See you tomorrow. Good night. Have a good rest. They said good night to each other. Yong Ho also closed his eyes, determined to get a deep sleep this time. The King of Gluttony constantly wanted food. At the same time, he kept pondering over a couple of questions. How would the master of the House of Mammon think about him? Objectively, how would he himself move? His answer was to stay put, waiting for a good chance. That was the best option to keep what he already possessed. But he was not supposed to do it. If he kept being on the defensive in a chaotic situation like this, it was certain that he would be consumed by bigger turbulence and turmoils in the coming days. Tomorrow. The King of Gluttony withdrew his power he had activated as a test. He turned inside a huge empty space. 
he noticed his royal bodyguards consisting of death knights and vampires. He also faced the bone dragons behind them. It was time for him to take the risk, just like he had always done so since he was a preta, the lowest demon. Now he had to bet everything to gain more power. The king of gluttony turned back. Looking to the south, he felt the power of godly energy. He controlled the power of sin and the power of energy surging in his body. The next day. It was time for him to go hunting once again. Thanks to Skathaka's blue water, Yongho did not fall asleep for a long time even though he was exhausted. He stroked Catalina's head, who was still having trouble getting up early in the morning. He then left Skathaka's mansion after kissing Kaiwan's cheek lightly, who was half asleep. He noticed the Skull unit doing farming even early in the morning. Skull was also digging potatoes with a hoe in its hand. He wondered if Skull was not a knight commander or a famous warrior but an excellent farmer in its previous life. Looking at Skull waving at him, he was lost in idle thought for a moment. Then he headed to the Demon King's room after leaving the Garden of Life. Good morning. Wall. Wall. Yuria, who was cleaning the room early in the morning, bowed to him politely. Baduk, who was mopping the floor, thought her greeting was natural, but it seemed to be quite strange to the baby dungeon meerkat on Yuria's head. In any case, all three were the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon, who were cute to Yongho, so he didn't care. He briefly thought about buying a dungeon hamster. He returned Yuria's greetings by stroking her head and sat on the throne. The throne also saw some different changes from when he saw it first. The stone throne, which was just rusty, had some pretty good pieces attached to it, as well as a cushion on the back to make him feel comfortable. While gently rubbing the smooth throne handle, Yong Ho called Lucia. Then he accessed the virtual space of the dungeon market. My dear client, I love you very much, but I can't love you if you visit me so early like this. Citri was almost buried in a huge cushion that was hard to tell if it was a bed or a sofa. She was wearing a see-through negligee he had seen before, and a cute sleeping cap that did not match the negligee showing her maturity. Embarrassed at the scene, Yongho smiled awkwardly, trying to avoid seeing her eyes. Ah. Uh, is it too early? Of course. You know, a beautiful woman is a sleepyhead. Taking off her sleeping cap, Citri fidgeted with her fingers in succession. A purple nightgown that appeared in the blink of an eye wrapped her negligee. The large cushion that she was buried in also turned into a nice chair. She quickly did a light makeup then faced him proudly. Since he was trying not to spy on her quick change, he now said with a more relaxed expression, I want to discuss something with you. Yong Ho knew early on that Citri was Mammon's lover. But only recently did he begin to ask for her help shamelessly like this. In fact, it was the first time he did so at the auction house recently. Citri narrowed her eyebrows a little as if she wanted to point it out, too, but she quickly smiled gently. She said, leaning against the back of her chair, Hmm, it seems like you ask for my help too openly, but that is also your charm. So, say what you want this time. He took a breath. He then listed the gist of what happened yesterday. Making Amun his subordinate spirit. Destroying the ten warriors of the King of Gluttony. The King of Fury's request for exchanges. After listening to each of what he said, Citri bit her lower lip instead of answering right away. She nodded several times and finally opened her mouth. It seems the situation is pretty much urgent. In fact, she also expected that the King of Gluttony would start a war. Perhaps, the sudden movement of the forces of the King of Violence must have provoked him. What she didn't expect was rather the King of Fury's action. Little did she think that the King of Fury warmed to the master of the House of Mammon so suddenly. Is it because of her encounter with him at the auction house? Citri laughed bitterly because she recalled some memories naturally. It pleased her just to recall it, but at the same time, it made her heartbroken. She opened her mouth again. She buried memories in her heart and faced the present. She said to the new king of greed, if you make an alliance with the king of fury, I think it's an ideal one because she has a pretty good relationship with the king of violence. As for that point, Yongho was guessing like her to some extent, for the king of violence and the king of fury didn't show any sign of hostility toward each other even when they moved their troops toward the king of gluttony. 
What Yong Ho needed was a basis for confirming his guesswork, so Citri's words deepened his conviction. Like Citri said, if he built a good relationship with the King of Fury, he could have a large coalition covering the entire southern area of the demon world. Citri shook her head, watching him somewhat excited. She said with a sigh, anyway, you don't have to imitate the bad side of the King of Fury, though. What do you mean, Citri? Citri knew much better about the King of Fury than him. No matter what others said about her, she was one of the five directors of the dungeon market from the time it was founded. Even though she was living in near seclusion, she boasted of her considerable intelligence capabilities. What if their meeting at the auction house was really the start of this kind of exchange? Citri, who sighed again, let her shoulders droop. Well, let me take care of your concern anyway since you are the king of greed. Let me stop my services for you here. Shall we talk about our deal now? She fidgeted with her fingers with a smile then a large catalogue appeared in the air. He could figure out what Citri would say. As he expected, Citri said, opening the catalogue wide. You recently asked me for an undead type spirit that could do necromancing, right? I found a suitable one for you. Yong Ho turned his eyes at the picture of one spirit in the catalogue. Be extremely careful, so you don't make the same mistakes. Of course, the images of our king in the video will overwhelm him, but don't forget that any of your behavior directly affects our king's honor. Kurdamukha gave Gardamundi a sharp reminder with a serious expression, but as always, she briefly smiled then let her warning in one ear and out the other. Just as she did when writing the letter in person, the King of Fury seemed tired after attempting to shoot the best images of her look in the video several times. Chapter, 202 But she said, with a bright smile, I hope I'm in your good hands. If we form an alliance with him, our people will be able to live more safely. Besides, we will be able to overcome the upcoming fighting in the north with less damage. I just hope that you can make your private wishes come true, too. When Gardamundi said it, the King of Fury blushed, but she didn't get angry. As if she liked the King's shy response again, Gardamundi giggled at her. Actually, she was not sure if she could have a good personal relationship with the master of the House of Mammon, but she hoped she could hit it off with him well. Then, as a faithful friend and loyal servant of Her Majesty Dhritarashtra, I, Gardamundi of the Garura clan, will leave for the southern area to carry out your order. Goodbye for now. The King of Fury hugged Gardamundi gently. Gardamundi winked at Kurdamukha, who was grumbling quietly over there then turned around. Without any hesitation, she jumped down to the ground from the balcony of the king's room. Right at that moment, a strong wind blew. Spreading her red wings widely, Gardamundi headed to the south. The king of gluttony left his palace at dawn. Flying through the red sky of the demon world, he reminisced about his past. He went through tough days. Being born as a preda, the weakest demon in the demon world, where the strong preyed on the weak, was like being born with the fate of disappearing as somebody else's meal or plaything. But the king of gluttony stood up on his own feet. He ate the same predas to increase his power and rose to the throne of the king step by step at the end of the day. He didn't reminisce about his past because he wanted to indulge in anything like sentimentalism. Actually, he wanted to recall his own identity that he had forgotten since he became the king. If the ten warriors had been alive, they might have stopped him from advancing into the south. He was pretty sure they would. He was faced with too much danger. The forces of the King of Fury and the King of Violence were showing threatening movement. The power of the House of Mammon in the south was almost unknown. That was why he had to move. There were limits to what he could obtain without taking risks. If he had only chosen a comfortable path, he would never have climbed to his present status. The King of Gluttony landed on the ground. As a result of high-speed flying magic, his body got heated up. He took a deep breath. He saw the entrance to the dungeon of the House of Mammon and the dungeon meerkats hanging around there. The King of Gluttony opened his hands. Then he made the undead army that he had prepared for his fight with the six kings descend on the ground. A barrage of raids day after day really shook the House of Mammon. Lucia immediately cut off the connection between Yong Ho and the virtual space of the dungeon market. Instead, she showed Yong Ho how the King of Gluttony was destroying the entrance to the dungeon of the House of Mammon. 
the king of gluttony did not appear alone. There were dozens of death knights beside him. There were also five mighty vampire lords, also called No Life King. To talk about each of these spirits, they were inferior to the ten warriors, but it was important to know that the king of gluttony was among them. Now, Yong Ho had two options. One was to lure them into the Garden of Life before he fought them just like he did when he fought the Ten Warriors. The other was to weaken their power by using the House of Mammon a bit. Both options had strengths and weaknesses. Yong Ho did not have time to compare the two for long. He suddenly stood up from the throne. He didn't need to summon all the dungeon spirits because all of them were gathered in Skathaka's mansion. He tried hard to calm down. The surprise attack by the King of Gluttony obviously caught him off guard, but this place was his own dungeon. So, he had to avoid useless sacrifices. However, it was also reckless for him to deal with the King of Gluttony, one of the six kings, casually as if nothing happened. Yong Ho made the decision. He opened his mouth to issue an order. However, the moment he arrived at the Garden of Life and faced his subordinate spirits with an embarrassed and urgent expression, he heard Lucia's warning. The ground is being destroyed. The boundary between the first floor of the House of Mammon and the first floor of the Labyrinth of Greed has been destroyed. What Lucia reported was only her description of what's going on before her eyes. The ceiling of the Garden of Life collapsed. The King of Gluttony, who went straight ahead without any hesitation, destroyed exactly one location. It was the very point where the ramp through which Yong Ho had lured the ten warriors into the Garden of Life was located. A large hole was broken through the ceiling of the Garden of Life. Now, Yong Ho's two options were gone, and he had only one choice. Death knights and vampire lords came down through the ceiling. Surprisingly, the undead army stood up beside them. They were the forces of death summoned by the vampire lords. The king of gluttony took a deep breath among them. It looked as if he was absorbing all the smells around him. The king of gluttony's sense of smell. If greed led its owner to what he wanted to possess, gluttony led its owner to what he wanted to eat. Yong Ho's heart was beating. The king of gluttony's heart was pounding wildly. Indeed, he is the same guy, said the king. The moment he saw Yong Ho from a distance, he was convinced. He understood why he was distracted by a strange young guy at the auction house on that day. There was a brief silence. It was like the calm before the storm. One or two seconds passed. Both of them now started to move against each other. The undead army of the King of Gluttony showed themselves first, while the Skull Unit also rose up, holding their own weapons. The subordinate spirits of the House of Mammon quickly revealed their power. The storm of mana was raging from all over. Yong Ho also summoned the silver dragon armor, staring at the king of gluttony. A silver armor wrapped around Yong Ho's body. At that moment, the king of gluttony hit the ground. He jumped out of the undead army as an individual then rushed to him. The garden of life was vast. However, it was only an indoor space. The king was fast. He was never dull. With just one leap, he crossed more than half of the Garden of Life in the blink of an eye. Catalina and Kaiwan hit the ground at the same time. Skull ordered the Skull Unit to prevent the undead forces. Ophelia and Eligos immediately aroused their wildness and followed Catalina and Kaiwan. The situation was favorable to Yong Ho. If the king revealed himself, it would only be easier for Yong Ho's forces to siege him from all directions. Skull and Tigrius planned to stop the undead forces. Catalina and Kaiwan threw themselves into the space between Yong Ho and the king. The silver dragon armor completely wrapped Yong Ho. Skathak hastily released the power of life to the Garden of Life as much as she could. Right at that moment, the king made a second leap. The moment he hit the ground, he saw Catalina and Kaiwan but ignored them. He didn't even attack them. He just focused on Yong Ho. He only thought of getting closer to Yong Ho, as if he was not afraid of the siege. Six horns sprouted above the head of the king. His mana that opened up in an instant was as good as a bomb. The explosion of mana enveloped Catalina and Kaiwan. Besides, even Ophelia and Eligos had to stop for a moment. The king of gluttony looked at Yong Ho. 
For a moment, he forgot about gluttony that resonated with greed. He didn't even think about the godly energy in his hand that was craving for a new sin. It was the power that he obtained after becoming the master of his house, which was also the driving force that helped him rise to his current position. He was also known as Bernani, the demon king of vigilance. The king of gluttony activated his power, opening a new world. Only heaven and earth existed there. There was nothing like the Garden of Life, the Undead Legion, and the mighty storm of mana surging from all directions. Yong Ho instinctively felt that his connection with Lucia was cut off. He couldn't feel her presence like he did when he entered the arena. It wasn't just Lucia. He couldn't feel the presence of Catalina and Kaiwan. The mana that he always received from his subordinate spirits through Brigada was also cut off. When he suddenly felt isolated, Yong Ho looked far away. At the end of his gaze stood the king of gluttony. I call this place a hunting ground or a dining table. The king shouted leisurely. His godly energy, responding to the enormous mana emanating from his six horns, formed its shape like the claws of a beast. My power. Only a hunter and his prey exist here. Only those who eat and those who are eaten exist here. And it is never deactivated until one eats or kills the other. Chapter 203. Because of this power, he could grow without an army. He could hide himself until he himself gained enough strength. Only two people existed in this world. So, even if the king of gluttony was inside Yongho's dungeon, it didn't matter. There was no support from the dungeon, nor the help of the dungeon spirits. There was only the battle for power in this dog-eat-dog -dog world. The reason why the king of gluttony brought the undead army with him was not because he wanted to overwhelm the house of Mammon. He just needed them until he could get close enough to the master of the house of Mammon to activate his power. The king of gluttony so easily succeeded in activating his power that he forgot his impatience. Indeed, he felt cozy in the hunting ground after a long time. The impatience that plagued him now turned into a sense of expectation. You have grown up, and you really look inviting now, king of greed. It was worth the wait. He felt he was right when he gave Yong Ho enough time to grow up. Although harvesting time was distorted by the king of violence, it was still a satisfactory harvest. Since he activated his power, it didn't matter how Yong Ho killed the ten warriors. In this land where Yong Ho could not get the support of the dungeon as well as his subordinate spirits, there was no way for him to overpower the king of gluttony. Let me eat you, king of greed. The king of gluttony already began to drool profusely, as if to reveal his nature as a devil. The king released mana, while he kept gulping down. Yong Ho saw the king activating his power, drooling. It was obviously terrifying mana. Indeed, it befitted him as the king. Yes, he was a king, and his power befitted him in such a position. Yong Ho stretched out his hands. Grabbing in the air, he got the magic spear of the red lotus. It was something that could become united with Yong Ho, so he could stay with Yong Ho despite the king's enormous power. As one of Mammon's twelve spirits and the one who witnessed the power of the real king, Amun made the request to Yong Ho. Show it to me, my master. You, great king of greed. The king of gluttony flinched at the moment he heard a strange voice that was not supposed to be heard here. However, he had no time to respond. A huge mana that could shake off such thoughts instantly exploded in front of his eyes. Yong Ho's six horns, which could be comparable to the king's, radiated a tremendous mana. He didn't waste the time he gained when the king was embarrassed. While holding Amun, he held his right fist to the chest. Then, he activated the heart of the demon god, Mammon's legacy, to fill the gap of power between him and the king. It was exactly as the king said. Yong Ho could not get Lucia's support nor could he mobilize the mana of his subordinate spirits except for Amun. He could not even get Skathaka's help. But Yong Ho didn't need them because the king of gluttony was also alone now. Both of them were kings with the power of sin. The claws of the demon god's heart got into Yong Ho's chest. Each time they got into it, it increased Yong Ho's power more than before. A total of four claws were triggered. That was the maximum that Yong Ho now could handle. A hunting ground or dining table. It was a place where one of the two must die before getting out. 
Yong Ho didn't respond to the king's description of this place. Instead, he rushed toward him violently. He became the one and only hunter chasing his prey here. There was something like a flow in the fighting. And the flow could overcome any gap created by objective indicators of strength. The king of gluttony was strong. His mana was obviously superior to Yong Ho's. His body, which evolved several times through predation, another power of gluttony, was hard, fast, and strong. Based on the objective indicators alone, he was stronger than Yong Ho. But that factor alone did not point to absolute. It wasn't just the numerical supremacy that determined the outcome of a fight. Yong Ho had a talent for fighting. The moment he rushed toward him forcefully, he already noticed the gap. And he understood that in order to overcome this unfavorable situation, he had to control the flow. Although there was a gap between their mana, they had the same number of horns anyway. Yong Ho could make good use of his attack before the King of Gluttony. Moreover, the heart of the demon god filled the gap between Yong Ho and the king even for a short time. To control the flow, Yong Ho had to disperse the king's fighting energy. He had to take the preemptive strike against the king to take the initiative. Yong Ho held his breath. The moment he hit the ground, he changed into a silver bullet and crossed the space. The king was panicked. It confused him that Yong Ho turned into the hunter, revealing his teeth and claws, targeting him now instead of being a prey. He sized up Yong Ho through embryo. He found the cause of Yong Ho's rapid growth in the sin of greed. But he didn't know enough about Yong Ho. He didn't even imagine anything like the labyrinth of greed or mammon's twelve spirits. And such a gap in intelligence made a decisive difference. Right now, Yong Ho was a very powerful creature that exceeded the king's expectations. Objectively speaking, Yong Ho was still weaker than the king, so it took time for the king to fully accept the new fact about Yong Ho. It wasn't that long. It was very short. It was imperative that Yong Ho shouldn't miss that moment. In the blink of an eye, the distance between the two disappeared. At the same time, the violent green flames spewed out of Amun and covered the surroundings. The king instinctively closed his eyes. Yong Ho took another step. Checking out the king's lower body, he rushed low and fast to attack it. The king was a right-hander. He had godly energy on his right hand, and he enjoyed fighting rather than magic. Embryo's tips about the king of gluttony were fragmentary. But when they were put together, Yong Ho could find the gap. The king generated mana to drive out the green flames. Then he opened his eyes urgently to look for Yong Ho. However, Yong Ho was in the middle of the green flames. Yong Ho's energy was everywhere, and the dazzling green flames disturbed the king's vision momentarily. The lag time was only a second or so. And that one second made a difference. The moment Amun exploded, the king screamed in pain. The ultra-high temperature spear with the green flames penetrated the king's waist. It was a powerful blow. However, Yong Ho let go of Amun instead of twisting it. He immediately deactivated Amun and lowered his posture as if he was almost lying on the floor. The king's long and big arm penetrated the space where Yong Ho was a moment ago. Tremendous wind pressure tore the space. The king rotated his whole body and struck him with his right fist. It was a lightning strike. But Yong Ho threw himself to the left to avoid it. He focused on the king's godly energy that caused something like a small earthquake after tearing apart the ground. It was like the head of a beast. Burning red, it wrapped around the king's right arm just like Yong Ho's magic field. Yong Ho rolled his eyes again. The king also saw him. Amun shouted at Yong Ho, defend. The space was torn. The head of the red beast that came out from Yong Ho's left side opened its mouth. Yong Ho immediately raised his left arm. A shield of distortion released from Kaiwan's ring blocked the beast's head by a hair's breadth. Yong Ho felt hot. As if he was hit by a truck, Yong Ho was pushed back. The shield of distortion was quickly crushed and swallowed up by the king's godly energy. Yong Ho discovered that the king's godly energy didn't break the ground only. Part of it leaped into space. Only the invisible part of it struck Yong Ho from the side. The king withdrew his fist. There was no more embarrassment on his face. 
This land was his hunting ground, after all. It was a dining table where he ate so many people. The king attacked Yong Ho again. The mana emanating from his six horns overwhelmed the surrounding area. It wasn't just a fight between the two. The clash between the invisible mana of the two was also a variable that influenced the victory and defeat of their fighting. If this place had not been the boundary of the king of gluttony, the surrounding area would have been destroyed just by the collision of their mana. Yong Ho stopped breathing once again. He then rushed face to face toward the king, who was also charging at him. Faced with the king, he released the mana that he sharpened hard. Their mana collided primarily. With the surrounding area reverberating hard, the king stretched out his fist. Yong Ho lowered his posture. He remembered Gyuzhin's teaching at that moment. Instead of releasing mana again, he used it internally. The moment he was convinced of the trajectory of the king throwing a punch, he exploded mana inside. Yong Ho's movement accelerated. Ignoring the king's punches, he got closer to the king. Then he jumped vertically without missing the distortion of the mana he felt on the right. Bang! Chapter, 204 The king's punch that broke the space on Yong Ho's right hit the air. There was frustration on his face. Yong Ho rotated his body in the air. Instead of obsessing with the attack using Amun, he used what he had learned from Ophelia. A powerful horn mixed with his spin kick struck the king's head. The king stumbled for a moment. The huge power released from Yong Ho's six horns was beyond imagination. Dozens of his cogwheel like teeth, which were exposed because of his nature as a preta, were shattered to pieces at once. Now was the chance for Yong Ho. As soon as he landed on the ground, Yong Ho stopped breathing again. Instead of grabbing Amun, he attacked the king's thick stomach with a penetrating strike but it was foolish for him to target it because it was stronger than iron. However, Yong Ho's attack wasn't that simple. The moment he was attacked, the king twisted his body, moaning in pain because his intestines were literally mangled. The penetrating strike. It was Embryo's secret weapon intended to inject mana directly into the enemy's body. Embryo's legacy was not just his tips about the king of gluttony. He also reserved everything about him for the new leader of the herd of wolves. The king of gluttony staggered even more. Without any hesitation, Yong Ho stretched out his left hand for a hard blow. As if he was punching up, he poured out mana while attacking his belly. The king's giant body went up suddenly, though briefly. The mana Yong Ho injected into his body again raged violently. When Yong Ho's mana clashed with the magic field that the king released for defense caused even more disturbance. Yong Ho tried to get cold. He had to end this fight in the same way he fought Stravati. No matter how much money one had or how strong mana one had, it was over if one died before using it because one didn't know how to use it properly. So, it was best to finish the fight before the opponent used his maximum power. The king, who went up momentarily, flopped down because he couldn't land properly. His mouth was already filled with blood, and his eyes were full of pain and anger. Yong Ho also bled through his lips. It looked like the side effects of the devil god's energy began to affect him. They began to be impatient. However, their impatience was different. The king swung his hands to attack Yong Ho at random, but Yong Ho calmly avoided it. The moment he checked the king's waist, the target of his attack, Yong Ho once again pierced his chest. Then, he stabbed the king's wounded part with the penetrating strike for the third and last time. He made a terrible scream. At the same time, tremendous mana radiated from his body. It was a violent and cruel vortex of mana that ripped apart everything around him. It was powerful enough to tear any ordinary opponent. But Yong Ho was on par with the king. He immediately destroyed the mana the king radiated at random. His heart hurt. His hands and feet trembled even for a moment. There was not much time left to keep the energy of the devil god. He clenched his teeth and stared at the king then he blinked unwittingly. What came down from above was the king's head, not his fist. There was a terrifying noise when his teeth interlocked. And his mouth, which became more than twice as large as it was before, swallowed the air. Yong Ho, who stepped back by quickly hitting the ground, realized that there was no more discernment in the king's eyes. Bang! 
the king of gluttony leapt again. As if he didn't know how to punch, he opened his mouth again. He was not a beast or a preta, not a king. His attack was simple and straightforward. But it was much harder for Yong Ho to avoid it. The mana released from his body was also different from it in the beginning. There was his determination to eat Yong Ho in it. The king threw himself in the air, but Yong Ho, clenching his teeth, attacked him from the front. Although the king fully released the power of gluttony, Yong Ho confronted it with the mana of greed that he sharpened as much as possible. Then he got close to the king who bit the air once again. But at that moment, the king activated the power of godly energy. The godly energy, which appeared after jumping into space, bit Yong Ho's left shoulder. Dozens of teeth dislodged his bones and flesh at once, and the grip that he could never escape ripped apart his shoulders. It was a terrible pain. He felt like he would pass out from the shock. Yong Ho's left arm, which lost its shoulder, rolled on the floor. The king, who swallowed part of Yong Ho's body through the godly energy, smiled in satisfaction. It wasn't just bones and flesh that the king ate. Not only Yong Ho's mana but also part of his soul was eaten away. Yong Ho clenched his teeth. He quickly released mana to close the wounded area. He then almost threw his body. As if not to miss him, the king also poked his mouth to him. His mouth, his gluttony, and a lump of gluttony. The moment he faced the king face to face, Yong Ho made a decision. Instead of avoiding the king's mouth getting closer to him, Yong Ho faced it bravely. Then he punched it with a roaring sound. Yong Ho rammed his right fist into his mouth. The king's gluttony did not hesitate to take it. He tightened his chin to swallow Yong Ho's entire right arm as well as his right fist. Right before the king's cogwheel like teeth interlocked themselves, Yong Ho grabbed the magic spear of the red lotus once again. The green flames of the red lotus flared up inside the king's mouth. The spear's blade pierced the roof of the king's mouth, and the spear broke through into his throat. The king felt terrible pain. But his gluttony did not stop. The king tried to eat Yong Ho as well as Amun together. However, Yong Ho also did not tolerate it. He concentrated all the remaining mana from the demon's god on his right arm where Amun was located. Then, Yong Ho ordered Amun as the king of greed. Grow big. Amun followed his order. Amun seemed to change several times. Both the spear's blade and the spear were made several times larger than the original. The violently swirling green flames swallowed up the mana of gluttony. The spear blade pierced the palate of food hunger and destroyed it. Because of the spear that surged from the bottom, the king's head was mangled. Besides, the spear didn't stop at crushing his throat, but it crushed his intestines that had been already mangled by Yong Ho's penetrating strike. The king couldn't shut his mouth. He didn't dare to activate his godly energy. His hands and feet trembled, so did Yong Ho. Ignoring the pain of his heart, Yong Ho triggered the fifth claw on the fifth mana. Amun got back to its original size. Yong Ho grabbed Amun tightly. Then he released fierce green flames into the king's broken head. Although the king's godly energy tried hard to sustain its owner's life, it was too late. The sin of gluttony itself burned away amid the green flames that became united with greed. The enormous mana released from the king's six horns were useless. Now that the king's body was destroyed, his mana, which could be called the incarnation of gluttony, was just hovering in the air. Yong Ho let out a breath. He pulled out his hand after pushing Amun into the king's body. He stared at the king's body supported by Amun that was plugged into the ground after getting out of it. It was hard. Even though Yong Ho was exposed to the king's attack with teeth only once, his life was at stake. He had fever all over his body like a fireball. However, Yong Ho did not budge a bit. He still had something to do. His greed guided him. He found out the origin of the king's gluttony. Yong Ho deactivated the heart of the demon god. As soon as the five toenails stuck deep in his chest came out, Yong Ho felt a sense of pain and liberation at the same time. He stumbled. He reached out his right hand toward his heart as well as the essence of the king. By triggering greed, the embodiment of possessiveness, he took the power of gluttony. The sin of gluttony and the sin of greed collided head-on. 
The enormous manna of the king of gluttony came in like a tide into his heart, opened by the excessive use of the demon god's heart. Gluttony struggled. Greed swallowed up gluttony. Just like they did in the past, greed forcibly subdued gluttony and pushed it into the heart of the demon king. The seven deadly sins, they were the fragments of the soul of the demon god or its seven fragments. Yong Ho roared, feeling so much pleasure beyond description. Cracks covered the sky and the earth. The dining table collapsed. The king of gluttony's firm determination collapsed over Yong Ho's head, who took the sin of gluttony. Chapter 205 The world of the king of gluttony collapsed. As the false world that existed in the gap between the boundaries of the demon world collapsed, a real world emerged. It was the garden of life full of the power of life released by Skathak. But Yong Ho could not recognize it. He cried in ecstasy. Greed never missed the essence of the king of gluttony. Greed tried to devour it completely. Yong Ho's heart responded to it. His heart, which was on the verge of being broken because of God's heart, maintained its shape by accepting the manna of the king of gluttony. Absorbing essence was most efficient when absorbing that of someone who was stronger than oneself. The king of gluttony's manna was enormous. It was a huge mass that surpassed what Yong Ho could take, like it was when he accepted Agars as power. The power of evolution opened its eyes and evolved itself on behalf of Yong Ho, who lost his mind while absorbing the king's essence. Yong Ho broke the bowl. Using the overflowing mana, he made a new bowl. It would be good to say he completely changed for the better through evolution. This time, his body was made more efficient and powerful than before. The number of his horns was still the same six horns. But they were never the same before and after his complete changeover. His body was now closer to his mana. The number of passages that controlled his mana was rather down. The loosely connected springs merged into one to form a huge river. There was a dazzling green flash. Since Yong Ho's body was completely reborn, the loss of his shoulders didn't matter. A lump of his mana became bones. Muscles and blood vessels were connected in a row, and on top of that, unblemished skin was added. A huge amount of mana was released in the process. And, a collision of intense force comparable to this external fierceness took place inside his body. It was the desperate resistance of gluttony. Although gluttony already lost its owner and got swallowed by greed, it did not give in meekly. Rather, it tried to eat away greed from the inside. The last malice left by the king of gluttony turned into a terrible curse with gluttony. The power of evolution could not help greed. Yong Ho's complete change itself was already causing a terrifying torrent of mana. Greed and gluttony ate each other. It seemed that the demon god's heart containing both sins would explode any time soon. Yong Ho's heart screamed silently amid the two sins' competing rivalry. And there was someone who approached him. Not one, but many. Catalina screamed, hugging his shoulders. Five horns that sprouted on her head were vibrating violently, releasing mana. Catalina stepped forward with mixed feelings of joy and pain. Kaiwan also forcibly opened her eyes, opening up her five horns. She saw the godly energy of greed that got out of Yong Ho's severed arms and began to shine alone. Skull grabbed the godly energy. Ophelia and Eligos screamed, holding each other's chest. Tigrius activated the power of synthetic evolution. Almond flared up alone in the air. The green flames of the red lotus looked at its owner, radiating a violent green light. Amon gathered all the will of his subordinate spirits. The godly energy of greed shined. Yong Ho, who was floating in the whirlwind of not only his own change but also the confrontation between greed and gluttony, felt all of his subordinate spirits now. At the same time, he perceived the power of Yuho Yuan, who were raising their voices from the godly energy of greed and the power of harmony. Greed possessed everything that the king of gluttony built up and devoured. Yong Ho, who gathered all the power of his subordinate spirits, trampled down the king's desperate resistance and his malice. Gluttony gave off its last malice. However, the tide was turned already. The sin of gluttony, kneeling before greed, took its place in the demon god's heart. The dazzling green light fizzled out. Yong Ho's body, which was floating, propelled by mana, fell to the ground 
and the pain and joy that swept through his subordinate spirits subsided. The silver dragon armor that was wrapped around Yong Ho's body was dismantled and scattered. After completing the second changeover, Yong Ho closed his eyes in supreme pleasure. Then he fell, losing consciousness. Catalina and Kai Wan staggeringly approached him. Skull sat down on the floor, holding the godly energy of greed in his hand. Amun finally turned to Skathaka's mansion. Skathak, who could not leave the mansion, stood while looking at Yong Ho with a regrettable expression. Two of the seven deadly sins gathered. The House of Mammon regained one of the seven godly energies, godly energy of fury. Amun suddenly thought of Mammon when he last saw the king climbing the stairs alone. It was the thing of the past. It was never going to be repeated again. Amun himself would make sure it would not happen again. The flames of Red Lotus arose from Amun. Then it disappeared into a handful of flames to return to the new king of greed. Gardamundi could not believe her eyes. Even though she closed and opened her eyes again and again, the scene before her eyes did not change. The entrance to the dungeon of the House of Mammon was gone. It wasn't just a simple collapse. The entrance itself disappeared as if it was swallowed by a giant monster at a gulp. Gardamundi hurriedly rolled her eyes. Fortunately, it wasn't long before she could find the dungeon meerkats of the House of Mammon. They were sticking out their heads through a hole in the cut section as if they were hidden in the nest deep inside the dungeon. It wasn't the safety of the dungeon meerkats that Gardamundi was worried about. She was worried about the inevitable situation where she would have to run away, deserting them. The House of Mammon was attacked. If so, who was the attacker? There was almost none in the southern land who could dare to attack the House of Mammon. If so, was it attacked by an outsider? Gardamundi bit her lips. She made a decision. Erecting her five horns, she began to glide by adjusting her wings. She soon landed on the ground to check the condition of the House of Mammon. The dungeon meerkats saw her. So, if the soul of the dungeon was still alive and could deal with the outsider who appeared at the entrance of the dungeon, he or she was supposed to respond. Gardamundi grabbed a steel spear instead of a huge flag symbolizing the King of Fury. Holding it gently, she stared at the dungeon. Then she quietly counted deep down. She decided to wait five minutes. When there was no response even after five minutes, she was going to storm into the dungeon. When it came to the outsider, there were only two the King of Violence and the King of Gluttony. It was very unlikely that it was the King of Lust since the King of Lust was in a distant place, or the King of Pride and the King of Envy. Who were now engaged in fighting with each other, would pick a fight with the House of Mammon at the southern tip of the demon world. Even if it was an attack by the King of Violence or the King of Gluttony, Gardamundi should have double-checked it. It was her duty as the scout serving as the King of Fury's eyes and ears. Extremely tense, she felt the time that had passed so fast. Five minutes passed in the blink of an eye. Strongly determined, Gardamundi took the first step. At the same time, she aimed at the front with a steel spear. I'm Eligos, the butler of the Mammon family. Welcome. When she was about to storm into the dungeon, she was stopped by a red beast who greeted her calmly. The beast's upper body was revealed as if he was just done making a changeover, but his steel-like muscles made her feel he was not naked at all. Gardamundi let out a sigh of relief briefly. His face and voice matched with the butler she had met the other day. I'm Gardamundi of the Garura clan. I've come here with a letter from Her Majesty the King of Fury. Was something bad happening here? When she asked him directly, Elago smiled gently. Then he responded in a soft but firm tone. Something bad happened, but it was taken care of. By the way, I'm afraid we can't accept a precious guest like you right now. After all, he declined her visit this time. But she put it bluntly once again. If you need my help, please let me know. I will try to help you as best as I can. No thanks. Please forgive me for not accepting you who have come a long way. Eligos clearly expressed his intention again. After all, Gardamundi gave up looking inside the dungeon. She felt it better to step back and take time than prodding him impatiently. After putting down her iron spear, Gardamundi also withdrew her horns. 
she opened Sarasvati's pocket on her waist and took out a letter and a small box. It's a letter from Her Majesty the King of Fury, and her return present for your master's specialty. Gardamundi presented the letter and the box with both hands, and Elagos, after hesitating briefly, approached her and accepted them. In some ways, Elagos's action was just normal, but Gardamundi narrowed her eyes because she sensed something unusual. A true scout like her was not just content with observing what she saw. It was important for her to discern the person she was dealing with, let alone objects around her. In her eyes, Elagos changed, and he changed a lot overnight at that. She could not know specifically how he changed because he had just done changing his power, but it was certain that he became stronger than before. Chapter, 206 Gardamundi took a step back. As if she was wearing a mask, she said cheerfully without showing any doubts, On my way, I saw a city in the north. I'll stay there for some time, so let me know when you get the message for me. I'm going to say hello to the master of the House of Mammon and receive his reply. Obviously, she suggested that she would not go back empty-handed. Elagos liked this straightforward messenger. I will contact you as soon as possible. The tavern located in the western part of the city is owned by the House of Mammon, so I hope you can stay there comfortably. Gardamuni was already aware that not only the pub but the whole city was owned by the House of Mammon. She asked to share hands with Elagos. Gently clasping his big, hard hand, she stepped back with a smile and said, I will wait for your reply then. I look forward to seeing you again. Gardamundi spread her wings. Holding back the urge to look beyond Elagos into the inside of the dungeon, she flew away. She flapped her wings toward the free city. Citri said, the reason why the King of Fury is favorable to the House of Mammon is so simple. It wasn't because if she united with the Mammon family, she could create a great coalition of the southern region. It wasn't even because she was scared of the potential of the House of Mammon that united the whole southern unclaimed lands. The House of Mammon is not under the control of any king. There was some significant meaning in it. To examine it further, it was very clear why the King of Fury showed favor, not hostility, to the House of Mammon. The master of the Mammon family is not a king, so he is lower than me, the King of Fury in hierarchy. He is not a man that I have to compete for godly energy and seven deadly sins. That's why I can feel relaxed. I can trust him. It was difficult to believe in somebody else who was stronger than oneself in the demon world where the strong preyed on the weak. Besides, if the opponent was a king, it would be more difficult to trust him, for such a king might have a motive to kill her and take her sin. That's the most important thing for you to keep in mind when you build a relationship with the King of Fury. Should he reveal his greed or hide it? Should he face her as a king or as the descendant of the prestigious family who unified the unclaimed lands in the south? Yong Ho opened his eyes and woke up. He felt cozy and comfortable. He wanted to close his eyes again and fall asleep right now. If he hadn't heard the voice right before his eyes, he would have fallen asleep again. Young master. Are you alright? Can you hear me? How many are these? Obviously, the other party spoke with a lot of concern, but her voice was clear. Yong Ho looked at the beauty of blue, water-colored hair, who approached him up close. He instinctively recognized somebody waving her two fingers hard before his eyes. He then opened his mouth, scat hack. Can you count how many this is? Two. You're all right. Scat hack hugged Yong Ho all of a sudden. Since he was in the blue water at the moment, she fell into the water with a splash when she hugged him, but she didn't seem to care at all. He felt she was cozy and soft like the blue water. Before he knew it, he closed his eyes then hugged her face to face. But this time, it didn't last long. Scathack laughed after pushing him out as fast as when she hugged him. Because some other people are waiting for their turn now. Uh. Scathack stepped back and got out of the blue water. As soon as she got out of his vision, some others came up close. Master. Yong Ho. Catalina and Kaiwan on both sides hugged him at the same time. He hugged them all at once this time, too. Catalina rubbed her head against his shoulder, flapping her ears, and Kaiwan kept kissing his cheeks. How do you feel? Are you okay? Are you feeling any side effects? 
Kaiwan and Catalina asked competitively. Since he got confused at the moment, he paused a moment before replying. They looked at him earnestly with their eyes shining. He withdrew his hand that wrapped her waist and put it on his chest. He could feel his heart pounding hard. And he felt one more thing, something he couldn't feel in the past. The sin of gluttony, he murmured quietly and closed his eyes. He then focused his consciousness and got convinced. It's inside my body. I don't think I can use it like greed right now it's definitely mine now. Obviously, gluttony was located in one corner of the demon god's heart, which was now almost united with his. Unlike greed, it did not obey Yong Ho meekly, but it was not holding any hostility or malice. It was obvious that over time he could make use of it like greed. Oh, oh. Admiring Yong Ho's condition, Catalina flapped her ears, looking at his chest. Her tail also fluttered in the blue water. Kaiwan was as excited as Catalina. She screamed, tapping his chest loudly. You know what? You're the first to have two sins in your body since Mammon. She spoke confidently, looking at him proudly and respectfully. He also couldn't hide his smile. He looked a little silly but laughed happily. He defeated the king of gluttony. He won and survived. And he became the first king who obtained more than two sins since Mammon. Yong Ho squeezed his fist lightly. After taking a deep breath, he looked back at himself. I feel my weight is so light. Is this the result of my absorption of the king's essence? Obviously, he felt different from it when he was in blue water a moment ago. He really felt much lighter. He felt as if his body was like a feather. He traced his memory and soon realized that he had already felt something like this before. The power of evolution. He felt the same when he defeated Agars and took his essence. He had to do something to absorb his essence, who was much stronger than himself. The power of evolution reconstructed his body, making it more powerful and efficient. Your physical ability has improved a lot. Your look has also changed slightly. Of course, you're much more attractive than before. As if she was patient enough to keep silent until now, Lucia spoke in a bright voice, at last. When he heard from Lucia that even his look changed, Yong Ho touched his body here and there. He knew his body more than anybody else, so he immediately noticed how it changed. First, he grew a little taller. His skin was smooth and soft like a baby's. And his body that used to be hard became strong like steel. And there was one more change in his appearance. Oh, oh. Oh, 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 oh. Admiring his changeover once again, he was very satisfied. Kaiwan and Catalina, who were looking at him blankly, soon gazed at where Yong Ho was looking at, and blushed almost at the same time. Kaiwan turned up one corner of her mouth slightly, while Catalina flapped her ears excitedly. Amon, who remained silent, whispered, The power of your anguish is increasing. This time, Lucia cleared her throat. Hmm. By the way, Master. I've got some important news. The King of Fury has sent you another letter. Perhaps, since they were inside Skathaka's mansion or perhaps, since Lucia became stronger than before, Catalina and Kaiwan could also hear Lucia's voice. Catalina said, quickly looking for something on her waist, here you are. While Catalina was looking for the letter, Yong Ho asked Kaiwan, how much time had passed after I fell? A full day. This time, that same Garura girl brought this letter. Now she is waiting for your reply at the tavern in the free city. We're in a grave situation right now, so we can't accept her into the dungeon this time. He pinched Kaiwan's cheek a bit because she seemed to ask for his praise of her action. Good job. Here you are. Catalina handed him the letter right at that moment. He stroked her hair once more then opened the seal on the envelope. Right before opening it, he narrowed his eyes and said, I can feel her mana here. Kaiwan said, I think it contains her video magic. Nodding at her explanation, he opened the letter. Indeed, like Kaiwan said, a pile of light gathered in the air just above the letter and formed a certain shape. It was her face, the King of Fury, who he met at the Dungeon Market's special auction house. Test, test. Can I talk over here? In the video, 
the King of Fury spoke, blinking her big eyes. Then, another woman's voice was heard very quietly from a little distance. You already started recording. Startled, the King of Fury blinked her eyes again and immediately cleared her throat. Then she changed her posture and looked straight ahead. Hmm <laughs> hmm. It's nice to greet you in a video like this, Master of the House of Mammon. I am the King of Fury, the chief of the Gondarv clan. My name is Drydarastra, the head of the eight clan people. Well, I guess she is trying to act cute to Yongho. Besides, she seems to be conceited a bit. Kaiwan spoke quietly while Catalina focused on the video, feeling a bit out of place. Chapter 207 Yongho looked at her, feeling fresh about her using honorifics, unlike her sharp-looking face. The King of Fury continued, I received your reply and special products through Gardamundi of the Garura clan, my faithful friend and right-hand man. I am very happy that you are also thinking of making a friendly relationship with our people. With a gentle smile, the King of Fury stopped talking for a moment. As if hesitating, she curled up her lips several times and finally opened her mouth. It may be a little bit early, but why don't we meet and talk about the exchanges between our people and the House of Mammon? The future of the demon world is uncertain due to the ongoing war between the King of Pride and the King of Envy in the northern area. Even the belligerent King of Gluttony seems to be ready to start a war anytime. I think we will be able to overcome this turbulence wisely if our people and the House of Mammon join hands together. The voice of the King of Fury had a strong appeal. After she continued to talk firmly, she took her breath once then relaxed a bit. She resumed talking with a gentle look and voice, as I said, you might think it a bit early that we meet face to face. So, just feel free to do so if you feel uncomfortable about my proposal. I look forward to your frank reply. P.S. I really enjoyed the fried chicken you sent me. Thank you. Her postscript was not her own voice, but a message of light. But Yong Ho seemed to hear her voice in it. He folded the letter. At that moment, Kai Wan and Catalina were lost in thought respectively, instead of responding recklessly. His reply to the King of Fury's offer was a major issue that could determine the future of the House of Mammon. He closed his eyes for a moment and recalled his conversation with Citri. She said something at the time. She mentioned one decision that she said was the most important. You already have the answer from the beginning. He needed to hide his status as the King of Greed from her. He also needed to hide the fact that he took the essence of the King of Gluttony. The King of Fury's goodwill to Yong Ho was based on the fact that Yong Ho is not a king. So, he didn't need to break a friendly relationship by revealing it. For the same reason, he didn't have to reveal that he defeated the King of Gluttony. What would happen if the King of Fury found out that he not only obtained the sin of greed but also the sin of gluttony? What if other kings found it out, too? There was a historical precedent to it. There was a precedent in which all the other kings joined hands to destroy Mammon who obtained as many as three out of the seven deadly sins. So, it was the best option to hide it from the King of Fury. Yong Ho could meet her in his capacity as the master of the House of Mammon, not as the King of Greed. After making up his mind, Yong Ho opened his eyes again. Then Lucia, who was checking his condition, opened her mouth. By the way, master. The space for securing your subordinate spirits also increased significantly. Probably, you can make one of Mammon's twelve spirits your own subordinate spirit. What she said was a bit irrelevant to his main topic, but he could not ignore her. He raised his head instinctively and looked at Scathack. She shook her head and said, Thank you, but it's premature. You remember you made the promise to me, right? Sure, I do. What she presented to him as the condition for passing her test was the liberation and subjugation of Gus Ion. So, securing Gus Ion was more urgent to Yong Ho than Scathack. And this is my recommendation to you as the healer of the Mammon family. Just take a journey back home sooner or later. Home. Are you talking about my hometown in the human world? She nodded at his question again. Approaching the blue water where Yong Ho, Catalina, and Kai Wan were soaked, she said, right. I think you should because your body has gone through a complete changeover this time, the demon god's heart, too. 
so, I think you had better go back to the human world once more and take some fresh air. Although she replied to his question, Yong Ho got even more curious. He tilted his head and asked, I know what you mean. But why did you mention the demon god's heart? Well, Master Mammon completed the heart of the demon god in the human world, not the demon world. As a result, many of the ingredients of the demon god's heart are mixed with that of a human being. Blinking again, Yong Ho looked at himself. He felt fresh about the heart of the demon god made of Brigada. Kaiwan quickly hugged his arm and said, I want to come with you, too. I also want to say hello to your father. Me, too, said Catalina, who also hugged his other arm earnestly not to be outdone by her. He momentarily imagined his father encountering Kaiwan and Catalina at the same time. What would his father say to him? He just giggled when he imagined it. He shook his head and withdrew his arms from them, gently saying, let's solve the important problem first. In fact, the King of Fury's messenger was waiting for his reply in the free city. So, he had to take care of that matter first. Lucia, gather all the dungeon spirits in the conference room. Okay, master. I'll summon your subordinate spirits, garrison Captain Rykam, and workshop Chief Bergrim in the conference room on the first floor. It will take some time to gather them all in one place, so please take your time. Yong Ho nodded. Then he asked Kaiwan, Catalina, and Skathak a bit belatedly, are all our people all right? When the King of Gluttony raided the Garden of Life, he was not alone. At a glance, there were dozens of death knights and more than five vampire lords surrounding him. After defeating the King of Gluttony, he was so absent-minded that he could not afford to pay attention to them. Even his subordinate spirits didn't know exactly what had happened, except for Kaiwan, Catalina, and Skathak. At his asking, the three looked at each other and soon giggled. Then they nodded at the same time. There were several small rooms attached to the left and right of the Demon King's room, which had been moved to the first floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. On the right were Yong Ho's room as well as that of Kaiwan and Catalina, respectively, while a conference room and Yong Ho's private office were on the left. When Yong Ho arrived at the conference room with Kaiwan and Catalina, all the spirits needed for the meeting were already gathered. Starting with Yuria, who was carrying teacups with Baduk, they bowed to Yong Ho politely. We're so happy to see you safe and in good health. Eligos greeted him on behalf of the others. He patted Eligos's shoulder, which seemed to have become even stronger. I'm glad you guys are all safe. Let's sit down first. Yong Ho sat at the top of a long rectangular table. On his right side were Catalina, Eligos, Tigrius, and Rykam, while Kaiwan, Ophelia, Skull, and Bergrim were on his left. Rikim and Bergrim were the only ones who were not his subordinate spirits. Of course, Yuria and Baduk, who sat next to the teacup sets in the corner, and the nameless meerkat were not, either. As you see, I am all right. Since I absorbed the essence of the King of Gluttony, my mana has become more powerful now. I haven't actually opened it up, but my mana is probably equal to that of the King of Gluttony. It wasn't just the King's essence that Yong Ho took. His greed ate even the King's memory. Of course, he did not completely absorb all the King's memories because almost all of them sank deep in the sea of his subconsciousness. However, he could remember several of them. Birudika, the King's name, was one of those memories. Yong Ho activated the heart of the demon god in order to defeat the king of gluttony. But now he had the same mana as that of the king even without using the demon god's heart, which showed the explosive growth of his mana. Of course, I benefited more from my body's complete changeover. Yong Ho, who had learned the use of mana from red demon Gus Ion, realized that the amount of mana that he could instantly concentrate was more important than the total amount of simple mana at least during the fighting. As a result of his body's changeover, the speed of mana circulation was much faster than before. Now he could concentrate more than a third of his full mana on his fist during the short span of time he threw a punch. Yong Ho's growth meant the growth of the House of Mammon as a whole. Kaiwan said with a subtle smile, thanks to your growth, your subordinate spirits have also become stronger. Now, all the spirits have five horns on average. I'm on the verge of getting six horns. I feel like I've reached the maximum. Oh, of course, Amun is an exception. 
she turned her eyes at Yong Ho's wrist. Then, the flames of the red lotus flared up in the air. I also got stronger. Although I'm not as strong as I was during my prime days, I think the day will soon come when I can fully restore my power. Chapter, 208 When Mammon died, the power of the twelve spirits belonging to him was also weakened. Yong Ho realized Mammon's power once again. Given that Amun's power was still powerful, he must have been much more powerful during his prime days. What about Mammon who had Amun as his subordinate spirit? It was beyond imagination. Yong Ho felt like he was seeing another sky beyond the sky. But he didn't feel unpleasant at all. Rather, he felt he had a glimpse of a goal that he had to achieve. Okay, then let's get down to business. The first agenda or question is this one. What happened to the undead army that the King of Gluttony brought with him? Actually, he asked Kai Wan, Catalina, and Scathack about this, but they didn't reply, saying they would like to talk about it at the meeting. Of course, Catalina was going to reply anyway, but Kai Wan stopped her. Ophelia said, they disappeared right after you disappeared with the King of Gluttony. According to Scathack, it seemed that they were summoned back. Summoned back. Tigrius, who is in charge of the magic of the Mammon family, explained, yes. Some high-ranking summoners often keep special summoners in a separate subspace. In other words, they are used only when necessary. Likewise, they are summoned back right away when they are not needed. I think the King of Gluttony seems to have stormed into the dungeon to fight you in a duel. As a result, the moment he got inside the dungeon and faced you alone, he seemed to summon back the undead army to reduce the useless consumption of his mana. As a matter of fact, there remained the miscellaneous undead troops summoned by the vampire lords. Of course, the Skull Unit destroyed them all later, said Ophelia, as if to make up for Turgrius's explanation. Finally, when Yong Ho looked at Skull, he laughed as always and shouted, Skull Skull. Obviously, he was very proud of his unit's achievement. With the atmosphere getting warmer, Amun said, Our master has obtained gluttony now, along with the king of gluttony's essence. Greed is the power of possession even if it's impossible right now, if our master can better handle gluttony, it's highly likely that he can access the subspace created by the king of gluttony. Because all the things the king possessed now fell in the hands of greed. I see. Yong Ho nodded quietly. It was not because he agreed with Amun, but because he felt he could do it. Perhaps it was because of his memories of the king of gluttony that were in the realm of his unconsciousness. Over ten death knights and five vampire lords. That wasn't all. The memory of the king of gluttony told Yong Ho that bone dragons were also located in the subspace. They were the elite troops kept by the king of gluttony in preparation for his fight against the six other kings. Already, they alone could be called an army corps. As a result of Yong Ho's victory, they now belonged to the House of Mammon. Although Yong Ho could not use them right now, he could use them as a secret weapon that nobody expected at all. All the dungeon spirits didn't hide their joy when they heard Amun's explanation. Yong Ho wondered how they would react when he told them that bone dragons were also preserved in the subspace. Let me hold on to their pleasure until later. He still had lots of other agenda to discuss with them. So, he could tell them about the Bone Dragons after he could take control of the subspace of the King of Gluttony. He signaled to Catalina with a glance, and she put the red gauntlet on the table, which she carefully carried. At a glance, the magical machine looked very unusual. Yong Ho said, this is one of the fragments of the demon god's flesh, but at the same time was the godly energy of fury possessed by the King of Gluttony. Everyone in the conference room looked at it tensely. Watching it before their eyes, they realized once again that Yong Ho really defeated the king. Ophelia, who was checking his mood for a moment, asked, looking at the flames of the red lotus, I'm sorry to ask you, but why did the king of gluttony possess the godly energy of fury? Other subordinate spirits turned to Amun as if they were curious about that. When Yong Ho turned his eyes, full of curiosity, the flames of the red lotus flared up more intensely. Amun whispered to everyone, in the past, Mammon, the great king of greed, acquired three sins and four godly energies. The three sins were greed, fury, and gluttony, respectively. The four godly energies were greed, fury, 
gluttony, and lust, respectively. They were also aware of this. Amun continued, after Mammon died, all three sins and four godly energies were dispersed everywhere. The godly energy of lust was in the hands of the king of lust. However, greed, fury, and gluttony wandered around in the demon world without finding their true owner. The three godly energies changed hands several times over a thousand years. At the time, all of them were possessed by different kings, but they didn't find their proper owner. Probably, that's why the king of gluttony had the godly energy of fury. That's perhaps the case with the king of violence. Perhaps, the king of pride and the king of envy might have different godly energies that didn't match their own sins. Is the match of sin with godly energy important? When Yong Ho asked it, the flames of the red lotus arose again. Amun said firmly, yes, it's important. It's only when it faces the sin that matches with it when godly energies shows its real power. Yong Ho looked at the godly energy again. Come to think of it, the godly energy possessed by the king of gluttony did not play any efficient role. Of course, his attack by leaping through space was powerful, but it wasn't that effective, given the enormous potential of godly energy that totaled only seven in the demon world. According to Amun's explanation, the godly energy of fury could only display its true power when it was in the hands of the king of fury. So, Yong Ho thought about it the other way. As long as he possessed the godly energy of fury, the king of fury would not be able to use her power perfectly. As a matter of fact, Yong Ho was building a fairly positive relationship with the king of fury. But it didn't mean that she was his perfect ally. It was regrettable that he could not get the real godly energy of greed by fighting the king of gluttony, but he was lucky enough to have obtained the godly energy of fury. After sorting out his complicated thoughts by nodding, he brought to himself the attention of his subordinate spirits at the meeting. Then he brought out the next topic. I think I had better hide the fact that I defeated the king of gluttony. What do you think? I agree. For all the world, the king of gluttony mounted a surprise attack against us. So, I think the king's allies might regard the current situation as the king's sudden disappearance, said Ophelia. This time, Tigrius opined, there is a high possibility that the king's allies will hide his death, for it is clear that the king of fury or the king of violence will move once it's known that the king has disappeared. Unless the king's allies show any suspicious movement, I don't think we have to go to the trouble of drawing other king's attention by revealing that we defeated the king of gluttony. I agree. Substance is more important than what's on the surface. It's more likely that they will suspect the king of violence, not our master, Kai Wan said provocatively. When Yong Ho looked at him, Raikam, who was listening silently, replied with a tense expression, I agree. In fact, everybody at the meeting was on the same page on this issue. So, Yong Ho switched the topic again. As all of you agree on that, let me talk about the King of Fury. Everyone, watch this video. Catalina. When he called her, she quickly drew out a letter and opened it. A video of the King of Fury appeared on the table in the conference room, and Yuria, who was watching from her seat in the corner, looked at the king, with her eyes glistening at her fresh and beautiful appearance. When the video ended, Yong Ho spoke again, as you can see, the King of Fury is asking to meet me in person. I'm thinking of meeting her. Of course, I'm going to hide the fact that I defeated the King of Gluttony, as well as the fact that I am the King of Greed. Tigrius and Elagos were satisfied with his statement. That's a wise judgment. I think the King of Fury's goodwill to you is based on the fact that the House of Mammon is not a royal family. So, I think it's the best option for you to make the most of her ignorance. I don't think it's not a big problem morally because you have not deceived her anyway, Ophelia added mischievously. What she wanted to say was Yong Ho had never lied to her deliberately. I recommend that when you meet the King of Fury, you don't carry the godly energy of fury. Absolutely, because there might be synchronization between them. Yong Ho, who accepted Amun's advice, asked Ophelia again, was her name Gardamundi? How is the messenger of the King of Fury doing now? Chapter, 209 She's doing all right at the tavern. Yesterday, she went around the free city all day long, and today, she is just gambling all day. Yong Ho briefly recalled her image. She was a bright, cheerful-looking beauty with red hair and wings. 
He didn't think she would look sad just because she lost some money at the gambling house. I think it's okay to meet the Queen of Fury unless there is any big trouble. What about the date? I think it would be better for the king to choose the date. Instead, we can choose a meeting place. I think somewhere in the north or west would be nice. As always, Ophelia presented a good solution. Elagos, who somehow nodded with a satisfied expression, said, looking at her, requesting for a summit, meeting with you, it looks like she has high expectations for our alliance. In fact, the Queen of Fury herself, not anyone else, would come to the place to meet Yongho face to face. So, Yongho could not treat this meeting lightly. Right at that moment, Catalina, who was rolling her eyes at the heated discussion, raised her hand timidly and said, by the way. Ha! Huh. When Yongho turned around, Catalina curled her lips once. After checking Kaiwan's look, she asked, waving her tail gently, I wonder if this is a trap. I mean just like the king of gluttony ambushed our master all of a sudden. Yongho thought someone would raise some doubts about her question but no one did. Catalina checked his face nervously as if she felt she asked a silly question, but Yongho reached out and stroked her head. That's a good question. But it's unlikely because she doesn't know I'm the king of greed. Even if it's a trap well, I can deal with her duly in that case. Yongho was no longer weak as he was in the past. He was a strong man who was on par with the six kings who ruled the demon world. If the Queen of Fury did a trick on him, he would definitely smash her. Her proposal for a summit meeting was risky not only for Yong Ho but also for her. When they were done discussing the important agendas, Elagos, Rykam, and Bergrim began to report about some pending issues respectively. Elagos and Rykam briefed them about the general dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon, its dungeon, and the Free City, while Bergrim talked about various equipment and dungeon restoration. Bergrim reported about the status of the restoration on the blackboard. Silver Dragon Armor is under its own repair right now. The destroyed dungeon entrance is currently undergoing restoration. I think it will be possible to recover completely in two days. After sipping a new tea brought by Yuria, Yongho moved his neck gently. It was about time for him to wrap up the meeting that lasted almost an hour. Okay, this is my last agenda. The word last made them tense a bit. Yong Ho, who waited for his subordinate spirits to pay attention to him, said after taking turns to look at Catalina and Kaiwan, I'm going to visit my hometown again. It seems like your visit is very timely because it is very likely that a terrible confusion will come again sometime later, Ophelia said. The king of gluttony was dead. Like Ophelia or Tigrius predicted, they could not keep the secret forever even if the king's allies tried to hide it. The death of the king with great power could soon lead to the collapse of his entire forces. Didn't the house of Mammon collapse in an instant after the death of Mammon, the king of greed? Moreover, because of the war in the north, the six kings were nervous wrecks. The sudden absence of the king of gluttony could be the starting point for the disruption of the balance of power that had been maintained in the demon world. So, if Yong Ho had to visit his hometown in the human world, now was the right time like Ophelia said. He could meet the Queen of Fury a few days later, and it was unlikely that the death of the King of Gluttony would be revealed during that time. It was impossible that the war in the North could end suddenly. Yong Ho's plan to attack the North on the occasion of his absence was attractive at first glance, but it was not realistic. Although the King and his right-hand men were killed, the powerful forces who used to be under the King's command were still alive. It was absurd for him to start attacking the north with a small number of troops when he decided to hide the fact that the king was killed. What the House of Mammon currently needed was time, as always. Yong Ho had to take control of the whole unclaimed areas in the south completely. He had to increase troops and hurry up the attack against the labyrinth of greed and the arena. He also needed to secure a means of transport that could move his troops to a long distance speedily like the Queen of Fury or the King of Gluttony. So, his alliance with the Queen of Fury would make him gain time, until he secured all of those things. If the Queen of Fury's decisive reason for showing goodwill to Yong Ho is because the House of Mammon is a royal family, time was the decisive reason for Yong Ho. It wasn't because Yong Ho coveted the Queen of Fury as the incarnation of anguish, like Amon cracked a joke about it. It was motivated by his calculations that he responded to her goodwill with his goodwill. 
Of course, it is true that I hate to fight her, if possible. However, it was just his own personal feeling. If the time came when he had to draw a sword for the Mammon family and its dungeon spirits, he thought he would do it without hesitation. When they began to talk about his visit to the human world, Lucia, who checked the status of the dungeon, quickly spoke, there is one day left before the reuse hour of the space door expires. It's really the right time for your visit. It was never easy to travel to the human world through the door of space. Not only did it consume a lot of mana, but it also took a considerable amount of time to reuse it. It was like a long cool time in games. Now, the reuse time was running out at the right moment. It was as if an invisible force was pushing Yongho to travel to the human world. Are you going to start right away? Asked Eligos. Yongho tapped on the table with his fingers for a moment as if he was organizing his thoughts then said, since there is a day left as Lucia said, I think I had better get things squared away first before traveling. There wasn't much time for him to spare. It was unlikely that the Queen of Fury would suddenly make any provocations, but in any case, Yongho had to respond immediately if something happened. The King of Gluttony's allies might not be able to conceal the King's absence well, as expected. Like before, it would be two or three days during which he could visit the human world. It was difficult for him to stay there more than that period. Even those two or three days were not short. Ophelia smiled with a mixture of regret and wistfulness, well, I can't help it if Scathack insists on it. Please take a good rest when you go there. Yongho wasn't going to travel to the human world for pleasure. Following Skathaka's advice, the healer of the House of Mammon, he was going there for healing purposes. So, it would be wrong for his subordinate spirit to oppose his visit. Catalina smiled warmly as she thought of going back to the human world. Kaiwan seemed excited, too. And there was one more who got excited about his upcoming visit to the human world. Pitapat, Pitapat. This is not the sound of my heart pounding. It's someone else's. Lucia spoke small enough to be heard by Yongho alone, and he could find the owner of the heartbeat sound. He burst into laughter unwittingly. Yuria was standing in the corner, with her eyes twinkling. Although she didn't know it in detail, she could figure out roughly what they were talking about. Yongho was supposed to travel back to the human world. The last time he returned from the human world, he brought a surprisingly delicious chicken and coke. Moreover, he brought her the best treasure beautiful colored pebbles. Looking at her twinkling eyes, Yong Ho understood that her acting cute was her survival strategy. He waved his hand to Yuria gently and stroked her head. Let me bring you a present. A bright smile was on her face. He pinched her cheek lightly before he knew it and looked over her shoulder. Then he said to Baduk who was impatient, too, yes, I'm going to bring you one, too. Wow. Wow. Meowing. Meowing. As if he pointed at them, Baduk and the baby dungeon meerkat were also excited. Bowing to him, Yuria returned to her seat with Baduk and the baby dungeon meerkat. She kept smiling even at the thought of his gift. He again looked at his subordinate spirits. As the meeting was almost at an end, Eligo said, Well, why don't you have a meal first, master? Great. You're my best butler. Actually, he didn't eat anything all day. He got up and headed for the restaurant in a pleasant mood. Chapter, 210 The first thing Yong Ho did after eating was accessing the virtual space of the dungeon market because his conversation with Citri was cut off because of the King of Gluttony's intrusion. I wonder if she was worried about me a lot. For some reason, however, he felt she wasn't. He felt like she would welcome him with a relaxed expression, as always. You have defeated the King of Gluttony. Yong Ho felt strangely excited at what he achieved by himself, namely getting rid of one of the six kings who coveted Yong Ho's greed. He slowly opened his eyes and faced a totally white world. As always, Citri was standing there. Wearing a dark purple dress that revealed her shoulders under the white sky, she was standing there to face him. Somehow she looked different this time. Yong Ho couldn't open his mouth thoughtlessly, and Citri only looked at him. Awkwardness made him feel time pass very slowly. After all, Citri stepped forward, and he looked at her. Now, there was only one step of distance between Yong Ho and Citri. 
My dear client. Citri. She was tall for a woman but much smaller than Yong Ho, who grew up by going through a double changeover. Because of this, she looked up at Yong Ho. She asked in a voice filled with warmth, Can I just hug you once? Sure, any time, he replied in embarrassment. Citri slowly closed her eyes. Then she took one step further and hugged him tightly. She was warm. She was smaller than him, but he felt like he was held in her arms. The king of greed. She whispered. There was some sadness in her voice, which was hard to describe. He knew what the strange feelings he felt were. He felt different from when he held Catalina or Kaiwan. Scathack came to his mind at that moment. Obviously, he felt something like her warmth, who hugged him like a mother. He closed his eyes and hugged her, too. Again, time passed slowly this time, and Citri pushed him away gently. Thank you. It's only a moment, but I could recall him. She was moved to tears. Then she took one step back and said, Well, you're different from him, though. You look like him a lot, but you're my client, anyway. He knew who she was talking about. That was why he felt some more sadness in her voice. Citri stepped back a few more steps. Yong Ho, at a loss about what to say first, opened his mouth finally, while I defeated that king of gluttony. When he said that, Citri blinked without replying. He felt a bit awkward, so he blushed. Come to think of it, he felt like he was asking for her praise of what he had done. He recalled the time when he got perfect scores in a test at the school as a boy. Citri kept blinking without a word. When he got even his earlobes red, embarrassed, she burst into laughter and said, Dear client, do you know how cute you are right now? Actually, Citri knew at the moment she realized that he had defeated the king of gluttony. He cleared his throat in embarrassment, and Citri didn't bother him. Let me tell you this. There were already cozy and fluffy chairs arranged behind them. Citri, with her back buried deep against the back of the chair, waited until he sat down. She then said, Dear client, do you remember what I said shortly after I saw you first? I told you to be wary of those who valued pure blood. At that moment, he tilted his head, not knowing what she was talking about, but he could soon remember what she meant. When he nodded, she said again, As you may know, this demon world is a mess. There are not only those born in the demon world but also a lot of people from the alien world like you, my dear customer. When she fidgeted with her fingers, there was a picture of light drawn in the air. A round circle symbolized the demon world, and the small people in the circle and the new people following the big arrow outside the circle represented the demonic natives and the aliens, respectively. Purists are those who claim that only pure demons are masters of the demon world. They have a radical idea that everyone who comes from the alien world should be enslaved. Their idea could also be called a kind of fascism. Similar thoughts were found in the human world where Yong Ho used to live. Are there so many here from the alien world? A lot. Right now, the people of the Queen of Fury, the Eight Clans, are from the alien world. So is the King of Gluttony. The King of Gluttony was a Preta, the lowest demon who came to the demon world with the Eight Clan people. That was why he chose the Afsaras, who had a deep connection with the Eight Clan people, as his pleasure girls. Of course, it's been quite a while since the Eight Clan people came from the alien world. It's already been a few hundred years since they came. However, from the perspective of the purists in the demon world, they are no more than an inferior race to be enslaved. When Citri moved her fingers again, a simplified dragon shape was drawn in the air. The dragons, belonging to the clan of the King of Violence, are also from the alien world. Of course, there are also some dragons from the demon world. They are called the demon dragon race. Anyway, it's a situation where the stone that just rolled and takes out the embedded stone, but that's the current situation. In fact, dragons came down here so long ago that they are hard to be called an alien race. The dragon's shape changed to a map of the demonic world this time. Citri said, adding a new line in the middle, there are more powerful purists in the north. The king of pride and the king of envy are the typical purists. In particular, the king of envy is also notorious for not recognizing anybody as a king, except for the king of pride, the king of lust, and the king of sloth. 
They were all born in the demon world like him. Just under the line drawn by Citri was the territory of the Queen of Fury. Citri pointed to that area and said, the eight clan people were originally enslaved in the north for a long time. It wasn't until the Queen of Fury appeared that they started enjoying a stable life. It's natural that the Queen of Fury was called the King of Defender. The light was scattered. Citri looked at Yong Ho instead of the empty space. No one can be sure of how the situation of the demon world will be in the future. However, if the Queen of Fury gets what she wants, there is a high possibility that there will be a confrontation between the North and the South. And the core of that confrontation is the fight between the purists and the outsiders. In that respect, it's essential to form a Southern Alliance front. Well, that's possible when the King of Pride successfully occupies the North. Citri crossed her legs in reverse. She usually helped him indirectly, but it's very rare that she took the initiative to tell him about things in detail like this voluntarily. The fact that he defeated the King of Gluttony might have moved her for some reason. Let me draw your attention to this. Again, an entire map of the demonic world drawn in the air. But this time, different emblems were embedded in each area. He soon realized that each emblem represented the six kings who ruled the demon world. The emblem representing the King of Gluttony among them disappeared. Citri bit her lower lip slightly and said, a country created by a king is strong and organized beyond comparison with the southern area. Probably, the king of gluttony's subordinates can hide the secret about their boss's death for some time, but not forever. Once the secret is revealed, the land of the king of gluttony will turn into a battlefield. And it's my personal wish, but I hope that you can play a big role in such a situation. You still have some time to strengthen your forces. There were clearly expectations for him in her gaze. He did not want to betray her expectation. Let me stop talking about this difficult topic. Oh, our conversation last time was cut off when I told you I obtained the gift you asked me for, right? Yeah. Well, let me conclude at this time. Please choose one. She snapped her fingers at the same time. Then two catalogs appeared in the air. Each contained a magic device and dungeon spirits. The magic sword with the secret of necromancing and a lich specializing in necromancing. It's up to you which one you want to choose. The two catalogs that automatically opened turned to him. Yong Ho returned. Citri was left alone in the whole white space. Citri closed her eyes. Her bright smile with which she saw him off turned into sadness. Hundreds of years ago there were five kings during Mammon, the great king of greed's days. King of Greed. King of Pride. Queen of Sloth. King of Lust. King of Envy. At the last minute, the King of Pride, the King of Lust, and the King of Envy betrayed the King of Greed. The Queen of Sloth did not actively betray him like the other three kings, but that was it. He was different from Mammon back then. Now it was the thing of the past. Citri closed her eyes. On the day Mammon died in her arms, she remembered what the great king of greed told her. The white world turned black. Darkness enveloped Citri. Chapter, 211. It's the 25th floor of the arena. Eucrasian, the ninth master of the house of Mammon as well as the floor master of the 25th floor, turned to the special seat, sweating buckets, where Gusion was seated, sweating. Gusion shook his head when she earnestly indicated she would like to surrender. In the arena, a cruel testing place, there was no option like I want to surrender even without trying to fight at all. Eucrasian, who was about to cry, looked straight ahead. She felt like a terrifying and menacing manna was squeezing her body tightly. Eucrasian took pride in her own strength. She had five horns, and her combat skills were advanced far enough because she practiced long enough in the arena. However, she never thought that she would be able to beat this monster challenger in front of her now. Hey, this it's against the rules. The challenger wasn't as strong as now until he successfully challenged up to the 24th floor. He had a soft spot as a human being because he almost died from suffocation. Challenger Yong Ho released his full power in front of Eucrasian. He wanted to test how strong his power became after taking the essence of the King of Gluttony. Enormous mana soared from his six towering horns. Their presence itself resonated with the whole area around him. 
Yongho's mana, represented by the green flames, did not contain only greed. It had the power of gluttony, though a bit now, and Yongho's determination to eat, which could be called gluttony itself, caused instinctive fear in those who encountered him. Eucrasian resembled Kaiwan. Since Eucrasian was Kaiwan's ancestor, it was correct to say the latter resembled the former. Yongho wasn't very comfortable because the beauty with rich gray hair was trembling with a sad expression. However, he had no intention of relenting. Let me end this fighting with just one blow. When he shouted mercifully, she clenched her teeth and released mana. Facing her, though, he lifted Amun in his right hand and concentrated mana at once. Ah! Eucrasian rushed, screaming like crazy, but Yongho swung Amun. As he promised, he punched her down with just a single blow. What a cruel guy! cried Gusan. But her pain must have been very short. When Yongho replied casually, Gusayan narrowed his eyes further. Then, he added, pretending to be startled, what a scary guy. Her last screaming was sadness itself. It was so sad that Yongho got worried for a moment whether death in the arena would actually lead to actual death. Despite that, Yongho was calm and composed. Maybe he might react differently, but he was a thorough combatant during battle. That's why I like him. Murmuring to himself, Gus Ion smiled, as if his criticism of Yongho until a moment ago was fake. Kaiwan hugged Yongho's arm tightly and said, Eucrasian has a good personality. So, you will be fine. It seemed Kaiwan's words were out of place, but Yongho nodded because Eucrasian didn't look like a bad person. When they began to talk less and less, the flames of the red lotus arose. Amun, who was with Yongho even during battle unlike he was before, asked Gusayan gently, what do you think about our master's power's growth, Gusayan? Now, Amun changed the way he called Yongho. His title was now master, not young master, like before. Gusayan, who went to the trouble of differentiating between young master and master, didn't miss his title change, of course. Instead of looking at Yongho up and down, Gusayan smiled and looked at his eyes, which were normally emitting a green light. Gusayan admitted it, too. You have definitely gotten stronger. Much stronger. To simply talk about the strength of mana, Yongho was the strongest among those who visited the arena for the last 1000 years. And Gusayan knew that it was not just his mana that saw a dramatic growth. Yongho was as hard as steel that went through repeated quenching. Not only in the arena but also in other places, he experienced deadly fighting again and again. Victory in fighting was not determined simply by one's mana and physical strength. Fighting spirit and fighting skills, bold judgment, and flexible thinking affected one's victory and defeat greatly. The Yongho in front of Eucrasian was very good at fighting. Besides, he had lots of fighting experiences through numerous deadly fighting. For the first time since becoming the owner of the arena, Gus Ion began to have expectations for Yongho. Don't hesitate. Come up quickly. I am on the 39th floor, said Gus Ion. For the first time, Gus Ion informed the challenger of his specific location in the arena. Yeah, because I trust him and I have expectations for him. Gus Ion was convinced that Yong Ho would definitely overcome all the difficulties that would stand before him on the 39th floor one day. Yong Ho nodded when he looked at Gyuzhin's intense eyes. He said with a cheerful expression, not now. Let me go back to my hometown first. Oh, I've got Skat Hakka's letter for you. Ha! Huh. Although Gus Ion was perplexed because he didn't challenge the next floor, Yong Ho quickly turned. Kaiwan, who was holding his arm, said, I'll buy you a present. See you next time. Catalina also turned, waving her tail gently. Finally, Amun spoke, See you next time, man. Yong Ho didn't need to be escorted by the man with a beast mask. He walked out of the arena with big strides. Gus Ion, looking at the spot blankly where Yong Ho and his party left, turned his eyes at Skat Hakka's letter. He nodded when he read her message that she wanted to meet him soon, not just saying, I miss you. Gus Ion again looked toward the passage through which Yong Ho went out. He smiled gently, which didn't befit his image normally. Gardamundi soared into the sky. 
She held a letter from the master of the House of Mammon in her arms, and some gifts in Sarasvati's pocket on her waist. Of course, among the gifts were the special product, fried chicken. The master himself visited the free city. His visit was very unusual, which was a strong indication that he, too, treated Gardamundi, the messenger of the Queen of Fury, with respect. However, Gardamundi thought about it in another aspect. Why did he visit the free city directly without calling her to his place? Of course, some of the masters did not want to expose their dungeons to outsiders, so they handled all their diplomatic affairs at the dungeon entrance. However, the House of Mammon once admitted Gardamundi into the dungeon recently. So, it didn't make any sense that they didn't want to let her enter the dungeon this time. Is it because the entrance to the dungeon was destroyed? The House of Mammon was attacked. The entrance to the dungeon, which was built so strongly as to resist any attack, was destroyed entirely, so the attack must have been very devastating. The master of the House of Mammon told her that the alien people attacked them by intruding into the twisted door of space. Was it really true? If he lied, why did he make up such a lie? The farthest area of Mammon's dungeon, namely in Cotropagnium, was notorious for the unstable flow of mana. It was not easy to find the traces of twisting because the flow of mana was strong there in the first place. Well, the Mammon people are friendly to us anyway. Rationally speaking, it was natural that Yong Ho welcomed her because his alliance with the Queen of Fury would be beneficial to him anyway. He got stronger. The master of the House of Mammon never opened his horns in front of Gardamundi. But she could feel something different about him between now and then. He was stronger than when she met him last time. And it was the same with the women on his left and right. Perhaps it was the attack that made them stronger. Given the outcome of the attack, though. Unlike Kurtamukha, who was making a big fuss over the possible alliance and excitement, in fact, Gardamundi initially did not take seriously the marriage of her master Dhritarashtra, the Queen of Fury. It was because she didn't think the master of the House of Mammon was the right candidate to be her king. But she changed her perception of the Mammon master. It didn't matter that the House of Mammon was weak. The master of the House of Mammon and his subordinate spirits were strong. Of course, he was not powerful enough, but she felt he could stand before her master proudly. Finding the bridegroom candidate among the eight clan people was not beneficial to the king. So, her alliance with a powerful outside force would be of great help to her people. Gardamundi loved and cherished the Queen of Fury very much. But she was a king. Her marriage was not something about her own matter as a king, but something she had to take into account for the interests of her people. Gardamundi flapped her wings a little faster. She flew fast through the sky of the demon world with her red wings, which was called the fastest among the Garura clan. Exactly one day had passed since Yong Ho woke up. All of the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon gathered in the room where the door of the space was located. This time, you have consumed the mana of not two, but three among us. Fortunately, you did not use the mana stored in the dungeon when you fought the King of Gluttony. Of course, if you come back after your visit, it looks like even the stored mana will be running out. Chapter, 212 Yong Ho fought the king in a place where any outside help was blocked from the beginning. Because of this, the reserved mana in the dungeon was more than enough despite a series of big battles in succession, which turned out to be better for the House of Mammon. Yong Ho, standing at the door of space with Kai Wan and Catalina, looked back. He made eye contact with Skull first, who stood out most among the dungeon spirits. Skull Skull. Skull was still in the shape of a dragon bone knight. He said with a bitter smile, let me make the decision after I come back. Skullkull. A magic sword containing the secret of necromancing and a lich specializing in necromancing. Yong Ho eventually chose both and paid for them. This took the House of Mammon into deficit again, but he didn't feel any regret about it. Skull always showed more returns on his investment than expected. The real wealth of the House of Mammon was always the few talents who made up the elites. Yong Ho again rolled his eyes and looked at a larger entity than Skull. He smiled with a sorry expression. I'll bring you something you can eat this time. You can trust me. Treant responded by shaking its branches. Like the goblin ranger and goblin, he was no longer an ordinary Treant thanks to repeated evolution. 
When Yong Ho looked back at his subordinate spirits one by one and promised them a gift, Kai Wan pulled him slightly. Then she said mischievously as if she was a bit critical, you're going to use all the money to buy the gifts. You need to save some money. Of course, she cracked a joke, but Yuria got serious, who was waiting for her turn to make eye contact with him, trying to suppress her excitement. Yong Ho couldn't hold back his laughter when he saw Yuria, who became seriously worried about the financial situation of the House of Mammon. He reassured her by pinching her cheek and said, You do not have to worry. We have a lot of money. Bye. Feeling relaxed, Yuria quickly bowed to him, followed by Baduk and the baby dungeon meerkat. Meowing. Meowing. After exchanging greetings with his subordinate spirits, he turned his eyes at his most trusted aides. On behalf of his subordinate spirits, Ophelia said, Don't worry about things here. Have a great journey. If anything happens, let me know right away. Okay. Ophelia, Elagos, and Tigrius bowed to him. Their atmosphere was somewhat different from Yuria, Baduk, and the baby meerkat. Yong Ho turned. He tightly held Catalina's hand, who was just happy because she had been there already, as well as Kaiwan's hand, who seemed to be a bit nervous. Let's go. Yong Ho and Catalina jumped at the same time, and Kaiwan hit the ground a bit late as if she was sucked into them. The door of the deep blue space swallowed up the three. The door opened. It didn't come to his mind well how he passed through the door. It looked like it took long but short at the same time. What he saw when he opened his eyes was the unfamiliar living room of his house in the human world. Yong Ho took a big breath. Catalina also expressed her peace of mind by waving her tail gently. Only Kai Wan looked around, turning white with nervousness. Right at that moment, his father called, Yong Ho. His father, who was sitting at the kitchen table over a meal, blinked, holding a spoon. Yong Ho smiled brightly and turned around. Daddy. His father calmly put down the spoon and drank cold water. He got up and said, The one on your left is my daughter-in-law. Thanks to the interpreting magic, Catalina recognized the expression daughter-in-law and flapped her ears and tail. Then he turned his eyes to the right. Who is this lady on the right? This time, Kaiwan was more quick-witted. Holding down a little motion sickness, she said hello to his father cutely, which didn't fit her usual behavior, How do you do, sir? My name is Kaiwan. I'm Yongho's wife. She unusually pronounced strongly when she mentioned wife. His father blinked once again. He looked at Catalina, just in case, but he realized that he could not find any sign of her divorce or separation in her expression. Then there was one possibility left. Yong Ho, you must be a king, right? Yong Ho smiled awkwardly at his father's prodding. By the way, Dad, why are you at home at this hour? When he asked, blinking his eyes, his father frowned. Then he knocked on the table with a bang and said, It's morning, son. Do you think the chicken house is a 24-hour convenience store? It's closed in the morning. Uh. Time difference. When he left the demon world, it was obviously in the afternoon. When he visited here last time, there was almost no difference in time between the demon and human worlds. Did the passage of time change by any chance? His father narrowed his eyes then said right away, Well, it's March here. Yong Ho knitted his brows. Since he last visited, he has spent less than two months in the demon world, but more than three months passed in the human world. Obviously, the passage of time was different between the two worlds. And it changed significantly than it did last time. He didn't know how the passage of time between the two worlds was different, but it was going to be a problem if the current difference would be bigger than now. Should I take him to the demon world soon? It would be a big headache for Yong Ho if his one year stay in the demon world would mean the passage of ten years in the human world, with his father getting ten years older than now. While Yong Ho was agonizing about it, his father took the spoon again. Let me finish my meal first. Did you eat anything? Yes, I did. Although his son suddenly brought a new daughter-in-law, he never lost his composure, as always. After looking back at Catalina and Kai Wan, who were standing blankly, he said to Yong Ho again, Wives that expression of mine is weird. Anyway, 
go into your room with them and watch your picture album. Let me finish eating and join you in no time. Uh, yes. See you later, daughter-in-law. He looked back at Kai Wan, who quickly smiled and said, Yes, father. Smiling at her again, he began to eat again. Yong Ho quickly led Kai Wan and Catalina into his room. The room was empty and spacious because all the furniture was put away. Kai Wan, sitting in the middle of the room, looked around curiously. This place is very small. Is it a warehouse or an annex? Yong Ho recalled the house of Mammon when he visited first. It was definitely a ruined house, but it was big. Even Kaiwan's office there, relatively small, was bigger than his living room. Catalina quickly whispered to Kaiwan, All the houses in the human world are small. Really? Yeah. Kaiwan again looked around Yong Ho's room again. Looking at her glittering eyes, it seemed that she was thinking of bringing someone from his family that she had once planned. At that time, she thought of it to get some help from a remote relative, but given the condition of his house, it seemed that she would need to help him. Let's look at your album. To change the topic, Yong Ho unfolded an album chosen by his father but regretted it in no time. But Catalina and Kai Wan burst into laughter, watching his pictures. Among the pictures of his baby days was one showing he was all smiles, fully naked. Yong Ho's embarrassing moments lasted until his father came into the room. The album was filled with his humiliating photos as if his father chose them deliberately. Just like someone who knew the etiquette, his father served Catalina, Kai Wan, and Yong Ho a cup of green tea. Yong Ho asked, sipping the tea after blowing on it to cool it a bit. Did you have anything special, Dad? Not really. How about you? I'm fine, too. I'm comfortable. He hid his expression by lifting the teacup, but he knew he was already caught by his father. As expected, it was impossible for him to deceive his father. However, his father didn't bother to ask him. After putting down the green teacup, he said again, Come to think of it have you seen it when you came here last time? I mean the article about those who fell into a coma while playing online games. Uh, yes. I remember it. Obviously, he saw the news on the electronic bulletin board while delivering chicken. Since he mentioned it out of the blue sky, Yong Ho prodded him to continue. He continued, such people increased significantly. I hear there are over hundreds of thousands of people in a coma all over the world. Hundreds of thousands were never small. Catalina and Kai Wan were embarrassed, while Yong Ho leaned forward. Were they playing any specific online games? No, they played irregularly. There are even some who fell into a coma while doing Super Mario Multiplay. Their game machines were all different. This was definitely a phenomenon in itself. Moreover, this was not all. But what happened next after they fell into a coma is weird. Their recovery period is all different. Recovery period? Are there any who regained consciousness? A lot. Almost all of them regained their consciousness. But as I told you already, their recovery periods are different. Some wake up from their coma right after they fall into it, and others wake up a few days or a month to two months later. There are even people who have not been able to wake up until now. Chapter, 213 Yong Ho felt more and more strange about it. His father added lastly, some of the people who have recently woken up said something crazy. They said while they were in a coma, they experienced something like a fantasy world that would appear in movies. Those who woke up before them didn't say anything like that. But some among those who woke up after March are talking about their fantasy experiences. Yong Ho seemed to know why his father mentioned it. Leaning toward him, his father asked, Do you know anything about this? Some of them must have been summoned to an alien world in a coma. Well, I've never heard of it. How about you, Kai Wan? Coma means that their bodies are left behind here, right? I've never heard of an alien summon magic that takes only their souls, Kai Wan replied quite seriously. Yong Ho, too, did not hear that a large number of humans appeared in the demon world. Checking Yong Ho and Kai Wan's reaction, his father let out a sigh. Then he said feebly, as if he was a bit distraught, Do you remember Yong Jie? I mean your cousin, Yong Jie Chion. He immigrated to England, 
as you know. Of course I do. I played games with him before I went to the demon world. What happened? Oh my, I hear he fell into a coma then died. I can't believe Yong Jae. It was a few years ago that he saw Yong Jae's face last time. However, he continued to get in touch with his cousin online. His father put his hands on Yong Ho's back then said, I asked you, just in case. Don't dwell on it too much. He died already several months ago, and even his funeral was already over. Yong Ho nodded slowly. Maybe because it's not the first time he saw someone close to him die, or because he lost contact with his cousin for some time, Yong Ho felt more embarrassed and empty than sad. By the way, what has brought you here this time? It's nice to see your face once in a while, but you surprised me with your unexpected visit, said his father, smiling on purpose. Yong Ho also responded with a forced laugh, you know I'm from the human world, dad. I hear that it will be good for me to take some fresh air here. I also wanted to introduce Kaiwan to you. His father narrowed his eyes, not knowing what he was talking about. Do you need more coke? And other stuff. Both of them laughed together. It's been a while since I saw you anyway. I'm glad to see my daughter's in-law, too. Catalina and Kaiwan smiled shyly at the same time. With a hearty laugh, his father asked them, isn't he giving you any headache? Catalina and Kaiwan rolled their eyes once again, embarrassed. Yong Ho hoped that his father would get out of his room as soon as possible. Oh my god. Kaiwan opened her mouth blankly. She could hardly calm down like someone who just experienced a miracle. She was now standing in front of a big supermarket. The human world is really abundant. So many people here, too. There were hundreds of items in the supermarket everywhere she looked at. Not only food ingredients but also all kinds of items were piled up like a mountain here and there. It was truly a wonder to Kaiwan. She felt like she was in Mammon's arsenal in the labyrinth of greed. Besides, there were so many people. People were crowded everywhere on the streets. Population density itself was different from that of the demon world. Yong Ho, who was somewhat conceited before he knew it, once again pressed the baseball cap Kaiwan was wearing. He pushed the cart with Catalina who covered her head with a hood. Yong Ho, Yong Ho. How do you read this? The only thing the interpretation magic stone could solve was providing language through voice. Yong Ho replied, looking at the item that Kaiwan presented with full of curiosity. Ha! Huh. Salami. Salami? Yes, salami. She narrowed her eyes, while Catalina blinked, embarrassed. Kaiwan inquisitively asked again, Hey, can you eat this? Yes, why? Salami, it was a kind of Italian sausage. She shook her head from side to side after putting it down. You're so mean. How come you named it like this? If Salami heard about this, he would be very much disappointed. Yuria, Lucia, Baduk. These names have nothing to do with food, right? Catalina quickly jumped in. Yong Ho replied hastily, no, just Salami only. Only Salami is a food name. Catalina and Kai Wan became even sullen for his reply, which sounded like his excuses, so he quickly pushed the cart. They caught up with him, but he didn't look back. Two days passed like a flash. The main purpose of Yong Ho's visit to the human world, namely the recovery of his body in the demon god's heart, was successful. As Skathak said, his exposure to the air of the human world seemed to be helpful to him. After shopping then visiting the amusement park with Catalina and Kaiwan, Yong Ho opened the door of space after piling up all kinds of items to give his subordinate spirits and others a mountain load of stuff. I'm going to come back to take you sooner or later, Dad. He grabbed his father's hands. Fortunately, thanks to his Max Evolution EXP, his father experienced another evolution, so he had a strong build, something rare for a middle-aged man. However, Yong Ho didn't feel good because he had to leave his father behind again. His father gently wrapped the back of Yong Ho's hand. He didn't feel good, either. He had lots of things to ask Yong Ho, but he could easily find out that the demon world was not a land full of safety and peace. All right, son. Take care. Don't overwork yourself. 
After Yong Ho said goodbye to him, Catalina and Kai Wan did the same thing. Kai Wan hugged him suddenly, so Catalina, who only shook hands with him, was showing a regrettable expression. But it was too late for her to hug him. His father waved at them, standing still, and Yong Ho bowed to him lastly. He then threw himself into the door of space. The king of violence's consciousness was separated from his body and hovered in the air. He recalled a meeting with the king of sloth. Then he connected the king of sloth's demands with what he confirmed from the king of sloth. In a way, it was pointless. It was just like tracing things of the past. There were almost a few of those in those days who survived until now. The king of violence turned his gaze from the past to the present. He saw the demon world, facing a period of confusion in the days ahead. Who would be the hero of the history that would unfold in the coming days? He was not the king of gluttony, nor was the queen of fury. The most likely candidate was the king of pride who ruled in the north. But he was not alone. There was another one in seclusion, who didn't reveal himself yet in the demon world. The king of greed. The godly energy of greed tipped him that the king of greed returned. As his true master, the king came down to the demon world after a thousand years. The consciousness of the king of violence closed its eyes. It stopped hovering in the air and united with its main body. Ancient Red Dragon Dragon Lord of the Day The strongest dragon in the demon world. The man who rose to the position of king confidently even without any of the seven deadly sins. The king of violence opened his eyes. His mountain-like giant body began to move. The Queen of Fury opened the letter from the master of the House of Mammon in excitement. His face that he recalled several times appeared through a video message in the air. Kurtimuka smiled mischievously behind her back, which looked subtle but dangerous. Gardamundi looked at Yong Ho's images in the video rather seriously. The message Yong Ho conveyed through the video was routine. In the message, he said he thanked her proposal for alliance and summit talks, which he said were good. He said he would leave it to her to set the date, but argued that the meeting would take place in the unclaimed area in the north. He added he would look forward to seeing her. His message was plain, but the Queen of Fury didn't feel like that. The Queen of Fury lightly pressed the letter down on her heart, feeling it was beating somewhat different from when it did at the auction house. The King of Lust leaned against the throne comfortably. He felt that the deep regrets that had haunted him for a thousand years were coming back to him. He couldn't help it. There was no way for him to reverse his betrayal on that day. The King of Lust admitted his wrongdoing. He closed his eyes in deep regret. The King of Pride reached out. He grabbed the pieces randomly lined up on the chessboard. His gaze was not fixed on the northern part where a war was going on. The southern area. The land where Mammon, the cursed king of greed, ruled. The king of pride smiled. He looked down at the ground from the highest place in the sky. Seven deadly sins. Seven godly energies. It had been a thousand and a hundred years since Mammon, the king of greed, died. Sin and sin began to call each other again. The seven godly energies yearned to return to their masters. After all, the seven sins returned, along with the seven kings. Did sin resonate with godly energy because they hoped for the arrival of a new demon king, or was there another reason? Nobody knew it yet. Chapter, 214 The death of a demon king soon led to the death of the soul of the dungeon. Because of this, if the demon king who went outside the dungeon met with a violent death, it was conveyed to those who remained inside the dungeon in near real time. The king of gluttony was dead. It was only about ten minutes later when Orlando, the king's butler, came to know about the king's death. Unlike red demons, blue demons were good at magic, compared with their weak physical abilities, and often showed surprising calmness even in a crisis. Orlando responded to his death with composure and calmness befitting his identity as a blue demon. Orlando blocked the dungeon immediately. When the dungeon's soul died, most of the dungeon's functions were supposed to be paralyzed. In that case, those dungeon spirits inside the dungeon would feel something strange, belatedly or not, and some of them might be suspicious of their master's death. So, it was better to have rumors getting around about the blockade of the dungeon outside than letting things inside leak out. 
Orlando, who blocked the dungeon, agonized. The King of Gluttony did not leave any contingency guidelines in case he died. He didn't have any successor chosen in advance. The king was not prepared for his death. It wasn't because he was too young to think of anything like death yet. It wasn't even because the king's death wasn't something to consider. The king rose to the throne after overcoming the crisis of death over and over again. It was common for the master of a house to prepare for their own death, regardless of whether he was young or old. Nevertheless, there was one reason why the king of gluttony did not prepare for his death. He simply didn't care about anything after his death. What was the point of caring about anything after he died anyway? An heir was not important to him because he was a king who had grown up by defining everybody other than himself as an enemy and literally eating them. For a man like him who thought only he was important, preparing for somebody else after his death was nothing but a futile effort. But that was only the position of the king of gluttony himself. Orlando, who was left behind, agonized. The number of those who belonged to the kingdom of the king of gluttony was huge. As a result, only the king of gluttony could stay insensitive to the lives and well-being of his own people. It wasn't just the absence of the king that made Orlando concerned. The absence of the ten warriors, the king's right-hand men, also made him worried. The king was killed, and his right-hand men were killed. Not only his top deputy but also other top subordinates were all killed. Fortunately, most of the ten warriors were the king's subordinate spirits, not masters. If each of them was a master, even Orlando would not be able to hide the deaths of all of them, no matter how smart he was. It would be a matter of time anyway. Since the king of gluttony was a womanizer, he had numerous pleasure women for his sexual desire. Because of this, those offsprings, who inherited the king's blood, mushroomed. Maybe Orlando might have to choose one of them to succeed their late father. But was it enough? Would other kings watch the kingdom whose king had disappeared, and in a tense situation like this at that? Orlando eventually stopped judging for himself. Since all of the ten warriors were the king's subordinate spirits, he decided to rely on the unexpected benefactors to resolve this issue. Orlando wrote three letters. They were addressed to the three masters under the king's command, who led a mighty army defending the front lines in the north and west. The king's subordinate spirits could not be the masters, so they could not become local strongmen protecting the dungeon at an important point, even though they could be the king's close aides. Although not only the king but also his ten warriors were killed, there were, fortunately, three strongmen in the kingdom of the king of gluttony who defended the borders. Orlando decided to leave this matter to these three strongmen. He hurriedly sent out the letters to each of them. That's weird. Samuel, the fastest wing, tapped the table with her finger. The tea she prepared in advance was already cold for a long time. It had already been over an hour since the appointed time passed, but the king of gluttony did not appear. It was strange. The king had never broken the appointment. Though he was somewhat hysterical, he was basically a meticulous man. He didn't appear at the secret place he requested first, let alone sending any message about his failure to appear. Samuel was upset because she was put out after waiting for more than one hour in vain, but she was one of the five directors of the dungeon market. Rather than being upset, she came to think about the reason rationally. The king of gluttony was not a man to break the appointment. Even if he broke it, this was not the way he did it. Then, what was the reason? Did something big happen to make it impossible for him to keep the appointment? Samuel stood up. Instead of dismissing her assumptions like this as delusion, she acted. She called an incubus. Hey, guys. I'm back. Yong Ho just passed through the door of space, shouting with her hands open. Catalina curled her tail as if she was shy, but she posed with him. Kaiwan clicked her tongue after stepping back from him. Yong Ho's subordinate spirits and others reacted differently. Salami, sitting in a corner with Bucephalus, shook his head, narrowing his eyes, while Bucephalus tapped on the back of Salami with a horseshoe as if comforting his rival. But Salami growled at Bucephalus, unhappy about him putting his feet on his back. Ophelia laughed awkwardly as if she was shy, and Tigrius gently turned away. However, Uria, who Yong Ho had in mind from the beginning, 
welcomed his return by clapping her hands, so did the baby dungeon meerkat on her head and Baduki on her back. Welcome back, master. Eligos expressed due manners on behalf of all the dungeon spirits just like the butler of the House of Mammon. Not only his subordinate spirits but also all the major dungeon spirits of the Mammon family welcomed him in the room of the space. Yes, thanks for your warm welcome. I've brought you guys a bunch of gifts. You bought mine, right? Did you buy Marona? Pit a pat, pit a pat. There seemed to be something strange stuck in the middle of the gift packages, but Yong Ho nodded with a smile and lifted a small pocket apart from the large package like he did last time. It was a magic pouch he obtained as a reward in the arena. Looking at it, it was a small pocket that could barely fit a fist, but it was expanded a lot inside with magic, so much so that it could contain even a car. Even normal packages were piled up like a mountain, so when Yong Ho lifted the magic pocket, Ophelia became a little worried. Quick-witted, Kai Wan whispered to her, don't worry about the budget. In the human world, the value of a jewel was more than that here. We used one of the jewels we carried there to buy all this. Ophelia felt relieved to hear that, but a bit embarrassed at the same time, so she nodded quietly. Yong Ho pulled out the first item from the magic pouch. Now, this one is for Trey Ant. Trey Ant, who was standing at the entrance to the room because of his huge body, where the door of space was located, shook its branch in surprise. It didn't think it would be called first. Yong Ho waved at Trey Ant once again, who waddled on its roots and approached him. This is a plant nutrient. I don't know if it tastes good, but it must be good for your body. Yong Ho lifted dozens of plastic containers with yellow liquid then removed one of them and put it into Trent's body right away. Trey Ant flinched for a moment, but it soon became satisfied and happily hung down its branches. As Yong Ho said, Trey Ant obviously didn't feel it tasted good. Besides, a single nutrient could not have restored Trent's body immediately. Nevertheless, Trent's expression was satisfaction itself. He seemed to be pleased with the fact that he received a gift from Yong Ho more than anything else. In fact, Trey Ant could be said to be one of the founding members of the dungeon, so Yong Ho felt sorry he could not take good care of him until now. If Kai Wan hadn't followed him this time, he wouldn't have been able to bring anything like this for Trey Ant. When Yong Ho expressed gratitude to Kai Wan with a glance, she signaled to him to continue quickly. He immediately took out a second gift. It was a metal polish. This is for Skull. I think it would be good when you clean weapons or armor. Yong Ho unwittingly laughed while slurring his words because Skull applied it on his body as soon as he received the polish. He didn't know if it was because of his pleasant mood or because of the real product effect, but it seemed that Skull's body was pretty shiny. Oh, you can do it, too. Then Yong Ho handed out other gifts. All of them were picked up by Kai Wan tailored to the needs of each spirit. This cosmetics is for Ophelia, a pot set for Eligos, and this one is for Tigrius. I don't know if you'll like it. Tigrius, who received a lighter that looked pretty luxurious, lit it a few times. He then expressed his gratitude with a very satisfied expression. The lighter was a fun toy and collectible for him, who lit a magical flame every time he smoked. Now, this is dog gum for you. The best gift for a dog was a dog gum. Yong Ho also handed over a few bags of dog snacks. He then rummaged through his pocket again and took out a present for Yuria. It was also a gift that Kai Wan chose, but it was a bit questionable. This is for Yuria. When Yong Ho handed the gift to Yuria without expressing his feelings, Yuria, who was so excited at the moment, opened her eyes wide. She admired it from the bottom of her heart. Wow. It was none other than a soccer ball that Yong Ho gave her. He originally planned to buy her something like a doll, so he was embarrassed that she liked it so much. Kai Wan, who chose the gift, was half convinced that Yuria might like a soccer ball better than a doll, but little did she think Yuria really liked it so much. Thank you. Chapter, 215 When Yuria kept bowing to him to show gratitude, Baduk and the baby dungeon meerkat also followed suit. Oh, Yuria really likes the ball. When Yong Ho blinked, suggesting he couldn't believe his eyes, Kai Wan gently nudged his elbow as if to confirm from him that she made the right choice. 
In fact, a good gift for Yuria was something that she could play with Baduk. In that respect, a ball was better than a doll. What about mine? You don't have one for me. Right after Yuria received her gift, Lucia looked at Yong Ho impatiently. He soothed Lucia with a small voice, let me give you a gift later. Later? Yes, later. Yong Ho, who gave Raikam a nice lighter, looked at the two dungeon spirits remaining in the room. They were Salami, who was snorting with lots of expectation, and Bucephalus, who pretended to be calm while expecting to receive a gift deep down. After giving Bucephalus a comb to trim mane, which should eventually be done by Skull, Yong Ho stood in front of Salami. He looked at Kaiwan and Catalina once then took out the gift after hesitating a bit. Okay, Salami. This gift is for you. It's salty, so don't eat too much at once. Yong Ho gave Salami an Italian sausage salami, while Catalina and Kaiwan waited for Salami's reaction with mixed feelings of curiosity, joy, and nervousness. Salami blinked once then ate a slice of salami, flapping his tail. For some reason, Yong Ho felt a bit guilty and stroked Salami's head. Just like a demon king who cared about the welfare of his subordinate spirits, Yong Ho had brought enough food to hand out to all the spirits of the Mammon family. The limelight of all the gifts he brought this time was ice cream, not chicken. Enjoying melon-flavored ice cream, which Lucia mentioned carelessly as the spirit sharing some memories with Yong Ho, he asked, there has been no reply from the Queen of Fury yet? There were only four in the heart of the dungeon Kaiwan, Catalina, Ophelia, and Eligos. Ophelia, admiring the subtle taste of ice cream she tried for the first time in her life, responded belatedly, Ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah. Sorry. Hmm, hmm. No, we haven't received any reply from the Queen of Fury yet. Actually, her reply was too fast last time. Anyway, it looks like she thought that if she sent her reply fast, she would reveal to us that she was in a hurry or impatient. So, even if she has the means to send her reply quickly, it is common for her to drag on for several days when it comes to this kind of exchange. Is it like a girl reading a boy's text message and not replying right away? Yong Ho thought to himself. He nodded, recalling his experience of a rare blind date as a college boy. Obviously, it was important to push and pull in these kinds of exchanges. Right at that moment, Lucia, who loved the white dress that Yong Ho bought and kept spinning in that dress, suddenly set herself up. As if she looked into the air a bit, she smiled cheerfully. It seems the Queen of Fury is pretty much impatient. Our master has won in this push and pull game. This is what the dungeon meerkats have just reported to me. Even without hearing it, Yong Ho seemed to know what it was about. Ophelia said with a smile, it looks like the Queen of Fury is very anxious to meet you. Why was she making such haste? After exchanging a glance with his subordinate spirits, he went out of the heart of the dungeon. Gardamundi landed in front of the dungeon entrance just like she did on her first recent visit, and waited for a reply from Yong Ho. Perhaps, since she was concerned that the House of Mammon was attacked last time, she did not raise a large flag symbolizing the Queen of Fury. She was here in her capacity as the secret envoy sent by the Queen. The dungeon meerkats gathered at the entrance of the newly built nest and looked at Gardamundi. The entrance of the new dungeon built under Bergram's command was twice as large and hard as the previous one. It was again Eligos, the butler of the Mammon family, who came out to meet Gardamundi. But this time, he wasn't alone. He was accompanied by his assistant butler June and the Goblin Rangers. They were dressed up, as if to greet the Queen's envoy officially. Welcome. Please come in. What? Right now. Gardamundi asked, embarrassed by Eligoza's hospitality. Even though it was true that the Queen and the Master of the House of Mammon were in a friendly atmosphere, she didn't expect they would welcome her into the dungeon so quickly without taking any defensive measures. Eligos smiled gently and quenched her curiosity. While building the new entrance, we added some facilities. Our master is waiting for you in the reception room. Only then did Gardamundi figure out what was going on. The entrance of the dungeon didn't get bigger and harder without any reason. It was probably because the new reception room was located at the entrance of the dungeon, like other dungeons. Stepping into the entrance of the new dungeon, Gardamundi was quite impressed. 
The fact that the entrance of this size was newly built in just a few days proved the power of the Mammon family. Moreover, it seemed that there were multiple facilities added this time. Like a discerning scout, Gardamundi was busy checking here and there while she was standing there. When she took the twelfth step, she noticed something unusual. A special breed? One dungeon meerkat heading to her nest located right before the dungeon entrance was unusual. It looked like a baby, not fully grown, but it had small wings on its back. She had never heard of a dungeon meerkat with wings. While taking the thirteenth step, she traced her memory, and when she took the fourteenth step, she realized that the dungeon meerkats outside the dungeon were somewhat different from typical ones. What was it? Did they buy only dungeon meerkats of a special breed and raise them? Before she could even deduce the answer, Eligos stopped walking. Shown into a well-decorated room, she immediately got the question out of her mind and showed due manners to the master in front of her. Gardamundi of the Garura clan, the messenger of Her Majesty the Queen of Fury, is honored to greet you. She put together her hands in a typical show of manners of her clan. Yongho responded with a warm smile, it's nice to see you again. Please sit comfortably. In the room, there were two sofas placed across each other. The place was too simple for the master to receive a special envoy of the Queen of Fury, but she preferred it because she was not the type of woman who liked empty formalities and vanity. Seated across Yong Ho, Gardamundi put it bluntly without any diplomatic rhetoric. To get right down to the point, our Queen of Fury has accepted the conditions set forth by the master of the Mammon family. The meeting place is in the unclaimed area in the north. I want to leave it to you to choose the specific meeting place. As for the summit date, our queen has set the date as you suggested. Gardamundi paused for a moment then continued after clearing her throat. She proposed meeting you twenty days from now. Of course, you can decide whether to take it or not for the next couple of days. When you decide on the specific summit place, I hope you can fix the exact date. It was obvious that the Queen of Fury made enough concessions. Lucia whispered to Yong Ho. You seem to have completely won in this push and pull game, right? But her judgment proved too hasty. As if she overheard Lucia's voice, Gardamundi added, I heard that the unclaimed area in the north was not in a big chaos without law and order. So, the Queen of Fury wants to see you in the Nestle of the House of Mammon. Although she used some diplomatic rhetoric, she expressed the queen's wishes directly. Yong Ho nodded, with a smile on his face. Of course. I would like to appreciate her consideration. Gardamundi also kept up a bright expression. Then she handed him the letter in the queen's own handwriting that she kept in her pocket. Unlike she did last time, Gardamundi did not ask him to read it right away. Yong Ho intuitively realized that he had nothing more to talk with her. So, he said, standing up first, Ophelia, my subordinate spirit, will lead you into a guest room. Could you wait a moment while I prepare the reply? Sure, that will do. Thanks for your consideration as the master of the Mammon family. Ophelia, who was waiting behind his back, led Gardamundi to a guest room next to the reception room. Since he revealed Ophelia's identity, he wanted to show Gardamuni that he was treating her seriously. As soon as Ophelia returned shortly afterward, Yong Ho convened a small meeting attended by the key members of the House of Mammon. Wow, she is quite straightforward, isn't it? What the Queen means is we should show her our ability to overpower the North within twenty days, right? When Kai Wan spoke sharply, Catalina blankly blinked, not making head or tail of it. She made an embarrassed expression, suggesting to ask Kai Wan, is that what it means? Catalina quickly pretended not to have seen her. Fortunately, nobody paid any attention to Catalina. She is straightforward, as always. Of course, it's good that she is not beating around the bush with diplomatic rhetoric. Ophelia laughed bitterly. Whether it was a secret talk or an open talk, they were supposed to negotiate with language, so it had been the basic of diplomacy that they use rhetorics to hide their intention. In particular, the negotiator was supposed to be responsible for his language, and the more detailed his language was, the greater his responsibility if something went wrong. The unclaimed land in the north was not completely ruined like the west, but it was now like a lawless area like Gardamundi said. It was because Stravati, the hegemon of the eastern area, 
devastated the northern area instead of occupying it in order to build up his power to challenge the House of Mammon. Can I take a look at the Queen's letter first? Chapter 216 As if to change the atmosphere, Yong Ho opened the envelope of the Queen of Fury's handwritten letter. When he opened it, there appeared a video just like it did last time. It was a pretty short video this time, too. In the video message, the Queen, with her face a bit blushing, said she would look forward to meeting him in person after expressing her wishes that both of them could build a solid alliance on the occasion of their summit. It looked like she was expressing such wishes for the sake of formality. No matter how much you look at her, she looks suspicious. Kaiwan signaled to Catalina with a glance after checking the Queen's blushed face through narrowed eyes. Catalina nodded as if she agreed. Ophelia said, if you look at the military relations of the King of Violence, Queen of Fury, and the King of Gluttony, it is likely that the King of Violence and Queen of Fury have already established an alliance. Perhaps, the reason why the Queen of Fury is so anxious to form an alliance with us hastily is because she wants to build a perfect southern alliance. The King of Violence and Queen of Fury did not keep each other in check. Their armies were sharply monitoring the movement of the King of Gluttony's forces. Yong Ho nodded, recalling what he heard from Citri about those purists born in the demon world. If the Southern Alliance was really formed, Yong Ho would have nothing to lose. It's not just for our alliance with the Queen of Fury. We need to take control of the unclaimed land in the north as soon as possible, said Tigrius. He spoke, opening the entire map of the demon world illuminating in the air. The reason the Queen of Fury and the King of Violence don't move their troops yet is because they don't know that the King of Gluttony was dead. Before they take action, we must take control of the unclaimed land first, so we can be ready to fight with them for hegemony over the territory of the King of Gluttony. Although the King of Gluttony and his ten warriors were killed, there were still many troops active in the King's territory. In order to confront them and claim their credit with respect to the Queen of Fury and the King of Violence, it was necessary for Yong Ho to build up a formidable army. We don't have to occupy all of the territories of the King of Gluttony. We can just take part of the territory and hand over the rest to the Queen of Fury or the King of Violence because we don't have to share our border with the North. It is also not a bad strategy for us to use the forces of the Queen of Fury or the King of Violence as a shield. Tigrius agreed to Ophelia's idea. Nodding once, Yong Ho looked at the map of the demon world quietly and said naturally, Ophelia, gather intelligence about the other kings. In particular, I need some more intelligence about the three kings King of Pride, King of Envy, King of Lust. The three kings in the north were far too far away. That was why Yong Ho didn't gather intelligence about them actively until now. He had to change it from now on. Now that he defeated the King of Gluttony and stood on par with the six kings, the enemies that he had to confront were the three kings in the north. I will follow your order, Ophelia replied right away. Her heart was full at that moment. The three kings in the north were clearly burdensome and formidable. However, assuming Yong Ho's fight against them itself testified to the growth of the House of Mammon. Strong confidence in Yong Ho's victory and pride filled Ophelia's heart. Let's get back to our main topic and discuss how to overwhelm the kings of the north. What do we need the most right now? He looked back at his subordinate spirits gathered in the reception room. Kaiwan replied, sitting on his right, I think it is the means of transport. Kaiwan used the power of distortion on the map of the demon world that Tigrius made with magic. He drew a line from the southern tip of the unclaimed area where the House of Mammon was located to the northern tip of the unclaimed area bordering the territory of the King of Fury. At a glance, it was quite a long distance. As we all know, the northern area has been virtually devastated. It is no exaggeration to say that there is almost none who can dare to challenge the Mammon family's power. I think even a handful of Yong Ho's subordinate spirits here can rise up and suppress the northern area. But we need infantry in order to occupy and rule the north if our goal is not to destroy it simply. Right now, we absolutely need the means of transportation with which we can move our troops within a short period of time, said Kaiwan. Like Kaiwan said, destruction and occupation were different. No matter how strong an individual was, there were clear limits to the area that this individual could control. How do you usually move troops? Yong Ho asked. 
Opelia replied to his question casually, if our troops are more than several thousands, we have no other choice but to march. But I hear that if our troops number several hundreds, we can use vehicles such as a giant flying spirit. Oh, I see. Actually, Yong Ho guessed so. He had seen a section on the means of transportation in the catalog of the dungeon market. The catalog showed a giant flying spirit like a mixture of an insect and reptile that could hold hundreds of units in its arms, an enormous sky whale that could carry a large number of troops on its back, and a sailboat flying in the sky. There were obviously various means of transportation. To be honest, Yong Ho coveted all of them. But the problem was the budget. Since he continued to invest freely for the growth of his subordinate spirits, the shortage of the budget was tight. Although he had never mentioned the budget problem, Ophelia and Kaiwan already knew what he was agonizing because they had the same concerns. However, they didn't agonize long. An unexpected voice whispered in the air. If you have a budget shortage, there is a solution. Everyone's eyes turned to the flames of the red lotus in the air. Almond asked Yong Ho, my master, you have secured up to the sixth floor of the labyrinth of greed. If so, what do you think is the remaining facility? Each floor of the labyrinth of greed quickly came to his mind. The garden of life was on the first floor and the gateway to the labyrinth of greed is on the second floor. The third floor was a gambling hall and the fourth floor was the workroom. The fifth and sixth floors were an armory in a prison, respectively. Then, what was the remaining facility there? Wasn't it a must in any dungeon? The treasure storage. Yong Ho uttered unwittingly, and Amun made his flames burn more intensely as if he was laughing heartily. The eighth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. A place guarded by Richard, the Leo warrior. Right there on the eighth floor, there is the treasure storage of the great king of greed. Mammon's treasure storage. A bright smile was on everyone's face instantly. But why is the eighth floor being mentioned more instead of the seventh floor? It was long after they first talked about the treasure storage that Yong Ho raised the question about the eighth floor. In the meantime, he not only wrote a reply to the Queen of Fury but even saw Gardamundi off in person. In fact, if he took a step back and thought about it, there was nothing strange. The treasure storage was just on the eighth floor. So what? There was no correlation between Yong Ho's success in securing up to the sixth floor and the floor layout of the Labyrinth of Greed. However, the reason why he expressed doubts about it was because Amun did not explain about the seventh floor at all. While he was securing up to the sixth floor, Amun always mentioned the next floor he had to challenge without any additional explanation. Amun kept delaying the answer to his question, saying that he would know it soon. And it was exactly as Amun said. It wasn't long before Yong Ho, who reached the seventh floor with his subordinate spirits, knew why Amun did not explain about the seventh floor. Well, is it just as I suspected? Smiling bitterly, he looked at the large door located in front of the stairs leading from the seventh to the eighth floor. An impressive bull's head with a towering horn was embossed on the steel door, which was very magnificent, and the word Mammon's Arena was written on the wall next to it. What the heck? Are you disappointed? Oh, not really. Yong Ho, shrugging his shoulders in front of Gus Ion, who was making a sullen expression, looked around once more. He was now standing near the entrance to the arena. It was the real entrance, not the one he used to come and go, led by a guy wearing a beast mask. The interior of the corridor was as large as the door. First of all, the ceiling was high, and the corridor was nearly ten meters in width. On the left and right of the corridor, there were stone statues that were carved so precisely that any visitor could be mistaken that they were real. Yong Ho was convinced when he saw a statue of a beautiful woman with ferocious eyes located in the middle of a giant steel cow and somehow pitiful centaurus. They were the stone statues depicting the floor masters of the arena. He alternately looked at Gus Ion and his stone statue at the end of the corridor. At that moment, he broke into laughter before he knew it. Is this the feeling I have when I come through the main gate of the arena? The shapes of the floor masters of the arena were not limited to humanoids. The corridor lined with dozens of stone statues, including several monsters and giants, was very magnificent. Any timid visitor seemed to get cold feet even when they stepped in the arena. Following Yong Ho's gaze at his stone statue, 
Gus Ion laughed cheerfully. Yeah, the passage through which you used to come and go was like a dog hole, compared with this. Yong Ho felt disgusted at his description of the passage as a dog hole. Tilting his head, he looked behind Gyuzhin's back. He saw a familiar arena over there. Chapter, 217 But the grain is the same. How can it be different? Yong Ho and Gus Ion, who exchanged small talk like that, headed to the arena. The rule that at least one of those visiting the arena must challenge the arena was also applied to those who entered through the front door. Yong Ho, whose challenge of the arena already became one of his daily routines, did not feel any big burden. All of his subordinate spirits were also relaxed because they had already visited the arena several times. Only Salami and Bucephalus looked around in surprise. After taking a seat in the special stand reserved for Gus Ion, Yong Ho asked, There are almost no dungeon monsters around here. I wonder if we can move around freely on the seventh floor. The dungeon monsters that were filling the other floors hardly existed on the seventh floor. Gus Ion shook his head when he asked with some expectations. The spirits of the arena cannot get out of the arena. The reason there are no dungeon monsters here is probably because of the strong space-time barriers that make up the arena. Should I say that there is a distortion that is so strong that small distortions disappear naturally? Dungeon monsters are introduced through the distortion created in the dungeon, so if the distortion itself is not generated, there will be no way for them to appear. Do you mean that big waves absorb small waves? Sort of. Their conversation was cut off for a moment after Gus Ion replied. During that short moment of less than a few seconds, Gus Ion, who was sullen all along, tapped the handle of the special seat several times with his fingertips. He then said, By the way, isn't it too racy? About what? Yong Ho looked back at Gus Ion as if he could not make it, while Catalina, who was sitting next to him, also pricked her ears and blinked. On the other hand, Kai Wan covered her mouth and giggled, as if she understood what he was talking about. Gus Ion said, Man, I already told you I was on the 39th floor. Then you should have continued to break through the floors up to the 39th floor with a sense of challenge. When you came last time, you went right back. Although the passage of time is subtle here, I can find out that our young master is not in a hurry. So, are you sad about it? When Yong Ho asked mischievously, Gus Ion turned his head, pretending not to have noticed it. Since Gus Ion was originally a red skin, it was hard to tell whether he showed any feelings, but Yong Ho knew the red demon like Gus Ion well thanks to Eligos and Ophelia. He could immediately discover that Gus Ion was embarrassed. In fact, Yong Ho also really wanted to conquer the arena. However, there were some legitimate reasons why he could not get focused on the arena alone. First, the arena was still useful to Yong Ho. It wasn't just because of Mammon's mana or clear rewards that he obtained every time he broke through each floor of the arena. The arena allowed Yong Ho to experience a desperate struggle. The fastest way to accumulate evolution EXP was to experience desperate fighting. It was thanks to the arena that he could repeatedly use the power of evolution so far. Moreover, the arena allowed him to experience various battles. The arena with a mixture of behemoths, giants, powerful humanoids, etc. was truly a treasure trove of fighting experience for him. He could learn various battle patterns by fighting them and test various tactics and techniques as well. He could not obtain those skills by blindly outpouring the floor masters with mana only. The reason he smashed Eucrasian on the 25th floor with mana was to find out the maximum value of his newly acquired mana. The second reason was because of the growth of his subordinate spirits. The arena as a treasure trove of experience was equally important to them. That was why Yong Ho allowed them to challenge the arena despite the great danger. The value of the power of evolution was higher than Yong Ho expected for those spirits whose efficiency of essence absorption was not so good. It was important for Yong Ho to acquire the arena, but the growth of his subordinate spirits was more important. So, he needed to maintain the arena a little longer for them. Of course, the arena isn't so easy to occupy even if I make up my mind. Given that he easily beat the 25th floor master Eucrasian, he might sound conceited, but he was serious. The higher the floor, the stronger the arena's defense was. Not only did the floor masters become stronger, 
but also, it started to damage Yong Ho's power. Because of the characteristics of the arena where its difficulty level rapidly increased per 10 floors, it was highly likely that Yong Ho could not smash the floor masters with mana alone on the 30th floor and above. And the battle was not determined only by mana. Yong Ho's actions up to now proved it. The enemies that he confronted, starting from Forest to the King of Gluttony, were always stronger than him. However, it was Yong Ho who eventually won. The third and final reason was time. Time often passed faster than expected in the arena where the passage of time was different from the outside. For Yong Ho, who had to keep an eye on the ever-changing external situation, staying in the arena where the time was unknown was a significant risk. Even now, he was constrained by time limits in the case of his summit meeting with the Queen of Fury. He couldn't spend time only in the arena. When Yong Ho briefly explained his reasons, Gus Ion became more embarrassed, and Kai Wan bit her lips to hold back her laughter. But, I can't delay occupying the arena forever. The arena's strength was mighty. Although the threat of the King of Gluttony disappeared, the King of Pride and the King of Envy were still active in the north. Yong Ho could not figure out the intentions of the King of Violence, and the Queen of Fury was not his ally yet. He thought of investing some more time in the arena for a while after successfully forming an alliance with the Queen of Fury. So, you want to obtain the treasure storage on the eighth floor? Gus Ion, who cleared his throat several times as if to hide his embarrassment, changed the subject. Yong Ho gently accepted it. Yes, that's my idea for now. My budget problem will be solved at once. It was a treasure trove of the King of Greed, allegedly the incarnation of possessiveness. It was evident that a tremendous amount of treasure was piled up like a mountain. Gusayan nodded slowly and said, Certainly, given your power, you can open the door. Open the door. Well, the one who is guarding the treasure storage on the eighth floor is Richard. Did you hear about him from Amun? I haven't given him any specific explanation yet. I hope you can brief him on my behalf, Gusayan. Amun's answer was heard from the flames of the red lotus that already arose. Gus Ion nodded lightly and said, Leo, the silent warrior Richard. Mammon's twelve spirits were the legends of the demon world. Not only Catalina and Kaiwan, but even Tigrius focused on Gus Ion curiously. He is strong. He is in the top group of the twelve spirits. To simply compare physical strength, he is on par with me. What Gus Ion said wasn't anything like self-praise. The reason that Gyushin's nickname was Herculean strength, was because he had the strongest physical ability among the twelve spirits. When discussing the strongest among them, Gus Ion was always mentioned without fail. He is silent as his nickname suggests. It doesn't mean he can't speak at all, but I've hardly ever heard his voice even though he and I went through all kinds of hardships together. Anyway, he's reticent and brusque. And as is the case with this kind of guy, he is thoroughly sincere when it comes to his job. Gus Ion smiled at the end of his words because he recalled lots of memories related to Richard. He closed and opened his eyes. Then he pushed away the vague memories of him and looked at the present. Richard is the gatekeeper of the treasure storage. So, he doesn't care about anyone if he is qualified to come to the treasure storage. It is only when he faces an unjust intruder that he takes up his weapon. Gus Ion gave a short description of Richard, but Yong Ho could size him up roughly. Gus Ion continued, as such, it is unlikely that he has prepared any trial or test for you. Even when Mammon was alive, he didn't prepare anything like that. So, whether or not you can open the door of the treasure storage will depend on whether you have qualifications. Is opening the door itself a test? That's right. It would not be easy for you because you can't open it just with strong mana alone. Stopping at that point, Gus Ion got up and urged him. You can hear more about Richard from Amun while going down. You know the rules of the arena, right? At least one member of your group must challenge the arena. Hurry up as you have a long way to go. Since Gusayan kept prodding on him, Yong Ho led his subordinate spirits to the arena located below the stairs. Like Gusayan said, he had no time to waste, so one of his subordinate spirits still staying on the lower floors was to challenge the floor master. When Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits disappeared, only Gus Ion and Amun's consciousness were left. 
It was Amun who spoke first, you are not pushing him unexpectedly. Yong Ho defeated the king of gluttony. He was closer to the king of greed than any previous master of the house of Mammon during the past 1000 years. Nevertheless, Gus Ion did not push Yong Ho hard. He didn't press Yong Ho to conquer the arena as soon as possible. What Mammon was worried about and the reason why he stopped Gus Ion from telling the truth about his death to the unqualified. Gus Ion let his shoulders droop with a bitter expression. It's because so many years have passed that I can feel the passage of time even in the subtle arena. I haven't forgotten that day, but that doesn't mean I can't stay thirsty for revenge forever. Amun quietly burned flames and whispered, Too much time has passed. Too much time. Chapter, 218 Gus Ion let his shoulders droop with a bitter expression. It's because so many years have passed that I can feel the passage of time even in the subtle arena. I haven't forgotten that day, but that doesn't mean I can't stay thirsty for revenge forever. Amun quietly burned flames and whispered, Too much time has passed. Too much time. Yes, maybe even Master Mammon would not have thought it would take so long for a new king of greed to appear. It was just over a thousand years. Like Amun said, too much time passed. You said that Asclepius went crazy. His voice was rather heavy. Amun answered in a form of a question, Are you worried about Richard? Gus Ion could not deny it. But he said to himself and Amun in no time, Richard is a guy. He is as steady as a rock that won't change even after a thousand years. Even if you or Scathack had not fallen asleep, or if you had been awake all along, I can assure you he will be there. He's a good guy. If Asclepius went crazy, that was it. Gus Ion didn't want to imagine any more tragedies. The fighting has started. Is it Kaiwan's turn this time? Gus Ion asked in a bright voice. Amun respected his friend's intentions. Instead of mentioning Mammon's twelve spirits, he focused on Kaiwan's fighting in the arena. The door of the eighth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed is opened. Lucia's voice was a little lighter than usual. It was because she could not completely occupy the seventh floor due to the existence of the arena. Ophelia and Eligos, who displayed their wild nature, took the lead. Salami lit himself, illuminating from behind, and Skull and Tigrius scattered the lights in all directions to drive out the darkness. There was no single facility on each floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. There were several rooms on the first floor, a garden, and some convenience facilities such as the dungeon spirits quarters and restaurants were also present on other floors. It was natural that each floor of the Labyrinth of Greed was as large as a medium-sized dungeon. However, the eighth floor was somewhat different. When they went down the stairs and looked around, there was only one way. There seems to be nothing in between. Literally it's just a hallway. Catalina spoke, seeing through the darkness. Other floors had rooms attached to the corridor itself or passages leading to other directions, but the eighth floor had only a single passage. Master, the eighth floor is a place that was created to serve as a treasure storage only. The only thing that exists beyond the corridor is a staircase and a treasure storage leading to the ninth floor. When Amun explained, Ophelia looked back, startled. Looking for the flames of the Red Lotus, she asked, looking at Yong Ho's wrist, do you mean that the entire eighth floor is a treasure storage? Yes. Ophelia gulped at his short reply. The size of each floor of the Labyrinth of Greed was vast. If so, how many treasures were piled up on the whole floor used as the treasure storage? Not only Yong Ho but also his subordinate spirits quickened their steps. There were no dungeon monsters on the eighth floor perhaps because of the arena. Because of this, they could reach the entrance room of the treasure storage within several minutes. Ophelia and Eligos, who were walking ahead, didn't even need to throw the lights. As soon as they entered the entrance room, a soft light poured from the ceiling, illuminating the dark room. It was a large and spacious room. On the left and right, there was a large staircase leading to the lower floor and a steel door that was larger than that of the arena. Everyone in the room naturally turned their eyes at one place. It wasn't a staircase or a steel door. They looked at the man in front of the steel door. A giant was sitting on a huge stone chair. He wasn't wearing anything except for a lion's skin on his head, but he didn't look naked thanks to his steel-like muscles. 
His tan skin and sturdy muscles gave them the illusion of him wearing armor all over his body. The giant held a dark red club in his right hand. They couldn't know what the material was, but it seemed to signify the bluntness of the club itself. Leo, Silent Warrior Richard. He opened his eyes. He got up silently and greeted Yong Ho and his party. His mouth, tucked between his shaggy beard, didn't open. Holding the dark red club like a cane, he just looked at them. Upon close examination, he wasn't a giant. He was taller than Elagos by a couple of heads. In the demon world where humanoid monsters such as ogres and trolls existed, he could be called a tall man, but not a giant. But he looked like a giant. It wasn't just because of his wide shoulders and steel-like muscles. They felt something like his overwhelming presence that made them feel as if they were facing a giant, tens of meters tall. Richard was silent, which reassured Amun. Yong Ho felt as if he saw Amun smile. Master, try to open the front door. Richard is the same. He is still faithful to his role as the guardian of the treasure storage. His voice was filled with deep relief and delight. When Amun had to kill Asclepius on the fifth floor, he didn't express his feelings, but he felt great sadness. Only after hearing Amun's voice, Yong Ho realized that there were two cylinders in front of Richard. Yong Ho was so focused on Richard that he missed them even though they were right before his eyes. Subordinate spirits, do not follow your master, but wait here. Only the master can make the attempt to open the door. At Amun's declaration, they flinched while trying to follow Yong Ho. Catalina looked at Richard and Yong Ho alternately as if she was worried. Yong Ho nodded. As if to calm her down, he stroked her hair once and exchanged eye contact with Kai Wan. He smiled with an effort then walked toward Richard. Richard was still looking at him without moving. Though this kind of description wasn't appropriate for the terrifying giant warrior, he truly had clear eyes. It seemed like he could see through any muddiness and dirt. Yong Ho stopped in front of the cylinders. There were two cylinders slightly higher than Yong Ho's waist, with something on top of it. The cylinder on the left had a deep and large hole while the cylinder on the right had a small sphere that looked just the right size for resting a hand. You can use the left device only when you have a key. My master, use the right device to open the door to the treasure storage. Despite hearing Amun's voice, Richard did not respond. His eyes were fixed on Yong Ho. Yong Ho took a deep breath and raised his right hand. He put his hand on the sphere on the top of the right cylinder. It was cold. He felt like he touched a marble. Shortly afterward, his attempt to open the door of the treasure storage began. Heat radiated from the sphere. The pleasant coldness transmitted through the palm of his hand evaporated at once. His test to open the treasure storage was simple. All he had to do was to stabilize the turbulence of the mana protecting the front door by inserting mana through the sphere. Yong Ho closed his eyes and concentrated. He understood why Gus Ion said that even he could not open it with his mighty power. It wasn't a simple torrent of mana. Not only was it fast and strong, but it had seven attributes. Wind, water, earth, flames, lightning, rock, and darkness. When these seven attributes were added to the swirling storm of the blade, its power was really terrifying. Even though Yong Ho was injecting mana from a distance through the sphere. He felt as if he was thrown into the middle of the torrent. Yong Ho generated mana. He erected six horns to emit powerful mana befitting a king, and at the same time, he triggered the godly energy, a lump of brigada equipped on his left hand. Yong Ho's own attributes. Flames, coldness, and lightning. Catalina's darkness, Kaiwan's wind, Elagoza's land, and Tigrius's light were also added to his attributes. A fierce light arose from the godly energy of greed. Harmony, the power of Yuho Yuan, was once again triggered, and at the same time, Tigrius's power of synthetic magic united seven different attributes into one. A cold sweat flew down Yong Ho's forehead. His whole body vibrated, starting with his right hand. But Yong Ho smiled. Dissipating mana at once caused him intense pleasure. Yong Ho's mana was thrust into the torrent of mana like a bomb. He confronted Richard's seven attributes with his own. The wind and the flames clashed. 
light and darkness became one, and the earth and water were in harmony. Lightning and darkness collided and scattered. Yomho's right hand vibrated more violently. It was never easy to simultaneously use his seven attribute powers while releasing enormous mana. However, he overcame that difficulty. By combining all the attributes into one, he achieved a huge power of harmony. There was no explosion. The torrent of mana, which was like a mad vortex, naturally weakened. Finally, it scattered and became calm and still like a lake. Yomho breathed out roughly. His whole body was sweaty. He didn't know how long he injected mana. However, when he opened his eyes, he felt an enormous sense of accomplishment. It wasn't just because he opened the door of the treasure storage. He just achieved growth by struggling hard a moment ago. He felt like he learned how to use Brigada to bring out the power of a true king. He raised his head. There seemed to be a little sign of emotions in Richard's eyes, who was indifferent. Instead of expressing his feelings, Richard stepped aside. He opened the way for Yongho. The steel door of the treasure storage opened automatically. A dazzling golden color caught Yongho's eyes. Chapter 219 Pinch My Cheek Kaiwan spoke to Catalina with a blank expression, so Catalina pinched her cheek without any hesitation. It hurt. So Kaiwan pinched Catalina's cheek a little harder then burst into strange laughter, mixed with emptiness, embarrassment, and joy. Even Salami and Bucephalas, who were basically not excited about treasures, admired what they saw. Eligos was rather scared while Ophelia sat down, overwhelmed by the amazing treasure. Her feet became wobbly at that moment. Even Tigrius, a detached old gentleman, kept gulping. Only Skull behaved as usual. With a hearty laugh, Skull threw himself into the piles of gold in front of him. He rolled on the floor like a stone beside Yongho. Yongho dived into the sea of gold. Of course, it hurt. It was impossible to swim in a sea of gold that he saw in the cartoon. He felt nice though. Even the pain was a pleasure. The treasure storage was vast. The whole eighth floor really looked like a treasure trove except for the pillars in between. And the treasure storage was filled with various gold and silver. His description of the treasure storage as the sea of gold was no exaggeration. Ancient gold coins, jewels with beautiful colors, various treasures made of gold and silver, each one of them had tremendous value, but there was nothing special inside the treasure storage. It was literally a treasure trove of great wealth. You guys, come in. Yong Ho, who was rolling there with Skull, shouted. Catalina, who wanted to jump in, fluttered her ears and tail. Like Yong Ho, she dived into the sea of gold and felt pain. However, she laughed like a fool like Yong Ho. Kaiwan, who was so excited, came in immediately. After taking off her shoes, Ophelia walked barefoot on the gold and trembled with thrilling pleasure. She even moaned, though briefly. Although Eligos felt fear in front of a huge amount of gold, he felt more joy than fear when he stood on the sea of gold, holding Ophelia's hand. He was even moved to tears, recalling all sorts of hardships in the past. Bucephalus ran through the treasure storage, and Salami rolled over gold. Even the gentle Tigrius buried himself into gold as if he returned to his childhood. Next time when you return from the human world, please buy me a hundred clothes. No, a thousand. Just buy me a department store. Lucia shouted in joy, and Yongho nodded several times. He overcame the temptation to keep rolling several times and stood up quickly. Hearing Lucia's words, something came to his mind suddenly. He thought of the most fundamental reason why he found the treasure storage, and what he could do now. He had to meet Citri. Now was the time he did shopping at the dungeon market. My dear customer. Uh, you look a little scary. Said Citri, frowning a bit. It was because Yongho's expression was very unusual. Ah. Yongho giggled, facing Citri. His laughter was mischievous and sly on one hand, but silly on the other. Citri, who always had a chair close to him, doubled the distance between the chairs by fidgeting with her hands quickly. She said, slightly putting her body back, don't laugh like that because I'm afraid my love will cool off a little. 
Startled by her serious voice, who really didn't like the way he laughed, Yong Ho cleared his throat, but he did it again. Hmm. Ah. It seemed like his condition was serious. Putting her body back a little more, she said in a nervous voice, customer. Now, she didn't use the modifier my dear, which made him come to his senses again. Only now could he stop laughing silly and opened his mouth with a straight face. Hmm. Oh yes. I have something I want to buy. He was a little excited, but now he was back to normal. Citri narrowed the distance between the chairs then said, you want a catalogue about flying spirits plus a five-star flying monster. He nodded happily because she guessed right. Citri pointed out the price of the flying spirit on the first page of the catalogue, and he responded with a relaxed smile. Citri closed and opened her eyes once. Then she laughed several times as if she got wind of it. She then corrected her posture. She looked straight into his eyes and said, You have obtained his treasure storage, right? He did not deny it. It was natural for Citri, who was Mammon's lover, to know the existence of the treasure storage. She must know how much gold and silver were there. Well, I don't think I can't sell them at this price. Citri. Instead of answering, she narrowed her distance with him. She narrowed it down to almost where her knees would touch his. She then snapped her fingers. Then, the whole white world turned black. Only the surroundings of Yong Ho and Citri were white now. Citri once again closed and opened her eyes. Then she said with a charming smile, from now on I'm going to start a secret deal, between the king and the director of the dungeon market. As soon as she finished talking, new catalogues emerged behind her back. All the covers of the catalog were black. Titles made up of golden letters were somewhat different from previous ones. Boarding objects. Immortal. Different species. Fairy clan. Demon clan. There were no star numbers in the black catalogues. Only dungeon spirits were classified. Citri fidgeted with her fingers and put one of them on her lap. It was rather weird among the new catalogues. King of Greed. Looking at the title, he then turned his eyes at her. She opened the catalogue with a happy smile and explained it to him. This is exclusively for your use, my dear customer. It is a secret ledger to record the details of my transactions with you. The catalogue, named King of Greed, was completely empty. Yong Ho asked her immediately, do other kings also have secret ledgers like this one? Yes, they do. You are very smart to notice it so quickly. A secret deal between a king and a director. A catalogue named King of Greed. He could naturally infer it. Citri continued, I'm sorry to the other customers who use the dungeon market. But those kings with sin and godly energy are more special than other beings in the demon world because they are the big players who control the destiny of the demon world. It was the same even now. The king of gluttony caused great turbulence of burning the entire unclaimed land in the south by supporting embryo. The king of pride raised up the army directly and shook the entire northern area. The king of violence plunged the king of gluttony into confusion and terror by simply deploying his troops along the borders. Each decision by the kings determined the fate of many people. Citri wasn't wrong. The core of the dungeon market is the merchant group. Therefore, we provide special services to special customers. That's what we call a secret deal. She let her shoulders droop then said with a gentle smile, I'll give you an example. A demon king living next door suddenly started to buy horses to attack a dungeon. Then, what will his neighbors think? And how do they act? Well, they will prepare for an attack or form an alliance with other neighbors. If the demon king bought something, it was because he needed it. Therefore, it was also possible to guess the intention of the buyer by checking his purchased goods. Citri was satisfied with his reply. You're right because his purchase history itself is part of his information. Yong Ho suddenly recalled the story of the Pentagon and the pizza box he had heard somewhere. The Pentagon was a huge pentagonal building where the U.S. Department of Defense was located. He was not sure if it was real or just an unofficial story, the story about the Pentagon was rather plausible. On a day when pizza delivery to the Pentagon surges, something serious will happen. 
For this reason, spies belonging to anti-American countries or groups are keeping an eye on pizza houses around the Pentagon. The story derives from rumors that the day the United States made the decision to start a war with Iraq, the Pentagon's pizza deliveries increased in record numbers due to their emergency work. It was a little bit different from the example that Citri cited, but both had something in common because she said that she could infer some information about the buyer from his purchase history. Citri continued, almost all the masters in the demon world use the dungeon market. I'm a bit embarrassed to say this, but in a sense, the dungeon market is allegedly an organization that governs the demon world. What if the dungeon market raised food prices drastically? What would happen if the dungeon market stopped selling items needed for dungeon operation or didn't sell them to a specific target? What Citri said wasn't an exaggeration. The influence of the dungeon market on the demon world was so powerful. Because of this, the dungeon market had no rival. There was no option for the masters of the demon world to use a different dungeon market. And that was important, after all. The dungeon market is one and only such place in the demon world, used by everybody. So, if you work really hard, it's not impossible to find out the other party's purchase history, especially when it comes to those items that cannot be easily found in the dungeon market. That's why they want a secret deal. Yong Ho suddenly recalled secret accounts in Switzerland. With such accounts, they have to pay the account fee rather than receiving interest from the bank. Nonetheless, numerous people have used Swiss secret accounts, even paying high fees. Their reason was simple. Swiss banks never reveal the account holders of the secret accounts. They protected the account holders thoroughly. The dungeon market used the same method. They kept their transactions about which spirits were sold to whom at what price secret. Besides, they didn't reveal the existence of the sold spirits at all. Citri nodded then said in an alluring voice, the secret transaction between the king and the director is kept secret, as the name suggests. Your purchase history is never disclosed to other customers. What's more, you can buy things that you can't obtain normally because kings have a great wealth to purchase them. She seemed to explain indirectly why she hadn't offered such a secret deal to Yong Ho until now. Yong Ho was now qualified. He possessed not only sin but also godly energy and wealth. Citri bowed to him, and said a little playfully, products that are known to be available only through special auctions, or special products that cannot be found in general catalogs are the main targets of secret trade. Hearing it, Yong Ho said unwittingly, the undead elite troops of the King of Gluttony. He also recalled his conversation with Ophelia about the bone dragon mobilized by embryo. Chapter, 220 Citri was neither positive nor negative. Putting her hand on his lap, she mentioned something else. As the strongest Herculean power and the director in charge of the North, Oroba deals with the King of Pride only. Franz, with the best intelligence, deals with the King of Envy in the King of Lust. Each king had his own director to deal with. Samuel, the fastest wing, deals with the King of Gluttony, and Abrasax, with the strongest mana, deals with the Queen of Fury and the King of Violence. I deal with the reclusive Queen of Sloth and the King of Greed that does not exist. She winked at him at the end of her remarks with an alluring gesture. But Yong Ho brought up another topic just like she did. What is it, Citri? Pardon? Oh, I mean your nickname. The other five directors all seem to have nicknames. The fastest wing or the strongest mana for example. He asked it unwittingly, so he quickly wrapped it up, embarrassed. But she opened her eyes once and smiled softly, well, how about the best beauty? Yong Ho blinked. He thought she was joking, but he felt she, not anybody else, could use such a nickname. This time, Citri was embarrassed. She burst into laughter and said, oh, I was kidding. I feel good since you believe it. My dear customer, I'm sorry to say this but my nickname is a secret. She then held his hand and pulled him while standing up. Please stand up. From now on, I'm going to start a secret deal with you. As soon as Yong Ho stood up hastily, the chairs behind their back disappeared. With the surroundings still dark, she sat behind him after fidgeting with her feet. She said, hugging him from behind, please close your eyes for a moment. Yong Ho followed her instruction with strange anticipation. 
When he closed his eyes, he felt the fragrant scent from her body getting closer. Okay, would you like to open your eyes again now? Citri stopped hugging him and took a step back. He opened his eyes wistfully. He then opened his mouth foolishly. He looked blank just like he did when he saw Mammon's treasure storage. A white space unfolded again instead of darkness, and the space was filled with something huge. Flying vehicles and large flying spirits were lined up. All be told, they were a few dozen. My dear customer, you already have a cute car called Salami. Nonetheless, you want another flying device because you need a means of transporting troops, right? The purchase items revealed the buyer's intention. Since his partner was Citri, he nodded, who, in turn, gently hugged his waist. Then she stepped forward with him. Huge sailing ship-shaped flying vehicles that were almost 100 meters long. Sky whales with storage spaces not only on its back but also inside. Giant spirits resembling a dragon with storage spaces attached through special renovation. Flying vehicles with a futuristic design that could only be seen in movies. Battleships armed with various weapons. All of them attracted his attention. Yong Ho was so excited that he wanted to check the inside of the flying vehicle, but she still hugged his waist tightly and urged him to move forward. Although you occupy the unclaimed land in the south, you will invite other kings' suspicion if you buy this kind of huge flying vehicle suddenly. In other words, you might draw their unwanted attention. No matter how secretly he bought the items, the moment he released them, he would draw people's attention. Because of this, he had to purchase the right items if he wanted to hide the treasure trove to some extent. Since you have to carry the skull unit, the flying vehicle should be able to accommodate at least 200. Fortunately, the skull unit members are undead, they won't take up that much space. If so, you could buy a smaller flying vehicle. A flying vehicle which was not so large and which could be purchased with his money. As he stepped forward, he found the flying vehicles getting smaller and more shabby. Although his natural greed wanted those large vehicles a little far away rather than near, he had no other choice. Citri whispered into Yong Ho's war, but because you are the king of greed, you have to ride something that suits that name. Moreover, you have occupied the unclaimed land, so you need to show off your power to some extent. Finally, Citri stopped walking. Now, there were no flying vehicles or spirits on the left and right. Yong Ho looked back at her, and she smiled. She stared into the air instead of him, as if reminiscing about her memories, and soon leaned her head on his shoulder. Then she gently fidgeted with her fingers and revealed the objects hidden in the pure white space. It was red and huge. It was streamlined and long with a red dragon head attached to the head. Huge propellants were attached to both sides of the fuselage. Yong Ho remembered the word space battleship at that moment. His greed, which kept looking back all along, now raced toward the front and wrapped up the red flying vehicle. Shrouded in the thin smoke of greed, Citri released her hands that were holding him. He stepped forward alone and stood in front of the red flying vehicle. This is the eight-handed Baruna's last work, one of Mammon's twelve spirits. It's the private plane for the king of greed that he left behind only its design because he could not complete it. It was supposed to be the plane that Mammon would ride during his days. Mammon was revived in numerous legends and stories. The moment Yong Ho brought out his legacy, people would look at him differently. In that sense, this flying vehicle was fine. It was Mammon's plane, but he didn't use it, or he couldn't use it. Citri bit her lips once. She corrected her expression with her back against him and turned around and smiled. The king's ship, Red Giant Dragon Tiamat. He swallowed, looking at the giant vehicle. She smiled mischievously and said, Let me sell it cheap because it's only for you. He laughed heartily. Led by her, he approached the Red Giant Dragon. Calm down. You'll see him quite soon. At Kurtimuka's affectionate soothing, the Queen of Fury flinched as if she was pierced by a needle. Then she said annoyingly, Nope. Why are you saying I am so nervous? Though she spoke in a harsh tone, Kurtimuka smiled warmly. The Queen of Fury's earlobes turned hot. I haven't said that. The Queen of Fury cleared her throat when she was trying to play innocent. She quickly fidgeted with her hands to finish making the clothes she was at. 
stop the nonsense and put on this one. There were a lot of miscellaneous handicrafts near the queen. Whenever she was distracted or nervous, she made the habit of making handmade stuff. As the chieftain of the Gondorf clan, she could be called the queen of craftsmanship because of her manual dexterity. Kurtamuka, who received a jacket with embroidery, appreciated her warm considerations. She winked at the queen gently and put it on. She was wondering whether the clothes would fit her well. Oh, it suits me well. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. The queen, who smiled at her, realized that Kurtamuka's eyes began to twinkle again. She cleared her throat again and put down the tools she was holding in her hand. Hmm. Anyway, let me stop making clothes here. She caught her breath while adjusting her expressions. It wasn't just because of the alliance with the Mammon family that the queen made clothes and embroidered. There were a few more things that were eating her up. She looked at Gardamundi and asked, How about the king of gluttony? Is he still silent? It has already been more than ten days since the king of gluttony disappeared at the border. The sudden disappearance of the king could be a big strategic variable because of the tense situation along the borders of the three kings' territories where their armies were concentrated at the moment. Gardamundi narrowed her eyebrows while reviewing the intelligence tips collected by the Garura and Kalavinka clans. Then she said with a worried tone, it's strangely quiet over there. The king of gluttony liked to visit his territory in person, but I haven't seen him for a few days. Isn't he plotting a scheme against us? He might want to take a strategic advantage by hiding himself. Kurtamuka added. It was quite possible. The Queen of Fury closed her eyes for a moment and tried to organize her thoughts. Over several decades had already passed since she became the Queen. And she was engaged in a war of nerves with him during that period. As her longtime enemy, she knew the King of Gluttony better than anybody else. She shook her head and said, It doesn't befit him as the King of Gluttony. He is not the type who acts like this. The King of Gluttony was clearly a cunning man. However, he never allowed himself to be a bait. His long silence must be his personal preference rather than any strategic thinking. The Queen of Fury moved her fingers and concentrated her mana. She instantly drew a map of the demon world in the air. She fixed her gaze on the border with the king. She was suspicious of the movements of the three outstanding masters of the king. Although she was not quite sure, she smelled a rat. What about the king of violence? When she moved her fingers again, the map moved itself and placed the southwestern area in the center. Unlike Kurtamuka, who became nervous at the mention of the king of violence, Gardamundi replied calmly, he is also silent. The Dragon Legion under his command is still holding its place along the border. After all, it seemed that the king moved the dragons to the border to threaten rather than attack. It's really frustrating. She was not frustrated by the king of violence's action. If he really wanted to avoid the fight by threatening, that was fine with her. It was because she had one thing in common with him that they should avoid the war that they didn't have to engage in. What frustrated her was the current situation. Thanks to the King of Violence's deployment of the Dragon Legion, the King of Gluttony was silent. The King of Pride and the King of Envy were so busy fighting each other that they could not afford to pay attention to the South. Because of this, the eight clan people of the Queen had to remain tense but did not have to fight a bloody fight. It was good that there was no war. However, it was not good at all if the present precarious peace was a sign of a greater war. Sometimes, it was necessary to take some preventive action to prevent a bigger disaster. Chapter, 221 The Queen of Fury's alliance with the House of Mammon also had great strategic significance. She wasn't sure if the Mammon family had great power, but if she could join hands with them to counter the King of Gluttony, she felt she could produce good results. Although it was sad, the best way to stop war was something like a lovely dialogue. It was a powerful force that could even stop those refusing to talk. If you hit me, you'll get hit, too. This kind of warning was straightforward and coarse. But it was the most effective means. If the Southern Alliance became strong, the King of Pride would not start a war easily even if he beat the King of Envy. It's not just because my heart is pounding. As a matter of fact, the House of Mammon was a variable that the Queen didn't think about, but it was a very meaningful one. 
her alliance with the Mammon family had sufficient strategic value. The Queen of Fury lightly pressed on her heart. She gently closed her eyes and counted the dates until her meeting with the master of the House of Mammon. Calm down. It's around the corner. Nope, why are you saying I'm nervous? Gardamundi burst into a silent laughter when the two repeated the same conversation ten days ago. She watched the two engaged in a war of nerves with their chins on their hands. Time flew like an arrow. There was nothing unusual during the past twenty days. The King of Gluttony still did not reveal himself, and the war between the King of Pride and the King of Envy in the north was still going on slowly. The mana, called a moving fortress and the dungeon of the Queen of Fury, was a unique dungeon even in the demon world where all kinds of different species prevailed. The mana was built on the back of a living giant and giant turtle spirit. To be precise, the mana was the name of the turtle. A dungeon created naturally on the back of a super large spirit. The Queen of Fury modified the dungeon somewhat and made it her palace. The only dungeon as unique as the mana was the Sky Fortress, considered the dungeon of a nameless master in the north, which was built on a giant and giant sky whale. Anyway, the Queen's dungeon could move. However, instead of moving the mana itself, the queen directly led her subordinates to the unclaimed land in the north because her moving the mana would draw the attention of other kings. Finally, the day of her forming an alliance with the master of the Mammon family arrived. Since it was a secret alliance, the queen of fury was accompanied by only her close aides Kurdamukha and Gardamundi as well as five people from each of her eight clans. No matter how secret an alliance it was, she needed to show a proper decorum because the alliance itself was a sacred ritual. That was why she took a total of forty people with her. Of course, they are going to serve as my bodyguards, just in case. Gardamundi took a fresh tour of the uninhabited wasteland in the north. Even though it was an open area, no one could be seen. It seemed that there would be nobody to spread rumors even if something happened here. However, the queen had to be prepared for contingencies. The master of the House of Mammon and his subordinates that she saw were far from weak. The forty representatives of her eight clan people formed their own groups and set up flags. As the power of their eight mysterious flags came together, a blocking barrier was created over the surrounding area. Now, nobody could guess what was going on inside by watching from a distance. Anyway, calm down. Take a deep breath. Oh, I've never been nervous. Although she said that, the queen took a gentle deep breath. Her chest went up and down a few times, which made her feel a little more relaxed. But where the hell was the master of the House of Mammon? The appointed time was close. Wasn't it time he appeared? Kurtamukha asked Gardamundi inquisitively. Since it was an open wasteland, he could be seen anywhere if he was approaching by now, but there was not a soul in sight, let alone the troops of the House of Mammon. Kurtamukha considered the Mammon master as the bridegroom for the queen, but if he couldn't even keep the appointment, she would think twice. It was not just a promise, but a summit meeting with the queen to form an alliance. I wonder if he is late. Instead of refuting Kurtamukha's words, Gardamundi frowned and looked around again. If the Mammon master was willing to keep the appointment, it was about time he appeared from any direction in the open land by now. Kurtamukha frowned even more, and the queen was also a bit disappointed. Right at that moment, Gardamundi uttered with a blank expression, no way. Gardamundi raised her head right away, and the queen and Kurtamukha, who was looking at her, also raised their heads instinctively. They opened their eyes wide at about the same time. Gardamundi uttered in an embarrassed voice as if expressing feelings on their behalf. Is he the Mammon Master? The clouds were scattered. There appeared a huge flying vehicle reminiscent of a red dragon from the far sky. Tiamat, the giant red dragon. The private flying vehicle of the Mammon Master left a deep impression on the queen and her close aides with its overwhelming force. And this was not all the performance that Yong Ho prepared. The hatch of Tiamat, the giant red dragon that landed far away from the queen, was opened. The first to appear from the flying vehicle was Skull and his 100 elite soldiers that had been selected from the Skull unit. The Skull unit, which marched, led by Skull, moved in perfect unison without any error, as if to boast of their synchronization. After a wonderful march, they lined up and opened a way. Since they were an undead army, 
they didn't move at all after stopping. Their black armor uniforms shone in the sun. Yong Ho walked on the road between them. Behind him were Catalina and Kai Wan, dressed in their best costumes. Ophelia, Elegos, and Tigrius remained inside Tiamat. They were on standby just in case of contingencies. Kurtamuka nodded in satisfaction, looking at Yong Ho, who appeared confidently in time for the appointment. Gardamundi narrowed her eyes, watching Tiamat, the giant red dragon, because it was far from any ordinary flying vehicle. The Queen of Fury stiffened like a piece of wood. Once again she pressed on her heart. Wow, it's real. Her heart was pounding very hard. Yong Ho approached the queen. The nearer he came, the harder her heart was beating. I'm honored to meet the Queen of Fury. My name is Yong Ho Chion, the master of the House of Mammon. He first expressed due manners to the queen. Thanks to his practice overnight under the supervision of Kai Wan and Ophelia, the way he extended courtesy to her was perfect. But the queen could not respond. She just stared at him blankly. She didn't respond for about five seconds. When Yong Ho and his close aides began to be embarrassed about her silence, Kurtamuka hurriedly shouted at the queen through her psychological interaction with her. Your Majesty. Only then did the queen come to her senses suddenly. When she found him standing a few meters away from her, she held her breath once again, embarrassed by her pounding heartbeat. She was at a loss about what to do at the moment. She then hurriedly cleared her throat and barely opened her mouth. Nice to meet you. I'm Drydarastra, the head of the A-Clan people. Kurtamuka felt she ruined the whole thing. Her face got stiffened, and her voice was stiff. When Kurtamuka felt frustrated, Catalina rolled her eyes and looked at Kai Wan, who narrowed her eyes. However, Yong Ho himself did not feel anything strange about her response, for he didn't properly focus on her voice and facial expressions. His heart was pounding. It wasn't just because of his resonance with her. She felt a stronger impulse than he did when he encountered her at the auction house. Why? For what? He barely held down his strong greed that arose to engulf not only the queen but also her aides. He gulped while his heart was beating fast before he knew it. Was the queen standing before him right now different from when he met her at the auction house? He looked down at her lower body and stared blankly at the metal belt wrapped around her slender waist. He knew it now. Barely holding back his urge to utter exclamation, he murmured to himself. The godly energy of gluttony. The gluttony inside him was crying for it desperately. It showed a terrible longing for its other half. It was a very fleeting moment. The desire of gluttony was about to express itself outside. Unlike the desire of greed, Yong Ho was not aware how the desire of gluttony expressed itself outside. It was because he could detect the flow of the desire of greed, but not gluttony. But the problem was that the moment gluttony inside him expressed itself outside, it could be detected by the queen. After all, he brought out the power of greed. He did it almost instinctively because his action was very fast. His greed that arose fiercely swallowed up the sin of gluttony. It was tough because he had to suppress gluttony without exposing the power of greed to the outside. He controlled both sins by exercising strong control. A cold sweat broke out on his back. It wasn't because he was worried that the queen would catch him possessing the two sins. It was because it was so tough for him to control both sins at the same time. It was only a few seconds. With utmost concentration, his greed suppressed gluttony. He made sure his greed completely engulfed gluttony. The sin of gluttony did not reveal its craving anymore, even though the godly energy of gluttony was right before it. Only then did Yong Ho let out a sigh of relief. He felt a sense of accomplishment. But soon he realized he had made another mistake. He didn't have to feel relaxed just because the queen did not notice the sins of greed and gluttony for now. He was now standing in front of the queen of fury. All this happened only a few seconds, but he didn't even know what kind of expression he made because he couldn't pay attention to those around him due to his extreme concentration. He hastily looked straight ahead. The queen was blinking, with her head tilted. He quickly opened his mouth without thinking deeply. Sorry. I heard the rumor that you are a beauty. 
I got distracted because you are much more beautiful than I heard about you in the rumors. It was ridiculous bullshit, just nonsense. Who the hell would be hoodwinked by this bullshit? What did he say? But the queen's response was strange. The queen, biting her lower lip slightly, looked down and twisted her body a bit. Her earlobes and cheeks turned red, which stood out because of her fair skin. This time, Yong Ho blinked blankly. Did his impromptu excuses pay off? Sensing his gaze, the queen smiled awkwardly and said, I'm flattered, but thanks for your kind words. Then she lowered her head as if she was shy. He blinked again then looked at the queen, feeling somewhat different about her. While the two were interacting like that, Catalina raised her tail and Kai Wan looked at him fiercely, but no one noticed it because they just focused on Yong Ho and the queen. Everybody was silent for a few seconds except for Kurtimuka, who was moved, holding her hands together. Yong Ho, who also came to his senses, escorted the queen to the meeting place, as he had practiced, and the summit between the two began. Chapter 222 The summit meeting, which they started awkwardly, lasted for about an hour. But it seemed they got familiar while talking during the summit, or they came to know better their own position while conversing seriously. Both of them regained their usual composure in the middle of the talks. They even exchanged jokes, though briefly. Since they already discussed the framework of the alliance through their correspondence, they didn't need to talk long about the alliance itself. It was not an alliance that required the exchange of a treaty, but an alliance that literally established their friendship, so there were no details. The queen went back to her aides, escorted by Yong Ho. Watching her briefly, he concluded the summit by getting aboard Tiamat, the giant red dragon. But that wasn't the end of the talks. The queen, who got aboard a small flying vehicle, sat comfortably in the captain's chair. Leaning against the chair comfortably, she said, he's very strong. Her expression was serious. Kurtimuka, who was going to ask her a barrage of questions about the mammon master, shut her mouth out of embarrassment, while Gardamundi agreed, calmly nodding. She lost her mind because her heart was beating so hard while meeting him, but she could find out several things about him. The queen participated in so many battles and earned the title of warmonger. She saw countless strong men and experienced countless fights. Accordingly, she realized from her experience that the Mammon Master experienced deadly fighting that risked his life. It wasn't once or twice that he participated in such fights. He experienced literally numerous battles. Actually, she tested him several times during the talks. She made a gesture that could make him trapped gently but fatally. Every time she did so, he responded. His response was not deliberate, but simultaneous. It was mana that they valued most in the demon world. However, the one with strong mana was not necessarily a strong man. There were more important things in a fight. She could discover from her senses and experience that the Mammon Master was strong. He was much stronger than she expected. Gardamundi, the Mammon Master, Yongho Chion, is the flame his real power? Kurtimuka's eyes sparkled at her question or the way she called Yongho. Unlike Kurtimuka, however, Gardamundi focused on the very reason the queen raised the question. She replied in a calm tone in a break with her usual cheerfulness. I'm not sure. It is true that he handles flames freely, but I can't say he is the demon king of flames. As you know, there are many ways to deal with the flames even without using your power. As for the rumors that the Mammon Master beat a bone dragon, you said you didn't think the rumors were false, right? Right, your majesty, said Gardamundi. The queen sorted out her thoughts once again, with her lips closed. Watching her quietly, Gardamundi added, there is one more rumor I've come across recently. Gardamundi was a born scout. When she stayed at the tavern in the free city, she didn't just spend time gambling. In addition to her existing information, she could gather additional intelligence about Yong Ho while gambling, drinking, and buying things at the tavern. I did not report to you because I was not sure, but I hear that the Mammon Master seems to have artifacts that increase the abilities of his subordinate spirits. Increasing his spirits' abilities? Yes, it's rumored that his artifacts increase their ability to change drastically, so much so that even their appearances are changed. In fact, she heard that some of the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon benefited from his artifacts. 
but Gardamundi took a step back and thought about it. Was it really because of the effects of their artifacts? Was it probably the power of the Mammon Master? Gardamundi didn't even have to explain because the queen felt the same way. Maybe I think we will get much more benefits from this alliance that we think. It was a sad fact, but the best deterrent against war was the powerful force that made the enemy dare not to attack. If the House of Mammon really possessed more power than expected, and if the queen could form a true alliance with the Mammon Master, and the King of Violence could help her, she could build a really strong deterrence. Definitely, peace would continue for decades to come even under the Cold War situation. The Queen and Gardamundi were serious at the moment so was Kurdamukha. She asked carefully while checking the Queen's expression. Your Majesty, how did you feel about the master of the Mammon family? As a Yacha, Kurdamukha was clumsy at concealing her feelings. Since she knew why the Yacha woman asked such a question, the Queen quickly got up and turned around. She succeeded in concealing her blushing face, but she couldn't hide her earlobes that turned red. I'm tired. Let me have some rest today. Kurdamukha was satisfied with her response. She politely bowed to her with a mischievous smile. Sure. Have a good sleep. As Kurdamukha and Gardamundi left the captain's room, she threw herself on the extra bed. Since she was really going to hit the sack, she turned off the light. When she met Yong Ho, she felt really strange. She felt her heart was pounding hard, but it was different from when she experienced it at the auction house. This time she felt more intense feelings and a stronger impulse. Was this really love like Kurtamukha said? Or was there something she was missing? She kept thinking about it in bed. Anyway, she had to keep in close contact with him for a while. She could check her feelings in the process. Let me go to sleep now. Pulling herself together, she closed her eyes. But she opened her eyes within a few seconds. She raised her hands and placed them on both cheeks. Her face felt hot. What should I do? I can't sleep. When she closed her eyes, Yong Ho's face came to her mind. Her heart began to pound again, and she kept tossing and turning in bed. She is strong. Her mana is not the problem. It is a matter of pure strength. The Queen of Fury is stronger than the King of Gluttony. Yong Ho heard Amun's whispering from the flames of the Red Lotus in the air. He nodded. Actually, he felt it throughout the talks. He seemed to know why she had the nickname Warmonger, despite her fresh and pleasant images. What the King of Fury has must be the godly energy of Gluttony. It's a pity that it's in her hands. Ironically, he had the godly energy of fury. In other words, the two had each other's sin that they needed. It would be nice if they could exchange the two because they formed an alliance, but it was impossible right now. He briefly recalled the godly energy of gluttony wrapped around her waist and understood why there was something sly in her attributes. He bit his lips slightly and quickly shook it off his mind. Tigria said, the queen seems to have good feelings toward you more than I expect. We need to be cautious, but if you make good use of the alliance, I think you can think of taking control of the territory of the King of Gluttony. As you know, there are many things you can take even if you don't occupy the territory. It wasn't just the heart of the dungeon and the essence of the king. The numerous dungeon spirits that Yong Ho could make his own subordinates and the wealth that the King of Gluttony had accumulated over the years were also something he had to take into account when he decided to march into the king's territory. The king and his ten warriors were killed. Ophelia said, I think it would be okay if we deploy troops after reinforcing the Cadiz fortress first. The West was devastated, and all the Eastern masters have pledged their loyalty to you. So, if you are not concerned about the King of Violence and the Queen of Fury, you can concentrate all your power on the King's territory. In fact, the King's territory was a treasure without an owner. Yong Ho could march his troops without any hesitation when other kings could not move for fear of the King of Gluttony's sudden disappearance. When they were engaged in serious conversation, Catalina, with her ears drooping, turned her gaze and looked at Kai Wan. When she signaled to Kai Wan as if she was asking for the latter's advice, Kai Wan responded she would try to find the solution at night. Yong Ho, who did not know what was going on between Catalina and Kai Wan, focused only on what Ophelia was talking about. He sighed, tapping the map of the unclaimed land in the south, 
which was spread on the table. Am I the problem then? Although I have Tiamat and Salami, it takes too long for me to travel between the labyrinth of greed and Kadi's fortress. Yong Ho and Tigrius had to stay in Kadi's fortress in order to attack the territory of the King of Gluttony. But Yong Ho had a lot to do in the labyrinth of greed. He had to conquer the arena. He also had to be recognized by Richard, the gatekeeper on the eighth floor. He also had to finish the synthetic evolution of Skull and the reinforcement of his subordinate spirits that he had put off for now. While no one could quickly come up with the right solution, the flames of the Red Lotus arose. Almond whispered, My master, if that is the case, there is a solution. Is there just a good solution on the ninth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed? Yong Ho asked as if on cue, and his subordinate spirit's eyes twinkled. The flames of the Red Lotus waned a bit as if to express embarrassment. Well that's right. Ophelia, who got so excited perhaps because of her experience on the eighth floor, approached the flames of the Red Lotus and asked, What is the solution? Since they were as thrilled as she, other spirits cast a glance at Amun. Even Tigrius showed interest. Amun laughed warmly then whispered to not only Yong Ho but the other members of the Mammon family. The Integrated Control Center for the Door of Space. It manages the space leap to the dungeon under his control. And. Amun blurred at the end. As if to make them fret about his answer, Amun paused for a moment and continued, protecting the ninth floor is Scorpion, the Grand Magician Magnadon who destroys the earth. Ophelia's expression changed. Tigrius held his breath while Kaiwan and Catalina were amazed at the same time. Grand Magician Magnadon. His nickname was the Earth Destroyer. The one who changed the map. He was the most erratic and the greatest magician of Mammon's twelve spirits. The flames of the Red Lotus arose fiercely, radiating both yearning and joy at the same time. Chapter, 223 The demon world was vast, so were the king's territories. Because of this, it often took more than one day for them to reach from one dungeon to another by riding a horse. Kings generally had dozens of dungeons under their control. Given the distance between dungeons took more than one day to reach, it meant dozens of days to travel back and forth between them. So, they needed to cross the whole kingdom to travel from one dungeon to another in the farthest place. Mammon, the great Jing of Greed, thought about this problem. It's inefficient. So, Mammon installed the door of space in all dungeons. And he connected all the doors to make it one. The flames of the Red Lotus arose inside the giant red dragon, Tiamat, which was returning to the house of Mammon. Amun continued to explain, of course, Mammon was not the first who created the door of space. He wasn't the first demon king to travel back and forth dungeons through the door of space, either. However, he was the first to connect dozens of dungeons. It can be said to be one of Mammon's great achievements. There were quite a few means of transportation with which they could move a long distance in an instant. Just like Citri's cat carriage or the flying carriage of the dungeon market that he used when he visited the auction house of the dungeon market. But even those transportations were slower than the door of space where they could move instantly. Really? Is it true that there is a control center on the ninth floor that manages all the roads and doors? When Yong Ho asked, the flames flared up more strongly. Yes. However, you will not be able to use the connecting roads that Mammon had made. You must create the new connecting roads of your own. That's efficient. Yong Ho's being able to move between the dungeons under his command in an instant meant that the range of activities of Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits, who were like tactical nuclear weapons in the human world, could be enormously expanded without attracting the attention of the enemy at all. But it's not perfect. There are only dozens of people who can move through the connecting road all at once. And you can only use it twice a day. Keep this in mind. It was impossible for Yong Ho to mobilize large troops by using the door of space. However, he was not disappointed. That's why I have Thiamet. It wasn't just Tiamat. He planned to purchase a few more flying vehicles in the future. The option to purchase a large flying spirit and evolve it was also attractive to him. A large armed fleet flying through the sky. He felt like his wild ambitions were surging just by imagining it. Then, are you going to go back and challenge the ninth floor? Taiwan asked, 
who sat right next to him. But he shook his head and said, No, I need to prepare a little more. It was the Grand Wizard, Magnadon, who was on the ninth floor as one of Mammon's twelve spirits. In the legends, he was like a disaster, splitting the land and breaking mountains. Almond said firmly that Yongho's fight against Magnadon was inevitable. Magnadon was different from Skathak or Richard. Whether he was crazy or not, Magnadon would chant an attack spell as soon as he saw Yongho. Catalina, who was sitting across Kaiwan, asked Yongho a bit timidly, Would you like to make the silent warrior Richard your subordinate spirit? His relationship with Richard, the guardian on the eighth floor, was very subtle. He didn't advise or help him like Skathak or Gus Ion, nor did he attack Yongho like Baphomet or Asclepius. He was just faithful to guarding the entrance to the treasure storage. At her question, Yongho said, with his shoulders falling, I would like to, but I have a little problem. You mean any more vacancy for the spirit? Taiwan asked right away. Yongho nodded. Almond spoke again, the master can afford to have one more subordinate spirit. Of course, if your power grows a little more, you can afford to have more subordinate spirits. When Amun mentioned one more, he was referring to one like Mammon's twelve spirits, not a general dungeon spirit. Ophelia added, the number of subordinate spirits is confined to five or six even if you are a king. The king of gluttony who controlled at least seven subordinate spirits was very exceptional. The king of gluttony had eight subordinate spirits, but what Ophelia actually saw was seven. Whether it was seven or eight, however, it was clear that the king had more subordinate spirits than generally accepted. Each of the seven deadly sins has its own special powers. As the current master of the House of Mammon, you probably know what the fundamental power of greed is. Although what Amun said was somewhat off the main topic, Yongho just nodded again because he understood what Amun was trying to say. Possessiveness. Was that the reason why Mammon could have as many as twelve subordinate spirits? Greed wanted to have possessiveness because pure possessiveness was the source of greed. More subordinate spirits. It didn't matter whether Yongho had five or six. Greed longed for possession of more of them. Of course, it is thanks to the power of greed that Mammon could have twelve subordinate spirits. But his addition of the power of gluttony and fury also helped him control as many as twelve spirits. If he had not possessed three sins, he would not have made twelve spirits his subordinate spirits, no matter how strong Mammon was. Right now, Yongho had greed and gluttony. One day, he would be able to control as many as twelve subordinate spirits like Mammon. Anyway, is it a matter of choice for you right now? Kaiwan pointed out the heart of the matter. He agreed and said, Richard hasn't recognized me yet. He only allowed me to use the treasure storage. I can obtain the power of trust that he allegedly had. But I'm not sure if I can make him one of my subordinate spirits. It was also not easy for him to force any reluctant warrior to be his subordinate spirit. Besides, this was the task of making one of Mammon's twelve spirits his own spirit. It was natural that he thought the task almost impossible. If I dare to recommend you, I think it's better to make Gus Ion your subordinate spirit first rather than Richard. Richard will never have a new master unless he is persuaded first. He would rather take his life if he was forced against his will. Richard was the man who kept the treasure storage of his deceased master for one thousand years. It was ridiculous to compare his loyalty with that of the twelve spirits, but there were few who could be compared with him in terms of loyalty. Suddenly Skull shouted. Catalina, who had watched Skull for as long as Yong Ho, understood what Skull tried to say. Flapping her ears several times, she said, holding his hand tightly, I am on the same page as Skull. I will never serve any other master than you. Me, too, because I'm yours, said Kaiwan jokingly, hugging his arm. Embarrassed but delighted, he raised his head and said to Eligos, who was moving up or down his lips hesitantly, Hey, Eligos. You don't have to express it because you know your heart. Same to you, Ophelia and Tigrius. Eligos's red skin turned even more reddish, and Ophelia smiled gently, looking at him. Tigrius cleared his throat to get out of embarrassment. Almond whispered to everyone, I said just one vacancy for the spot of our master's subordinate spirit. But I think it's not sufficient. The subordinate spirits of the master are rapidly becoming stronger. 
the master must also grow enough to accommodate them all. The power of evolution will lead the master and his subordinate spirits to a higher place. That was the case with Mammon's twelve spirits in the past. Even after reaching the peak of the demon world, Mammon and his twelve spirits continued to grow. Yong Ho clapped his hands loudly. Okay, I have to conquer the ninth floor in order to have Ophelia and Tigrius be in charge of Cadus Fortress and go through rigorous fighting in the arena. Let's get ready as soon as we return. Cadus was the northern fortress he occupied before his summit meeting with the Queen of Fury. It would take quite a lot of attention and renovation to rebuild the fortress that had been thoroughly destroyed by the invasion of two foreign enemies, Embryo and Stravati. Turning his face away from Ophelia, who was about to cry, and Tigrius, who gently cleared his throat, Yong Ho made the announcement. Kaiwan hugged his arm a little harder and asked, You said you have work to do before that? Of course, I do. Yong Ho's gaze turned to one of his subordinate spirits. Skulko. Name, Black Dirge. Category, Demon Sword. Black Dirge is a magic sword whose creator is unknown. Currently, the most prevalent theory is that Kakura Ladum, who was a blacksmith, made it with all his heart and soul for revenge. Black Dirge, a magical sword in the form of a giant claymore, puts a powerful curse of death on the user. Anyone who surrenders to this curse is resurrected as an undead and becomes a puppet of the Black Dirge. Black Dirge with a puppet repeats an indiscriminate massacre and increases the number of undead. However, those who overcome the curse will be able to perform necromancing with the power of the curse of the Black Dirge. Since the user uses the power of the magic sword, he can use it even if he is ignorant of magic. Tip of the Dungeon Market Because the curse itself is to resurrect the opponent into an undead, the initial undead can use the Black Dirge. Warning from the Dungeon Market Even if the user of the Black Dirge is an undead, anyone who is weak-hearted can be controlled by the Black Dirge. Once the curse is activated after purchase, no return or refund is possible for any reason. Chapter, 224 Yong Ho, who put down the item description catalog of the dungeon market, saw the black dirge on the decoration table. With the black evil energy blowing out like smoke, it looked like a magic sword. He felt like he would be cursed just by putting his hand on it. He picked up the second description catalog. Defective Product Category, Undead Detailed Category, Lich it is a lich created by using the Grand Wizard from an alien world as the material at the dungeon market. In general, it is common to use a live for the production of a lich. Even those who have become lich themselves prepare rituals in their lifetime. There was a low chance of success because the Grand Wizard from the alien world was already dead when he was found. Thanks to the accumulated know-how of the dungeon market, the Grand Wizard's body was successfully revived as a lich even though he had been already dead. But, unfortunately, the Lich, who was born like that, did not have a proper ego. Although he was born with powerful magic and some necromancing magic, it is impossible to operate him properly because he does not have an ego. It was not a prototype this time. It was a spirit that Citri specially saved from a warehouse where defective products were piled up. A huge skeleton, almost the size of skull, was hanging next to the Black Dirge. Like the Black Dirge, it was blowing out a black evil energy, but it looked emaciated and wobbly. Even when its eyes were supposed to glare, they were just sparkling dimly. It was a defective product that could not be sold because it had no ego. However, there was no better material for Yong Ho than this. Okay, let's buy this. Yong Ho did not agonize which of the Lich and Black Dirge he would merge with Skull, for he had a much more efficient third option. Synthetic Reinforcement It was different from general synthetic evolution. Combining something called an item and something called a spirit, so it could be strengthened through synthetic evolution. This kind of synthetic reinforcement was possible only once for Yong Ho's subordinate spirits. However, it did not require evolution EXP. Green light flashed in Yong Ho's eyes and the green flames also arose from his arms. His subordinate spirits, who were watching inside an empty room in the corner of the fifth floor, gulped while holding their breath. He finally put his hand on the black dirge and lich's shoulder. Then he activated the power of evolution. There was a tremendous light created. No, it was not light, but darkness. 
The light that emitted momentarily blurred his vision, creating a darkness in which he could see nothing. He felt his mana was sucked in in an instant. About half of the powerful mana he released from his six horns was consumed at once in the process. The darkness was cleared again. Yong Ho urgently received the dungeon's reserve mana from Lucia. Slowly stepping back, he looked at the newly born lich through synthetic reinforcement. The lich had already changed on the surface. His hazy eyes and drooping posture were still there, but his body itself turned more combative. He looked very sharp perhaps as a result of merging with the sword. Black evil energy raged. Combined with the lich's powerful mana, the curse of the black dirge became more powerful. Yong Ho gulped at the spectacular scene. Instead of stepping back, he turned around and looked at Skull. Skull. The curse of the Black Dirge was stronger than expected. The Lich, who had no ego at all, was rather free from the curse, but Skull, who had a free will, was not. What if Skull was defeated by the curse of the Black Dirge? Skull spoke. He stepped forward with his purple eyes glaring sharply. Yong Ho could not understand what he was saying, but he understood it. Instead of worrying, he trusted Skull. Skull stood by the Lich. Yong Ho saw the purple smoke rising up from Skull engulfing the Lich. Yong Ho caught his breath. He felt his subordinate spirits behind his back were extremely tense, swallowing. Skull Ko. Skull laughed. Yong Ho laughed along and soon stepped forward. He put his hand on Skull's sturdy shoulder. Time for synthetic evolution. Yong Ho clenched his teeth. He poured out more mana than before. The Lich threw out a black evil spirit, with his mouth wide open, as if he was screaming, and Skull firmed up his determination by bringing out purple flames fiercely. Once again, the light rose in Yong Ho's eyes, and the light gave birth to darkness. With his mana being exhausted, Yong Ho felt something different. He sensed a completely different power from it when he combined and reinforced the Lich and the Black Dirge. Mammon's Godly Energy A purple light, close to black, emitted from the magic field on his left arm. It wasn't what Yong Ho intended. The death sealed inside the magic field or the power of Baphomet arose by itself. No one explained it. But Yong Ho understood it. Mammon's Twelve Spirits They made the zodiacal signs their motif. It was a succession of twelve signs of the zodiac. Right at this moment, Baphomet's death determined his successor. A purple light, almost black, filled the room. It became more and more purple than black, and at one point, it emitted an intense light before disappearing. It happened only for a few seconds. However, Yong Ho could never forget those moments. Catalina opened her mouth before she knew it and flapped her ears and tail. Kaiwan made a rather silly smile. Eligos and Ophelia blinked again and again, while Tigrius uttered exclamation quietly. His subordinate spirits felt each other through Yong Ho. Yong Ho understood the man more directly who was standing right before his eyes. The growth of his subordinate spirits soon triggered their master Yong Ho's growth. Then it spread to all of the other spirits. The six horns towering over Yong Ho's head shuddered. Other spirits also quickly erected their horns, keenly realizing that one of them had reached a whole new level. It wasn't something like the Death Knight. It couldn't be compared to anything like the Lich. It was called Bernani No Life King. King of the Undead. Violet light was burning from the inside of Skull's empty eyes. Skull Skull. The energy of death was raging violently. It was powerful enough to overwhelm mana and cause dread and fear onto the living. Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits knew this energy of death. They had experienced the real energy of death, which was qualitatively different from the power emitted by the Bone Dragon or other undead. Capricorn, Baphomet, the Demon of Slaughter. He was one of Mammon's twelve spirits as well as the incarnation of death from another world. Someone swallowed, so did Yong Ho. He looked at Skull with a tense expression. His body got a little bigger. The Lich's sharp look, who was merged with the Black Dirge, was reflected in him. The glaring eyes located between the skulls wrapped in purple flames were gentle. Instead of flashing for a moment, they were flames that seemed to burn forever. Skull. 
Yom Ho carefully called him. He was worried a little bit that he might have been swallowed up by the black dirge. His subordinate spirits also concentrated. Their connection with him was in full swing. Skull replied, Skull Skull. Skull Skull. His voice was the same, mixed with laughter this time. There was a very brief silence in the room, and soon, they all smiled. Yong Ho sighed a breath of relief. It was Skull. Although he succeeded Baphomet's death and took the power of the Lich and the Demon Sword to surpass the Death Knight and Lich, his essence remained unchanged. He is still the same Skull that I know. Yong Ho was glad to confirm it, but he felt a bit sad because he expected Skull would be able to speak properly. Wait a minute. Did you say Skull Skull? Yong Ho blinked. Catalina, who was in a good mood, flapping her ears and tail, looked at Skull, startled as if she realized something suddenly. Kaiwan opened her mouth, didn't he make a noise that was different from usual? What I mean is Skull Skull. Skull said it again, and Yongho's subordinate spirits were surprised again. Obviously, Skull was saying Skull Skull, but Yongho could understand its meaning. Apart from him saying Skull Skull, Yongho felt like some sort of its meaning was conveyed directly into his head. It was as if Skull said something like, why are you so surprised? I am still the same as usual. When Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits were embarrassed again, Skull was also embarrassed this time. Skull tilted his head slightly and spoke again, Skull Ko. Was he saying master? Oh my god, Yong Ho uttered admiration. Tigria said, with a twinkle in his eyes, it's a powerful telepathy. As a result of synthetic reinforcement of the Lich, he seems to have realized the sorcery, namely his innate magical power. Sorcery. It refers to magic that is emitted by relying on one's will and innate strength without arithmetic calculations. It's similar to a supernatural power or the way you control the flames. Yong Ho has also studied magic several times since he came to the demon world, so he knew what Tigrius was referring to as arithmetic magic. Oh, I see. He couldn't imagine how Skull used magic while calculating arithmetically. It was much more like him to just use his supernatural power by instinct. Skull, do you know what kind of magic you can use? At Yong Ho's question, Skull flashed his eyes as if blinking. After a little pause, he answered, Skull Skull. Skull. He seemed to reply, I don't know yet but I think I know what I can do. A purple flame arose from Skull's right hand. The flame soon turned into lightning, and Yong Ho realized that it was a lightning bolt with the energy of death. It was the lightning magic that Skull acquired when he became a magic knight. Skull handled lightning freely just like Yong Ho handled flames. Skull scattered the flames into the air and created a new flame. Again, the flame had the energy of death this time, but it was different from the one a while ago. The lightning earlier was the power to kill the living, but this one was the power to resurrect the dead. Chapter 225 It's not just a death knight with lich magic. Skull must be more than that. He could be called the king of the undead. It's no exaggerated title, said Tigrius, with great excitement. Yong Ho, who recalled the title of No Life King, also nodded. But he had one question. Why was it that Skull couldn't speak properly even though he had been reborn as such a powerful being? Is it because of me? The power of evolution was Yong Ho's power. Because of this, the evolution that his subordinate spirits experienced reflected his unconsciousness. Because of this, Catalina's ears and tail changed in a way that she could flap them well, or Salami had a handle on his back. Yong Ho briefly imagined Skull speaking fluently, but he soon felt very strange about it. In his opinion, Skull would be better off remaining as Skull crying Skull Skull. As if he read Yong Ho's mind, Skull laughed, as always. The sound of Skull's laughter rang friendly. Aside from synthetic evolution, I was really amazed by the power of synthetic reinforcement. I still can't believe my eyes even though I witnessed it. I was amazed that you gave the power of artifacts to the spirits. When Elegos expressed admiration, Tigrius nodded violently, too. Returning from an old gentleman to a wizard after a long time, Tigrius repeatedly emphasized the fact that Skull absorbed the core powers of the Black Dirge. Kaiwan hugged Yong Ho's arm and said, 
as I said before, I want at least a dragon heart. Please get a dragon heart and strengthen me through synthetic reinforcement. Can you do that? Synthetic reinforcement could give the power of artifacts to his subordinate spirits. If Yong Ho could obtain a dragon heart and reinforce it through synthetic evolution, as Kaiwan urged, she would be able to use not only amazing mana but also the dragon's unique power just like dragon breath, dragon peer, etc. Synthetic reinforcement could bring about a much more diverse combination than synthetic evolution that was only available to some spirits as undead or golems. As if something came to his mind, Yong Ho asked Amun, Amun, did all the twelve spirits of Mammon go through synthetic reinforcement? Some of them did, but others didn't. Let me remind you for the sake of caution. I did not go through synthetic reinforcement through a spear. It was not Mammon's will that I became a spear. At that moment, Catalina flinched because she thought Amun was born through synthetic reinforcement through a spear. Amun said, creating a soft flame as if he was smiling. Master, you have only one chance to bring about synthetic reinforcement per each spirit. However, if you save it, you can make a big mistake. Yongho seemed to know what Amun was talking about. Even in the game, if he saved skill points for the skills he would use in the second half, the process would become much more difficult later. Moreover, in reality, not in games, it might not be possible for him to reach the second half at all. Skull gained the power of the Black Dirge by mixing his synthetic evolution with the Lich, who went through synthetic reinforcement. In other words, Skull still had an opportunity for synthetic reinforcement. Well, this kind of expediency is also possible. It would take a long time to collect EXP enough to be able to bring about synthetic evolution once again. It was Skull that experienced the most evolutions among the dungeon spirits of the Mammon family. Probably, the pace of him accumulating evolution EXP would be comparable to Amun by now. However, Yong Ho felt satisfied with it. Skull still had room for growth. Skull still had a potential that he hadn't fulfilled yet. Yong Ho recalled the artifacts in Mammon's armory that Asclepius guarded. Those artifacts that he could put to use for the synthetic evolution of his subordinate spirits came to his mind one after another. While he was lost in thought, Catalina, who checked his expression, rolling her eyes, raised her hand like a student asking a question. Amun, can I inherit Alun's power just like Skull inherited the power of the Twelve Spirits? Everyone was so surprised by synthetic reinforcement and the growth of Skull that they forgot one fact, which was as important as synthetic reinforcement and Skull's growth. Namely, Baphomet's death made Skull his successor. He delivered the essence of death to Skull. The essence of the Twelve Spirits was latent in Yong Ho's magic field. It was the same with the power of Alun or Asclepius, who had already died. She wanted to take over that power, so she could be the successor of Mammon's Twelve Spirits. Amun smiled at Catalina, who singled out Alun. Then he answered gladly, Yes, that's possible. Especially, your essence is very similar to Alun. If you are qualified, Alun's power, Justice, will choose you. Catalina was glad to hear Amun's reply, with her face blushing. Her tail fluttered in step with her slowly flapping ears. Kaiwan giggled at that and said, Are you going to be a new addition to the Twelve Spirits? I mean a mix of old and new generations of Twelve Spirits. Yong Ho's Twelve Spirits look great. Actually, the process was going on. Amun, who was Mammon's spirit, belonged to the seven subordinate spirits of Yong Ho's, and Gus Ion and Scathack would also stand by him. Okay, we must first conquer the ninth floor to do so. Let's move on courageously. As Yong Ho spoke vigorously, Kaiwan smiled and winked at him. Sure. Why not? Me, too. Skulko. When Catalina sneakily cut in, Skull also chimed in openly. Yong Ho told Eligos not to, who was checking his expression at the moment, then ordered everyone including Ophelia and Tigrius. Let's take a break today. We'll have to tough it out, starting tomorrow. He needed to conquer the ninth floor in order to normalize Cadiz Fortress and attack the territory of the King of Gluttony. Of course, the King of Gluttony was gone, and he formed an alliance with the Queen of Fury, but he still had a lot of work to do. Kaiwan grabbed Yong Ho's arm while everyone dissolved at his order. She whispered gently, By the way, Yong Ho. 
Ha! Huh. Which one is prettier, me or the Queen of Fury? The Queen of Fury or Catalina? Who was more beautiful? Obviously, she asked the question, recalling the mistake that he made while talking with the Queen. Kaiwan smiled gently, and Catalina pricked her ears. Instead of facing Kaiwan's narrowing eyes, he kissed her forehead lightly and then turned around. Kaiwan was still hanging on his arm, but he didn't reply. Kaiwan pinched his waist slightly, and Catalina quickly caught up with him. Skull laughed loud on behalf of him. Skullko. No telepathy was transmitted to him this time. But Yong Ho was grateful for the fact that instead of speaking properly, Skull was acting just like him. More than twenty days have already passed since the death of the King of Gluttony. With all of the ten warriors, the core power, gone, there were few things Orlando, the butler, could do. He had sought the help of the three powerful masters defending the borders. According to Orlando's wishes, the three masters agreed to select a suitable successor among the children of the king. They had no disagreement over the fact that for the time being, they had to hide the death of the king. Orlando, the butler, was relieved. And the three masters had a meeting among themselves without Orland. Although they argued over their achievements in the presence of the king in the past, they were surprisingly on the same page after the king was gone. It was futile to install the king's successor. None of the children of the king had the sin of gluttony. Only six countries existed in the demon world, and the number of countries equaled the number of kings. What did it mean? It was simple. It meant that a country could not survive without a king. The three masters did not think of defending the king's territory. They didn't even have the ambition to fight each other to be the next king. To whom would they dedicate themselves and their dungeons and dungeon spirits? Who would pay the most for their sales? It was natural that the three masters saw eye to eye on this. It was only those who had the same temperament as the three masters who could survive under the king. They couldn't move quickly now because they didn't know how the king died. So, they needed to watch the situation a little more, while following Oraldo's will. However, it was possible for them to exchange opinions among themselves. The three masters discussed which king would guarantee them the most efficient outcome, and they were surprisingly of the same opinion. Although they departed from different parts, all of them turned their eyes at the same place in the map of the demon world. The sky of the demon world was red. And a crimson dragon spread his wings under the red sky. The king of violence. He was the largest and most powerful supreme being among the dragons. He wasn't in his rare hideout place anymore. He stood on the most important land in the demon world, which was unknown to most of the beings in the demon world. Mammon's memories left behind in the godly energy of greed confirmed it. It was this land. Right here, the great king of greed, Mammon, died. The king of violence looked around again. The stairs leading up to that high sky no longer existed. It was the thing of the past, dating thousands and hundreds of years, closed a long time ago. Mammon was a man who saved the demon world in a place no one knew and disappeared from history because of his betrayers. The king of violence raised his head high. Looking up to the sky, he let out a low voice. A strong wind from somewhere scattered the truth that the king of sloth told, and the voice of the king of violence. The king of violence no longer had any lingering attachment. He soared into the sky, leaving the land behind, where Mammon met his last moment. He crossed the red sky of the demon world, which was not blue and should never be blue. Chapter, 226 There had been numerous kings since the beginning of the demon world. Those with the power of the seven deadly sins reigned as kings and established their own kingdoms. However, no family has succeeded in carrying on the lineage of a royal family. The only exception was the royal family of the King of Pride. The reason why they did not create a royal family was simple. Their sins were not carried on to their successors. It was also impossible to transfer the sins in the usual way. It was highly likely that a family who once possessed the sin would produce offspring with the power of sin, but even such a family could not form a royal family. It would be easier if they killed the owner of the sin and take away his essence. In that case, they could kill the old king just before his death and inherit his sin. It was cruel, but at the same time, it was natural. 
even in the human world, not the demon world, there were heinous children who killed their parents for money. They could do something crueler if they inherited the sins. However, the sins were not inherited that way. Anyone who had the qualifications of a king could take away the sins by killing the opponent as if to absorb their essence, but there was no way of knowing if the person had a king's qualifications. Even if the person who claimed to be the successor was not qualified as a king, the one who was old but obviously a king would lose his life for nothing. There was only one certain way to overcome the power of the sin. It was possible only when a king killed another king. In other words, the king who had a sin should take another king's sin by killing him. Therefore, the royal family was not created because there was no family that could satisfy the condition that the successor already had the sin. But the royal family of the king of pride was different. The king's sin was naturally inherited from generation to generation. It was highly likely that the first king of pride, who acquired the sin of pride for the first time, had found some other way. Maybe the succession of the sin itself was a special ability embedded in the sin of pride. The only royal family in the demon world. The king of pride at that time, the master of the royal family of pride, looked down on the earth from the highest point under the sky. Everything was going on smoothly. The war with the king of envy was going on well according to his plan. The king of envy was slowly crumbling, and the king of lust wasn't making a move, crouching in his stronghold. In the south, the king of gluttony, who could not be more vulgar, and the queen of fury were busy keeping each other in check. He didn't expect that the king of violence intervened in their fight, but it was not a variable enough to shake his plan. There existed no king of greed. The king of sloth, who disappeared for more than a thousand years, was virtually non-existent. So, everything went well. There were no significant variables. I just feel repugnant. It repulsed him for a long time that the Queen of Fury and the King of Gluttony, who were only negligible in his eyes, were leading a happy life after taking possession of undeserved treasures. Besides, there was one more thing that made him feel displeased. The abandoned land in the south was unified. Although the unification was not complete, it was only a matter of time. The House of Mammon. A family that once enjoyed glory and fame. However, like most families that produced a king, the family crumbled because it failed to continue its lineage. He felt repugnant about the fact that a family without the sin unified the unclaimed land in the south. The kings in the south couldn't attack the unclaimed land because they were busy holding them in check. The king of pride himself could not attack it either because he was in the north, totally opposite from the south. But that wasn't all. There was one fact that made the king of pride feel anger, not just displeasure. An alien's blood was running in the current master of the Mammon family. The king of pride was not sure which idiot of the Mammon family installed him as their master. The pure blood of the demonic blood was once again disgraced. A negligible master resurrected the failing Mammon family and unified the unclaimed southern land. The king of pride caught his breath to subdue his anger. It was only now that the negligible kings were rampant. Everything was going as the king of pride planned. The king of pride turned his gaze back to the north from the south. He looked at the territory of the king of envy, which would be his first target of attack. The garden of life was brutally invaded by skeletons and damaged by farming tools here and there, but fortunately, some of it was left intact enough to be called a garden. On the remaining lawn near the shore of the lake where Skathaka's mansion was located, Yuria slightly lifted her skirt. After politely bowing, she opened her arms wide, watching Skathak sitting in the yard of the mansion over the lake. Okay, let's start. Skathak responded with clapping. Yuria turned around with a rather tense look and said to the nearest ones who were lined up behind her back. Baduk and Dungeon Meerkat, flip. The moment Yuria ordered them, Baduk and the baby Dungeon Meerkat, jumped high and somersaulted into the air. It wasn't surprising to see Baduk, with strong muscles, be comparable to an ogre, jumping more than a few meters and turning it into a somersault, but the dungeon meerkat was different. No matter how light she was, it would have been impossible to jump many times over her body and tumble around. Yuria happily watched them doing a somersault several times then looked back. She shouted loudly, White Wolf, Flip! The leader of the wolf herd led by Embryo, which had unusually gray hair, 
made a sullen expression as if to boycott her order, but eventually, he hit the ground and made a somersault. Yuria's face turned red with excitement. She cried out louder. Now, everyone, do it together. The gray wolf, the leader of the herd, was turning a somersault with others. A dozen wolves also jumped high and somersaulted into the air without any complaints. Everybody was amazed at a dozen wolves tumbling at the same time. Scat Hack got up from her seat and applauded. Great. You're really doing well. I was impressed with you, sis. He he he. When Scat Hack praised her, Yuria smiled shyly and twisted her body a bit as if she was shy. But when they heard the baby dungeon meerkat struggling with a moan, Yuria stopped them immediately. Lucia, who was watching them doing somersaults, uttered admiration somewhat differently from others. She has such a strong ability to control the crowd. It looks like as a result of repeated evolution, her ability as a princess crazy ant has been sublimated into a monster tamer's talent. Monster tamer did not mean a simple trainer. A monster tamer was a trainer who brought out more of their power by empowering monsters. Just like the ability of the queen crazy ant to rule her colony sublimated into the talent of a monster tamer, Yuria's power was quite strong. The power of evolution reflected Yong Ho's unconsciousness. As a result of repeated evolution, Yuria could no longer be called Princess Crazy Ant anymore. It would be impossible for her to become a queen ant because too many parts of her body had been already humanized. However, she acquired a powerful ability to control the crowd instead of becoming a queen ant. If she could use her ability well, she could lead a mighty legion that could not even be compared to her crazy ant colony. Isn't she praiseworthy? Lucia saw the Garden of Life on the first floor and the treasure storage on the eighth floor at the same time. Yong Ho nodded, standing on the eighth floor or on the stairs connecting the eighth and ninth floors. Like Lucia said, she was praiseworthy. He was suddenly moved, feeling a tug at his heart. Maybe the doting daddy feels the same way toward his daughter. He giggled quickly before he knew it then got things about Yuria out of his mind. It was time he had to focus on more important things. A week passed after his summit meeting with the Queen of Fury. During that period, Yong Ho, who had enough rest as well as training in the arena, headed to the ninth floor with all of his subordinate spirits. Scorpio, Grand Wizard Magnadon, who destroys the land. His nickname was never an exaggeration. As Mammon's wizard, he was the best wizard of his time. The ninth floor had exactly the same structure as the eighth floor. But they had different dungeon monsters occupying several empty rooms on their floors. Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits moved forward, literally sweeping away the dungeon monsters. Soon, they reached a large door. Compared to the eighth floor, it could be the entrance to the treasure storage. Master, please stop for a moment. I feel the energy of my old friend. Amun's voice was transmitted not only to Yong Ho but also to all his subordinates. He stopped as Amun instructed and looked at the steel door embossed with a large scorpion. He immediately found out which energy Amun was talking about. Seven colors of mana swirled in front of the steel door. The combined mana soon became a circle, and it soon changed into the shape of a human again. It wasn't real. Like Elun's memory that appeared on the third floor, it was an alter ego left by magic. Grand Wizard Magnadon. He was a being as if he personified a scorpion. He covered almost all of his body with a red cloak, but a large, heavy tail not covered by the cloak proved it. His hair, with a white beard on bronzed skin, was no different from a human, except for his red eyes and pupils. Chapter, 227 the translucent Magnadon's alter ego didn't attack Yong Ho recklessly just like Amun first said. He said, looking straight at Yong Ho, has the master's successor finally appeared? It's been such a long time. Magnadon. The flames of the red lotus arose right next to Yong Ho because even Amun, who was usually calm, couldn't stand it. Magnadon was certainly alive that last day. He didn't die. Then, why didn't Magnadon himself, not his alter ego, appear? Magnadon looked at the flames of the red lotus with mixed feelings of longing and joy. He responded to Amun's call with a smile. Yeah, Amun. I am already dead. 
Not long after I arrived at the labyrinth of greed, my energy was all exhausted. As soon as he finished talking, he shook his head. He continued even before Amun could say something, Amun, my friend, don't make an expression like that. Who do you think moved the whole labyrinth of greed? And who do you think maintained the labyrinth of greed and our twelve spirits? As a matter of fact, I was injured severely at that time. As I used up all my energy, it's natural that I died. It was as if he was talking about somebody else. He even laughed heartily on his own then turned his eyes from the flames of the red lotus to Yongho. He nodded politely out of courtesy. I apologize for the late greetings. I am Magna Don, my lord Mammon's wizard. I'm Yongho Chion, the master of the current Mammon family. When Yongho introduced himself, Magna Don moved his eyelids as if he was hesitating for a moment. He opened his mouth again after looking back at Kai Wan, who stood by him with a somewhat nervous expression. You are the new king of greed. If so, you must be my lord's successor. But I didn't expect it would take over a thousand years for you to appear before me like this. I think my lord's arrangement for his successor paid off anyway. In any case, I'm glad that his successor has appeared. He muttered to himself then didn't give Yong Ho and Kai Wan any chance to respond just like he did with Amun. He said, opening his arms wide, let me tell you bluntly. There are lots of magic traps inside this door that I have made myself. Indeed, it is a series of traps that reflect the producer's malice. He was a typical evil sorcerer, given that he was laughing, mentioning his malice. Magnadon stroked his long white beard and said, at the end of the room, there is a control device that can control the traps. And beyond that, there is a control tower that I can describe as the true purpose of the existence of the ninth floor. This is the trial I have prepared for Mammon's successor. And surely, Amun might wonder why I have put so much effort into something like the control tower. Tut, tut. That's why you can't go far. The control tower is more important than you think. He poured out words as if he was doing both sides of the conversation. Magnadon took a step closer to Yong Ho as if he wanted to emphasize his point. The network built by Mammon in the past does not include only the dungeons under his command. His network reached all over the demon world. It was an important point. It was like a solid rock amid a flood of words he poured out. Magnadon laughed again after reading his expression. Then he continued with a satisfied expression, of course, over a thousand years have passed. Many parts of the network collapsed, and probably, there are lots of places where the gates of space built everywhere in the dungeon world were destroyed, so you might not be able to pass. But there are still some places left intact. I think you know about it even if I don't tell you anything more. What Yong Ho first expected was just the door of a space where he could move between the dungeons. But if it was true that the network was also connected to other places beyond the unclaimed land in the south as Magnadon said, this was a really big deal. Magnadon took another step back. This time, he bowed deeply to Yong Ho then pointed to the steel door with a theatrical gesture. He said provocatively, it's my masterpiece. I hope you can lightly break through it. Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits turned their eyes at the steel door all at once. The embossed scorpion moved according to Magnadon's gestures, and the steel door was soon opened. Kill it. Wipe shield. Hey, Yong Ho. Yong Ho and Kai Wan's voices were mixed in the air. At the same time, Yong Ho, who held her waist, lifted her high and blocked the front while Kai Wan activated the power of distortion toward the front. Various magics threatening to devour the two began to scatter into the wrong places when the power of distortion distorted the attack trajectory of the magics. Yoshi. Grando season. What the heck is he saying now? Yong Ho cheered up, watching the magics exploding in the wrong places, and Kai Wan concentrated on the power of distortion while cursing profusely. She converted Yong Ho's mana transmitted through the Brigada ring into the power of distortion. Yong Ho and Kai Wan were currently located halfway through the trap room prepared by Magnadon. Like Magnadon warned, the room was full of magical traps with Magnadon's malice. Yong Ho had seen the greatest number of magic since he came to the demon world. Of course, it did not mean that Yong Ho suddenly went crazy. Normally, he would have used himself, not Kai Wan, as a shield. 
Although they were arguing over this issue, both already agreed before they left. It was Kai Wan who mentioned it first. Hey, Yong Ho, just in case, use me as a shield and run. As you know, I'm much better than you in controlling the power of distortion. When Kai Wan, who had the power of distortion, was determined to defend, the strength of her defense was beyond imagination. However, in that case, she could not move, which was a fatal weakness. So, she tried to solve this problem by letting him hold and present her as a shield against the opponent's attack. They agreed on this, and it was Kai Wan who brought up this issue first. But, this is unfair. How come you are using me as a shield even if I okayed it? You asked me to do so, right? Granted it, I feel terrible more than you think. What she imagined was rather romantic, such as Yong Ho running with her in his arms as if she was a princess. But he grabbed her waist and lifted her up. Although she was ready for it, she felt really disappointed when he treated her roughly like a shield. In short, she was upset. Right at that moment, when she was screaming, he violently swung her to the right. Kaiwan. To the right. Shield of darling. Arg, I'm going to see you later at night. Got it? Why night? He laughed instead of flinching. Although he was in the midst of an enormous magical storm at the moment, he kept laughing. Magnadon, who watched them from a distance, made a comment befitting him, he really looks silly, but awesome. In fact, Magnadon could not find any more appropriate word than awesome. It was a trap room made by Magnadon himself, who was called the best wizard during Mammon's reign. Each of the activated magic was very powerful and fatal. But Yong Ho was breaking through the trap room very fast and recklessly braving it from the front at that. That kind of breakthrough was generally impossible. Strong gravity magic was in effect in the trap room. Normally, anybody trapped in the room could not even walk because their legs were held by an invisible force. Yong Ho wasn't just running with Kai Wan as a shield. He also continuously released mana. He stopped the interference of gravity magic with a lump of pure mana. Magnadon widened his vision to check the paths that Yong Ho passed by. From the entrance of the trap room to the middle point where Yong Ho started using Kai Wan as a shield, a huge number of corpses were scattered everywhere. All of them were the bodies of the dungeon monsters that Yong Ho used as his shields. What Yong Ho did as soon as he encountered the trap room was to bring back as undead all the bodies of the dungeon monsters he had encountered on the ninth floor. Of course, Yong Ho did not do it himself. No life king, Skull, who was reborn as the powerful undead king, supervised the work. Skull did not memorize complex magic spells. Having learned necromancing as sorcery, Skull resurrected the dead by releasing the energy of death with only his will. As they didn't go through any special process, the only thing Skull had to do was to resurrect them as zombies, which were moving bodies. But that was enough. Hundreds of corpses themselves were excellent shields for Yong Ho. Magnadon also glanced at the other subordinate spirits near Skull. With their eyes closed, each of them was concentrating to deliver even a little stronger and pure mana to their master Yong Ho through Brigada. A smile was on Magnadon's. Although they were not comparable with Mammon's twelve spirits, he loved their close connection with their master. Their ability to exchange mana with Yong Ho smoothly proved that he was not only very competent, but he also had firm solidarity with them. Magnadon looked straight ahead again. Yong Ho was still blocking the magic, wielding Kai Wan. It was an unsightly scene, but Magnadon, who thought a demon king was supposed to be evil in nature originally, expressed satisfaction with his personality rather than blaming it. If he really conquers the next floor, I have no other choice but to recognize him. The last magic trap in the trap room. The swirling magic storm of the seven attributes. Magnadon, the greatest wizard of the demon world, could use all of the seven major magical elements of wind, fire, water, earth, lightning, light, and darkness. The vortex of the seven major attributes created by Magnadon was very destructive and dangerous in itself. It will be difficult for him to push them out with just mana. Since the vortex itself is big, it would be impossible to distort the orbit like he did a moment ago. If so, what would he do? How could he conquer the floor? Chapter, 228 Kaiwan, 
who focused only on the power of distortion instead of blaming Yongho as if she gave up, sensed that something had changed. The mana swirling in front of her eyes was different from what she used to know. Yongho what the heck? Even before she called him, Yongho pulled Kai Wan, who he put up as a shield, into his arms suddenly. He looked straight at her with more intense concentration than before. Kai Wan, who was held in his arms all of a sudden, immediately shut up after trying to say something. Instead, she buried her head on his chest and focused her consciousness on the Brigada ring. She passed mana to him. The vortex of seven attributes is mana. Yong Ho already experienced it. He recalled the trial he had to face in order to unlock the eighth floor treasure storage. It was foolish to confront this kind of force with the same force. Rather, he had to adapt to it. It was important for him to naturally go with the flow of mana. The silver light of harmony, symbolizing Yuho Yuan, arose from the godly energy, namely the magic field attached on his left arm. He changed the attributes of the sequentially released mana. By substituting the attributes of Yong Ho himself and his subordinate spirits into the vortex of mana one by one, he harmonized with it instead of colliding with it. Magnadon opened his mouth wide. Although he originally made the vortex of the seven attributes in mind, he never thought there would be anybody who could really overcome it. The vortex of the mana began to crumble little by little. Each of the seven attributes disappeared one by one, and when it happened, the speed of the vortex also slowed down. At last, the vortex disappeared. The mana of the last flames faded from the air, just like the green flames of Yongho. The sky after the storm was supposed to be calm. There was a zone of mana created in the trap room. Yongho opened his eyes. Cold sweat broke out on his back, but he smiled. Kai Wan, who opened her eyes slightly and looked up at Yongho, hugged him tightly. Although she was upset that he roughly swung her as a shield, she forgot it now and thought he was cool. Her heart was pounding. Yongho's subordinate spirits at the entrance opened their eyes one by one and breathed a sigh of relief. Catalina flapped her tail pleasantly. Now, Yongho passed all the tests. Once he went through the room with no mana, Magnadon's test would be over. When everyone thought so, Magnadon laughed slyly once again. Originally, the trap was supposed to catch him off guard. So, Yongho needed to realize that it was the most dangerous moment when he felt relaxed. The last trap was simple. It was a lump of pure and powerful mana. It was also the last mana that Magnadon himself left behind while dying. Yongho took a step. He passed through the zone with no mana. He needed to take only a couple of steps to the final destination. At that moment, mana poured from the ceiling to the floor. Kaiwan, held in his arms, hurriedly raised her head, but it was too late. She had no time to activate the power of distortion. Various voices could be heard from everywhere. Each of Yongho's subordinate spirits at the entrance was screaming. Magnadon saw it. He blinked and soon laughed out loud. The godly energy of fury mounted on Yongho's right hand opened its mouth wide like a beast. A lump of brigada, it accepted the sin of gluttony. It literally swallowed up the pouring mana. It was possible because what poured out of the ceiling was a mass of pure, not processed, mana. For the past one week before he challenged the ninth floor, Yong Ho spent the whole time in the arena. He wanted to learn how to use the godly energy of fury and the sin of gluttony that he obtained recently. The king of gluttony used the godly energy of fury to devour everything. Of course, the original purpose of the godly energy of fury was far from it, but it was a pure and huge mass of brigada. It was more than enough as a medium to release the power of the sin of gluttony that the king had. If the attribute of greed was possession, that of gluttony was devouring. So, the sin of gluttony devoured Magnadon's lump of mana. Greed then possessed it. After overcoming the last trap, Yongho didn't hesitate to move on and threw himself into the safe zone. Arrived. Standing on a large platform, he turned around and looked at the entrance. Catalina flapped her ears and tail while Ophelia and Eligos clapped. Tigrius also did not hide his admiration. Magnadon put his hand down while stroking his beard. As if he put down a heavy baggage, he let his shoulders droop and said warmly, Young master, 
you have passed all my tests. I would like to recognize you as the true successor of the House of Mammon. Magnadon didn't just pay lip service. Yong Ho felt a new force was added to the magic field on his left arm. He naturally raised his left arm and saw a new light. It was golden like the glory of the morning. Passion, the power of Magnadon, was reflected in the godly energy of Mammon. Unlike Elun, Magnadon did not disappear immediately after transferring power to Yong Ho. He still had one more mission left. As Amun has already told you, you have to create a new network of your own. But you don't have to abandon the old network built by Mammon at all. It would be best for you to build a new network based on the old one. The network created by Mammon is truly vast. Magnadon, who poured out his words eloquently, fidgeted with his hand, standing on the platform at the end of the trap room. Then, the entire trap room vibrated, revealing the true image of the ninth floor. The doors of the space rose from the ninth floor. It was not one but nine in total. In addition, a waist-high cylinder rose above the platform. Magnadon triggered the controller by moving his hand again on the cylinder. A light map of the demon world emerged above the cylinder. Magnadon moved his fingers again, and blue magical light appeared everywhere above the map. Yong Ho knew it without his explanation. They must be the network of the doors of space that was left intact even now. The light also shines in the north there are also light in the territory of the king of gluttony. Ophelia shouted before she knew it. Though there were not many, there was some blue light outside the southern unclaimed land. Although there was only one light, it was there not only in the territory of the king of gluttony, but also that of the queen of fury, that of the king of envy, and even that of the king of pride in the far north. Mammon did not build a network only in his dungeons. He hid the doors of space throughout the demon world. Catalina, looking at the light map with her eyes open wide, reached out and pointed to the blue light in the territory of the Queen of Fury. Don't you think it's moving? Indeed, it did, like she said. The blue light she pointed at with her fingertips was moving really slow. Instead of explaining, Magnadon operated the controller to enlarge the blue light that she was pointing at. Then, a window of light with tips about the location of the blue light appeared in the air. Vimana. Oh my that turtle is still alive. Magnadon burst into laughter lightly. As if he was glad to know that the turtle, which he saw during his time a thousand years ago, was still alive, his voice was filled with a pleasant surprise. But Ophelia and Tigrius's expressions changed instantly. She approached Magnadon and asked urgently, Magnadon, did you say it was Vimana? Turtle Demon Vimana? Yes, it's even famous these days, right? Magnadon said as if to humor a child. Ophelia raised her hand and covered her mouth. There was still a big surprise in both of her eyes. Ophelia? Yong Ho called her in a low voice, as he could not figure out what she was talking about. Only then did she come to her senses and said calmly, Vimana is the dungeon of the Queen of Fury. It's a dungeon placed on top of a giant turtle monster. It is a kind of movable fortress. Yong Ho recalled the ancient universe view he had seen one day. It was a picture of an elephant on a turtle then a land on it again. However, that picture disappeared from his mind instantly because he understood what she meant. Wait a moment. If so, is any door of space in our network connected with Vimana? Exactly. If you want it, you can always go to Vimana through the door of space. If my memory serves me right, her dungeon is inside Vimana's shell, said Magnadon, who grasped the situation while talking with them so far, with a laugh. The door of space connected to the dungeon of the Queen of Fury, not anyone else. Given that the network was still intact, it was clear that the Queen of Fury did not know the existence of the door of space Mammon had built. The Queen of Fury was a strong ally who formed an alliance with the Mammon family. However, he didn't need to let her know the Door of Space. The Door of Space located in the shell of Vimana would certainly play an important role someday. It seems important that this network is still intact not only in the territory of the King of Pride but also in the King of Gluttony's territory. If you use it well, you will be able to target only the core of the King of Gluttony's territory. Tigrius reminded everyone of the core point. 
As he said, what was important to the Mammon family right now was not the network connected with the Queen of Fury, but one connected with the King of Gluttony. The King of Gluttony was no longer alive. His right-hand men, the Ten Warriors, were also gone. Except for the Mammon family, there were no outsiders who knew this. Yongho already learned the War of the Demon World while fighting in the unclaimed land. It wasn't necessarily the best way to conquer the territory and own it. What mattered was to lap up the cream. Yongho and his subordinate spirits looked at the map of the demon world. As if they promised to do so, their eyes turned to one place. Chapter, 229 It was no exaggeration to say that the soul of the dungeon and its master were one in body and soul. The growth of the dungeon master soon led to the growth of the dungeon and vice versa. Lucia also had a strong control of the dungeon now that could not even be compared with in the past. Nonetheless, she still needed more power. The labyrinth of greed, or the dwelling place of Mammon, the great king of greed, demanded much more power than now. In particular, Lucia had to skip the seventh and eighth floors to conquer the ninth floor, which was a big challenge for her because she had to cross the two floors remotely to reach the ninth floor. Lucia barely managed to take control of the ninth floor. But her control was incomplete. She needed to grow a little more in order to completely control the ninth floor and control all the remaining floors of the Labyrinth of Greed, including the seventh and eighth floors. The easiest way to grow the soul of a dungeon, Lucia, was to feed her the dungeon's heart with the essence of the dungeon that was collected from the heart of another dungeon. Here was the problem. The number of dungeons in the unclaimed southern area was reduced to less than half because of the civil war that took place in all sides of the east, west, north, and south. Yong Ho, who had to dominate the enormous territory of the unclaimed southern area, had to stop the dungeons from shrinking anymore. Because of this, he gave up the idea of obtaining the essence of the dungeons from the dungeons in the unclaimed southern area. What he should aim for was the dungeons outside the unclaimed area. There was prey, of course. It was also very tempting and could be obtained relatively easily. Numerous dungeons located in the territory of the King of Gluttony. Although the masters under the command of the King of Gluttony were still alive, the king who controlled them and the greatest deterrent against the invasion by other kings, disappeared. And it was only the House of Mammon that knew the fact. Missing such a golden opportunity was simply ridiculous. In general, there were two basic ways to attack dungeons. One was the standard attack by mobilizing a massive military force. More than 80% of the dungeon battles that took place in the demon world were fought in this way. They advanced by dismantling the dungeon's defense forces and traps by using a number of dungeon spirits. In this case, the damage to the general dungeon spirits was enormous, but this kind of fight could reduce the damage of the elite forces including the master's subordinate spirits. Moreover, in terms of occupying and dominating the dungeon, they had no choice but to mobilize a large army. The stultifying massive mobilization of troops by Vizarro, Embryo's right-hand man, was such an example. Although his force was small in scale, compared to Vizarro's, Foras used a similar method when he attacked Yongho. The other way was to mobilize a small number of elite troops. The stronger the elite troops were, the less damage they suffered. Besides, they reduced the time of attacking the dungeon. Since the size of the troops themselves was small, it was good to mount a surprise attack that the other party never expected. However, it was a bad way to dominate the dungeon. Moreover, it carried a high risk because they had to send the elite troops into the dungeon where there might be an unknown danger and trap. In the worst case, the existence of the attackers would be put in jeopardy. Yongho experienced both the pros and cons of the second method as the attacker as well as the defender in the past. He did not mobilize many troops to attack the eastern area. It was Yongho himself and his six subordinate spirits that attacked Stravati's dungeon. Because of this, he did not lose a single spirit in the process of capturing Stravati's dungeon. At that time, he took the initiative to attack Stravati's dungeon, so he could minimize the damage to his troops. The King of Gluttony used the same method as his when he attacked the House of Mammon. However, the king suffered a great loss, contrary to Yongho. The ten warriors that he sent first were annihilated. Then he himself went out next only to lose his life. 
The reason that the king of gluttony moved in person was because he lost the ten warriors, his right-hand men and loyal bodyguards. When the king was killed in a battle, his territory was reduced to something like an empty shell. The two dungeon battles not only cost the king his life but also shook the foundation of his kingdom. Yong Ho was lost in thought while looking at the map of the demonic world that marked the territory of the king of gluttony. After thinking hard, Yong Ho made the conclusion. He could not use the first method, namely using the massive troops to attack the territory. Although Skull and his unit, as well as the Black Orc Squadron, which were the elite forces of the Mammon family, were powerful but numerically too few. He realigned the troops in the process of occupying the unclaimed area in the south, but the number of troops he could mobilize at the moment was less than 2,000. It was unreasonable and absurd for anyone to attack the north with these troops. Moreover, if he attacked the north with massive troops, it was highly likely that the absence of the king of gluttony would be exposed to the other kings too quickly. As it was always the case, he needed time. The later the news about the death of the king of gluttony became known, the better. And the less the other kings including the Queen of Fury held him in check, the better. Because of this, he had no other choice but to choose the second option, namely using the elite troops. He had to attack the dungeon by using the best elite troops. Although the king of gluttony was gone, the dungeons under the command of the late king could not be compared with the unclaimed land in the south. Moreover, it was better for him not to mobilize all his subordinate spirits to realize his bigger dream in the coming days. From his point of view, the attacker who would infiltrate the dungeon under the king of gluttony should not be the house of mammon. For him, a mysterious force with unknown identity would be the ideal attacker. If that was the solution, what should he do? What other troops should he use than his subordinate spirits to attack the dungeons under the command of the king of gluttony? Were there any available troops in the Mammon family? Of course, there were such troops. They certainly existed. Yong Ho expressed a small appreciation to the king of gluttony, who was like a tree that gave everything to him generously. That's fine with me, but why do you want this place? Said Gusayan with a sullen expression, the owner of the arena. Yong Ho responded by warming up slightly in the arena. It's strong here. It's good to fight. Right now, they are in the thick of farming in the Garden of Life. Gus Ion wanted to remind him that the Garden of Life was originally a place for ornamental plants, not for fight or farming, but he only sighed. He suddenly recalled Skat Hakka's letter in which she complained about the stench of fertilizers. I miss Skathka. You will see her soon. After answering readily, Yong Ho relaxed his shoulders. He took a deep breath and corrected his posture before looking at his subordinate spirits who stood in the arena like him. They were standing in a large circle with the center empty. Everyone, get ready. We're going to start right away. As soon as he spoke, each of his subordinate spirits took their position. Kaiwan giggled and let down her whip sword, and Catalina erected her tail stiff as if she got nervous. Ophelia and Eligos relaxed their ankles and wrists, respectively, and Tigrius gently swung his cane. Skull, the most important figure in carrying out Yong Ho's plan, announced that he was ready by laughing loudly. After checking the condition of his subordinate spirits, he looked back. He shouted at Gus Ion, who was sitting in the special stand at a distance. You can help me just in case, right? I don't think you need my help. Gus Ion was being sarcastic pleasantly. In fact, he was so glad to know that Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits grew up to the point that they did not need his help. Yong Ho caught his breath again. He bit his lips slightly, which became dry as he became tense, and licked them. He then closed his eyes and concentrated his consciousness. What he was trying to wake up was his desire for gluttony and the mana of the king of gluttony that he swallowed with the power of greed. His greed possessed everything that belonged to the late king. It was indeed a very greedy extortion. Yong Ho found out about one of them. He deceived one that he had found with the sin of gluttony and the mana of the king of gluttony. Yong Ho made himself mistaken for the king of gluttony then ordered that the door of space be opened. The contract formed by magic followed Yong Ho's command. By carrying out the contract, Yong Ho opened the door of the hidden space. When the space opened in front of Yong Ho, there appeared several beings with great power. Vampire lords, 
Death Knights, Elder Liches, Bone Dragons. Each one of them was the top undead who could overwhelm people with their names alone. The number of those spirits purchased by the King of Gluttony in a secret deal with the dungeon market for a battle with other kings was less than a dozen, but each one of them was already tantamount to an army of monsters. Yongho did not call out all of the undead in the space. He only summoned those monsters that the King of Gluttony had reserved to attack the House of Mammon. Although he intended to do so from the beginning, he could summon them successfully because he used the most recent records on their summoning. Five Vampire Lords and Eleven Death Knights Chapter, 230 Suddenly summoned, they were in a big confusion. Apparently, they appeared after being called by their master, the King of Gluttony, but the king was not seen anywhere. They looked at him all of a sudden because they could feel the late king's mana in him. When a spirit reached the level of a death knight, he would form his own ego and a fairly high level of intellectual ability, let alone the vampire lords, the ruler of blood. They were thinking while looking at him. The man they were looking at now was obviously the master of the house of mammon that their master, the king of gluttony, had ordered them to attack. If so, should they attack him now? Or should they wait and watch the situation a little more? But they didn't have to agonize. Yong Ho had no intention of giving them any time to make the choice from the beginning. His subordinate spirits released their mana at once. Just like those present at the auction house did, they ruthlessly released mana massively. The vampire lords and death knights became trapped in a storm of mana out of the blue. But that wasn't all. In addition to the storm of mana, there was one more thing that threatened and scared them. The death knights instinctively sensed it. The vampire lords looked back in great astonishment. Death was standing there. No life king, namely Skull that inherited the power of Baphomet, the incarnation of death. The undead who belonged to death felt fear of death before their eyes. The purple energy of death enveloped them. And the last shock struck the undead six towering horns on Yong Ho's head. Greed and gluttony released their powers at the same time. The godly energy of Mammon and that of Fury radiated the light at the same time. The undead couldn't properly control their bodies like those who forgot to breathe. They were overwhelmed by the powerful mana that closed in on them from all sides. The undead army originally prepared by the King of Gluttony. They were his subordinate spirits based on their mutual contact. So, no matter how much Yongho possessed the sin of gluttony and mana of the late king, it was impossible for him to perfectly control them. So, it was necessary for Yongho to renew the contract. As was the case with Salami in the past, he needed to make the contract radical and compulsory. All right. Let's move on from now on. He shook his head slightly from side to side. Each of his subordinate spirits also released the mana of gluttony and greed through their own brigada. Wycross, the Red Moon Knight and the head of the Vampire Lords, gulped for the first time since he became a Vampire Lord. Yong Ho approached him. While grabbing the flames of the Red Lotus from the air, he ordered, it's time for re-education. Shortly afterward, Wycross screamed for the first time since becoming a Vampire Lord. This is the mask you mentioned. As you requested, I made it in the shape of a dragon. Yong Ho nodded when he saw Bergrim's small blackboard. After congratulating Bergrim in satisfaction, he took the item Bergrim brought to Catalina and Kaiwan. After completing the true and correct re-education of the undead army, Yong Ho ordered his subordinate spirits to rest and headed to his room. He met Bergrim without waiting long. Bergrim, who always worked hard, finished the stuff in a short time that Yong Ho asked for. What Bergrim brought was a mask in the shape of a dragon's head. Since it was worn over the entire head, the mask was actually more like a helmet rather than a mask. Although the color was different, its basic shape was similar to the helmet of a silver dragon armor. While touching the metallic shiny mask, Yong Ho quickly wore it on his head. Just like Bergrim paid special attention to it, he didn't feel any stuffiness when he put it on. How do I look? It's awesome. Catalina clapped, flapping her tail. Seeing her ears flapping as always, he thought she was really impressed with the mask. It's great, isn't it? Yong Ho also liked it quite a bit, so he smiled happily and looked at Kaiwan this time. However, unlike Catalina, Kaiwan frowned and snapped, isn't it too childish? 
the color seems too red. More than anything else, you look like a child when you are happily smiling like that. Yong Ho snorted at her comment and said, I don't think you are not qualified to make such a comment as a woman yelling at me to be ready for punishment, wielding a whip sword every time we spar. Taiwan flinched at Yong Ho's point that hit the nail on the head. Nope, I didn't. Yong Ho didn't have to keep a straight face by narrowing his eyes because Catalina stopped fluttering her ears and tail and said seriously, Yes, you did. Yeah, I did, Kaiwan reluctantly agreed. When Yong Ho agreed with Catalina, Kaiwan had no choice but to admit it. With her face and neck turning red, she was at a loss about what to do. But he was not cruel enough to deal another blow to her. He took off the mask and touched it again and smiled. It shouldn't be the House of Mammon that would strike the King of Gluttony's territory. A mysterious force. The being who, wearing a red dragon mask, controlled the elite squad of the highest undead. Now, then, shall we get a kick out of it from now on? Master, do you know you look like a very bad villain right now? I like you better because you're a villain. I'm really excited to see the mask and attire that your subordinate spirit Kaiwan would be wearing. Lucia spoke to everyone loudly, and Kaiwan, who was blushing, flinched. On the other hand, Catalina laughed quietly. And the next day Yongho began to attack. Dungeons were like castles or fortresses in the human world. Inhabitants of the demon world built their houses around dungeons, and their villages and cities were also settled near the dungeons. Because of this, it was possible to hide the dungeon's internal facilities and scale, but it was almost impossible to hide the fact that the dungeon existed. The kings knew where the dungeons were located in the territory of another country, and they also knew the total number of dungeons very well, even if there was a slight error. There were a total of 56 dungeons and 40 masters or lords under the king of gluttony. Yong Ho could know it accurately because he took away everything from him. The 56 dungeons could be divided into four major sections. The center, which was directly ruled by the king, and the three regions bordering the territories of the king of violence, the king of pride, and the queen of fury. Most of Mammon's networks were lost, but there were still some left intact. There were a total of five doors of space in the territory of the King of Gluttony, so Yongho decided to use the door of space near the territory of the King of Violence. Yongho devised the plan very carefully. He decided on the order of attack after selecting the list of nearby dungeons from the door of the hidden space at the foot of the Rocky Mountain. His fight this time was different from his dungeon battles in the southern area. Those masters in charge of the dungeons in the territory of the King of Gluttony were united. So, when he decided to target any particular dungeon, it was not just the soldiers of the dungeon in question. If Yongho's forces dragged their feet on conquering the dungeon, it was certain that the king's reinforcement army would be dispatched from other dungeons. I feel like a bank robber. So, time attack was important. It would be only after Yongho's forces conquered at least four dungeons that their attack was noticed by the allies of the King of Gluttony. It was a bright moonlit night. Yong Ho, who passed through the door of space of the control room on the ninth floor, stood in front of a cave located deep in a lonely rocky mountain. The reason why the door of space could be maintained even after more than a thousand years was because it was so well hidden like this. Probably, the rest of the intact networks of Mammon were similarly located deep in the mountains where nobody could get access to. After breathing in the cold night air, he put on a red dragon's mask. The reason why he chose the Red Dragon was because of its association with the King of Violence. Of course, it was impossible for Yong Ho to divert all charges toward the King of Violence with just this small prop. It was too shallow to do that, and Yong Ho didn't even want to make an enemy of the King. All he needed was just a little bit of confusion. And this kind of trick was enough to cause such confusion. Yong Ho looked at his subordinate spirits who stood before him after passing the door of space one by one. He was accompanied by three for this operation. Skull, covered with silver armor, cried out excitedly. He was the king of the undead, which would be good as the incarnation of death, but he was a sacred knight now, wearing silver armor that completely covered his body. To conceal his identity, Skull wore a red and ornate cloak and held a sword and shield with colorful decorations instead of a hammer. Catalina wore silver armor like Skull to conceal the fact that she was a dark elf. 
Her tail, which clearly revealed her attitude, was wrapped around her waist so that it was not exposed outside. And the last member, Kai Wan said while frowning, I feel like playing a penalty game. You wear it like that usually, right? Kai Wan, dressed in a red leotard found in the armory on the fifth floor, kicked his shin, but he gently avoided it. After howling at him, she raised a whip instead of a whip sword. She swept up her hair dyed in gold then put on a dark red butterfly mask. It was a costume and mask that really suited her. Yong Ho checked the time. It was time for him to move slowly. Chapter 231 Yong Ho's target today was the dungeon located closest to the Rocky Mountain. Almost flying down the mountain, he ran toward the dungeon entrance without any hesitation. He heard the dungeon meerkats whimpering, but he lightly ignored it and smashed the dungeon entrance with the skills that he had earned from Gusion. The lights at the entrance to the dungeon that detected the intruder were turned off. The sound of the dungeon spirit's rushing steps was heard deep inside. Kaiwan threw a lighting fixture she had around her waist and drove out the darkness. At the same time, Yongho concentrated on his consciousness. He found the key with the power of gluttony and opened the door of space. Five vampire lords, headed by Wycross, lined up next to him. Ten death knights stood behind Skull, holding their own weapons. At Yongho's order, Wycross, who was reborn as his loyal bodyguard as a result of true re-education, summoned the squad-level skeletons and vampire lords. When he first invaded the dungeon, there were only four defenders inside it, but they numbered more than one hundred now. Yongho lightly clenched his fist. Instead of using Amun, he grabbed the sword he had picked from the armory and whispered to his subordinates, we're going to go the most direct route. His announcement was his order. The smoke of greed rose from all over his body. Skeletons and zombies generously threw themselves to dismantle the traps. Although hundreds of dungeon spirits at the gathering site were ready to defend in unison, they could hardly do nothing. The attack by the ten death knights, led by Skull, was a disaster for them. All the death knights were assigned to Skull's unit. Because of this, they could synchronize with Skull and show a much more brilliant performance than Yong Ho expected. The Death Knights could reach a higher level by sharing their battle experiences. Moreover, this time, Skull also benefited from them. The Death Knights' combat experience reinforced Skull further, and they further enhanced the combat power of his entire members. Faced with the Death Knights wielding their swords like one, the dungeon ministers collapsed like scarecrows. Yongho's greed also presented the correct path to conquering the dungeon. After smashing the resistance of non-living dungeon spirits such as living armors and golems, Yong Ho and his subordinates reached the heart of the dungeon in no time. Who the hell are you bastards? Kai Wan rushed toward the master of the dungeon shouting at her. She wasn't grabbing a whip sword as usual, but she had a whip in her hand instead. The black leather whip, which was faster and sharper than her usual whip sword, wrapped around his body quickly. As always, she shouted, lifting the master stuck at the tip of the whip high and said, it's time you got punished. She rolled her eyes. As expected, he was staring at her after stopping confronting Yong Ho and Catalina. She threw him down on the floor roughly then blushed inside her mask. After striking him down several times, she murmured as if she made excuses, I was just absorbed in my role. Instead of asking her what it was, Yong Ho just smiled at her. It seemed to be fun to bother Kaiwan a little more, but his priority was striking the dungeon first. Catalina took the essence of the dungeon master who collapsed on the floor after losing his consciousness. Yong Ho also went into the heart of the dungeon and extracted the essence of the dungeon. Since the dungeon's soul was already killed, there was no obstacle other than the dungeon shield. After extracting the essence of the dungeon radiating brightly, he gave them the next order because his target was not just the essence of the dungeon only. The smoke of greed led him to a new path according to his wishes. As soon as he reached the dungeon treasure storage, located not far from the heart of the dungeon. The vampire lord summoned new skeletons to have them collect the gold and other jewelry of the treasure storage and put them in the leather sacks prepared in advance. Once the leather sacks were full, Yong Ho sent the vampire lords and death knights back to the summoning room made by the late king of gluttony. The skeletons, each carrying one leather sack, followed their master, 
the vampire lords, so when Yong Ho was done with their reverse summoning, he was left behind with Skull, Catalina, and Kai Wan. The reinforcement units from other dungeons had not yet appeared. Yong Ho signaled to them with a glance to get out of the dungeon. The night was still long, and he had lots of work to do. There were still fifty-five dungeons left under the command of the King of Gluttony. While Yong Ho was in the thick of attacking the dungeons, Ophelia and Tigrius were busy reinforcing Caddis Fortress. It was clear that Yong Ho's guerrilla attack would contribute to collapsing the remaining forces of the King of Gluttony. It was no exaggeration to say that Yong Ho's attack would quicken the collapse of the king's forces by at least a month or more. That was why Yong Ho's subordinate spirits Ophelia and Tigrius would have to hurry up to prepare for their collapse. There was not much to worry about in the west, thanks to Embryo's destruction of the western area early on. The eastern area was now in a stable stage, and the southern area was long occupied by Yong Ho. Ophelia and Tigrius needed to raise up the army to conquer the territory of the King of Gluttony while reinforcing the defense of the northern part with Caddis Fortress as the center. Caddis Fortress today was more of a bridgehead for attack than an axis of defense. The demon world was a place where the strong prey upon the weak. The Queen of Fury was just an ally of Yong Ho's. She was an outsider to the House of Mammon. And it was the same case with the King of Violence whose intentions were never known to other kings. The strength of the Queen and her subordinate spirits, who could be called her swords, was enough to stand up to other kings. However, she didn't have enough forces to deter them. In some respect, this kind of turbulent times, coinciding with the collapse of the remaining forces of the King of Gluttony, gave the House of Mammon a golden opportunity to form the new forces. Yong Ho had to move fast enough to make the other kings feel that he made a surprise attack. The reason he chose to attack the dungeons close to the territories of the King of Violence or the Queen of Fury was because he wanted to reduce the dungeons that the two kings could occupy later. In that respect, Yong Ho's guerrilla attack was not just directed at the remaining forces of the King of Gluttony. In a broader context, it could be called a surprise attack against the King of Violence and the Queen of Fury. The House of Mammon was long buried in history after losing its glory in the past. Yong Ho's counterattack to restore his family's past glory was already well underway. On the surface, the current demonic world was relatively peaceful. Although the forces of the King of Pride and the King of Envy were continuing the war in the north every day, there was peace maintained in other regions, even though it was peace amid tension. But it was just peace on the surface. It wasn't just the House of Mammon that was preparing for the counterattack secretly. Other kings also continued to get ready for the war behind the scenes. The three masters who enjoyed the most power under the command of the King of Gluttony joined hands together and wrote a letter, and they urgently dispatched an envoy to the king to whom they would donate their country. Abrasax, who boasted of the strongest mana among the five directors of the dungeon market, once again met with the King of Pride. Originally, Oroba who had the strongest Herculean power was supposed to make a secret deal with the king, but neither Abrasax nor the king didn't think so. Bifrons, the most intelligent among the five directors, had a meeting with the king of lust. The king was supposed to request all the five directors if he wanted a secret deal, but he didn't this time. It was Bifrons who made the request to the king first. The king of lust wanted to reject the request, but he couldn't because Bifrons made the offer that he could not reject. Samuel, the fastest wing, discovered belatedly that one lich had disappeared from the warehouse where the dungeon market's defects were piled up. As the one who boasted of the best intelligence power among the five directors of the dungeon market, she could find out easily who took lich. She knew it was Citri who was responsible for this theft. It was no exaggeration to say that she, as the oldest member of the five directors, simply existed in the demon world for ages but she had been pretty active recently. And it was the new master of the House of Mammon that made her busy. Samuel remembered the warning Citri gave her at the special auction house. But still, she had no intention of stopping now. Yong Ho Chion, the new master of the House of Mammon. There was something mysterious about him, something not known at all to the demon world. Samuel pulled out a letter from the office desk drawer and opened it. It was a letter related to the last secret deal requested by the King of Gluttony. Those who could move history were preparing something on their own behind the scenes. 
and some of their activities had an organic relationship with each other. It was peaceful on the surface. It seemed as if the current peace would continue in the future. But it was different. Their movement behind the scene would soon become a big current and affect everything on the surface. The king of violence, returning to his own hideout place, belatedly read the letter from the queen of fury. In the letter, she said she formed an alliance with the house of Mammon and asked him what he would do in the coming days. What do you think of the master of the Mammon family, uncle? Do you feel he is a good person? I think he is. The new king of greed. The king of violence put down the letter. Instead of writing a reply, he watched over the world as the king of the greatest race of dragons. There was a gentle ripple above the water. Soon, it was clear that the current below the water would shake the whole demon world. This time, no matter how much you don't want to stay away from it, don't think you can avoid it. The king of violence recalled the queen of sloth. Since she had been secluded for a long time, she was forgotten in the demon world, but she was also inevitably involved. Her contract with the king of violence himself proved it. The giant red dragon, the king of violence, established himself in the place where he was supposed to be after decades of absence. He closed his eyes comfortably. Past events that provoked his doubts were almost sorted out in his mind. Now it was the future events that sparked his curiosity. The king wanted to take a nap. As an observer of the world, he was waiting for the era of turbulent times in the near future. Chapter, 232 Gusayan had a dream. It was a dream that he could definitely call a nightmare. He, who woke up from his dream, breathed out wildly. A cold sweat broke out all over his red body. Too much time had passed. It was a very long time that he could not feel even in the arena where he could hardly feel the passage of time properly. Gus Ion closed his eyes again. He could not dream any more though. However, the scenes that he saw in his dream and the fragments of his old memories came to his mind vividly. It was definitely a nightmare. But at the same time, it was a yearning dream. It could be called his good old memories. There were so many people he couldn't meet unless they didn't appear in his dream. At first, he was angry. He was frustrated, and finally, he conceded that he could not reverse all of these things. Maybe he might have been tired of overwhelming time. But he was not impatient. He calmed down his troubled mind. He tried to understand what Mammon wanted. Naturally, he recalled the successor of the King of Greed, Mammon. He smiled before he knew it. Just thinking about him made him feel a lot better. Gus Ion opened his eyes again and looked into the darkness. He took a deep breath in the cold air floating in the arena and stood up. He would witness it quite soon. He would decide sooner or later. Master. He called the name quietly. He didn't hear the master's reply. He woke up from his memories to face a reality where the king did not exist. One month and fifteen days have passed since Yong Ho mounted a guerrilla attack on the King of Gluttony's territory. He attacked seven more dungeons during that period. Almost all of them were dungeons located in the western part of the King's territory. Lucia, who fully absorbed the essence of the dungeons, grew up rapidly and succeeded in taking complete control of the eighth and ninth floors despite skipping the seventh floor. In addition, Yong Ho could refill Mammon's treasure storage with the gold and other jewelry he collected from the seven dungeons. Of course, the treasure storage almost looked the same as before. In fact, there was no sign of the treasures decreasing even when he took a huge amount of gold to buy the red titan dragon, Tiamat. Indeed, it was a huge treasure storage befitting the king of greed. Ophelia and Tigrius developed Cadis Fortress well. It was no exaggeration to say that money ruled the world. The more money they spent, the more concrete results they got fast. One month and a half were never short. The long silence of the king of gluttony was enough to make other kings have doubts about his whereabouts. Yong Ho's guerrilla attack spread little by little to the territory of the king of gluttony and other territories. Because of this, Yong Ho temporarily loosened the reins in the attack. It was enough for him to watch how the other kings reacted before he made his next move. Time was on the side of the Mammon family. Yong Ho never wasted time. In order to make the best of the time for the Mammon family, he had to spend it well and efficiently. 
he attacked the arena with his subordinate spirits. He embodied the new power he gained through actual battles. And there was one more thing he should not miss. The door of the tenth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed is opened. Which of the twelve spirits is waiting for you this time? Pit-a-pat pit-a-pat. Yong Ho shook his head at Lucia's charming briefing. There were only two of Mammon's twelve spirits that he had to beat. Since the two won in many battles with brilliant records, Yong Ho could find out all the detailed information about them quite a bit just by browsing through a few books. It was Ares Yuscha, who defended the Grand Library of Mammon on the tenth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. Nicknamed the Navigator, she was both the king's advisor and a prophet. Master, the Grand Library is a treasure of knowledge. It is no exaggeration to say that it contains all the knowledge of this world. Yuscha's wisdom will also help you a lot. As always, Amun's advice was universally sound. However, it was still a library anyway. It could not be denied that Yong Ho was more interested in the various living facilities on the eleventh floor than the library on the tenth. Moreover, it was none other than Virgo that guarded the eleventh floor. The eleventh floor was filled with various personal spaces including the rooms of twelve spirits. Guarding the eleventh floor was Virgo Yuno, the last member of the twelve spirits. According to many legends, there were many episodes about her beauty, so it was natural that Yong Ho was interested in her as a man. Of course, it's just my curiosity, nothing more or less. Murmuring to himself like that, he looked at Catalina, who was sitting next to him. She tilted her head and fluttered her tail as if she was curious about his unexpected glance. Just like the tenth floor suggested, it was full of powerful dungeon monsters. In addition to the Nightshade, also called the Prince of Darkness, spiritual monsters with dark attributes such as Spectre and Race were waiting for Yong Ho and his party. It was difficult for Yong Ho to deal with dark properties, especially spiritual monsters, among various dungeon monsters. It was because Yong Ho could attack them physically, and the unique energy of the dark attributes poisoned the living. However, Yong Ho already possessed not only darkness but also the attribute of light. His subordinate spirits received the mana of the light attribute from Yong Ho through Brigada, and as always, they attacked the tenth floor fiercely. This is the entrance to the main library. It's been a long time since I came here. Amun whispered in front of the steel door with the embossed head of the sheep. There was a deep yearning in his voice. Skull and Elegos opened the steel door at Yong Ho's order. The peculiar smell of paper came out from inside the door. At the same time, Yong Ho found himself amazed at the size of the library. It was huge. It looked like it was as large as the treasure house in terms of size. The ceiling was high enough to fit five floors. It was very large on the side, let alone its depth. It had only a few pillars with no separate walls, so the vastness of the library caught his eye immediately. It was no exaggeration to say that books were everywhere. It was as if even people who didn't like books felt like reading books, enchanted by the atmosphere. In that respect, it was absolutely true that Amun said that the library contained all the knowledge of the world. Kayin would have loved it here. Kaiwan recalled her younger brother before she knew it. So, she quickly changed her expression after clenching her teeth. Fortunately, no one noticed her because others were distracted by the massive library, except for only one. Haven't you ever seen a library? You don't see me. An old woman shouted at her. Only then could all of them, who were hooked on the huge library, fix their eyes on somebody right before their eyes. Although nobody was right before their eyes, there was clearly a skinny and tall old woman sitting in the seat reserved for a librarian about ten meters away from them. Yuscha. Amun raised his voice first. When the flames of the red lotus arose in the air, a smile was on her face, who looked like a dry old tree. Amun. You still look as great as you were a long time ago. She was wearing a black dress that covered her body up to the neck. A pair of sheep's horns stood on her neatly curled gray hair, and light emerald pupils were shining below it. Old woman Yuscha, the king's advisor and a prophet. Perhaps, because of her upright posture or because of her peculiar disposition, she gave out an air of confidence when she spoke or acted. I'm Yuscha, a librarian in charge of the Grand Library. As you can see, I'm a lonely old woman. 
understand me when I speak to you curtly. I'm the oldest among the twelve spirits of Mammon. Man, I've lived longer than Amun. At that moment, Yong Ho recalled a notorious cursing old woman he had seen on TV in the human world several times. Of course, Yuscha didn't use any abusive language. Yong Ho stepped forward and introduced himself, I'm Yong Ho Chion, the current master of the Mammon family. You're great. You don't look like a mere successor. Nice to see you anyway. Since you're the legitimate successor, I can't say anything short. Please understand me if my tone is a little messy. She laughed heartily then turned her eyes at the flames of the red lotus instead of talking to him. She asked Amun, Amun, how much time has passed? I don't know because I was asleep while the door was closed. One thousand and hundreds of years have passed. She closed her eyes at his reply. One thousand years was never short even for her who had already lived such a long time. Much more time has passed than I expected. Too much time has passed. But it's not all bad. The passage of time must have devoured the traitors. It might be much better for guys like Gus Ion. She spoke eloquently. Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits focused on some of her words. Traitors who must have been devoured by the passage of time. That turned out better for Gus Ion. It was obvious that her mention was related to Mammon's death. Yong Ho opened his mouth, Yuscha opened her eyes. She looked straight at Yong Ho and said, Hear it from Gus Ion, not me. It would be best for Gus Ion to tell the story of Master Mammon to you. She wasn't strict. Rather, it was more like the kind of advice that a grandmother gave to her grandchildren. She shrugged again and said, But the order is in a mess. You came up to the tenth floor, but you have yet to conquer the seventh floor. Yuscha, you know the arena well, don't you? When Amun replied indirectly, she frowned. Then she hysterically said, I wonder if the previous masters of the Mammon family have been piled up in the arena over the last thousand years. He didn't have to reply. Amun just ignited the flames of the Red Lotus, and Yong Ho made an awkward expression. Yuscha said with a sigh, Oh my God! Dang it, Gus Ion. I knew that that damned arena would devour the Mammon family. The lineage of the Mammon family has been carried on for over a thousand years even when its masters were caught in the arena one by one. But I can't say that this is also bad. That means the accumulation of power in the arena is tremendous. Chapter 233 She was no more fussy and cold-hearted. Yongho even felt she was a pleasant woman. Oh, I think I talked about useless things too long. An old woman like me shouldn't take away our prince's time anymore. Come here. Let me hand over my power. Yuscha suddenly beckoned to him. Surprised more by what she just said than her calling him a prince, he asked instinctively, May I ask if you have any test? Since she looked like an old woman, he used honorific language before he knew it. Besides, he recalled his grandmother he had seen in the human world only a few times. Yuscha clicked her tongue then said, Nope. As a prince, you have only greed but also gluttony, let alone half of the twelve spirits of the House of Mammon. Besides, you were formally recognized by that fastidious old man Magnadon. What more tests do I need to give you now? Tests are just cumbersome stuff to me. Come over here quickly. Let me hand over my power to you right now. She just wanted to get it done quickly. Kaiwan and the other subordinate spirits were all smiles. When he sat right in front of the desk, Yuscha signaled to him with a glance to reach out. He held out his right hand without hesitation. She overlapped her dry and wrinkled hand on his right hand then said slowly, My power is patience. Doesn't it perfectly suit an old woman like me? He smiled awkwardly at her instead of replying. Instead of putting him on the spot, she injected her power into him. A subtle gray color had been added to the magic field on his left arm. Don't worry too much because you are going to make Gus Eye on your subordinate spirit then scat hack. Of course, you have to make Richard your subordinate spirit. I think I can join them lastly. She laughed then let go of his hand. Then she opened the desk drawer one after another and pulled out a thick stack of cards. I feel sad if I have to leave after just handing over my power to you. I'm not a heartless woman. 
As you know already, my nickname is the Navigator as well as the King's Prophet. Of course, in a world with so many possibilities, you can hardly make a prophecy. Identifying the big trend comes from insights based on information. She moved the cards busily in her hand. The cards looked like tarot cards, given the way she mixed them. But using these cards can also help us prepare for the future. Isn't it better to rely on the small starlight to find the way rather than drifting in the vast sea? With a warm smile, Yuscha put a well-mixed stack of cards on the desk. Just like before, she looked into Yongho's eyes and said, Then let me read the fortune for your love the eternal subject of interest for the young people. How about it? Well, as for my love horoscope. He tried to ask her for another horoscope because he heard Catalina flapping her ears and tail. But even before he finished, Kaiwan cut in. I hope he's in your great hands. Yongho looked at Kaiwan, but she looked at Yuscha only. Okay, then let me take a look at our prince's love horoscope. Speaking like an actor, she drew a card from the stack of cards and laid it on the desk. Not only Catalina and Ophelia, but all the subordinate spirits gathered around the desk and looked at her fingertips. Right at that moment, Kaiwan asked in a rather sharp voice, Wait a moment. Why are you drawing three cards? Yuscha laughed insidiously, and Kaiwan and Catalina looked at Yongho at the same time. He raised his hands to show his palms to prove his innocence. Now, then I'll turn the cards over. While they were rolling their eyes sharply, Yuscha turned over one of the cards. Everyone turned their eyes at the card again. How about writing a letter to him first? Kurtamuka said, wearing the shawl she received from the Queen of Fury for the seventh time this month. Her master, the Queen, who was like her younger sister and daughter, stopped moving her fingers for a moment. But she soon resumed sewing. It seemed like she wanted Kurtamuka to support her with more specific action. Kurtamuka covered her mouth with her hand because she could not hold back her laughter at the Queen of Fury acting cute. About two months had passed since the alliance between the Queen and the House of Mammon was made. During that period, there were no exchanges between the Queen and the Master of the Mammon family. In some way, that was natural because there was no reason for them to communicate with each other on a daily basis just because they were allies. Rather, frequent exchanges between them would be a red light. It was common that there were few exchanges between allies unless there was a war involving one of them, which was widely accepted not only in the demon world but also in the alien world. Nonetheless, the Queen of Fury was nervous and impatient. At least in Kurtamuka's eyes, she seemed so. Otherwise, she would not have shown such an eccentric behavior as making dozens of clothes in two months. Kurtamuka stopped smiling and looked seriously at the Queen. As the head of Gondarv, she was young. Just because she was born with the power of sin, she ascended to the position of queen representing not only Gondarv but also the entire eight clan people. But from the perspective of Gondarv who lived for hundreds of years, she was still only a young girl. Kurtamuka wished for the queen's happiness. That was why she stopped cracking a joke like she did in the first place and considered her marriage quite seriously. It seemed that the master of the Mammon family had several women who looked like his lovers, but this was not a big problem. Each head of a lord's house was said to be the king of a small kingdom. It was very important for them to continue their family lineage, so it was common in the demon world that the master maintained polygamy or monogamous marriages. Particularly, the eight clan people decreased in the process of escaping from the northern area, so it was common to allow any form of marriage as long as they could produce many offspring. Dhritarashtra was a queen with the sin of fury. Moreover, she led the people consisting of eight clans. It was no exaggeration to say that it was a fait accompli for the queen of fury to become the official wife of the master of the house of Mammon the moment they married. The marriage of the two was not just a union between a man and a woman, but a union between the eight clans and the Mammon family. Although it might sound repugnant, their union could be described as a political marriage. Moreover, it would be a marriage between the queen and the master of a prestigious house. Ideally, the house of Mammon would be absorbed into the queen's eight clans, which would not go against the common sense of the demon world. Kurtamuka didn't mention this kind of formality at all because she didn't want to offend the queen's thrill of first love, though it came to her belatedly. It would be okay for you to convey your best wishes to him in a simple letter. 
since you have formed an alliance with him only recently, you might want to exchange gifts that would promote your friendship with him. The queen pricked her ears at her suggestion. Kritamuka waited, and the queen slowly raised her head and moved her hands. She said after pretending otherwise, hmm. Promoting friendship. Yes, promoting friendship is necessary. Kritamuka cheered her up again. The queen opened her lips slightly. Then she said reluctantly as if she could not help it because of Kritamuka's repeated recommendation, then shall I do that? Kritamuka nodded happily. However, another one cut in at that moment. I am opposed to that. I don't think it would be nice for you to show him that you are impatient. When you are pulling hard to get, timing is very important, said Gardamundi. She flew through the open window into the queen's room. Kritamuka tried to complain about her intruding into the room without passing through the main door, but the queen acted first. Standing up quickly, the queen was no more a laughing girl but the ruler of the eight clans. She looked at Gardamundi because she was holding a small red box in her hand. Instead of arguing with Kritamuka, Gardamundi approached the queen and knelt. She handed over the red box to the queen. The reply from the king of violence has finally arrived. The box made of a red dragon scales meant the letter was written by the king of violence himself. The queen took a deep breath after receiving the box. She was tense and nervous before she knew it because she received his reply in about three months. Kurtamuka, who overreacted when it came to the king of violence, waited for the queen to read the letter, with her face stiffening like the queen. Gardamundi was also tense now, though she was in a jolly mood at first. The Queen of Fury took the letter out of the box and opened it. The voice of the King of Violence came out of the letter cast with a spell. My decision to move the Dragon Corps was to keep the King of Gluttony in check. I never intended to threaten you, so don't worry about it. The Dragon Corps will stick to their current position. Unless they are attacked, they will never attack first. So, keep this in mind. I heard rumors about the Master of the Mammon family. I think he is more than qualified to be the target of your alliance. It would be nice if we could build a sincere relationship with him. The queen smiled at the king's brief comment because she liked not only his viewpoint of Yong Ho and the reason why he moved his troops. The king of violence was not an enemy to the queen. He was an ally. That fact alone could relieve the queen. Kritamuka openly breathed a sigh of relief. Although she feared the king of violence and watched out for him, she still trusted him. She couldn't even imagine that the great dragon would act foolishly enough to deceive his master with a fake letter. But Gardamundi was still tense because the king of violence continued. Dhritarashtra, queen of fury. If you have truly made an alliance with the Mammon family, and if you intend to maintain that alliance, move more actively. Don't just be content with forming an alliance, but use the power of the alliance. If you can, use me in the Dragon Legion. The choice is yours, as always. I'll watch your choices, as always. That was the end of the letter. The Queen of Fury put the letter back in the box and flopped down on the seat she was sitting. Chapter, 234 There were some other things in the second half of the letter. The Queen of Fury was by no means a fool. By inferring from the King of Violence's comment that she could use the alliance actively, she immediately understood what the king proposed or what kind of advice he offered. The King of Pride and the King of Envy are at war. Because of this, they won't be able to concern themselves with what's going on in the south, said Gardamundi. Kritamuka opened her eyes wide after grasping the true meaning of their conversation in the end. Are you going to join hands with the Mammon family and attack the King of Gluttony? The queen did not answer. She thought of the alliance for defense, not for an attack. Gardamundi said again, the king of lust did not intervene in the war between the king of pride and the king of envy. It's highly likely that he would remain an onlooker this time again. The current turmoil could be an opportunity for us, too. Her analysis made sense. The king of violence's dragon legion itself was a threat to the king of gluttony. If the Mammon troops and the Queen's army were marching into his territory from the south and the west respectively, the King of Gluttony had no choice but to divide his army into three. The Queen could devise such a plan because the power of the House of Mammon was much more mighty than she thought. Although her plan was quite up in the air, 
she could win the war if she made the decision to act. But that would be the first strike on her part. In other words, the Queen of Fury would start a war, something she had never thought of. Of course, it was not the first time the Queen conceived of such a plan. Although she didn't reveal it to anybody else, she considered it many times from the moment she thought about forming an alliance with the Mammon family. Besides, some of the heads of her eight clans secretly asked her to take the lead in the attack. Your Majesty took the lead in every battle because you wanted to minimize the damage on both sides. Gardamundi approached the Queen and knelt on the floor to talk to her at her eye level. It's not different. It's based on the same logic. It is clear that if you save the King of Gluttony, you will bring about a great disaster someday. At a time when the North is in turmoil, we have to stabilize the South. If you succeed, the King of Pride won't dare to invade the South even if he beat the King of Envy and took everything from him. The Queen closed her eyes. She knew what Gardamundi was talking about. Her point was reasonable and attractive. But this would mean the start of a war. She could not make the decision to start a war by exchanging a few words with her close aides, nor she should not. Gardamundi. Yes, your majesty. Please ask the master of the Mammon family for a secret meeting. I want the meeting in fifteen days. It would be nice if I meet him at the same place as the last one. There was no excitement or thrill on her face anymore. Gardamundi felt heartbroken about it but nodded. Politely bowing to her, Gardamundi stood up. She threw herself out of the window and flew away. Kurtamukha. Kurtamukha flinched at her calling. The queen caught her breath again. She recalled her eight clans who were on standby all the time, preparing for a possible war with the king of pride because of the turbulence he brought about. The queen said with a sigh, please summon the heads of the eight clans. She didn't make the decision yet. She had to hear their opinions first. Kurtamukha left the room. The Queen of Fury looked down at the clothes she stopped sewing and closed her eyes instead of holding the needle. She tried to regain her composure in the darkness. Now, calm down and listen. It would be a lot of fun if you can guess who the woman this first card symbolizes. After telling them gently, Yustya removed the hand that was covering the card. On the card was a picture of a knight standing with his back in the twilight. These cards that symbolize. Yustya drew several cards in succession and laid them out on the desk. She presented three cards again. Oh my god! It's been a while since I saw this kind of card. Catalina and Kai Wan looked tense. In particular, Catalina, who thought of Shadow, in the night standing with his back in the twilight, gulped because she thought it was her card. Yustya said, let me give it to you straight instead of beating around the bush like the fortune teller who thinks of it as his own monopoly. The owner of this card was born under the star of a pushover. Besides, she is under the protection of a drunken dragon. Nobody could deny it's a useless pushover. There was one among Mammon's twelve spirits who was born with this fate. Are you referring to Alun? Kaiwan immediately asked. Catalina covered her face with both hands, about to cry. Yustya giggled at her and continued, that's not necessarily bad. The one who is protected by the drunk dragon is unlikely to die, even though she will suffer from distress and sadness. I would say she is very resistant to bad luck. Is it good for her? Catalina asked with her ears drooping. She seemed to ask Yustya why she was teasing her. Yustya chuckled once more and explained about the rest of the cards. This woman is showing her faithful love to the prince more than anyone else. If you can guess who she is, you had better be nice to her. Having said that, Yustya glanced at Yong Ho, and Catalina flapped her tail. Here is the second card. Queen. Everyone's eyes focused on Kai Wan when the woman on the card was standing with a whip. Kai Wan thought the woman on the card was her, but she was embarrassed because of the straightforward description of her figure. Oh my. Why? Kai Wan asked hurriedly because Yustya's expression was not bright. Shaking her head violently, Yustya said, grinning at her, I don't know who she is, but she has a crush on our prince. She is deeply loving him. She pretends to be arrogant and lofty, but she is like a very dedicated and obedient angel to the prince. Everyone turned their eyes at Kaiwan again. She blushed. 
Oh, that's not true. She retorted. They responded with a gentle smile when she tried in vain to deny it. At last, she pinched Yongho's waist for help. Now, then let's look at the third card lastly. I see this one on the card resembling our prince. Catalina and Kai Wan, who were suffering from embarrassment, looked at the card sharply. Even Yongho looked at the third card, pretty much tense this time. He could not figure out who the one on the card was. Yuscha quickly flipped the card over and placed new cards from the stack of cards in succession. She immediately interpreted without having them wait for her reply. It's a pure virgin. Ha ha, this girl is also born with the star of a pushover. She is also protected by a drunken dragon, but she seems to be a good friend of the first woman. In other words, the two sympathize with each other. Catalina blinked, and Kai Wan looked at Yong Ho. However, Yong Ho was tilting his head. Even if this woman matches the keywords of a virgin and a pushover, he could not figure out who she was. She is just a possibility at this point. As I said at the beginning, it is impossible to make absolute prophecy in a world where there are so many possibilities. Yuscha cleared all the cards at once then leaned her skinny figure against the back of her chair. She turned to Yong Ho and said, I'm tired because I am talking too much after a long time. Prince, can I stop here and see you later? Yong Ho obtained the power of patience with her formal recognition. Since Lucia was still too weak to take over the Grand Library, he did not have much more to do here. Take good rest then. Thank you, Prince. Ophelia and Tigrius showed interest in the library's collections, but they could do it some other day. The two left the library with regret, not to mention Eligos and Skull. Yong Ho, who looked around the library once more, was about to turn when Yuscha whispered to him, No one can predict when the storm will blow. But I don't think it's good for you to put off making Gus eye on your subordinate spirit too long. The Mammon family needs more power to confront the storm. Yong Ho nodded. After bowing to her politely, he left the main library. It wasn't just because of Yuscha's advice. For the past one month and forty-five days, he always stayed in the arena except when he attacked the dungeons of the King of Gluttony. It was time for him to keep the promise he had made to Skathak. The night had passed and the morning drew on. He headed to the arena and faced Gus Ion. Time passed fairly everywhere. When the sun set and rose, another day began for everyone as always. A war was going on in the north. The forces of the King of Pride and the King of Envy were engaged in a fierce battle every day. Outsiders criticized this battle as a boring protracted war to avoid the final showdown, which was undeniable. However, from the standpoint of those involved in the fighting, it was never a boring protracted war. When the fighting began, people died and got injured. It was true that the forces of the King of Pride won a series of battles, but that did not mean they had no casualties. A considerable number of dungeon spirits of the King of Pride were killed in action. It was definitely the same day as always. However, when the confrontation in the morning was over, the King of Pride issued a new order. Like he did fifteen days ago, the King advanced some of his troops to attack the dungeons belonging to the King of Envy. Fighting broke out both inside and outside the dungeons. The fighting was so fierce that they wanted to behead those who ridiculed the war as a protracted confrontation. Although both sides sent only a fifteenth of their total forces, that was the only military strength that those directly engaged in the fighting could turn to. Each of their lives was at stake. Yaksini, one of the dungeon spirits, barely breathed, falling on the ground. Covered with blood, sweat, and tears, she could not see anything before her eyes. Shouts and screams coming from everywhere deafened her ears. Yaksini was from the clan of Yiksha, one of the eight clans under the command of the Queen of Fury. Just like her clan was treated so in the north, she was a slave. She foamed at the mouth. She found it hard even to breathe now. She felt extreme pain in her left arm then she had no feeling in it soon. Only the pain she felt when her bones and flesh were crushed tormented her. Screaming was continuing everywhere. Yaksini felt a strange silence amid the miserable screaming and angry shouting. Maybe this was the peculiar sensation she felt at the moment of death. Chapter 235 Fortunately, she didn't feel anything like a kaleidoscope. 
Living as a slave in the North was a continuation of misery. She didn't want to suffer in the past until the moment she was dying. Today was different from yesterday. Yaksini felt it. It was not limited to her as an individual. It was sort of some intuition, something like the unique superpower of a member of her clan who was awakened to it right before she died. Yaksini tried to open her eyes. The tears that ran down her cheeks washed away the impurities around her eyes. She couldn't even rub her eyes. She barely opened her eyes and looked at the sky. As if they were outsiders watching the war in the north, the sunlight was pouring out so hotly. Blood splattered around her again. Something big and heavy fell down with a thumping sound, and the battle around her gradually moved to another location little by little. It was because the tide of the war was decisively in favor of one warring country. It looked like the pattern of repeated fighting over the past few months. However, Yaksini felt something definitely different this time. It was funny. She was now on the verge of death after being dragged onto the battlefield as a mere slave what she felt different from yesterday was meaningless to her, despite the reverse of the tide of the war. However, Yaksini stared into the sky desperately as if she had a fever. The flying vehicles and giant flying spirits that she wished she could ride one day made a huge shadow over her head, making everything around her dark. She realized something in that darkness. She now understood what was different. Today was clearly different from yesterday. It was clear that tomorrow would be more different. The Queen of Fury stared straight ahead with her face stiffened. She was not in Vimana, her home and fortress. Standing in a temple located in the center of her territory, she was waiting for the heads of her eight clans. The temple was circular and it had eight pillars. The Queen of Fury was the head of the eight clans, but she was different here in this temple. She was not recognized as the queen, but only as the head of the Dridarashtragandharv, one of the eight clans. Because of this, she was equal to the heads of the other seven clans. She never reigned over them nor was she trampled from below. Dridarashtra felt a strange sensation. It was too ominous for her to blame it for her being nervous. Kurtamukha and Gardamundi, who always took care of her, were not here. It was only the heads of the eight clans who could stand here, where they would determine the future of their people. Dridarastra clenched her fist and pulled herself together. She felt a bit relaxed when she recalled the face of the master of the Mammon family, just like Kurtamukha advised, although she blushed as a side effect. A fresh wind blew. It was the wind caused by Biryabaka, the head of the Garura clan and Gardamundi's father, while he was descending from the sky. The tall, red-haired and bearded Biryabaka bowed to Dridarastra, who also returned his greetings by lowering her head. As if he was heralding the arrival of other heads, they began to appear one after another in the temple. Deva, Dragon, Yiksha, Gandharv, Azura, Garura, Kalavinka, Maharaga. It had been a long time since the heads of the eight clans gathered in one place. Moreover, this was not a meeting where the Queen of Fury and the heads of their own clans attended. She came here as the head of the Gandharv clan, not as the Queen of Fury, which was very significant. As the head of the Gondarv clan, I would like to make a proposal to you, head of your own clans. She slowly opened her mouth. Her cold and calm voice was different from her usual affectionate voice, or her harsh voice resonating on the battlefield. The heads of the eight clans already knew why she called for the meeting at the temple. They listened to her, according to the tradition. The meeting went smoothly. However, while chairing the meeting, she suddenly looked up at the sky before she knew it. Something was different. She couldn't figure out what it was exactly, but she felt it was different. She struggled to suppress her anxiety. She continued to talk in front of them. She proposed they would attack the territory of the King of Gluttony. Citri raised her head. It seems that she took a nap before she knew it. The cat wagon flying through the sky already landed on the ground. The carriages of the five other directors lined up on the roof of the main store of the dungeon market, located in the center of the demon world. It took some time for Citri to wake up from her memories. She looked at the other wagons with her half-closed eyes. They were four, all told. Apparently, all but Citri herself already arrived. She wasn't late for the appointment. There was still a little more time left before they could see face to face at the meeting, 
which was not a meeting in a virtual space. It was unusual for the five directors to actually get together in one place. But it was already the third time they met this year, which meant that the demon world was in turmoil. Citri once again gently closed and opened her eyes. Finally, she woke up from her memories and looked at the present. She swallowed the cold air at the main store of the dungeon market, which was shrouded in darkness night and day, although it was close to the sky. She felt wistful at the moment. She stood up from the carriage, frowning her eyebrows slightly. The reason they called the meeting today was because of the agenda of the King of Gluttony. As someone who had been more enthusiastic about a secret deal than any other king, the King of Gluttony not only broke the secret deal unilaterally but also he was not seen for more than two months. As for the simple seclusion, the Queen of Sloth and the King of Lust secluded themselves for a long time, which was nothing new to the five directors. Moreover, unlike the King of Lust, the Queen of Sloth could not exert a great influence on the demon world because she did not have any big power. The King of Gluttony had been very active before he was missing. Whatever the reason, his disappearance could have a great impact on the entire demon world. Of course, Citri already knew why the King of Gluttony suddenly disappeared. But she had no intention of commenting on it at all. Just like she did, as always, she would retire when the time came. As one of the founders and the longest-serving directors of the dungeon market, she was content with her current role. While walking through the corridor heading deep into the building, Citri recalled Yongho. A smile was on her face before she knew it. He looked like Mammon, but at the same time, he was different. She loved him for that all the more because that little difference proved that Yongho was Mammon's child and that he was his true successor. Nobody knew it except for Citri herself, but it was Mammon who drafted the plan on the dungeon market. As a true king, he envisioned the dungeon market for the revival of the whole demon world. It was because of Mammon's wish that the dungeon market supplied food at a low price while giving up big profits. Mammon had devised lots of more things. The current dungeon market was somewhat different from what Mammon originally had devised. But Citri wasn't greedy. Although she was the longest member, she was only one of the five directors. Maintaining the current food supply policy of the dungeon market was in her best interests. In return for that, she retired from her active role. It was because she was exhausted, but the biggest reason was because she wanted to keep the food supply policy in return for giving up her authority and influence, and she did. She passed the long corridor and reached the conference room. Other directors were already seated at the circular table that was identical to the virtual space. Oroba, the strongest power. Bifrons, the most intelligent. Abraxas, the strongest mana. Samuel, the fastest wing. Oroba greeted Citri with a glance. At first glance, it might seem an amorous glance, but Citri knew he didn't mean it. He was the oldest director after her. Bifrons was seated with his eight eyes closed. He seemed to have sensed that Citri arrived, but he didn't move at all. As always, Abraxas sat weirdly and fiddled with strangely shaped toys. After saying hello to Citri with an insidious smile, he focused on the toys again. How are you? Samuel greeted her with a gentle smile. She forgot what happened at the last special auction house. Because of this, Citri responded with a bright smile. Citri sat in the only empty seat at the table and greeted other directors. Bifrons opened his eyes. Abraxas was giggling after putting the toys back into his bag, and Oroba greeted Citri again. Samuel hid his deep feelings with a gentle smile. Citri buried herself in the chair and drooped her shoulders. It was the same meeting, as always. But somehow she felt different this time. Bifrons opened his mouth and proclaimed the beginning of the meeting. The arena was quiet. It seemed as if the cold air blocked all the sounds of the world. Catalina flapped her long ears and looked at the stand. In addition to the previous masters of the House of Mammon, there were many other people gathered. All the arena spirits also gathered in one place. Kaiwan laughed bitterly. Ophelia shuddered lightly, and Eligos swallowed. Tigrius fixed his eyes far away. Skull stopped walking. He watched Yongho stepping forward alone without stopping. He crossed the stand and stood in the arena. He looked at the man on the other side. 
did you know it's today? Because I lived long enough, I had something like a premonition. Gus Ion laughed brightly. He was wearing a leather combat suit instead of his usual black suit. Red heat was arising from the black gauntlet that he wore on his fists. You're the first to challenge me on the top floor. It was really long. It had been over a thousand years. Finally, the King of Greed had returned. Yong Ho was the successor who inherited all that Mammon had longed for so much. Gus Ion spat out the cigarette in his mouth. He said, grinning like a child, let me tell you in advance. I'm not going to give you a break. Even if I am defeated and become an arena spirit, I won't regret it. Yong Ho also smiled at his provocative declaration. He laughed heartily and wore the silver dragon armor. Grasping the air, he got the flames of the red lotus. Then he released the sins of greed and gluttony. Six towering horns on his head. They were clearly the power of the king. Yong Ho was on par with the six kings who ruled the demon world. Gus Ion admitted it calmly. Then Gus Ion released all the power available to him, even though it was less than that during his heyday. Six horns arose above his head. Gus Ion had Herculean power. He possessed the strongest short-range attack power among Mammon's twelve spirits. Except for Amon, virtually, Mammon's alter ego, he was the strongest among them. He was a legend and a living myth. Come on, you who challenges me, the king of the arena. Yong Ho saw him and did not delay any more. He rushed, creating the flames of angry greed. Gus Ion was the king of the arena. At last, the two titans clashed. Chapter, 236 The weight of years was heavy. It was never easy even for those mighty beings who lived for more than a thousand years to remember the things of the distant past. It was even hard for them to count the number of their past events. Thousands and tens of thousands of days were blocking the gap between now and the past. But Gus Ion remembered it. He could vividly recall what had happened more than a thousand years and an even more distant past than the day King Mammon died, as if it were yesterday. He watched the king from behind. The king's back view. He once decided to follow him. He was immature in those days. Master. My lord. My king. Gus Ion looked at the present, not the past. At that moment, he saw a man rushing toward him in an eternity of moments that had been split every second. The successor of the king and the man who resembled the king but looked different. Gus Ion clenched his fist. With a hearty laugh, he moved on fast. He focused on the present with the time that started flowing again. He clashed with Yong Ho. There was a big roar when they clashed. The time he climbed the thirtieth floor, Yong Ho could not use the power of his subordinate spirits. He could bring out the power of Mammon's twelve spirits through Mammon's godly energy, but he could not inside the arena. Therefore, his fighting on the thirtieth floor reminded him of his final battle with the King of Gluttony. And that was the same when he fought on the thirty-ninth floor, the top floor of the arena. Hitting the ground hard, he activated the heart of the demon god. Without going through the due step gradually, five of the seven claws immediately penetrated his chest. It hurt. At the same time, however, he felt power was soaring from inside. He pondered over it overnight. His fight against Gus Ion was not supposed to last long. For nearly half a year, he had been with Gus Ion. Given that the passage of time was not so clear in the arena, he might have spent more time with Gus Ion than he thought. Gus Ion did not spare his power. Since the day Yong Ho first asked Gus Ion to teach him, he tried to pass on to Yong Ho everything he knew. So, Yong Ho knew that it was impossible to maintain the distance with him or to make use of his superior mana to engage in a protracted fight. There was only one way for him to defeat the beast named Gus Ion, which was the primitive battle between the power of the two. Yong Ho was determined to demonstrate all his power available. Gus Ion might have felt the same way. This was going to be a fierce battle. Yong Ho concentrated. Gus Ion clenched his fist. Yong Ho tightened his legs and hit the ground. With tremendous power, he traversed the space quickly. He saw Gus Ion throwing his punch. There was a clashing noise. It wasn't something hitting against each other. 
their fists clashed against each other in the air. When the clashing sound exploded, Gus Ion punched him, which gently touched his cheek. Yong Ho avoided his first blow. Needless to say, it was a miracle. As the strongest red demon, there was no mistake in Gyuzhin's punch. Since his body and mana worked together at the moment he intended, Yong Ho could not discern the flow of Gyuzhin's mana as he used to. That was why it was a miracle that he avoided Gyuzhin's fatal blow. It was impossible for him to explain how he avoided Gyuzhin's attack. Maybe he did it instinctively or by experience. Yong Ho's eyes moved. He looked over Gyuzhin's huge left arm. His eyes met Gyuzhin's. Gus Ion was laughing. Bang! There was a deafening roar for the second time. Once again, a miracle happened. Gus Ion rotated his body then threw his right punch, but it missed the target. Before his punch broke the ground, Yong Ho rushed toward him bravely. He rotated his body in the same direction as Gus Ion and stood behind his back. The waves that shook the atmosphere reverberated on the ground this time. The ground that could not withstand Gyuzhin's mighty punch was torn in all directions. Yong Ho moved his right hand. He didn't sense the moment he did it. At the moment, no one could have guessed, Amun, with ultra-high green flames, became a flash of light. Gus Ion punched his jaw while the magic spear of Amun cut through the air. Gus Ion, getting close to Yong Ho, threw a punch for the second time. His punch bounced out. A shield of distortion released from his left hand twisted the trajectory of Gyuzhin's fist. Both eyes met over Yong Ho's silver dragon armor which was smashed by his punch. The two launched another attack against each other. There was a series of roaring whenever they clashed. Their close-range fighting brought about unimaginable results. Their mana collided. They hit then avoided each other's attack. Since their fighting was straightforward and simple, it was so intense and fierce. Gyuzhin's armor was stained with blood. The leather clothes that covered his red upper body were already burned with the green flames. Yong Ho wasn't that different from Gus Ion either. The silver dragon armor was already in tatters. Each time he attacked Yong Ho, its fragments scattered in the air. They now sped up their attack. The breathless fighting seemed to blow away Yong Ho's consciousness at any moment. On the other hand, Gus Ion felt extreme joy. It wasn't just because Yong Ho was fighting better than he expected. He just took great delight in fighting itself. While over a thousand years were passing outside the arena, Gus Ion trained himself. He didn't care about the loss of mana caused by the death of his master Mammon. He was a red demon who fought physically. Although his mana was weak, he was not weakened. He was still the strongest red demon ever. There was a change in his blazing fast attack. Instead of attacking Yong Ho, Gus Ion soared vertically. He jumped more than a dozen meters at once and rotated his body. He hurriedly raised his head and rushed down to Yong Ho with a mighty punch. His vertical attack was like a meteor burning the atmosphere. Gyuzhin's striking was so powerful as to break everything on the ground, but it missed its target. But he didn't care. What he wanted from the beginning was not to destroy Yong Ho. The air shook with the release of mana. The floor of the stadium collapsed at the moment his punch hit the ground. Hundreds of fragments that lost gravity because of his overwhelming force scattered into the air. Yong Ho saw him amid the chaotic moment. As Gus Ion was on the offensive, he was not distracted by anything around him. He threw his right punch toward Yong Ho, who missed the chance to counterattack in the fast-changing environment. This time, Gus Ion didn't use his fist. Instead, he grabbed Yong Ho's left hand with his right hand. Without ever crossing each other's gaze, Gus Ion used his Herculean power. Gus Ion let out a powerful force by swinging his right hand as hard as he could. Yong Ho screamed. His left arm was torn out. His muscles were torn and his bones broke. The shock of his left arm being ripped from his body made him feel hazy. Gus Ion threw away his left arm. Blood gushing from his left shoulder splattered over him and Gus Ion. Gus Ion didn't clench his right hand, which tore off his left arm. With the fragments of the destroyed ground falling down, Gus Ion resumed his attack. Yong Ho couldn't avoid or prevent it. None of that was allowed. 
For the first time since they fought in the arena, Gus Ion mounted a perfect attack. Yong Ho, who was struck between his left chest and waist, was thrown away tens of meters and hit against the wall of the stadium. He felt like his body was being smashed just by the impact of it colliding against the wall. Gus Ion saw Yong Ho. He was squirming, stuck in the smashed wall of the stadium. Gus Ion clenched his teeth. Without any regret, he moved toward Yong Ho. As he promised to Yong Ho at the start of the fighting, he needed to beat him and end the fighting. His decisive attack created this situation. If Yong Ho had struck him down decisively, he, not Yong Ho, would have fallen on the ground. Gus Ion raised his head and looked outside the stadium. Kaiwan and Catalina were crying. Ophelia was trembling, squatting on the stand, Eligos denied what was happening before his eyes. Tigrius gnashed his teeth with his eyes closed. Only Skull stood firmly, facing Gus Ion. Gus Ion turned his gaze from them. He took another step. He grabbed his right hand stained with Yong Ho's blood. The flames of the Red Lotus blocked him at the moment. It was a waterfall of fire. Starting from the Red Lotus, it became the Green Flames. A huge chunk of mana engulfed Gus Ion. Gus Ion felt the presence of Amun from the flames. United with Yong Ho, Amun was different from his other subordinate spirits. Even inside the stadium, Amun could enforce his own intentions. Amun's efforts were useless. Gus Ion generated mana and grabbed the curtain of fire with both hands. He pushed Amun out, who was rushing toward him without giving up. The fight was already over. Yong Ho could not beat Gus Ion in his current situation. He was so wounded that he could not even stand up. So, Gus Ion had to wrap up the fighting now. The curtain of fire was gradually split. Gus Ion looked straight ahead, stepping through the gap of the splitting curtain. Yong Ho was sitting among the fragments of the collapsed wall. Barely raising his upper body, he raised his right hand. Gus Ion looked into his eyes and felt great joy and sadness together. Fighting spirit was still burning in his eyes. Yong Ho opened his lips. Gus Ion was tens of meters away from him, but Gus Ion could hear his voice. So, he hurried. He urgently released power and tore the curtain of fire. Then he rushed to Yong Ho. Yong Ho saw him charging toward him. Instead of closing his blurry eyes, he grabbed his chest with his right hand. He managed to speak it out, synthetic reinforcement. He could not put it off anymore, nor should he. A green light was flaring up in his eyes. Once again, Amun intercepted Gus Ion rushing toward him. The waves of the green flames helped Yong Ho gain time. Mana, the target of the synthetic reinforcement, began to swirl in the heart of the demon god. Greed and gluttony roared at once. The moment Gus Ion finally crossed all the waves of the green flames, a strong light arose. The sixth claw was triggered from the heart of the demon god who became united with Yong Ho in a true sense. The arena beyond the fighting area reverberated. A terrifying mana was released from his body, along with the green flames. A temporary seventh horn in the shape of light came out between the six horns. Yong Ho was exhausted and his bones were broken. Even handling the released mana was difficult for him. He didn't even know how long he could stick it out. Nonetheless, he could still fight. Gus Ion laughed. He burst into laughter before he knew it. He gladly clenched his fist. Yong Ho also laughed. With his right hand, he grabbed the air. Then he stood up and let down the magic spear, Amun, the Red Lotus. The two looked at each other, then fought again. Chapter, 237 Now, the fighting between Yong Ho and Gus Ion was completely different from when they fought first. There was nothing like a hairbreadth escape or continuous counterattack. It was literally a primitive fight. The two attacked and counterattacked. They only thought of beating each other with a stronger attack. They slugged it out. Gusion's punch twisted time and space. Hundreds of thousands of Gusion's punches rained down on Yong Ho's body like an avalanche. But Yong Ho penetrated the avalanche with his secret weapon. The godly energy of fury took hold of the space around Amun instead of jumping through space. The avalanche crashed. 
the fighting ground could no longer withstand their battle. Mammon's shield protecting the stand was long destroyed. Not only Yong Ho's subordinate spirits but also the arena spirits shuddered at their fierce fighting. Once again, blood splattered in the air. The two instinctively felt they reached the limit of their physical strength. Gyushin's left arm did not move. Yong Ho's mana, which was going up endlessly, was slowly disintegrating. There was not much time left for his survival. The two stopped attacking all of a sudden. They burst into laughter at the same time. Since they were covered with wounds, their laughter was misery itself. They even threw out blood simultaneously. Young master, you're a real tough cookie. Our fighting was too long. Let's stop here and go see Scat Hack. They laughed again at their feeble voice. Both knew their next fighting would be the last. So, they didn't need any more talking. Gus Ion clenched his fist. Yong Ho concentrated all his power on Amun. The two clashed again. Both engulfed each other. Yong Ho's green flames and Gyushin's red mana not only brought about a huge impact, but it also generated enormous light and heat. A shock wave hit them at the same time. Gus Ion thought, falling on the ground. Even though he lost his right arm entirely, he felt something else rather than pain. Master. He felt dizzy. He was overcome by fatigue that he forgot while fighting. It seemed like he would lose consciousness any time soon. But still, his heart was beating. Gus Ion didn't close his eyes. He clenched his teeth to maintain consciousness even though his vision was already blurred. He felt the strong fishy scent of blood in his nose. Gus Ion recalled one day in the distant past. The day was like now, but different. It happened more than a thousand years ago. He smiled even when he was almost dying. Today was not that day. But he could see something similar to what had happened on that day. Unlike Gus Ion, Yong Ho was standing. His left arm, torn out in a mess, looked disgusting. Since he couldn't stand properly, he leaned on Amun, using him as a cane, but he didn't fall. He staggeringly approached Gus Ion. Now the fighting was over. Yong Ho won. Gus Ion couldn't stand it anymore. Tears flowed from his eyes. My king. His low voice soon became magic. He broke the invisible chains that held Gus Ion and many others around for many years. Mammon's shield was lifted. A pure white light covered the entire arena. Master. In the light, Catalina was crying loudly, which she kept holding down until now. She was about to run toward him, crying. But Kaiwan held her. As a former spirit of the arena, Kaiwan instinctively realized what kind of moment it was now. She also wanted to cry her eyes out like Catalina, she held it back. She had to watch the reunion of the king who finally returned and his vassals. Eligo supported Ophelia, who couldn't stand up properly because her legs became wobbly. Tigrius groaned with admiration. The lifting of Mammon's shield that lasted for more than a thousand years was a spectacular scene itself. Instead of laughing heartily as always, Skull breathed a sigh of relief. He then looked at his master with purple eyes. Since the shield of the arena was dismantled, Yong Ho and Gus Ion also recovered their original bodies. Their armor in tatters, as well as exhausted mana, were not perfectly restored, but they managed to face each other in a respectful manner. The spirits of the arena stood behind Gus Ion. They showed due manners to the new king and their new master by raising their weapons. My king, the great king of greed who has finally returned. Gus Ion did not hide his tears. He raised his clenched fist on his chest. Then he led the chant on behalf of the arena spirits. Gus Ion and the 112 spirits here swear allegiance to the master of the labyrinth of greed. His oath was simple but strong. Followed by Gyushin's chanting, the arena spirits raised their voices at once, which displayed their magnificent dignity. Amun didn't shout separately. In fact, he was so moved that he could not speak at all. He felt the same way as Gus Ion. Yong Ho felt a bit embarrassed because of their resounding voices, but he was a king now. As Gus Ion declared, he was the master of the labyrinth of greed. He felt a little awkward, but he smiled at the arena spirits. 
Then he got down to the point briefly and said, I hope I'm in your good hands. The arena spirits laughed here and there. Catalina and Kai Wan ran quickly and hugged Yong Ho, who was pushed back and fell on the ground. Gus Ion smiled faintly and sat down. Normally, he could hold their hands gently one by one, but he couldn't do it now. Instead of standing up, he just lay down and looked up at Gus Ion. He then said, hugging Catalina and Kai Wan, okay, then let's go recover right away. Gus Ion blinked. Each time Yong Ho smiled, he felt like he had a sharp pain in his stomach, but he once again smiled at Gus Ion and said, aren't we messed up? Then we should go to the hospital. I'm a little worried if I can walk to the first floor in this condition. Gus Ion looked up and looked at the entrance to the arena. After watching it blankly for a long time, he barely opened his mouth, Master. He called it shortly. Gus Ion raised not only Yong Ho but also Kai Wan and Catalina with his big hand, but Skull, who was excellent at doing something in a timely manner, stretched out his hand and removed the two women from Yong Ho. Gus Ion pointed to the ceiling by moving his chin. Let's go now. Yong Ho allowed Gus Ion to carry him on his back. At that moment, he listened to Lucia's voice while hanging on Gyuzhin's back, which was pretty large. Oh my god! You are in the arena right now, right? Nonetheless, you have got to be connected to me, right? He didn't bother to answer. He left the arena with Gus Ion and headed to the Garden of Life, where Scathack had been waiting for them. When they reached, Scathack was already crying. Hugging Yuria, at a loss of what to do, she cried her eyes out like a child. She cried and even had a runny nose, but she didn't care. Only the mansion located in the middle of the lake was the space allowed for Scathack. Since she couldn't step out of the mansion at all, she settled on the edge of the mansion. She waited for Yong Ho and Gus Ion at a place close to the entrance. Quick-witted, Lucia had the skull unit open the door in advance. As a result, the moment Gus Ion entered the hallway, he could see Scathack from a distance. Gus Ion ran. Scathack got up from her seat and leaned against the invisible wall. She cried out Gyuzhin's name. And finally, the distance between the two disappeared. Gus Ion hugged her with his large hands. Yuria, who was in Scathack's arms, got barely released and staggered while Yong Ho bounced off his back and rolled on the floor. However, neither of them were displeased. Where are Gus Ion and Scathack now? Kai Wan, who came up late, asked, looking at Yong Ho who was still lying down on the floor. Yong Ho, who was covering Yuria's ears with his hands for some reason, smiled bitterly and pointed at Scathack's mansion with a look. Catalina, who had the best hearing among the mammon spirits, pricked her ears several times and then covered her face with both hands. Suddenly, not only her ears and face but also her neck turned red. Well, they're making great love in a thousand years, said Ophelia. Eligos and Tigrius simultaneously cleared their throats. Yong Ho whispered into the air. Lucia, don't sneak a peek at them. Just focus on your work. You have to take control of the seventh floor Lucia. Ugh. Sure, I'll start taking control of the seventh floor. Pit-a-pat, pit-a-pat oh my. Let me start right away. Fortunately, only Yong Ho could hear it. Yong Ho pleasantly watched Scathack's mansion after breathing out deeply. He felt good he could obtain all the arena spirits including Gus Ion by conquering the arena, but what pleased him more was the dramatic reunion of Gus Ion and Scathack. Shall I postpone my work until tomorrow and pass out here? Although he was physically alright, he was mentally exhausted. It was because he was so inert as to stand up that he still lay on the floor. Moreover, the side effects of his reliance on the demon god were greater than expected. If he had turned to him in a place other than the arena, he could have suffered even more side effects. Right at that moment, the flames of the red lotus arose from his bedside. It was Amun as always. My master. Amun's whispering was delivered not only to Yong Ho but also to the other subordinate spirits. All of them felt warmth from the flames of the red lotus. You have conquered the arena. And you will make Gus Ion your subordinate spirit. Gus Ion could be said to be the beginning of the domino. Now, Scathack was going to join Yong Ho. If Gus Ion and Scathack joined him, 
it was highly likely that Richard would also follow suit. Just like Kai Wan said, Yong Ho's possession of Mammon's twelve spirits was within his grasp sooner or later. Yuzhen's power is courage, which was something that made him never give up in the face of any ordeal and overcome it. There is no other power that suits him perfectly other than that, given his role as the king's vanguard. Yong Ho agreed with a nod. Kai Wan, who had spent the longest time with Gus Ion, smiled warmly. And. Amun paused for a moment then created even greater flames. He said, looking directly at Yong Ho, now you're fully qualified as the master. It was clear what he meant. Yong Ho responded instinctively. Mammon. The king of greed. The greatest monarch in the history of the demon world. He suddenly disappeared one day. He disappeared from history, believe it or not. Mammon's twelve spirits knew the truth. However, they could not speak, bound by some prohibitions. Now all those bans were lifted. Yong Ho finally got the right to hear the truth. I agree with Yuscha. I think it is best to hear it from Gusayan. The flames of the red lotus flickered again. He whispered, you don't have to be in a hurry. Because it's just a once upon a time story. His voice was scattered. The flames faded away. Yong Ho saw the godly energy of Mammon on his left arm. He felt only a small beating from the heart of the demon god who was united with him. Time passed fairly. Various events were happening outside the Mammon house, in the north and west as well as in the center of the demon world. A day had passed. The war in the north continued. The meeting between the Queen of Fury and the heads of the eight clans didn't produce any consensus about the Queen's proposal, given the significance of the matter. And the meeting of the five directors of the dungeon market was somewhat different from what it was before. Yong Ho and Gus Ion faced each other at Skat Hakka's mansion. Gus Ion, as always, did not drag on needlessly. He started telling the truth about Mammon, holding Skathak in one arm. It was an old story dating from over a thousand years ago. Chapter, 238 The subordinate spirits of the House of Mammon began to gather at Skathaka's mansion. It was almost noon. Gusayan looked calm. Although there was still fatigue on his face, he didn't fail to smile. It was yesterday when he fought a deadly fight with Yong Ho. Even though he took rest all day long, he was not fully recovered, so Yong Ho delayed making him his subordinate spirit later. Actually, he summoned them for a different reason. Each of them took their seat comfortably. The blue water, which could be called the specialty of Skathaka's mansion, served as a jelly-like chair, where they leaned comfortably. Okay, master. May I reel out the story from now on? I would like to start, then. Holding Skathaka's waist with one arm, he spoke somewhat awkwardly. Yong Ho responded with a more awkward expression, that's enough. You don't have to use honorific language. Just tell me as you used to. I'll treat you the same as I did before. Hmm. That's why I like you, master. He gently grinned at Yong Ho then gave up using honorific language. Leaning on his chest, Skathak also giggled. All right. Where should I start talking? Actually, I've been imagining this moment for the last 1000 years, but I find it rather hard to speak in front of you like this. Yong Ho did not press him. Amun, who arose in the air as the flames of the Red Lotus, also waited calmly for his words. Finally, Gus Ion opened his mouth. It's a thing of the distant past. It happened a thousand and hundreds of years ago when Master Mammon was still alive. Skathak fidgeted with her fingers to help Gus Ion. Some of the blue water went up and became a map of the demon world in the distant past. About half of the demon world was unified under one name. There happened all sorts of strange things in many parts of the estates, or the territory of greed, ruled by Master Mammon in those days. For example, a whole dungeon or a small town disappeared altogether. Kaiwan leaned forward when he used the expression disappeared. She asked with a glance, and Gus Ion nodded and continued, sometimes a dungeon evaporated without leaving behind even a single piece of it, and sometimes the city was destroyed as if it were attacked. Since there were survivors left behind, this strange phenomenon was known a long time after it happened initially. Nobody knew when and where this kind of bizarre phenomenon occurred. 
It was because there was no guarantee that it would occur only in the village or a dungeon. At the end of the day, Master Mammon began to investigate the bizarre incidents in earnest, but he had not made any progress. He just doubted it might be some sort of twisting or earthquake in the affected area or dungeon. But it was too weird to call it a simple twisting. It was possible for the being created as the twisting to destroy the surrounding area, but it was impossible that the village or dungeon disappeared altogether as if the whole affected area was torn down and taken into another world. Gus Ion grabbed a part of the water that formed the map of the demon world. Although it was a model, he erased part of the demon world and continued, the more Master Mammon investigated the incidents, the more severe the situation became. The bizarre phenomena increased as time passed by, and the damages of the affected areas increased as well. In some cases, the affected dungeon was fine, but all the people inside it died without any wound as if only their souls escaped out of their bodies. Gus Ion paused for a moment. After catching his breath once, he continued, while Master Mammon was in the thick of investigating the events, the Queen of Sloth in the neighboring country visited him. Actually, the Queen of Sloth was investigating the same phenomenon in her country. If that's the case, this kind of strange thing didn't take place only in the territory of the King of Greed, right? Asked Ophelia. Gus Ion replied with a nod. You're right. That's the point. This strange thing occurred throughout the demon world. This was happening not only in the territory of the King of Greed and the Queen of Sloth but also in the territories of other kings. Gus Ion reached out for the map of the demon world. Then there popped up small holes everywhere on the map. Then he erased it one by one. About six months have passed since Master Mammon started investigating this strange thing. Finally, Mammon discovered the cause of this weird phenomenon. To tell you the conclusion, it was the result of twisting. However, it was different from the usual twisting. Beyond the twisting was an alien world, which was not the same demonic world. Moreover, the alien world was too much different from the numerous worlds that had a temporary passage to the demon world until then. It was a very special world. Gus Ion took a silver coin out of his pocket. Then, he made it float in the air with mana, which was round and flat. It can be compared to both sides of a coin. It could be called the twin of our demon world. A world that has been always connected to the demon world, but a world where people could not meet us in the demon world, nor should we. The silver coin that Gus Ion floated in the air rotated round and round. Everyone's eyes turned to the back of the silver coin, which was not visible at first. The twisting that occurred from that alien world affected the demon world. Sometimes, it evaporated the whole area, and sometimes, it absorbed all the souls around the twisting. In some cases, the beings that came from the twisting were engaged in destruction. The first two cases were particularly problematic. If this kind of phenomenon were allowed to continue, the entire demon world could collapse. This alien world was the twin of the demon world, but at the same time it would bring about the destruction of the demon world if something went wrong. Gus Ion grabbed the silver coin and whispered, Master Mammon called the world a celestial world. In many cases, the meetings of the five directors of the dungeon market proceeded with the participants reading their one-sided reports. And that was the same when they met face to face instead of meeting in the virtual space. As a result, the meeting was short as a rule. When the five directors met, their meeting usually didn't last more than two hours. But this time, the meeting lasted long. They couldn't wrap up the meeting in a few hours. Dubbed the strongest mana, Abrasax, called for another meeting on the second day. Indeed they convened a second meeting when Bifrons, the best intellect, agreed. Actually, they already discussed all the important agenda at their yesterday's meeting. Oroba, the strongest Herculean power, looked at Abrasax with a curious expression, and Samuel also showed great curiosity about the second meeting. Abrasax, who was dragging on without any interesting agenda, put down the toys he was playing with. Then he casually said in passing, Today the King of Pride will attack the King of Envy. It was nothing new to the participants. In fact, for the past several months, the King of Pride and the King of Envy were engaged in fierce fighting. Citri tilted her head slightly, feeling out of place. Abrasax raised his head and looked at her. Then he said, grinning at her, some of you already know what I mean. 
Citri narrowed her eyebrows. The five directors looked at each other. Right at that moment, some already began to move. There was a huge twisting between the celestial world and the demonic world behind this very bizarre phenomenon. Unlike other twistings, it was not temporary. Other twistings continued from the existing twisting that was always active. Scat Hacka's water drops became one and created a large map of the demon world again. One of them was separated and placed high in the sky. It's the door to the celestial world. Mammon had to close the door. Only then could the demon world be protected from this bizarre phenomena. Now, Gusion began to speed up the flow of the story. Ophelia, who kept swallowing while listening to him, asked quickly, Wait. Why is it so unilateral? If the celestial world is a twin of the demon world, aren't they supposed to be equal? I don't know about it. But what was clear was the fact that the power of the celestial world was like poison to our demonic beings. Those of us with weak mana had to lose their lives simply by being exposed to the power of the celestial world. Only those with at least three horns could fight even when exposed to the power of the celestial world. When he replied, Ophelia made a blank expression. He mentioned at least three horns. It meant that only a handful of people in the vast demon world could confront the celestial world. In no time, Master Mammon could find where the door was located. However, shutting down the door was not easy because our master found the existence of the door too late. Not only was the power of the celestial world abundant around the door, but there were also too many beings from the celestial world. Gus Ion paused for a moment. Chapter 239 It was just Gus Ion only who was talking. At first, everything went smoothly. But the situation became different when they were finally about to shut the door of the celestial world, faced with their fiercest resistance. Yong Ho closed his eyes. Kaiwan also clenched her teeth. Catalina bit her lips, hoping what she thought was not true. The king of pride, the king of envy, and the king of lust betrayed Master Mammon. The queen of sloth didn't betray him, but that's it. The situation was irreversible by that time. Gus Ion frowned as if he was about to shed bloody tears at any moment. Ilun was killed first, followed by Baruna and Yuho Yuan in the fierce fighting. All the twelve spirits of Mammon were severely wounded. Yong Ho could remember it at that time. He recalled it when he peeked into the memories of Citri and Mammon Gyushin was crying, shedding bloody tears, and Ilun died in Citri's arms. Fortunately, Master Mammon survived. But he did not choose to leave the scene. Gus Ion let down his shoulders. His angry tone now subsided. The door of the celestial world was too wide open. If he backed down, he couldn't promise the safety and survival of his country. So, Master Mammon decided to. The flames of the Red Lotus were burning high. Skathak put her hand on Gyuzhin's hand. Gus Ion cried and laughed while talking. Recalling the unforgettable king, who he had never forgotten for more than a thousand years, Gus Ion said, he climbed the stairs to the celestial world alone. He chose to sacrifice himself to save the demon world. Abrasax soon erected seven horns. As if his nickname, the strongest mana, was not fake, he took control of the surrounding area with his enormous mana. Almost at the same time, Bifrons and Oroba also opened their horns. The combined mana generated from the six horns became united with Abrasax's, increasing the density of mana. It was literally a choking pressure. Samuel, the fastest wing, hurriedly opened her horns to confront their mana, but it was in vain. Abrasax's mana was thrust into her like a serpent and tied her up. As if closing a bottle cap, he crushed her mana with his stronger mana. Citri also suffered the same thing. The mana of the three other directors squeezed her body. Abrasak said, I was thinking of executing it a bit slowly. Just like I did to Oroba and Bifrons, I took the time to try to persuade Samuel and Citri as well. But the situation was so urgent that I could not help it. Abrasak shook his head then made a smile humorously by twisting his beak. The king of gluttony was dead. I don't know who killed him, but he died anyway. Even the ten warriors that he boasted of so much were also killed. So, what should I do? Wouldn't the dog that lost its owner have to find a new owner? 
Samuel opened her eyes wide at his words that the king of gluttony was dead. Abrasax couldn't hide his joy. There is no longer the territory of the king of gluttony because the dogs who found a new owner hoisted up a new flag. Probably, there is a big turmoil there by now. They must be engaged in fighting each other, calling each other traitors. The three masters who used to enjoy a powerful force under the king of gluttony chose the king of pride as their new master. They reported to the king about the death of the king of gluttony and the ten warriors, but they also pledged to devote their entire forces to him. Now, it was time they kept their pledge. The three masters who changed their master under the red sky were probably having a bloody feast. Their first mission was to annihilate the puppet king and a handful of loyalists. They had to get rid of the king of gluttony's remnants to dedicate the king's whole territory to the king of pride. The king of pride will attack the king of envy. The king of lust can no longer resist him. Today the northern area will be unified under the king of pride, Oroba said in a low voice. Abrasax laughed even louder. The dungeon market will follow him. Our role as a preposterous charity organization is over. We're going to join hands with the King of Pride to go beyond the North to unify the whole demon world. The dungeon market had the power to control the entire demon world. However, they used it only in business deals. Besides, they didn't do the business properly. They were just content with handling the business as usual by playing the book. Abrasax hated it. He wanted to use the power of the dungeon market for a more valuable cause. We will reorganize the demon world. It would be nice if we could remove all the hybrid clans from the alien world. Don't you think the demon world will be much more beautiful and fresh? He spoke casually, but Samuel couldn't stay still. The number of what the purists called hybrids in the demon world was several million. Are they going to kill all of these hybrids? How could he mention it so lightly? Samuel could not even say they were crazy. She could not just stand her anger surging inside her. The best intellect, Bifrons opened all of his eight eyes. He said, watching Citri and Samuel, we don't have much time like Abrasax just said. I know the atmosphere is a bit coercive, but I want you to make the decision now. The dungeon market was like a beast with five heads. If any of the five heads differed with the other heads, it had to be cut off. Only then could the demon called the dungeon market could exert its united power. Oroba took a step. As the strongest red demon of his time, he did not hide his murderous intentions. Choose whether you will go along with us or you want to be killed. Mammon climbed the stairs alone. Since he chose to die alone. He forced his twelve spirits to return to the demon world. There was not enough time. Because of the influence of the celestial world, he could not use his ordinary magic to have them return. He had to break their will to stay with him. For this reason, their forced return was as good as sealed. Sending Amun back to the demon world, he left the rest up to Magnadon. Amun and Skathak didn't see him afterward because they were asleep for a long time. But Gusion was a little different. Like them, he didn't see Mammon, but he could hear from the previous masters of the House of Mammon who visited the arena about what happened afterward. The traitors went all out to destroy the House of Mammon. They also concealed the fact that the door of the celestial world ever existed in order to bury their disgusting and ugly betrayal in the dark. Master Mammon's sublime sacrifice was hidden, and the House of Mammon fell. And a thousand years passed. The King of Pride, who led the betrayal, died, and the King of Lust practically chose to seclude himself. The King of Envy, who was always controlled by another king, was on the verge of losing his country to the new King of Pride. Gusion was now done. He told them all he knew. But Yong Ho had a lot to ask. Why did Mammon want his twelve spirits to not reveal this truth? Why did he arrange for only the master who was duly qualified to know the truth? That was not all. He had more questions about the twelve spirits, but what he actually asked Gus Ion was quite a different question. What was the Queen of Sloth doing at the time? Three of the five kings betrayed Mammon. But the Queen of Sloth didn't. Then, what happened to her? What was she doing when the Mammon family was collapsing? Was the Queen of Sloth betrayed as well? Was that why she secluded herself? 
Gus Ion laughed bitterly and replied with mixed feelings of love and hate. The Queen of Sloth stayed with Master Mammon until he climbed the stairs. She fought with us twelve spirits. While the House of Mammon was collapsing, I am not sure what she was doing at that time. But it is clear that she has been upholding one of the late Mammon's wills. Yong Ho stopped breathing. The puzzles that were messed up in his mind were put together. But he didn't have the specific evidence. He was sure who she was. She was that woman, Citri. Mammon, she murmured to herself. She then shouted, shrugging her shoulders, Mammon. She called it out loud. It looked like she was about to cry at any moment. It wasn't because she was afraid of Orobas's threat. The dungeon market that she used to know was broken. One of Mammon's wills was once again defiled by the King of Pride. What did you say? Mammon? Oroba asked again. Citri didn't bother to answer. She closed her eyes and withdrew one of the attributes of her power, seclusion. The three directors felt it at the same time. Something changed. A weird force arose among the mana of the three directors that filled the conference room. Samuel felt Abrasax's mana surrounding her distorted. Abrasax was startled, Bifrons and Oroba hurriedly concentrated their mana to overpower Citri. But it was impossible. Seven horns of light rose above Citri's head like a crown. The mana she released all at once drove away their mana. And Citri was satisfied with that moment. She reached out into the air. Through the ring, she summoned a lump of Brigada into the air and grabbed the godly energy of Sloth in the shape of a cane, which was a fragment of the flesh of the demon god. Citri. She was the strongest force of the dungeon market as well as the founder of the dungeon market, following the will of Mammon, the king of greed. The queen of Sloth released her power, the sin of Sloth, after a thousand years. Chapter, 240. Tears kept flowing from Citri's eyes. She hugged Alun, who was covered with blood. Her body, which was getting colder little by little whenever she put her lips on her forehead, did not move this time. She could not believe Alun's death, let alone the other's death. But it was all true. She could not deny the stern fact. And now, she was faced with the reality she wanted to deny most. Her whole body ached. Her bloody body creaked before she hugged Alun. This space with the strongest celestial power in the demon world was a land of death even for Citri, one of the seven deadly sins. Citri cried. She squeezed her voice to say something, again tightening her arms holding Alun. Don't go. It was harder than she thought. Her wet voice was small. It was difficult for her even to add one more word. It was also because of the power of the celestial world, but she was overwhelmed by the emotions. She could not control the overflowing feelings. Citri once again opened her mouth, don't go. Please, please. She couldn't say anything anymore. Dozens of words came to her mind at the same time, but none of them came out of her mouth. What she barely squeezed from her mouth was her desperate appeal to Mammon, her master. Mammon faced her. Although her face was messed with tears, he touched her beautiful face and kissed her forehead and lips. That was his way of expressing his goodbye. His fleeting kiss made her wake up to the grim reality more sharply. A world without Mammon, which would disappear forever in a moment, scared her. Why? Why should you go? Why only you? She shouted out loud. It was a damn world. It was a filthy world full of dirty traitors. She could not understand why Mammon should sacrifice himself in such a situation. Why should Mammon bleed for those traitors? There were lots of things she wanted to say to him. She wanted to reproach herself for this deplorable situation. Mammon smiled at her again and said kindly, Because only I can do it. Because I am the king of you and everyone. It wasn't simply because he had the sin and godly energy. He was the king, the leader and the navigator who would lead everyone. And because it is mine since both you and this world are all mine, wouldn't it be natural for me to keep what's mine? His statement befitted his position as the king of greed. After wrapping up his words playfully, Mammon kissed Citri once again. Citri wanted to show him her own smile. But in the end, she could not help but cry again. So, 
she just begged him to take her. Mammon glanced at her lovably. He touched Elun's hand, which was still warm, and quickly stood up. The sky was twisted. The sky that should be red got mixed with blue light. There was really little time left for him now. Mammon looked up to the sky. Still smiling, he said to Citri, I will be back. Citri couldn't go with him together. Since it was his wish, she had no choice but to let him go alone. She wiped the tears with her bloody hands. She clenched her teeth to hold back her tears. She vividly etched the memory of him going along into her mind. Mammon went alone. He climbed the stairs leading to the celestial world the end of the sky. Citri. Everyone pricked their ears when Gus Ian mentioned her name all of a sudden. Although the name suddenly popped up, Ophelia and Kaiwan understood why Citri's name was mentioned. There was astonishment on their faces. Yes, Citri is none other than the Queen of Sloth, said Gusion calmly. Scathack made a sad smile at that. Catalina could not make head or tail of what was going on. Of course, it wasn't her fault. Gusion's mention of Citri was so shocking to everybody. With his eyes wide open, Eligos was aghast. With the exception of Yong Ho, Eligos was the one who met Citri most within the Mammon family until now. It seemed Gus Ion had to give them more background explanation. Kaiwan made an expression as if she was about to shout loudly at any moment, but she held it back to the end. She was now suppressing herself. Yong Ho closed his eyes. Citri's face and voice distantly came to his mind. Why? Yong Ho didn't ask Gus Ion why Citri was the Queen of Sloth. Opening his eyes, Yong Ho looked straight at Gus Ion and asked, If Citri is the Queen of Sloth, why are you resenting her? As Gus Ion admitted, Citri fought with the Mammon family. She did not betray Mammon like the other kings. If that was the case, why did Gus Ion resent her? Gus Ion smiled at his question, but his expression was far from a smile. He replied with a rather weary voice. The alliance of the five kings to save the demon world was a good thing. It's fantastic when you hear it. But Master Mammon knew that the reality was not that simple. It is only possible in a fairy tale for those who were fighting against each other until yesterday to join hands to fight together for their common ideal goal. And that was the reality. In fact, the three kings kings of pride, envy, and lust eventually betrayed Mammon. We twelve spirits did not trust the rest of the kings. So, we opposed our master's alliance with them. But the Queen of Sloth, Citri, made the case for the alliance. She encouraged Mammon to form the alliance, arguing that if the five kings joined hands, they could solve the current crisis. Gus Ion knew Citri believed the use of the alliance truly. In fact, Citri really believed their alliance would solve the problem facing the demon world. So, it was Citri who was more shocked than anyone else by the betrayal of the three kings. Scathack tightened her hand holding Gus Ion. Gus Ion laughed awkwardly again and said, Yes, I know. I was probably stupid. Maybe I might have needed someone I wanted to hate. Actually, Gus Ion couldn't stand it without hating somebody. But for it, he couldn't face the house of Mammon that collapsed in return for saving the demon world. Gus Ion could no longer continue. Scathack gently smiled at him, touching his hand. She wrapped it up on behalf of him. But it's water under the bridge now. There is no more threat from the celestial world. The King of Pride, who was the main instigator of betrayal, disappeared amid the passage of time. We still have the King of Envy and the King of Lust, but I wonder how we should deal with them. Even now, when she closed her eyes, she remembered that time. It was an unforgettable memory. But the passage of a thousand years made her calm down. Master Mammon was worried about us until the end. He had another concern while sending us back to the demon world in a hurry, for it was so obvious that we twelve spirits would cry out for revenge. Yong Ho recalled Asclepius at that moment. While he was confined to a thousand years of guilt, he became a madman. Perhaps, he must have thought of revenge before he went crazy. Scathack closed her eyes then cleared her voice before continuing. Master Mammon didn't want his successor, who would appear someday, to be passively entangled in our revenge efforts. 
That's why he wanted his successor to realize the whole truth only when he could take control of his twelve spirits. Actually, Yongho came to know the whole truth only after he could take control of Mammon's twelve spirits like now. Skathak opened her eyes again and looked at him with a calm and affectionate look, as always, not with an expression full of revenge. Young master, you're now our new master. We will follow your will. Yongho moved his lips a bit. Catalina let down her ears with an anxious look, and Kaiwan just swallowed, looking at him. Skathak said again, I'm not trying to pressure you. I'm not arguing for taking revenge right away. Too much time has passed for that. Now I understand what's in Mammon's heart. Mammon didn't want us to pursue blind revenge. When Yongho obtained the heart of the demon god for the first time, Mammon's memory told him that he should pursue his own path and live a life based on his choice. That was what Mammon wanted. Like Skathak said, he wouldn't have hoped that his successor and twelve spirits would be bound by revenge alone. Yongho nodded. Skathak once again considered his feelings. As if to control Gus Ion who got impatient at the moment, she pulled his arm gently and said again, Shall I change the topic a bit? Since you guys heard about this all of a sudden, let me answer your questions. If you have any questions about Citri or what happened on that day, I'll answer it. Just feel free to ask any questions. You won't necessarily focus on Master Mammon. Chapter, 241 After she was done talking, she looked at the subordinate spirits of the Mammon family. Then Kai Wan opened her mouth first. I've got a question. She moved her lips to try to speak but found it a bit hard to say anything right away. Skathak kindly waited for her. After hesitating for a while, Kaiwan finally asked rather impatiently, if Citri is really the Queen of Sloth, why did she hide it from us so far? Why did she just seclude herself instead of reigning as the Queen? Kaiwan couldn't understand. She was a queen with one of the seven deadly sins and godly energy. But why did she live as one of the five directors of the dungeon market rather than a queen? Was it because she was scared of the other three kings? Was it because she might be assassinated if they knew the Queen of Sloth was alive? Given the political circumstances, it was highly likely that the other three kings were not aware of the fact that the Queen of Sloth was alive, or they might have not known that Citri was one of the five directors of the dungeon market. Even the records on the Mammon family did not indicate that Citri was the Queen of Sloth, so it was very possible that the three kings didn't know about her existence. According to various records, the Queen of Sloth always covered her face and body with a black veil and robe. As a result, it wasn't strange at all that the King of Pride, the King of Envy, and the King of Lust regard the Queen of Sloth and the Red-Haired Witch, Mammon's lover as two different women. In fact, this kind of thinking was the most plausible. Otherwise, the fact that the King of Greed and the Queen of Sloth were lovers would have provoked the other kings too much. They would have thought that their romantic relationship would have stood in the way of their alliance. At Kaiwan's asking, Skathak made a frown. It wasn't because her question was difficult to answer. It was because even Skathak didn't know why. Skathak looked at the flames of the red lotus burning in the air. Unlike Skathak herself and Gus Ion, who had been confined to the labyrinth of greed for the past 1000 years, Amun moved in and out of the labyrinth of greed until recently. Moreover, he always met Citri with Yongho. Maybe he might have some clues. Yongho and Kaiwan also turned to Amun. Amun whispered in a quiet voice, I am not sure of her intentions, but. When I saw her after a thousand years, she was different from what I used to know before. On the day when the celestial door was closed, she was probably injured very much. Injured? Yes, because it was a fierce fight. It wouldn't be strange if I say that she had been so severely wounded that she could not have healed even with the passage of one thousand years. Moreover, Citri was with Mammon until his last moment. Just before or after Mammon closed the celestial door, something that Mammon's twelve spirits didn't know might have happened. If I speak based on my impression of her. Citri, as she is now, is not complete. She will not be able to properly exercise her power as the Queen of Sloth. There was a crack in the firm solidarity of the three directors. An alien force penetrated through the flow of their mana that got united as one until a moment ago. It was like an explosion. It was instant, 
but it was a tremendous power that completely pushed out the mana of the three directors. Abrasax, who was proud of his strongest mana at the dungeon market, was more sensitive to mana than any of the five directors. The moment he faced Citri, the queen of sloth's mana, he felt it keenly. That was the power of a true queen, equipped with both one of the seven deadly sins and the godly energy. Abrasax felt he was spaced out. He didn't hear anything about her from the King of Pride. What he heard from the King of Pride was that Citri was Mammon's lover and that she was a great demon who lived for a long long time. What should he do? How should he deal with the queen in front of him? A brief moment was like eternity. Abrasax saw Citri in astonishment, and Bifrons tried to trigger the hidden secret weapon. Amid the chaotic situation, Oroba, the strongest Herculean power, left himself to his instinct as a red demon. When everyone paid attention to Citri, Oroba hit the ground. Then he threw himself toward Samuel, who had not yet escaped from Abrasax's mana. Their distance narrowed in an instant. Oroba threw his punch at Samuel's eyes. He had nothing like a personal grudge against her. He just moved in a way that was most advantageous to his unique combat sense as a red demon. In some way, he acted, based on his cold rational judgment. There were two options that Oroba could think of. One of them was for him to be Samuel's ally. It was the best option. Although Citri showed obvious hostility toward him, Samuel joined hands with the three other directors, it was four to one. Under any circumstance, they could beat her. But the situation would be completely different if Samuel joined hands with Citri. If that was the case, the matrix of the fighting would be three to two. Given Citri's extraordinary power, it was highly likely that the three directors would be defeated although they were numerically superior. Oroba was not sure which of the two situations would unfold. Therefore, Oroba decided to eliminate the number of cases. If Samuel died here, the relative superiority of three to one would not change anyway. Oroba threw his punch. Even though he was obsessed with striking fast without any preparation, his blow was powerful beyond imagination. If he struck her accurately, it was clear that her delicate body would be smashed at once. At that moment, the Demon King's power, which Samuel exerted desperately, was a little faster than his punch. His fist, aiming at the center of Samuel's chest, hit her shoulders slightly. But even his missed punch was powerful enough to smash her shoulders. They were in tatters as if they were swept away by an explosion, and there were severe cuts on her body, exposed to the impact of his punch. The black wings, located behind her broken shoulders, literally evaporated. Even the five directors did not know about each other's power. Instead of thinking about why his punching missed, Oroba immediately prepared a second attack. Samuel failed to exert her power again because she closed her eyes in severe pain. All she could do was scream terribly in pain. Abrasax and Bifrons finally understood the situation. The two hurriedly turned their eyes toward Samuel only to find Samuel screaming in pain. Samuel was still alive. Oroba hastily turned around. Instead of punching her head, he slammed her in the back with his fist. His punch missed. When he turned his eyes after punching, Citri already began to strike his chest. This time, the eyes of Citri and Oroba crossed. Oroba clenched his teeth, but shortly afterward, his giant red body bounced off forcefully. Abrasax and Bifrons radiated their mana at the same time. Abrasax's mana pressed on Samuel, and Bifron's mana revived the mana of the other three directors and pushed out Citri who was releasing power as the Queen of Sloth fully. Blood was gushing all over Samuel's body, who was trembling hard. Her bloody discharge stained her white dress red. Kill her, kill her. Abrasax shouted, full of malice. There was already joy in his face. But Bifron's was different. He was breaking into a cold sweat endlessly. Now was not the time for him to waste mana on Samuel. Abrasax. Citri shouted at him. Abrasax looked back at Citri as if he suddenly came to his senses. Oroba, who had been bounced out, also got up quickly and looked at Citri. The godly energy of Sloth was shining. The godly energy that found its owner paired with the sin of Sloth, creating a tremendous mana. Abrasax's mana that had been squeezing down Samuel waned quickly. 
Besides, the combined mana of the three directors who seemed to swallow up Citri at any moment was pushed out once more. The Queen of Sloth. Abrasax was astonished. Sensitive to mana, he understood what was happening right before his eyes. That was why he was overwhelmed with instinctive fear. His mana was weakened. His mana that overpowered Samuel was not simply pushed out or evaporated. Actually, it was weakened. It then vanished. But the rate of its weakening was unusually fast. It seemed as if he was swept away by the torrent of time. Citri injected mana into the godly energy again. The godly energy that resonated with the sin of sloth released its inherent power. Corrosion of the Boundary. That was the name Mammon coined for the power. All the hostile forces that entered the boundary of this force were quickly weakened. It then perished. Chapter 242. Abrasax also shuddered. He recalled when he stood before the King of Pride. It was the same. In some way, he shuddered more this time. Citri's mana was as strong as his or rather weaker than his. Nonetheless, with the power of sloth alone, she blocked his mana several times as big as his. The power of the invisible wall of corrosion that weakened and eliminated everything was terrifying. Oroba couldn't dare charge at her. The reason Citri pushed him out in the first encounter was because she wanted to get hold of Samuel. If she had used the invisible wall of corrosion at that time to bring out the power of sloth, he might have received a fatal blow. He could not even think of that scenario at this point. However, Oroba was not stricken with fear just like Bifrons and Abrasax. His sense of combat captured something new. He noticed Citri's arm holding the mana of sloth was trembling. Blood came out of her lips. Attack her now. Oroba struck the air and gave off some mana. But Citri immediately triggered the godly energy of sloth to eliminate his mana. But she could not bear it anymore and spat out blood. Her chest and head were stained with blood. The blood flowing along her cleavage prompted Abrasax and Firens to attack her again. Kill her. Abrasax poured out his mana once again. It was foolish to use mana to strike down the invisible wall of corrosion that weakened mana itself. Rather, it was more efficient to attack it with pure mana. Bifrons moved his eight hands at the same time. Then he triggered the magic circles again. He then transmitted them to Abrasax instead of pouring out the flow of mana on Citri. Let me finish the fight now. Bifrons decided that he should not miss the Queen of Sloth, for she was simply too powerful. The queen who had her own godly energy had far superior power than he expected. The invisible wall of corrosion and the combined mana of the three directors clashed once again. Their mana was weakened and scattered again, but it was not quite the same as before. The boundaries of the invisible wall of corrosion were pushed back gradually. Citri, who was holding the godly energy with trembling hands, vomited blood again. A little more. Blood came out from Abrasax's eyes and nose, too. It was the first time he ever dealt with this kind of enormous mana, who had six horns since his birth. Citri now staggered. Blood came out again from her mouth. The boundary of the invisible wall of the corrosion was now reduced to less than half of it. Samuel raised her head. Dubbed the fastest wing, she spread her remaining wing and hugged Citri with trembling hands. No. No. Oroba shouted instinctively. Citri squeezed out her remaining power, and Samuel released her own power. A huge mana struck the ground. It not only destroyed the headquarters of the dungeon market but also rammed deep into the ground. The surrounding area was shaken as if there was an earthquake. Abrasax collapsed. As someone who operated mana directly, he knew that at the last minute, Citri and Samuel disappeared. Although he could not know what made them disappear at once, he clearly knew it was Samuel's power. Oroba hurriedly expanded his senses to check his surroundings, but it was useless. He could detect everything within a radius of 500 meters, but Citri and Samuel were not within that range. Bifrons gasped for breath. Thanks to an old friend of his who always gave advice, he could come to his senses quickly. He lost the Queen of Sloth. It was obvious that Samuel would not join hands with them. If that was the case, now was not the time for him to worry and fear. 
he had to do the next as soon as possible. Samuel is now our enemy. Oroba, give orders to your men. You must destroy Samuel's dungeon. Out of the five directors of the dungeon market, Citri was the most secretive one. Aside from the fact that she was the queen of sloth, the location of her dungeon was not even known. On the other hand, everybody knew Samuel's dungeon because the special auction house of the dungeon market was her own dungeon. The five directors of the dungeon market were basically demon kings with their own dungeons. Samuel, the master of her dungeon, had several subordinate spirits. If they destroyed the heart of her dungeon to annihilate her subordinate spirits, they could inflict great damage on Samuel where she was. The employees of the dungeon market headquarters appeared in various places. They didn't know what happened to the dungeon market today. They were in a chaotic situation, not knowing about the sudden tragedy that engulfed the market today. Bifrons caught his breath again. As his old friend commented, Bifrons' intellect was uniquely strong in analysis. He mentioned the most important thing in the current situation. Citri and Samuel are seriously injured. So, we still have time. Even though it's hard to overpower Citri, we must take away everything from Samuel. Citri was the most veiled out of the five directors. Apart from the fact that she was the Queen of Sloth, the location of her dungeon was not even known. On the other hand, everybody knew the location of Samuel's dungeon. The dungeon market special auction house was her dungeon. The dungeon market was like a beast with five heads. They had to wrap up the current turmoil by expelling Samuel as an enemy. They had to stop Samuel's forces from joining their hostile forces. Our king will reproach us in that case, Abrasax muttered. Looking at the results alone, their mission had failed. The three directors were supposed to go under the king of pride, but they didn't appease Citri and Samuel, nor did they get rid of the two. This was the worst situation they could think of. So, we have to hurry. We must get rid of Samuel's power. Even if it's impossible to take over the whole power of the dungeon market, we must hand over almost all of it to the King of Pride. Abrasak stood up, slowly nodding. Oroba kept swallowing, looking at the spot where Citri was standing. The Queen of Sloth. She was an enemy he had to confront again. And when he clashed with her again, he had to fight in a different way. The three directors did not delay any more. Oroba threw himself to join the forces attacking Samuel's dungeon, and Abrasax opened the door to the eastern region which would have been turned from the territory of the King of Gluttony to that of the King of Pride by now. The second mission of the powerful masters who hoisted the flags was to declare war on the Queen of Fury. Bifrons, who was left alone, turned toward the north. Today, which might be the watershed of demonic history, was not over yet. Betrayal had always been fatal throughout all ages and countries. The traitor was an insider, not an outsider. No matter how large and solid a giant castle was built to defend against outside enemies, they could not avoid the traitor among them from stabbing them from behind. The dungeon market special auction house, befitting Samuel's dungeon, one of the five directors, boasted of a strong defense that made it meaningless to compare it to the dungeons of ordinary masters. But, as expected, it helplessly collapsed at the traitor's attack. When Oroba arrived, more than half of the dungeon was already destroyed. Almost half of Samuel's subordinate spirits were killed by Oroba and Bifron's subordinates. Standing in front of the boundary line separating the deep floor of her dungeon and the special auction house, Oroba frowned. Samuel's right-hand man and the butler of the special auction house, Incubus Lord Carroll, was standing before him, with his body covered with blood. Excellent. Quite impressive. Oroba commented briefly. He said that from the bottom of his heart. About twenty crimson ogres belonging to Oroba's assault squad were scattered around him, torn apart in a terrible shape. Moreover, at least five kinds of monsters were also sacrificed with the strong scent of their blood mixed with that of the ogres. Perhaps, Carol must have resisted their attack alone so that Samuel's subordinate spirits could gain time to escape or strengthen their barriers. Carol glared at Oroba without any response. As if to collect whatever strength he had, he gasped for breath. He didn't ask why Oroba betrayed Samuel or where she was now. That kind of question was just meaningless in the current situation. Oroba smoothed out the wrinkles of his eyebrows, looking at Carol. He even smiled. 
He liked the man a lot for a long time. He wished Samuel had not turned into his enemy. He didn't show any signs of attacking. Flying nearly a dozen meters in the blink of an eye, he struck Caro with his fist. Caro could not avoid it. Caro activated the magnetic field immediately, but it was smashed as soon as it was created. Caro's left shoulder disappeared. There was no trace of it left at the tremendous impact of his attack. As in the case of Samuel, Caro didn't avoid it. Oroba targeted his shoulder on purpose. Caro couldn't even scream because Oroba's fist, which blew away his shoulder, punched his neck and mouth. Oroba grabbed him then threw him roughly to the ground. He was thrust into the ground with a force that could break it. Caro, whose bones were smashed to pieces, wriggled like an insect. Oroba stepped on his right arm with his feet. Then he tightened his feet to crush Caro's fingers and shoulders. This time, a terrible scream broke in his mouth. Then, he stopped screaming since he could hardly breathe now. Trampling down his arms, Oroba looked down at Caro. He had no intention of killing Caro right now. It wasn't because he felt Caro was too valuable to be killed. He still had to collect some more information from Caro, such as the location of a hiding place outside the dungeon where Samuel could hide her specific information about her power. Of course, it didn't mean Oroba had time to torture him slowly. Moreover, he had to deal a blow to Samuel by killing Caro, so he intended to keep Caro alive at least until the necromancer who would extract information from his soul arrived. You won't die just because of these wounds, right? Oroba spoke to him in a friendly manner, but Caro desperately tried to cast a spell. But Oroba destroyed his half-finished magic by smashing his left foot. I can't help but admit it. Again, it wasn't about Caro. Oroba did not deny the pleasure arising deep inside him. He felt like his frustration with his humiliating fight against the Queen of Sloth and Samuel disappeared a bit. The three directors went under the King of Pride for different reasons, of course. Chapter 243 Abrasax feared the King of Pride. At the same time, he wanted to run around, showing off his power freely. He was like a thrilled child so anxious to show off his power and the dungeon market everywhere. Bifrons wanted the unification of the demon world. And he hoped he could join in the process of unification. The reason he went under the King of Pride was simple. Under the current situation, he felt the King of Pride was most likely to achieve the unification of the demon world. Then, what was the reason for Oroba to follow the King of Pride? Oroba thought at first that it was because he wanted a struggle. He also thought that it was because he wanted to stand on the winning side. But in the end, he had the same reason as Abrasax. He just wanted to use his hard-won strength and overwhelming violence to his heart's content. He also wanted more wealth and power. Oroba looked at the closed door of the deep flow instead of Caro who had fainted, unable to endure the pain. After taking a deep breath, he swung his clenched fist with full power. Not only the heavy steel door but also the wall attached to it was smashed heavily. The whole dungeon shook as if the dungeon itself was screaming. Oroba once again felt satisfied. In order to thoroughly destroy the enemy, Samuel, he stepped into the deep floor. The dungeon market had dominated the commercial dealings of the demon world for the past 1000 years. In terms of influence, it could be called by far the strongest organization in the history of the demon world. Nevertheless, the dungeon market was always fair. They did not act like a bully nor did they pose any threat. They treated customers at a reasonable price. Besides, they even promoted the welfare of the demon world by supplying food at a low price. This kind of policy lasted over a thousand years. Inhabitants of the demon world became accustomed to the policy of the dungeon market. Eventually, they forgot how dangerous an organization they could become. Even the powerful masters of estates were not wary of the dungeon market, even though they kept a suspicious eye on their neighbors and their subordinate spirits. Therefore, the sudden hostilities by the dungeon market were fatally detrimental to its reputation as much as the betrayal of the insiders. The King of Envy looked around with an embarrassed expression. Every place was under the threat of the King of Pride's forces. Even though he was moving secretly, his location was exposed, and many of the reinforcement units who promised to arrive by now did not arrive. 
many of the masters standing by him complained about the sudden loss of their mana. Some of them lost almost half of their mana. Besides, the King of Envy sensed that some of his dungeons had been destroyed. Even the giant castle of Envy, his main base, was attacked. He needed to know why. Unable to suppress his anger, the king gave out a screech and released his mana. He expressed intense feelings through the seven towering horns on his head. The childish king of pride. The king of envy didn't know how it happened, but he knew clearly who initiated this turmoil. The intense feelings he released turned into black smoke. It was shaped like a demon. Faced with the king of envy, the army of the king of pride knelt to express due manners. When tens of thousands of troops on the plains lowered their heads to show their respect, it created such a spectacular scene. The King of Envy felt angry though. The subject of their respect was not the King of Envy, but the sky. Leviathan, somebody said in a low voice, which infuriated him all the more. Currently, the only one who could call his name was the King of Lust who achieved great things with him over a thousand years. Only she was equal to the King of Envy himself. The King of Envy stared at the sky with bloodshot eyes. The King of Pride, wearing golden armor and spreading his white wings, accompanied by his own royal troops, was watching over the ground arrogantly. You, bastard! What the hell are you doing? shouted the King of Envy. The dungeon market stands by my side. The King of Pride put it bluntly, and the King of Envy blinked, speechless for a moment. The King of Pride fully enjoyed the stupid change of expression on his face. Then he descended toward the ground, stepping on the sky like a staircase. When a delivery man from the dungeon market came to the door, any master opens the door without any doubt. No one thinks that the item purchased from the dungeon market contains a deadly magic bomb that will destroy the dungeon as well as its heart. The King of Envy hastily looked at the house masters around him. Each of them whose strength was reduced by half looked at him with despair. The destruction of the dungeon's heart meant the death of the dungeon. And it caused the death of the subordinate spirits who signed the contract through the dungeon. The death of the subordinate spirits was special. Some of the masters were consumed with severe stress. Some fell on the floor and wept. The King of Pride landed on the ground. The ground troops of the King of Pride showed due manners to him with their heads lowered. Dungeon spirits are different from subordinate spirits. They are just bound by contacts. If they can sacrifice themselves, they can also act against their masters like the numerous dungeon spirits that you purchased through a secret deal. The King of Envy could not respond at all. He felt like he was spaced out. The dungeon market is taking side with the King of Pride? The five directors in charge of the secret deal at the dungeon market are now the King of Pride subordinates. He couldn't believe it. But the current reality facing him proved it all. The King of Envy looked around again. Some of his troops showed due manners to the King of Pride. Some of the masters who were with him were seen no more. The King of Pride did not hold back his laughter. He shrugged ostensibly. Oh, don't I have anyone who can sacrifice their lives for me? Consumables that can give their lives for you. The King of Envy once again expressed his terrible feeling. The black smoke that spread around them was united to form a giant shape, and the king stood behind it. Then he reached out to his waist in succession and pulled out the godly energy of pride in the shape of a sword. The king of pride saw the godly energy of pride. After suppressing his yearning for it with a smile, the king of pride grabbed the godly energy of lust in the shape of a dagger in one hand. It was a secret that only the three kings who shared their great achievement knew. Contrary to what was known to the outside world, the three kings of pride, envy, and lust did not have the godly energy pairing with their respective sin. On that day, one thousand and hundreds of years ago, the three kings exchanged their godly energy with each other. It was one of the measures to prevent their betrayal amongst themselves. We exchanged them too long ago. It's time I took mine back. The troops of the king of pride raised themselves at once. At the same time, the king opened up the horns and mana that he had suppressed until then. The king of envy shuddered. His original plan to shatter this childish king was shattered. It wasn't just because of the king of pride's terrifying mana that would dominate the entire battlefield. It's a lie. 
The king of envy barely uttered one word. But the king of pride smiled brightly. He stepped forward and approached him. The sunset came soon. After talking with Gus Ion, Yong Ho dismissed his subordinate spirits and sat down on the throne in the demon king's room. Since Catalina and Kai Wan were not there, the spacious room was tranquil. He then rummaged through his pocket and took out a golden key that was a little smaller than his palm. It was the final reward when he defeated Gus Ion, the last floor master of the arena. On the thirteenth floor, the bottom floor of the Labyrinth of Greed, is Mammon's secret room. And you can open the door of the secret room with only this key. Unfortunately, that's all I know. I don't know what's in the secret room. Recalling Gyushin's explanation, Yong Ho grabbed the key lightly. After taking his breath, he corrected his posture. He closed his eyes to access the virtual space of the dungeon market. Citri. The Queen of Sloth, who was the only one who kept Mammon's side until his final moment on that day, one thousand and hundreds of years ago. Yong Ho had no intention of questioning why she concealed her identity. It was funny for him to comfort her while mentioning Mammon's last moment. But he thought he should meet Citri. Whatever it was, he wanted to have a conversation with her. It looked funny, but he thought he would feel relieved when he heard her calling him my dear customer like before. He felt that peculiar sense while accessing the virtual space. He slowly opened his eyes and looked straight ahead. There was no one in the white space. As he already experienced it several times, he looked up a little higher, not embarrassed. Soon he would hear a voice informing him of Citri's absence. It would be not too late for him to decide after hearing the voice whether to wait for Citri or just go back. Recognition number, 009. Descendant of the Man. Yong Ho Chion, the current master of the Mammon family. Recognition has been completed. Welcome. Citri is currently attending a meeting of the five directors at the headquarters of the dungeon market. You can't chat with Citri at this time. Given that there was no mention of his option of waiting, it seemed that the meeting would not end any time soon. Right at that moment, the voice of a lively and cheerful girl echoed in his mind, contrary to the rather low and hard voice of a woman. Master. Gardamundi, the messenger of the Queen of Fury, has come to see you. Currently, she is waiting at the entrance of the dungeon. It was Lucia. Since she became strong thanks to her repeated growth, she could exchange a short conversation with him even when he was connected to the virtual space. Master. At Lucia's repeated call, Yong Ho nodded slowly. Somehow, he felt heavy, but he decided to go back instead of waiting in the white virtual space. He looked straight ahead for the last time before leaving. It seemed that Citri, who was asleep, appeared and said hello to him in a hurry. I am coming. Maybe he could reassess the virtual space tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. He closed his eyes and got disconnected from his dedicated virtual space. Chapter, 244 Blowing heavily between the canyons, the winter wind left behind a sharp scar. A light smell of blood spread widely on the wind. Samuel was dying. She suffered the loss of her left arm and one wing, but the real blow was Abrasaxa's mana that was squeezing her body. Abrasaxa's mana with snake blood was poison itself. Although she shook off his mana by all means, just a little bit of poison that remained inside her body ate away her soul and mana. Citri, hiding in a crack in the rock, hugged Samuel tightly. She held her head in her chest to give her some warmth. She could not see ahead well. Citri herself was not sure if she was poisoned by Abrasaxa's poison or if it was simply because of her failing stamina. As the fastest wing of the dungeon market, Samuel's power as a demon king was a space jump. As one of the five directors who was considered to be the same as the kings, except that she had no sin and godly energy, her power lagged far behind that of Stravati, who was the owner of the unclaimed land in the eastern area. Citri could not clearly locate where she and Samuel were located. However, she was convinced that she was far from the headquarters of the dungeon market. Maybe she jumped hundreds of kilometers away from it. She felt dizzy. The wounds of her soul she suffered on the day of Mammon's death were opened up again. The price she had to pay for using the power of sloth excessively was harsher than expected. However, she had no choice but to use the power of sloth once again. 
Monsters were gathering toward her as if they smelled the blood blown on the wind. She had to avoid fighting them by all means. As things stood now, even a group of trifling ogres were a grave threat to her life. The power of hiding, one of the attributes of sloth, wrapped around Citri and Samuel, separating them from the world. Samuel. The reason why Samuel was in serious condition was not just because she was poisoned by a barisax. She had one more reason, which troubled Citri's mind. At some point, Samuel's mana was weakened sharply. Moreover, it was not just a simple weakening. The maximum amount of her mana itself decreased. Obviously, this was caused by the death of her subordinate spirits. Citri could not think of any other reason. Three betrayed directors were in control of the dungeon market. Besides, they already acquired the special auction house inside the dungeon market, which was Samuel's base. It was only a matter of time that the entire forces of Samuel fell into the hands of the three directors. Citri had to inform Yong Ho of this. She also had to warn the King of Violence and the Queen of Fury against this. Otherwise, they would collapse helplessly. Mammon. Citri closed her eyes, caressing Samuel. She could not remain conscious anymore. Like water was leaking from a broken vessel, her strength was constantly getting out of the wounds of her soul. The winter wind blew. Citri, who finally exerted her strength, lost consciousness. She fell into a deep sleep. Catalina, who always slept until late in the morning, found it hard to move around in the morning, but Yuria was jumping here and there vigorously, as always, as if she couldn't control her overflowing energy. This is the baby meerkat's bed, and next to it is Baduk's bed. And that one over there is the white wolf's bed. Yuria's room, also called the nursing room in the past, was very spacious. Raising her little hand, Yuria pointed to the beds of her friends sharing the room. The baby dungeon meerkat's bed was a miniature bed just right for a doll play, and Baduk's was an extra large bed that would allow even an ogre to lie down. Meowing. Like Yuria, the baby meerkat and Baduk raised their voices, jumping around. They were all smiles in a cheerful mood. However, the white wolf, the head of a group of wolves that once followed Embryo, remained silent with a complex and subtle expression. Unlike Baduk, he kept the attributes of a four-legged beast, so instead of a bed, he had a fluffy blanket and a straw suitable for leaning. Yuria was upset a bit because the white wolf didn't respond well as she wished. Yuria turned around and pointed to the pink bed opposite to Baduk's bed. It was the princess's bed that had a separate curtain as well as a roof on the bed. This is my bed. Isn't it pretty? Sister Kaiwan bought this blanket for me when she visited the human world with the master. As if she boasted, Yuria moved up and down the soft and fluffy cotton blanket. Obviously, she signaled to Skathack with a glance, asking her to touch it. As she was responsible for making her thrilled like this, Skathack did not refuse Yuria's favor. After stroking Yuria's head as well as the cotton blanket, she pointed to the large mattress in the middle of the room and the blanket spread over it. Then, what is this? At Skathaka's asking, Yuria scratched her face instead of immediately replying. Then she said while twisting her body slightly, he he he. I think we will feel lonely if each of us sleeps separately. So, we're going to sleep together at night. Only then did Skathak understand why each of their beds was so clean. She said with a big smile, Hey Yuria, then, shall I sleep here with you guys tonight? Really? Are you sure? Yuria asked with her eyes wide open. With her eyes wide open too, Skathak replied, Yes, I mean it. Yuria screamed and hugged her. Hugging her in her arms, Skathak closed her eyes. She was grateful that the first place she visited after leaving her mansion in 1000 years was Yuria's room. Watching them at a distance, Gusayan and Yongho spoke at the same time, It's warm and cozy here. Yeah, it is. In particular, Gijin's gaze and voice contained his mixed feelings. Skathak had always liked children. Skathak, who could be called the incarnation of life, could not get pregnant with Gijin's baby. As they had fundamentally different attributes from the beginning, it was inevitable. The Queen of Fury has requested for a meeting. Instead of indulging in idle thoughts, Gus Ion brought out a different topic. Yong Ho nodded slowly, 
recalling his meeting with Garda Mundi yesterday afternoon. It seems like she wants to attack the territory of the King of Gluttony with us. Of course, she wants to discuss the details at the meeting. The Queen of Fury did not know that the King of Gluttony was killed. If she had known that, she would have hurried to attack a little earlier. Well, I think there are many guys who can give you better advice than I, so let me skip it. But. Gus Ion, who blurred at the end of him speaking, dropped the cigarette that he was going to put in his mouth habitually. After looking at Skathack and Yuria still holding each other tightly with a pleasant expression, he said, I recommend you occupy the eleventh floor before going to the meeting. Since you've been recognized by Yescha, you won't have any big difficulties. Even if Lucia couldn't take full control of the eleventh floor, you might get Yuno's recognition. What I mean is there is nothing to lose if you challenge the eleventh floor. Just like Gus Ion said, if Yongho got the recognition of Virgo Yuno guarding the eleventh floor, who was counting the stars, Mammon's godly energy would be complete. So, it was better for Yongho to hurry up. There are only good episodes about this lady named Yuno, oh, who I feel a bit uncomfortable to call a woman. Is it true? Asked Yongho. Actually, that's true. Although she isn't as good as Skathak, she has a pretty good personality. She was the cook of the Mammon family as well as a great wizard. Oh, sorry, what you want to know about her is nothing like this. She is a beauty, yes she is really beautiful. She has a slim figure, and she is a beauty with a different charm than Elun or Skathak, Gus Ion replied in a subtle voice. At that moment, the flames of the red lotus arose in the air above Yongho's head. Master, the power of your anguish is increasing. Nope. And I wasn't curious about her look. Yong Ho, who cut off Amun's words in the middle, frowned without finishing his words. Gus Ion laughed heartily and said, that's why I like my master. He is honest. Yong Ho sighed. After holding back Amun, who was trying to say something, he changed the topic. Let's stop the nonsense here. Let me proceed with making you my subordinate spirit. In fact, everyone said you should be the top priority because I've reserved the spot for you for a long time. Ha ha ha. Do you think you can really control me? Don't worry. I think I can even make Skathak follow suit after you. It wasn't just Yong Ho's mana that became strong as a result of the synthetic reinforcement. The power of greed also became stronger than before, so he could possess more subordinate spirits than before. It was unreasonable for him to possess twelve spirits like Mammon, but it seemed possible for him to possess as many as ten. Then, why don't you do it in the afternoon after lunch? I think it will be efficient in many ways for you to proceed with it when all other subordinate spirits are gathered, said Gus Ion. Yuzhen's offer was quite reasonable because if Yong Ho made Gus Ion his subordinate spirit, it would have an immediate effect on other subordinate spirits. Okay, then I'll see you later in the afternoon. Yong Ho stood up after replying gently. Instead of standing up after him, Gus Ion laughed playfully and bowed to him with an exaggerated gesture. Goodbye, master. See you then, Yong Ho also replied a bit hyperbolically like Gus Ion and left Yuria's room. Chapter, 245 Ophelia and Tigrius returned to Cadis Fortress last night, and Elagos was busy providing shelters for a dozen former masters of the Mammon family as well as almost one hundred spirits of the arena. Yong Ho sat alone in the Demon King's room, leaving alone Kai Wan, who was just enjoying oversleeping openly, and Catalina struggling to wake up in the morning. As soon as he sat on the throne, he heard Lucia's voice. Are you trying to access the virtual space of the dungeon market? Yes, because I have to meet Citri. Also, I have to buy lots of stuff to strengthen my forces. Okay. I will prepare it right away. Please close your eyes. Yong Ho buried himself a little more comfortably on the throne. As soon as he closed his eyes, he got connected to the virtual space of the dungeon market. The whole white world was the same as the one he saw yesterday. Faced with an empty world, he let his shoulders droop in a little disappointment. Apparently, Citri had not yet returned. But suddenly, the sky turned red. At the same time, the endlessly connected space was cut off. The white floor quickly shrunk to a dozen-meter-long rectangle, and all other spaces were filled with pitch darkness. 
It was a completely different reaction from what he felt yesterday. Recognition number, 009. Descendant of that man. Emergency response 17. As of now, all connections between the virtual space and the public network of the dungeon market will be blocked. Only access from the labyrinth of greed is allowed. Citri. Yong Ho shouted instinctively. But he heard no reply from her. The letter of light also did not continue anymore. He felt ominous. It was clear that something had happened to Citri. The wording emergency made his heart pound rapidly. Citri. Answer me. Citri. No matter how often he called her name loudly, it was useless. He tried to stay calm. Instead of screaming blindly, he thought about it. This space was special. He always met Citri here. According to the light text, Citri went to the trouble of disconnecting this space from the network of the dungeon market, while keeping it connected with the labyrinth of greed. He recalled the memories of Citri, who he had seen the other day. The place where his memory had been reproduced was also this space. Citri sometimes appeared on the bed. She wasn't just acting, but she sometimes met him after waking up from a pretty deep sleep. So, he immediately realized that this space was not just a terminal. It was completely different from the place where other masters reached when accessing the virtual space of the dungeon market. In other words, it was Citri's personal space as well as her secret place. He closed his eyes and concentrated. Strongly yearning for Citri, he activated the power of greed. The smoke of greed arose like a flame. Spreading out in all directions, it filled the space at once, and it soon aggregated to form several strands. Finally, they became one and led him to the way. The air cracked, revealing a hidden secret door. The smoke of greed surrounded the door layer by layer. It shouted that there was something inside that he yearned for. He opened his eyes again and concentrated his mana. Breaking it halfway, he opened the secret door. Perhaps because the opponent was Yong Ho, the secret door led him in helplessly. So the place appeared. It was a space that was clearly reproduced on top of a virtual space, and therefore, it would have an impact on the real world. The smoke of greed moved once again. Permeating inside the secret door, it quickly wrapped up a huge red jewel in the middle of the room. It was the heart of the dungeon, connected with Citri's soul, her alter ego. He once again followed the guidance of greed. He put his hand on the heart of the dungeon then spoke to it as if he was dealing with Lucia. He tried to communicate with the heart of the dungeon. The heart of the dungeon, like the secret door, did not reject Yong Ho. It accepted him and told him what he wanted. And how long did it pass? Citri. He immediately got out of the virtual space then sprang to his feet. He was occupied with only one thing at the moment. He had to save Citri. The subordinate spirits of the Mammon family gathered at the door control station in the space on the ninth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. As soon as he got connected to Ophelia and Tigrius in Caddis Fortress by remote communication, Yong Ho immediately took out the main topic. There were two main things that Yong Ho learned through the heart of Citri's dungeon. First, Citri was dying now. Second, Citri's current location was somewhere in the north. Even through the heart of the dungeon, I could not find out her location accurately. I just know roughly where she is now. But you have to search the whole area to find her. Yong Ho's tone was firm. Ophelia, who was looking closely at the map of light that Lucia displayed in the air, presented her opinion. The dungeon market has its own territories throughout the demon world after the Six Kings recognized its influence. The headquarters of the dungeon market is located near the place you mentioned. It's a place where the five directors might have held a meeting. Ophelia raised her hand and pointed at the map. Lucia marked the area with a separate light. Yong Ho felt that it was the dungeon market's own territory. The headquarters of the dungeon market was located in a place where the territories of the Queen of Fury, the King of Gluttony, and the King of Lust bordered each other. Master, this is the location information of the doors of space currently available. Bright spots of light spread over the demon world. Its number decreased as they went beyond the blank area, but fortunately, there was a light near the headquarters of the dungeon market. Is the closest one inside the territory of the King of Lust? 
Although the door of space was not deep in the territory of the King of Lust, it was still within his territory. However, Yong Ho did not have any fear now. Even if it was located right next to the gate of the dungeon of the King of Lust, he was ready to carry out the operation. Gus Ion said in a low voice, Master, you seem to be in a hurry. Citri won't die easily. But Yong Ho stared at him immediately because he knew that Gus Ion had some feelings of love and hate toward Citri. Before he knew it, he looked at Gus Ion with a hostile expression. However, Gus Ion dealt with him casually, as usual. Soon Yong Ho let out a sigh first. He admitted that he was excited at the moment, so he tried to calm down. Tigrius, watching them quietly, said in a calm voice, I think it's also important to understand why this situation happened. Citri is one of the five directors of the dungeon market as well as the Queen of Sloth. So, it is very unusual and grave that she was on the verge of dying and neglected somewhere in the north. You mean this is an event involving the directors or even a king, Gus Ion added. As Amun said, she was the Queen of Sloth even if she suffered an irreparable injury. It was impossible for her to plunge in such a dangerous situation at the attack of ordinary men. That doesn't matter, Yong Ho cut off Gus Ion. If the opponent drove Citri into such a precarious situation, he must be very strong. But that didn't really matter to Yong Ho. The only thing that matters at this point is the fact that we are going to save Citri. Lucia, mark the position of the door of space once again. Okay, master. Apparently, influenced by Yong Ho's mood, Lucia responded in a rather hard tone and hurriedly followed his order. He continued to order, as you can see, the territory of the King of Lust is the closest to the door of space. Let me start exploring from there. He was urgent. He was nervous. He was definitely getting excited. However, it did not mean that he could not make a correct judgment. For everything except for Citri, he spoke and acted, based on his rationale. It is unreasonable to fly Tiamat directly across the territories of the King of Gluttony and the King of Lust. The invisible air barriers that the kings might have laid out in the sky pose a threat, but the bigger problem is our flying time. Therefore, instead of sending large troops through the flying vehicle, we are going to use the door of space. After infiltrating the territory of the King of Lust with a small elite force, we are going to search for Citri. Yong Ho paused for a moment and looked at Salami and Bucephala standing nervously behind the subordinate spirits. Unlike the usual meetings where they were absent, he had them attend at this time for this reason. Salami, who evolved into a fire elemental dragon, could adjust his size to some extent thanks to his attribute as a spirit. If he could stretch his body as much as possible, he could carry more than four on his back. Since we have to put priority on our mobility, all of us can't go. Moreover, we have to take into account how often we can use the door of space. So, let me call the names who will go with me. It was because of the limits to the daily use of the door of space that Ophelia and Tigrius attended the conference by a long-distance communication instead of coming directly to the labyrinth of greed. They could move through the space door control station only twice a day. Ophelia and Tigrius could not come. Yong Ho looked at the rest of the subordinate spirits. Gus Ion, Skathak, Kaiwan, Catalina, Skull. Chapter, 246. He smiled slightly at Gus Ion. So, with the help of Lucia, he registered Gus Ion as his subordinate spirit. He was the eighth subordinate spirit of his. Whenever they were added as his subordinate spirits one by one, the effect of their registration was reduced, but this time it was none other than Gus Ion. Yong Ho felt an enormous power like Gus Ion was joining him. He closed his eyes before he knew it and opened his horns. All his subordinate spirits did the same thing. With them opening up their horns fully, they felt the addition of a new power. In particular, the changes in Gus Ion and Catalina were significant. Mana was released from Gyuzhan's two horns that looked like a bull's. Gus Ion recovered some of the mana he had lost when Mammon died. Catalina's change was even more dramatic. Struggling in extreme pleasure and pain, she screamed, hugging her shoulders. White light was glaring in her eyes, and soon, new horns grew through her white hair. Like Kai Wan, she overcame the limits and obtained the sixth horn. Other subordinate spirits also felt their strength increase. 
Yong Ho let out a long breath to control his mana. After controlling not only his but also other subordinate spirits' mana, he removed his hand from Dujin's shoulder. Kaiwan quickly supported Catalina. There was a pleasant smile on her face covered with cold sweat. Normally, Yong Ho would have taken care of Catalina and Kaiwan, but he could not for now. He was so impatient at the moment. After asking Skathak to heal the two women, he ordered Lucia to activate the door of space. Magnadon, the wizard of Mammon, died. However, his legacy, the door of space, played its part even at this moment. Let's go. Yong Ho took the lead and stepped into the door of space. Kaiwan looked at him with some anxious expression but soon followed him with Catalina. After Gus Ion, Skathak, Salami, and Bucephalus went in, Skull tapped his chest, looking at Eligos as if to tell him not to worry. After smiling at him cheerfully, he finally entered the door of space. Let alone, Eligos closed the door of space. He prayed for Yong Ho's safety. There were many gorges and mountains in the land of the King of Lust. The stiff cliffs and rocky mountains had long served as a natural fortress to protect the king's territory. The door of space was inside the collapsed cave the entrance was cut off from the outside because of the large stones clogged up, which fortunately helped maintain the door of space for over a thousand years. Almond drove out the darkness by emitting only light from the flames of the red lotus. Gus Ion punched the rocks lightly to turn them into powder while Skathak solidified the collapsed sites with the moisture she pulled up from the basement. She took the measure to prevent the cave from collapsing again. Yong Ho could escape the cave within minutes of his arrival, thanks to the three subordinate spirits' excellent cooperation. A cold northern wind blew through the canyon. Facing the huge cliff in front of her, Kai Wan looked around with anxious eyes. She could sense the scent of the sword blade ogres, the wild monsters living in a group in the cold wind. If Citri was really dying, even those monsters would be dangerous. But. The gorge was too wide for Yong Ho and his party to search for Citri right away. He couldn't figure out where and how to search for her. Yong Ho swallowed, at a loss of what to do. Amun whispered to him in flames. Master, yearn for Citri. Maximize the possessiveness and bring out the power of greed. The only thing Yong Ho could rely on was to follow his desire for greed. However, the situation was different in the case of Catalina and Kai Wan, now Yong Ho's possession through their registration as his subordinate spirits. He had never had any desire for possessing Citri. He closed his eyes and thought about Citri. He thought about her when he held her in his arms and when he was held in her arms. That was clearly different from his possession. However, his greed did not forsake his desire. The energy of his greed that he was releasing at full blast engulfed everything around him. And soon, it became one and led him the way. It wasn't too far. She was surprisingly close to where he was. Salami. The moment Yong Ho ordered Salami, he spread his wings. After increasing his body as much as possible, he lay flat and let them get on it. Yong Ho, Kai Wan, Gus Ion, and Skat Hak climbed on it, and Salami flew without hesitation. Bucephalus, carrying Skull, followed. Catalina spread her wings of shadow and soared into the sky. Salami was flying low, so he could not be detected by the air barrier. Salami flew with all his might, and Bucephalus ran not only on the ground but also on the walls of the canyon without any fear. Catalina flew ahead of Salami and watched out for the ground. And at one moment, Catalina flew toward the ground as if she was falling. Yong Ho felt his heart beating fast. He felt it when he met the Queen of Fury or the King of Gluttony, but his feelings were different this time. There were many ogres on the ground with blade-like protrusions on their bodies. They were hostile to Catalina who suddenly appeared, but only briefly. The appearance of Skull and Bucephalus alone frightened them. Faced with Skull's glaring eyes, they got frightened and fled in chaos. Salami landed safely on the ground. Jumping on the ground in a hurry, he moved his gaze following the smoke of greed. There was something deep in the pile of rocks piled up randomly. There was nothing clearly visible because of something like a magical power, but he could feel it. His heart was pounding more and more. The power of sloth. After withdrawing the power of greed, he moved forward. 
Then he burned the barrier of sloth with the power of greed. At the moment, the space was twisted as if a haze was rising. A couple of human figures were seen through the pile of rocks. Citri. It was Scathack who shouted at her. She rushed to the pile of rocks. Then she held her breath, looking down at the two bloody women. It was Citri holding a blonde, black-winged woman. As she was a thousand years ago, she was always beautiful even though she was covered with blood. Scathack unwittingly shed tears. Citri was not the subject of resentment toward her. She was her precious colleague who had gotten out of the battlefield a thousand years ago. Even though she just took a glimpse of Citri, she was choked up with emotions. Even before wiping her tears, Scathack filled her hands with vitality. She then breathed it into Citri and Samuel. Both of you are still alive. You're very weak, but it's okay. I'll never let you die because I'm here, said Scathack. Yong Ho let out a sigh of relief, holding back the urge to hug Citri right away. She was in better shape than he was worried. Samuel. The one held in Citri's arms was obviously Samuel, the fastest wing, and one of the five directors of the dungeon market. Given that not only Citri but also Samuel was put in a precarious situation, something really big must have happened at the dungeon market. Is there a rebellion inside the dungeon market? The dungeon market was operating normally at this moment. Actually, Yong Ho had one of the masters in the eastern area to buy an item there and confirmed their operation. Be it an internal uprising or an external enemy, it was obviously a very covert attack. If there had been a massive attack, they could not have run the market normally as if nothing had happened. He stopped thinking. After getting next to Scathack, he quietly held her hand. The Queen of Sloth, when all the other kings betrayed Mammon, she stayed with him until the very end. He could not hear her reply, but Scathack's healing efforts brought color to her pale face. Scathack signaled to him with a glance. He carefully held Citri while Gusion held Samuel. I just gave first aid to them. I need to heal them properly in the Garden of Life. Yong Ho nodded. After tightening his arms holding Citri, he headed to Salami. They hastily left the place. The dungeon of the King of Envy was the same as yesterday. Nothing changed except the fact that its owner changed. The throne of the King of Envy. The King of Pride sat there, which belonged to the King of Envy for more than a thousand years. The King of Pride felt deep satisfaction. The power of Envy surging deep down delighted him all the more. Leviathan, the King of Envy, was dead. However, his forces were still fighting the forces of the King of Pride. Of course, they were not fighting out of loyalty to their late king. Most of them were unaware of the fact that their king was dead. And, interestingly, the forces of the King of Pride didn't know it either. Intelligence was power. Over time, it would be inevitable for them to learn that the King of Envy had died and that the dungeon market had been taken over by the King of Pride. If that was the case, the King of Pride needed to delay it as long as possible. Ignorance was always a fatal weakness. The King of Lust was actually the King of Pride himself. The godly energy of lust that he had around his waist was that of envy, not lust, proved it. The King of Pride closed his eyes and counted the numbers. He checked what he missed in his plan. First, the King of Sloth. He preferred Citri, who revealed herself as the specific enemy, to the Queen of Sloth that didn't appear, hiding somewhere. It was surprising to him that she was the Queen of Sloth, but according to the report of Bifrons, Citri at the moment was badly wounded. By now she was on the verge of dying. The Queen of Fury was nothing but a little kid. She didn't know how to fight properly and ran wild on the battlefield, saying that she would save her subordinates. As a woman who didn't know the fact that she was the queen, she couldn't be a match for him. Although he didn't like it very much, the King of Violence was powerful. Moreover, it was highly likely that the King of Violence killed the King of Gluttony, though he assumed it was a possibility for now. If he had obtained the godly energy of fury as well as that of gluttony, he must have changed into a formidable enemy by now. But even so, the king of violence would have two different sins. In other words, the king of violence and the queen of fury were not united into one. They couldn't do anything with such half-baked cooperation. 
there was a reason why dragons were called the arrogant nickname Dragonlord. Moreover, the Queen of Sloth had no connection with the other two kings. The three kings who had to confront the King of Pride. They existed as separate entities with no central figure to lead them. Then what should he do? His answer was simple. The King of Pride drew a line on the map of the demon world that came to his mind. He ordered the soul of his dungeon to deliver a message to the camp of the King of Gluttony. The sun had set and the night came. On the darkest night without even a star, the King of Gluttony's army began to move. They were marching into the west, to the territory of the Queen of Fury. Chapter, 247 The sky was blue and dark. There was still a lot of time left until it was dawn. The central temple, one of the sacred places of the eight clans, was as quiet as always. It was even more so because there was no strong wind blowing because of the terrain where the temple was located. It was quiet. Since everyone was asleep, there was supposed to be no sound at all, let alone footsteps. But not today. Lots of people went back and forth, raising their voices. Among them was Kurtamuka, the nanny as well as the bodyguard of the Queen of Fury. Your Majesty! Your Majesty! Kurtamuka shouted, who jumped into her room forcefully as if to destroy it. Her behavior was very rude, given that the one staying in this room was not only the chieftain of the Gondorf clan but also the Queen of Fury. But Kurtamuka didn't care at all. She didn't act arrogantly just because she was the Queen's closest aide. Your Majesty! Your Majesty! Wake up now. Your Majesty. She shook the Queen's shoulders violently with her big hand. The Queen, who was drooping on the big bed, opened her eyes wide open and talked nonsense, half awake. Ah, I didn't doze. No, I didn't nod off. Yes, I did so. Oops I'm sorry. Prince Antoniox, don't be upset. She was about to cry at the end of her words. It seemed that Mahora, who was a teacher of etiquette to her, saw Antoniox in her dream. Kurtamuka grew even more urgent. Once again she shook the queen's shoulders and shouted. Your Majesty! A terrible thing has happened. Wake up! Kurtamuka! The queen finally spoke, blinking her eyes. Her voice was very weak since she usually slept late in the morning. Kurtamuka shouted, holding her shoulders, it's a war. The army of the King of Gluttony has crossed the border. Battles are currently underway along the eastern border. The queen suddenly came to her senses. As soon as the queen got up from her bed suddenly, Kurtamuka said, picking up the clothes on the bed, a meeting of the representatives of the eight clans was called. As they are coming to the conference room, you have to hurry up. She was not in the movable dungeon, Vimana, but the temple of the eight clans. Besides, the representatives of the eight clans were also in the same place because of a series of meetings every day. She asked Kurtamuka instinctively. How big is their invasion? Is it big enough to require the convening of the representative of the eight clans? It's not clear yet. But it looks like an all-out war. It was already a few months ago that the Queen of Fury and the King of Gluttony deployed their own troops on the border areas. Because of this, their invasion and defense against each other was quick. The Queen of Fury slapped herself on the cheek with both hands. After completely waking up, she and Kurtamuka left the room. She was dressed in baggy pajamas, but she had no time to change her clothes leisurely. More than half of the heads of the eight clans already gathered in the conference room located in the center of the temple. Some of them were in pajamas like the Queen, others with their hair disheveled. The queen sat on her seat reserved for the head of the Gondarv clan. If she could have her way, she wanted to rush to the battlefield right now, but she had to endure it. In some cases, an all-out war could take place, so even if she was impatient, she needed to review and discuss the matter with them. She felt every minute, every second was so long. It took more than a few minutes for all the representatives to gather, and it took another more minutes for them to receive the briefing from those who attended the meeting to brief them about the war status on the battlefield. The Queen of Fury clenched her teeth. The situation was worse than she thought. It seemed that the King of Gluttony was thinking of an all-out war. 
He was striking the Eastern Front by mobilizing large troops, which could not even be compared to the armed clashes they had exchanged several times so far. It seems that he mobilized even those troops that he had concentrated to confront the King of Lust. He was also moving the troops confronting the Dragon Legion dispatched by the King of Violence. He must be crazy. Somebody cursed at the king. The Queen of Fury also agreed. If he had not cursed, she would have done so. The King of Gluttony's attack was like a reckless warmonger. Aside from his troops deployed to check the King of Lust, how could he move the troops from the front line where they were pitted against the Dragon Legion? Was he going to do lance charging without taking into account the consequences? What about the King of Gluttony? Did you find out his whereabouts? Mahabharata, the head of the Deva clan, asked. A young Maharaga who attended the meeting to brief them about the war status replied hastily, he is not seen anywhere at the moment. The man who is spearheading the attack is Judiciarus, the demon king of earthquake, who was in charge of the eastern front. He was allegedly seen commanding his troops on the battlefield. Even at this moment, the battle was underway. The Queen of Fury once again suppressed her feelings. She quickly reviewed all the intelligence available and checked out the situation. The reason the Queen of Fury planned to attack the King of Gluttony was because of the alliance with the Master of the House of Mammon as well as the assistance of the King of Violence. On the other hand, the King of Gluttony had no alliance. Rather, the King of Gluttony was confronting not only the Queen but also the King of Violence. So, it was unreasonable for him to strike first in this situation. If that was the case, what happened? Did the King of Gluttony form an alliance that she was not aware of? Or did he join hands with the King of Lust? She thought that the absence of the King of Gluttony for more than a month was related to his efforts to form an alliance behind the scenes. But she kept thinking he didn't do it because such activities never befitted the king that she used to know. What happened to the King of Lust's forces? Why are they moving? At that moment, Kavalaka, the head of the Karvinka clan, asked the young Maharaga. With her hair and feathers turned white, she was calm as always. As if impressed by her serenity, the young Maharaga replied calmly, the King of Lust has never shown any sign of moving. According to the reports of our scouts there, the masters under the command of the king are also showing no movement at all. More than half the scouts of the eight clans were the Karvinka clan who could freely roam the sky. It was almost impossible for the king to move a large-scale military force without avoiding their watch, who could look very far down the sky. Actually, the king of lust did not move. It was clear that his army did not join the king of gluttony. The queen of fury stopped thinking. It was meaningless for her to think further. She got up from her seat and drew everyone's attention. Let me tell you this as the queen of the eight clans, not as the head of the Dryderaster clan. I'm going to join our forces in the Eastern Front from now on and confront the King of Gluttony's forces. The King of Gluttony was still missing. However, his troops were constantly gathering in the Eastern Front. The Eastern Front, where the war was currently going on, was of great strategic value because it was not far from the border that shared the territory of the King of Lust. Aside from the personality of the Queen of Fury, the Eastern Battlefield was worthwhile for any king because of its strategic value. Let me ask for the assistance of the King of Violence and the House of Mammon. I would like to enlist your full support from the rear. She already revealed at the meeting yesterday that she formed an alliance with the Mammon family as well as the King of Violence. She took a deep breath then looked at the head of the Dragon Clan and the head of the Deva Clan. As always, I'm going to assume the worst scenario. Both of you, please defend the northern area like before. We take your order. Sugura, the head of the Dragon Clan, and Asterio, the head of the Deva clan, paid their respect to the Queen of Fury. Like she said a moment ago, she was giving them an order not as the head of her Gondorf clan, but as the Queen of the Eight Clans. Head of the Garura clan, dispatch a messenger to the King of Violence. Gardamundi, once again, go to the House of Mammon and ask for emergency assistance. Biryapaka, the head of the Garura clan and Gardamundi's father, also showed due manners to her and followed her order. Although Gardamundi tried to protect the queen who was going on an expedition to the Eastern Front, she could not dare to resist her order in a public meeting like this, so she also accepted the queen's order politely. After revealing her war plan like that, 
the Queen of Fury said, it must be an unexpected attack. But we have been preparing for this kind of war. As always, I think we can overcome this crisis wisely. Their first meeting was finally over. The Queen hurried out of the conference hall and climbed on the back of Astra, a huge beast, with her bodyguards. She cleaned her body and armed herself with weapons on Astra's back. As large as a fully grown ancient dragon, Astra spread its iridescent wings. Then it immediately soared high in the sky and headed east. The sun was rising. The Queen of Fury grabbed the godly energy of gluttony. Chapter 248 Time passed without a pause. Nearly a day had already passed since Yong Ho saved Citri and Samuel. Yong Ho looked at the mansion of Sketch with a nervous expression. He tried to sleep for a moment at night, but he couldn't because he was so worried. He felt something strange about Citri this time. Of course, he always thought of her as a special woman, but little did he think she meant a lot to him like this. In his mind, she was as important as Catalina and Kaiwan. He closed his eyes tightly. Then he erased the old memories that kept coming to his mind. Back then, it was a different story. There was no more bereavement now. They are coming out. Kaiwan shouted. He quickly opened his eyes and looked straight ahead. Like Kaiwan said, Skathak and Yuscha were leaving the mansion with their faces exhausted. By keeping his promise to take Gus Ion here, Yong Ho could become the true owner of Skathak. Completely lifted from the blockade that bound her for more than 1,000 years, Skathak could move freely outside the mansion. It was the same for Yuscha. After having recognized Yong Ho as the new master of the Mammon family from the moment she met him, she could be lifted from her confinement to the central library by re-registering as a general dungeon spirit of the Mammon family. They didn't have any sleep throughout the night because they focused on healing Citri and Samuel, who were seriously wounded. Yong Ho felt sorry for their exhaustion. However, he couldn't even comfort them by praising their efforts. As soon as he saw them, he asked about Citri's health instinctively. Skathak let down her shoulders a bit and responded in a rather gloomy tone. She has survived, fortunately. It seems that she was wounded deeply in her intestines, but it's not severe enough to not be cured. But there is some problem with her soul. Her soul. Skathak nodded. She said, looking at the flames of the red lotus that already arose before she knew it, as Amun said, that must have something to do with what happened on that day. How can I describe Citri's condition? It's like a crack in one corner of a glass bottle. The crack grew bigger because she used the power of sin excessively in such a condition. Yong Ho felt ominous to hear that. As if she could not stand it, Kaiwan cut in suddenly, can't you heal her even with the power of evolution? In fact, he had healed quite a few injuries with the power of evolution so far. Since Catalina not only felt the power herself but also witnessed the rebirth of Goblin Yan, who was on the verge of dying, she looked at him with anticipation. But Skathak shook her head. Yuscha said, although the power of evolution is certainly very powerful, I don't think he can cure her soul with it. But don't worry too much. As Skathak said already, she has survived. Besides, she is the Queen of Sloth. As long as she regains her consciousness, she will be able to take care of her own wounds. Catalina curled her lips, and Kai Wan sighed. Skathak continued, in the case of Samuel, her injuries are much more severe, but because she was physically wounded, curing her is rather easy. I think she will recover her consciousness today or tomorrow. Yong Ho could restore Samuel at once with the power of evolution, but that was possible only when she could be available for evolution. Even if Samuel became a dungeon spirit of the Mammon family, it would take a considerable amount of time for her to gain evolution EXP enough for evolution. Moreover, she was one of the five directors who were allegedly on par with the kings in terms of strength, although she had none of the seven deadly sins and godly energy. Maybe she needed to gain evolution EXP, comparable to that of Amun or Gus Ion. Yong Ho breathed out long. He had only seen her face only a few times, but that didn't mean that he was not worried about Samuel. What happened at the dungeon market? While Skathak and Yuscha were concentrating on treating Citri and Samuel, Yong Ho ordered the masters under his command to stop trading with the dungeon market. 
he didn't make any big announcement about the suspension of all trading forever. He just ordered them to stop buying any stuff at the dungeon market for the time being. Citri. Yong Ho once again suppressed his nervousness. Now that Citri and Samuel were not in danger of losing their lives, all he had to do was to wait for them to regain their consciousness. Then he would be able to know exactly what happened at the dungeon market. Leave Citri to me and take some good rest. You look really haggard. Scat Hack asked Yong Ho to take a rest, but he could not say anything because he was sorry. In fact, it was Scat Hack who was exhausted most. Right at that moment, Lucia's voice was heard by everyone, not just Yong Ho. Master. Gardamundi has come back. It seems she has a very urgent business. Gardamundi, who visited the house of Mammon only two days ago, visited again. It was very unusual that she came back. Instead of responding at all, Yong Ho headed straight to the reception room, accompanied by Kai Wan and Catalina. Astra, the highest flying wild bird, flew 10,000 miles a day. Her iridescent wings shimmering in the sunlight shattered the clouds, and her giant body was flying ahead of the wind. The Queen of Fury sat on Astra's back and meditated. She calmed down her burning determination to fight with a sense of composure. Her abundant chest moved up and down as she breathed long. Although she was going to war, the queen was still lightly dressed. Her white-skinned, long arms and legs were revealed, and only her thin, white clothes fluttered over her slender figure. But she was much more colorful than usual. The godly energy of gluttony in the shape of a waistband wrapped around her thin and elastic waist. She wore gold jewelry on her ankles as well as her wrists. All of them were armed with a mysterious power. Her bodyguards lining up behind her back were also armed like her. They wore pure white clothes and wore gold coats on their arms and legs. The only one wearing armor was Kurtamuka of the Yakasha clan. There was no darkness under the sun that rose completely. The intangible wall spreading on Astra's back broke the violent wind, and various scent was transmitted from the fragments of the wind. Kurtamuka did not miss the smell of blood mixed with the wind. The battlefield was not far. The Queen of Fury slowly opened her eyes. She got up and looked down at the ground. At least tens of thousands of soldiers were entangled with each other while fighting. Luxurious and glamorous magic engulfed the battlefield, and huge spirits such as mountain giants and cyclops ran wildly in the battlefield. Strictly speaking, the forces of the Queen of Fury were on the defensive. The number of the King of Gluttony's troops was almost twice as the Queen's forces. The Queen changed the way she breathed. She clenched her fists tightly. In a quiet voice, she ordered Astra. Astra cried loudly and slowed down her flying speed. Her wild crying swept through the ground, carried by the wind. The fighting troops on the battlefield looked up at the sky. The queen's forces as well as the king of gluttony's troops looked at the same time. The queen of fury closed her eyes. Astra twisted her body in the air, and the queen and her bodyguards left their bodies to gravity for a free fall. Naturally, they flew toward the ground. The wind was strong. They were approaching the ground at a terrific speed, while Astra was fading away into the sky. The queen opened her eyes and glared at the ground. She saw and heard a lot of things there. She opened her arms like wings. At the same time, she activated the power of her golden robes, and fully released her thruster energy that she had been suppressing until now. The sky flashed with flashes of light. It seemed as if starlight was pouring into the red sky. Each of her bodyguards was disguised as a translucent thrust giant. It was an embodiment of a thrust energy developed by the Azura clan, the most outstanding fighting race among the eight clans. And the brightest light among them was that of the Queen of Fury. A golden light shone again from her, disguised as a red thrust energy giant. An enormous light poured out from the godly energy of gluttony, a lump of brigada. Every soldier on the battlefield staring at the sky lost their vision for a moment. The Queen of Fury, engulfed in a light as bright as the sun, pulled her clenched fists. She looked at the ground, not the king of gluttony's forces, then punched it with her fist, shouting loudly. The light disappeared. Instead, a massive explosion wave swept the battlefield. 
The ground split apart the moment she punched it hard. It was like a giant was cracking the whole earth. The moment she punched the ground, dozens of dungeon spirits nearby were killed by the impact of her punch. And the resulting earthquake shook the army of the King of Gluttony, sending hundreds of them off into the giant cracks or breaking them down on the ground. This time, meteor showers rained down on them endlessly. Her bodyguards, who were disguised as the thrust energy giants like the Queen, landed on the ground quickly, causing a giant shockwave across the battlefield. The Queen of Fury stood up, stretching her knees. While flying down, she remembered what she saw on the ground. Then she released all the mana that she had received from the godly energy of Gluttony but also Brigada. She was holding a giant axe almost the size of a human in the right hand of the thrust engine giant with a ghostly face. Pour out, lightning. As soon as she shouted, lightning struck from the dry sky. Moreover, not one, but several lightning struck simultaneously. A terrifying lightning storm swept the ground. All the soldiers on the battlefield were forced to look at the Queen of Fury because of her terrifying presence. Tens of thousands of eyes were like arrows. The sudden silence was even terrifying. Face them all, the Queen of Fury raised her fists high. Standing proudly among tens of thousands of troops, she pointed at herself. Look at me. Who do you think I am? Her voice was as deafening as lightning. The sound of her thunderous shouting, which nobody believed could have come from the slender queen, overwhelmed them. The Queen of Fury knew how to fight. The high morale of the troops on the battlefield where tens of thousands of troops fought worked a miracle. Stand up! Warriors of the Eight Clans! Ooh oh! Wah! The silence broke at the crying of the Queen of Fury. The atmosphere of the battlefield itself changed when the Queen's forces, which were on the defensive, shouted all at once. The thunderous shouting of the tens of thousands of troops shook the heaven and earth. It heralded the arrival of their queen. Not only the recruits who first fought on the battlefield but also the veterans who had already fought numerous battles knew the queen. Dhritarashtra, the queen of fury, always stood at the forefront. When she was with her troops, they were never defeated. As long as they trust her, their morale could not be higher. The queen of fury stood at the forefront again. Just as the Queen's army knew it, the forces of the King of Gluttony also knew it. Chapter, 249 After meeting Gardamundi, Yongho fell into confusion once again. He heard from her that the army of the King of Gluttony mounted the first strike against the forces of the Queen of Fury. Objectively speaking, their attack was unthinkable, which was what Yongho never expected. The King of Gluttony was dead. If so, who in the world moved the King's army? The king's successor. The warlords who replaced the king's ten warriors. Either way, it was very strange. The king of gluttony's invasion was like a suicidal action. Who dared to challenge the queen of fury? Didn't they care about Yong Ho or the king of violence at all? Oh, master of the Mammon family, king of the unclaimed territory. Yong Ho suddenly raised his head at Gardamundi's call. She was looking straight at him. Although she was usually playful and lively, she was different now. She was extremely tense. Are you hiding something? Gardamundi asked. She asked calmly, but it looked like she was questioning him. Kaiwan and Catalina, who were standing behind his back, reacted at the same time. Their sharp gaze at her seemed to rip her apart at any moment. However, Gardamundi looked only at Yongho without moving at all. He was agonizing, faced with her. He had an alliance with the Queen of Fury. She was a good ally who would join hands with him to conquer the North in the future. If so, wasn't it okay to tell her the truth? If he shared the intelligence with the Queen, wasn't it possible to solve the current mystery by sharing information with each other? But he couldn't make the decision on impulse. If something went wrong, their alliance could be affected. Even if he decided to tell the truth, he needed to tell it directly to the Queen of Fury, not Gardamundi. Yong Ho opened his mouth. Gardamundi looked at him more sharply. At that moment, Lucia shouted. Samuel has regained consciousness. He sprang to his feet suddenly. As Lucia's voice was only delivered to Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits, Gardamundi became even more suspicious. 
I have an urgent message from the soul of the dungeon. Please wait for a moment. After speaking to her immediately, he closed his eyes. When he strengthened his connection with Lucia, he could bring out a video. It showed the inside of Skathaka's mansion. Caro. Caro. No. As soon as she opened her eyes, Samuel screamed and twisted her body. She must have recalled the shock when her subordinate spirits were massacred. Skathak quickly hugged her and breathed warm vitality into her, holding her in her arms. Samuel cried out loud. Then she was drooping. She then raised her head again. She looked at Skathak blankly. Obviously, she was far from normal. It seemed that it was difficult for him to get any meaningful information from her right now. But it was too early for him to give up. Yuscha grabbed Samuel's other hand. Then Yuscha injected mental magic into her body with warmth, and Skathak blew vitality into her again. Samuel was not an ordinary woman. As the head of the Harpy clan, she was strong enough to be one of the five directors. And her strength wasn't limited to her mana or physical body. Instead of healing Samuel's emotional wounds, Yuscha gave her a strong stimulus to shake up her mind. Quat. Samuel suddenly clenched her teeth. She cried again and gasped for breath. Then she looked around as if she came to her senses finally. Madam Citri. Citri was soaking her whole body in blue water at that moment. After confirming her face and safety, Samuel slowly pushed Skathak out of her arms once again, she rolled her eyes and found a face she recognized. Yuria, who was treated dearly by the master of the Mammon family as if she were his daughter, was looking at her while crouching in the corner of the mansion. Given the dog-like spirit and the baby dungeon meerkat, it was clear that this place was the house of Mammon. Samuel. Skathak carefully called her. She raised her head again and judged the situation quickly. Her own mana decreased sharply. All her senses connected to her subordinate spirits disappeared. She knew clearly what happened. Then, now wasn't the time to hesitate anymore. She cried out, with full confidence in the relationship between the Mammon family and Citri. Abrasax, Oroba, and Bifrons sold the dungeon market. They attacked me and Citri. The dungeon market today is nothing but the puppet of the King of Pride. Her voice was transmitted through Lucia. Yong Ho opened his eyes. Catalina was at a loss of what to do while Kai Wan looked at him, clenching her teeth. It was the worst situation he didn't even imagine. It wasn't just like a simple internal uprising within the dungeon market. The dungeon market joined hands with the King of Pride. At that moment, Yong Ho realized something. It was as if a lightning bolt passed through his head. The King of Pride. If the new strongmen in the territory of the King of Gluttony gave up protecting it and dedicated their loyalty to somebody else, who would be their master? The King of Pride was still at war with the King of Envy. The King of Lust's territory was located between those of these two kings. Then, what was the position of the King of Lust? Did the King of Pride make an alliance with the King of Lust? What if the King of Pride took over the forces of the King of Gluttony and even the dungeon market? What could the king do with his increased power? Father. A woman screaming broke his indulgence in such idle thoughts. Startled, he looked ahead. Gardamundi was trembling. In astonishment, she looked at the feather-shaped communication device connecting her and her father, Biryabaka. Gardamundi hadn't said anything yet. However, Yongho felt immediately what the King of Pride could do when he took possession of the dungeon market, and what could happen if the king attacked other forces. Gardamundi raised her head, confirming Yongho's conviction. The lords in the demon world traded their dungeon spirits at the dungeon market. It was no exaggeration to say that more than 90% of the spirits in the demon world were bought and sold at the dungeon market. All those spirits, and the elite troops that could be deployed at any time. They were not the only items possessed by the dungeon market. But that didn't matter. Only the fact that the dungeon market managed them was important. The King of Lust was with the King of Pride. The army of the King of Gluttony knelt before the King of Pride. Just like he dealt with the King of Envy, the King of Pride didn't need to keep his invasion secret. His invasion of the territory of the Queen of Fury through the dungeon market was clearly an effective means, 
but he could not keep relying on it. But the lords under the command of the Queen of Fury were not suspicious of the dungeon market just like the King of Envy subordinates. They welcomed it, as always. At the moment when the Queen of Fury cheered with her forces, the King of Pride began massacres throughout the Queen's territory. The Queen of Fury, who became a red flash and struck the battlefield, was beautiful. As expected, she always led her own bodyguards to the battlefield as soon as a large-scale battle broke out. The King of Lust stretched his body's length. His hair, white like snow, fell down on his shoulders and chest. His red eyes stood out between his pale face. Since he could take any shape, regardless of age or sex, the King of Lust had no such thing as a true self. It was also impossible to identify himself because of the additional effect of the sin of lust from his birth. For this reason, the King of Lust chose one of his countless alter egos as his true self. Actually, he decided on it a thousand years ago. It was something like a woman that the King of Lust believed as her true self. The King of Lust, Asmodeus, gently grasped the godly energy of lust. This new energy, which the king had separated on that day a thousand years ago, greeted him gladly. It changed its shape from a dagger to a long and thin sword. In the distance, the Queen of Fury was fighting. She stood out among the forces fighting the army of the King of Pride. The Queen of Sloth had one of the seven deadly sins and the godly energy, but he had no forces. The King of Violence had one of the forces and the godly energy, but he had no sin. Only the Queen of Fury had everything. Seven horns of light sprouted above the head of the King of Lust. Once called the best swordsman of the demon world, the King of Lust released the sin of lust from his fingertips. His heart was pounding. The King of Lust felt the Queen of Fury was on the battlefield now. The Queen of Fury also felt him. Even though she was still hundreds of meters away from him, the Queen looked back exactly where the King was. She was startled to find him. The King of Lust had a sad smile. He stepped forward and moved to the Queen forcefully. Let me go back now, Gardamundi said unwittingly. She was almost aghast. She served as the Queen of Fury's eyes and ears. At the same time, she was the only daughter of Biryabaka, the King of the Garura clan. She could gather all sorts of information in real time. She instantly knew both the Queen of Fury and the Temple of the Eight Clans were in danger, so she could not stay any longer. She had to go back to help them. When she thought about the current situation rationally, what Gardamundi needed most now was the assistance of the House of Mammon. But she was not an idealist. She was convinced that Yong Ho hit something. It was foolish for her to trust somebody like him. She felt she made a mistake by telling him unwittingly that the Queen of Fury and the Temple were in danger. She hastily turned, but Yong Ho grabbed her arm. He remembered what Citri had told him, as well as what the Queen of Fury told him about the importance of a southern alliance. The King of Pride was their enemy. He already began to take action. He took over the dungeon market and enlisted cooperation with the King of Lust. The remaining forces who lost their master, the King of Gluttony, were in the King of Pride's control. Perhaps, his fighting with the King of Envy might have been over without anybody knowing, just like Yong Ho fighting the King of Gluttony. Yong Ho couldn't lose the Queen of Fury. She was his ally who could confront the King of Pride. Gardamundi looked back at Yong Ho. Rather than explaining, he convinced her by action. He released the power of greed. The Temple of the Eight Clans was not a dungeon. There were no subtle traps or the darkness that blocked the vision in the temple built on the plains. Dark red smoke rose under the red sky. The beasts flocking to the smell of blood witnessed the slaughtering on the ground. Warriors from the alien world, death knights, vampire lords, arc demons, and night shades, these five star monsters ran wildly, slaughtering everywhere in the temple. They built a barrier with the bodies of the representatives of the eight clans gathered for the emergency meeting. They fought fiercely, but they were overpowered. Aside from their combat abilities, they were numerically inferior to these monsters. Oroba, the strongest Herculean power, took a cheerful step among them. His fists were already stained with the blood of the heads of the Maharaga clan and Karvinka. Chapter, 250 Not all the heads of the eight clans were strong. 
That was why Oroba felt them trivial after killing them. But he didn't feel bad because of that. He quickly realized how overwhelming his power was, which delighted him a lot. Indeed, Oroba had been practicing for many years. Because of his heart and continued training, he became stronger and became one of the five directors of the dungeon market at last. Given that anyone without one of the seven deadly sins could not become a king, his inclusion into the five-member executive council of the dungeon market was the highest position he could hope for as an individual. But he always felt he was inadequate. He wanted to be a little stronger. He felt he surpassed what he regarded as the ideal power of a man, but it didn't mean that his thirst for power was quenched. He indulged himself in excitement while killing them. He rushed to Kobareka, the head of the Yiksha clan, who violently tore one of the warriors from the alien world. Oroba could become stronger since he was once a subordinate spirit, with his mana growing drastically. For a red demon like him, the growth of his mana was the same as the growth of his physical abilities. Oroba crushed the foolish Kobareka like he destroyed the alien warrior. Oroba ripped apart his limbs with overwhelming force. Kobareka, whose limbs were torn while he was alive, screamed terribly in pain, but Oroba ended his pain by trampling on his head. It was impossible to annihilate the forces of the Queen of Fury with a single surprise attack. However, it was possible to weaken the power of the entire eight clans by killing their chiefs and destroying their main dungeons. The meeting of the chiefs of the eight clans was truly a blessing to these monsters. They could achieve their intended purpose by annihilating the heads of the eight clans here today. Maybe I've achieved more than that. Oroba looked west, rubbing against the ground the soles of his shoes stained with the blood and brain water of the Yiksha clan's King Kobareka. Perhaps today could be the last day of the Queen of Fury who was running wildly on the battlefield. I really feel it's a regret. He wanted to fight the Queen. He felt the strong urge now because he became stronger by becoming the subordinate spirit of the King of Pride. The Queen of Fury didn't have the godly energy of Fury. Her status as the Queen was not complete. So, she could not show a miraculous power like the Queen of Sloth, Citri. So, he could fight her, but he felt it was unlikely he would have a chance to fight her. He turned his body with a happy smile. He grabbed Maharaga's head and crushed him, who launched a surprise attack from behind. Think of it as a glory that you were killed by the strongest red demon ever, Oroba said in excitement. It seemed he was influenced by Abrasax who mingled with him recently. But it didn't matter to him. Obviously, Oroba himself was the strongest red demon ever. Shrugging once, Oroba stepped forward. He shouted loudly to find and kill the remaining heads of the eight clans. While he was stepping forward, he could feel each of the chiefs of the eight clans weeping, fleeing, or fighting desperately. His shouting, which could be heard 500 meters in radius, now resonated over 700 meters away. Oroba went to the trouble of shouting toward the entrance of the temple then stopped suddenly. He felt the presence of another being that he didn't expect was here in the temple. Somehow, he was overwhelmed by uneasiness. He turned immediately. It was a red demon like Oroba himself. The Queen of Fury shouted loudly. Disguised as a giant with the thruster energy, she rolled on the ground and swung the huge axe in her hand. Overpowered by her fierce attack, the forces of the King of Gluttony shuddered and fell on the ground. The tide of the battlefield, which had once been overturned in favor of the King of Gluttony's forces, was overturned once again. The Queen's forces maintained the momentum and crushed their opponents like waves hitting a breakwater. The Queen of Fury hurriedly raised herself and took out a new weapon while reinforcing her strength by releasing the thruster energy. Although she was fighting in the middle of tens of thousands of forces on both sides, she could get out of them bravely. Of course, the troops opened the way partly because of her devastating strength, but they were also distracted by a woman with her eyes half-closed right in front of them. She was standing there with her long red hair falling down her shoulders. Every time the woman with pure white hair brandished her sword, the sky and the earth split. She dispersed their large troops with her sword to make way for the queen. The queen of fury breathed wildly. Clenching her teeth, the queen stared at the woman. With seven horns of light on her head, the woman looked toward the queen only dozens of meters away, as if she was waiting for the queen to stand up. The king of lust. 
the king changed not only his look but also his gender from a man to a woman. The tremendous manna that the king released from his seven horns. His strong fighting spirit that the queen could feel even though he was dozens of meters away. The transcendent sword energy that separated heaven and earth. Only the king of lust had such abilities. Who could have all of those things except for the sword demon Asmodeus? The queen of fury soon shot up her six horns. She erased all the idle thoughts that came to her mind at the moment. She didn't concern herself about the possibility of an alliance between the king of gluttony and the king of lust as well as the disappearance of the king of gluttony. She needed to focus only on fighting her opponent right now. At one point, the queen hit the ground and charged at the king. The queen, disguised as a red giant, quickly crossed the distance of dozens of meters and landed right before the king. The king of lust looked at her indifferently. But the queen hit the ground, striking the king with the axe of lightning. A bolt of lightning struck right in front of the king. But it missed the target like before. It wasn't that the king avoided the attack by stepping aside lightly. It was also not because space was distorted or the invisible force pushed aside her axe of lightning. The queen cursed at herself. Even before she hit the target, she twisted the trajectory of the axe of lightning. She didn't hit the king. It was ridiculous, but the queen was serious. She couldn't hit her target properly because she was distracted whenever she attacked the king. Nonetheless, the king of lust stepped forward. He approached the red giant and gently swung his sword. Everything within the trajectory of the sword split. The queen of fury twisted her body desperately, but she could not stop the left arm of the giant from being cut off. Your majesty. Do not come. The queen and Kurtamukha shouted almost simultaneously. Since she was the queen of fury, she could even try to attack the queen. The queen pulled up the axe of lightning stuck in the ground. But the king of lust again swung his sword against her, and the queen released the full power of the red giant without any hesitation this time. The axe of lightning again hit the ground hard. After lowering her posture and letting his sword over her head, the queen moved her right hand to send off the lightning right before the king. Since she found it hard to attack the king directly, she wanted to mount an indirect attack as best as she could. A thunderbolt bounced and the ground exploded. The fragments of lightning struck the king of lust along with dirt, but the king quickly swung his sword to block all of those attacks. This time, the queen made a bold run toward the king and attacked his heart with the lightning that she accumulated until now. The queen of fury felt intense pain in her chest because she was kicked hard by the king when the thunderbolt struck. She bounced off over a dozen meters and rolled on the ground. At last, the queen's bodyguards gathered around the queen. Even though he was covered with the fragments of lightning, the king of fury was not wounded at all except for some damage to his clothes. But the queen of fury was not frustrated because she could ascertain that her indirect attack paid off. Now, she felt she could turn the tide. The king of lust looked silently at the queen. Instead of being angry or mocking, he lifted up the godly energy of lust. Then he activated one of the true powers of lust when it was united with the godly energy of lust. The king's mana wrapped around the surrounding area. But the queen unconsciously activated the power of fury and pushed his mana. But it was only the queen who could do that. Those exposed to the king's mana made a revolt against their master. The queen's bodyguards who gathered around her held their weapons, targeting her. They began to attack her like crazy. It was only Kurtamukha, her subordinate spirit, among her bodyguards that did not lose her reasoning. The queen hurriedly tossed both arms and wielded mana. After pushing them back with an invisible force, she shouted ferociously toward the king of lust. She maximized the power of fury that became more violent when she got angrier. But the king of lust didn't care. As soon as he noticed the loophole when the queen pushed back her bodyguards, the king charged at her, targeting her neck with the sword. A bolt of lightning struck. Then the sword split the space. Then the flames of the red lotus rained down between the two. The atmosphere was torn with a roar. The earth shook violently, and the green flames of the red lotus engulfed both the lighting and the sword, whose remnants scattered in different directions from the trajectory they originally intended. The magic spear was engulfed with the green flames of the red lotus. 
It was the first time the Queen of Fury had ever seen it, but she felt thrilled. The moment she saw the spear, her heart started to beat. Only then did the King of Lust make some expression on his face. He looked at the spear blankly. There was astonishment on his pale face. He knew the name of the spear. Once again, the green flames arose greatly and separated the two. The Queen of Fury grabbed her chest before she knew it. She felt like her heart was about to burst when she noticed the man holding the magic spear of the Red Lotus as soon as the flames disappeared. The Sin of Fury roared. It showed a strong desire toward her half. But the Queen's heart was beating more violently, apart from the resonance of the Sin of Fury. The King of Lust trembled. It wasn't because of the godly energy of fury that began to roar with the sin of fury. He trembled because of the one who was standing before him, staring at him with the magic spear in hand. The king of greed. Yong Ho did not answer. Instead, he swung Amun, the magic spear of the red lotus, toward the king. Chapter, 251 Several events took place simultaneously and very fast at that. After regaining consciousness, Samuel did not stop thinking while suffering from severe trauma. She grasped the situation by inferring from the new information obtained through the Mammon family, what she knew already, and what Abrasak said on the day she was attacked by other directors at the dungeon market. The battle among the five directors of the dungeon market was the beginning of the whole situation. The King of Pride made a bond with the King of Envy. Although there was a war going on in the northern area, it was only a deception after all. The majority of the King of Envy's forces were still unaware that their king was killed in action. The special auction house of the dungeon market, which was Samuel's own dungeon, was already captured by the King of Pride. Even though the King of Pride did not absorb Samuel's entire forces, it was largely irrelevant to him in the current situation. The territory Samuel was in charge of was that of the King of Gluttony. The territories of the King of Envy and the Queen of Fury, who must be engaged in a fierce battle at the moment, were taken care of by Bifrons and Abrasax, respectively. The army of the King of Gluttony began invading the territory of the Queen of Fury. The Queen of Fury attacked the east, as she always did, but the dungeon market directors attacked all over the territory of the Queen of Fury, seizing the moment. Although the information Gardamundi obtained through her family's secret channel was very fragmentary, Samuel, one of the five directors of the dungeon market, again inferred the situation this time. According to Samuel's analysis, the dungeon market pulled the sword properly this time. It was impossible to capture all the dungeons in the territory of the Queen of Fury in just one day, even if the masters under the command of the King of Pri were not wary of it. Therefore, the most rational strategy that the King of Pride could take in the current situation was to choose his target and concentrate on it. It was evident that the King of Pride must have deployed most of his forces to some of the key points, including the Temple of the Eight Clans. The demon world was vast. It was not possible to find out all the situations in detail even if the King of Pride dispatched scouts to the battle zones. The only information that he could get in real time was, at best, a military movement at the major crossroads. But it was almost impossible to find out in real time what was happening in the remote area. On the surface, the King of Pride and the King of Envy were still at war. Moreover, it took less than three days for all this to happen. During this period, the King of Pride privatized the dungeon market for the first time, so it was natural that the Queen of Fury was put on the defensive. Besides, the House of Mammon was located at the southern end. It took at least a few days for them to properly understand what was happening in the north. Without Citri and Samuel, nobody might have known what was going on. Samuel knew she had to stop the domino that started with the fall of the dungeon market. Above all, she had to stop the Queen of Fury from collapsing helplessly. The King of Greed Samuel burst into laughter before she knew it. As one of the five directors of the dungeon market, she was confident that she could observe what was going on in the entire demon world. But she didn't realize there was someone who established himself as the king of the unclaimed land in the south. Besides, he had the twelve spirits of Mammon under his command. It was shocking that Citri was none other than the Queen of Sloth. She could not hold back the urge to laugh when she recalled her reporting at the dungeon market director's meeting that the Queen of Sloth was still in seclusion when she was Citri. I can stop it. I can protect it. 
the power of the King of Pride was terrifying. He overpowered the North and took over the dungeon market. But Yongho's forces were as powerful as them. They were never inferior to the king's forces. Samuel closed her eyes. Recalling the faces of Karo and other subordinate spirits, she clenched her teeth. The Temple of the Eight Clans was burning. Based on the information Gus Ion obtained through his powerful sensation, the enemies numbered more than 100. Moreover, about 20 to 30 of them had an unusually powerful energy. According to the Dungeon Market's criteria for determining its items, they were five-star spirits. There was one fundamental reason why the Temple of the Eight Clans was forced to collapse helplessly. There was one entity that created the decisive power difference between the two sides. Gus Ion stopped gathering further information then ordered his men around him. Ophelia, who was more quick-witted than anybody else, took action first. The previous masters of the House of Mammon led the arena spirits and started attacking the dungeon market spirits scattered throughout the Temple of the Eight Clans. Gardamundi, who was in charge of guiding them here from the Door of Space, flew desperately to search for her father Biriabaka. When there was no one left behind, with Ophelia and Elagos leaving to join Yongho's forces, Gus Ion stepped forward slowly. The guy who was standing without moving several hundred meters away from Gus Ion also began to walk toward him. The surroundings were noisy. However, the two walking toward each other were silent. Gus Ion didn't say anything while his opponent Oroba trembled with joy. It didn't take long for both to stop walking on. They now faced each other about ten meters away from each other. Oroba swallowed, looking at him. He looked at Gus Ion several times, who was standing close enough to talk to him, then suddenly burst into a big laughter. He was not sneering at Gus Ion. He made a hearty and delightful laugh. Oh my god. This is that same guy. Yeah, he is right. I saw this man, the strongest red demon I had seen in a video I accidentally obtained as a child, Gus Ion murmured. He was the same as the one in the video. In particular, the horns of the bull that grew above his head were exactly the same. You must be Gus Ion with Herculean power. The strongest one of Mammon's twelve spirits, and my longtime target, Oroba said. Why did he appear here now? How could he still be alive like this? His desire to fight Gus Ion overwhelmed Oroba at the moment. He wanted to get those details out of his mind and fight him first. He wanted to prove his power. It would not be too late for him to hear the specific answers to such questions after defeating Gus Ion first. Oroba added mana to the six horns that he already released. By doing so, he brought out an enormous power that could not even be compared to when he slaughtered the representatives of the eight clans. There was no more silence between them. The atmosphere screamed as if it was shocked, and the small and light things around it shook violently. It was as if the whole world was thrilled with Oroba's power. Oroba was now indulged in pleasure. He said with a smile on his face, I'm the strongest power Oroba. As you can see, I'm the strongest red demon ever. I want to prove it by defeating you today. He spoke as arrogantly as possible. His narcissistic eyes were already seeing a glorious victory. Oh, you're the strongest. Gus Ion didn't say much. Instead of supporting his power with colorful words, he immediately opened up the six horns on his head. He didn't need to say anything when he was about to fight. I'm going to kill you. Gus Ion hit the ground and disappeared from Orobaza's vision. Amun broke through the air. The green flames rising along the trajectory arose once again, engulfing the surrounding area. The King of Lust stepped back. He saw the green flames with an incredulous expression. His hands holding the godly energy of lust kept trembling. Obviously, it was the magic spear of the Red Lotus that the King of Greed Mammon used to hold. Obviously, it was the sin of greed. Had he returned? Had he closed the celestial door, passed the one thousand years, and finally appeared like this? The king of greed. The king of lust shouted once again. And Yongho penetrated through the green flames. Amun's sharp spear was shot toward the heart of the king of lust. But it missed its target. Just before it hit its target, Yongho twisted his arm. 
Amun was shot in the air far from the original spot that he targeted while the King of Lust stood fixated on the ground as if nailed down and looked at Yongho. You are not Mammon, said the King of Lust. At the same time, Yongho stepped back, withdrawing Amun. Although he tried to smash the king right away, he could not control his body for some reason. You are not Mammon. It's greed, but not Mammon. You are not him, the king of lust said again. He gradually stopped his hands from trembling. Amun shouted in Yongho's head. It is the power of lust that seduces even the enemy. Withdraw your subordinate spirits. Only the queen of fury and you must confront him. Now, the king's hands didn't tremble anymore. Furious anger was on his face when he was startled by the man standing before him. Yong Ho hit the ground. Once again, he activated the green flames and blocked the space between him and the king of lust. Although he activated the flames to attack the king, he could not bring himself to kill the king. He was haunted by that thought. Catalina, back off. Join Kai Wan and fight at the front line. Chapter, 252 Yong Ho conveyed his strong message to her through Brigada. Catalina, who was trying to land on the ground along with Yong Ho, raised her altitude again, and Kai Wan, who was riding on Salami's back, bit her lips and headed for the forces of the Queen of Fury. The same was true of Skull and Scathack on Bucephalus. Avoid him. The Queen of Fury suddenly shouted at Yong Ho. He hurriedly lowered his body, and the King of Lust's sword energy cut through over his head. The green flames activated by him also cracked and faded away. Awaken the power of godly energy. The only one who can confront a king with a godly energy is a king with a godly energy. Even before Amun finished speaking, the King of Lust took action first. He rushed toward Yong Ho with a force that was several times more intense than when he charged at the Queen of Fury. The godly energy of lust clashed with Amun head-on. The godly energy of Mammon located on Yong Ho's left arm began to emit a luxurious light. Clenching his teeth, he looked at the king of lust then thought about it before he knew it. No, I don't want to harm the king. I would rather die if I have to harm him. His hand holding Amun became so weak. The godly energy of the king of lust didn't miss that moment. It was sliding on Amun's spear. It then suddenly drew a strange trajectory. It flew like a flash toward Yong Ho's neck. Amun shouted. At the same time, lightning struck. Yong Ho came to his senses only after he was covered with the fragments of lightning. The Queen of Fury was in the spot where he bounced off. She kept the King of Lust in check by wielding an axe bigger than herself. The power of seduction was so strong. Especially Yong Ho, who was the opposite sex from the viewpoint of the King of Lust who changed his identity to a woman, found it hard to overcome the temptation. The Queen of Fury was not on par with the King of Lust in terms of strength. Unlike Yong Ho who almost gave up, she didn't give up defending herself against the king, but she could not mount an attack properly because of the power of temptation. Her white limbs were quickly stained with blood. Yong Ho clenched his teeth. He not only erected his six horns, but he also triggered the demon god's heart then charged at the king at full speed. He stabbed the air right beside the king with Amun then made all of his available mana explode. The ground-shaking explosion affected both the king of lust and the queen of fury. The king of lust wielded the godly energy of lust to block the explosion and shockwaves, but the queen of fury bounced out, unable to defend herself properly. It was exactly what Yong Ho aimed for. Yong Ho hit the ground with Amun then injected the mana of greed into Amun, also one of his subordinate spirits, so Amun could fire up an intense flame that could not even be compared with any flame before. The green flames engulfed Yong Ho. The King of Lust retreated immediately, but Yong Ho threw himself toward the king, leaving Amun alone. Then he snatched the king's waist in the air and brought out Catalina's mana through Brigada. He spread the wings of the shadow and sword. Skathak said the only king who could confront a king with a godly energy should also be equipped with a godly energy, which Amun also confirmed. But Yong Ho's godly energy of Mammon was not complete yet, so he had to obtain the godly energy that could pair with the king's sin of lust in order to overcome his temptation. He could gain time only briefly by using the green flames of Amun. Crossing over the forces of the king of gluttony, 
he landed right on the ground. The Queen of Fury, who got out of Yong Ho's arms, stumbled. He grabbed her shoulders, covered with blood, and said urgently, Please unbuckle your belt. Ah. Uh. The Queen looked at him blankly. Everything was confusing to her. Even in the midst of the fighting, her heart was beating like crazy. Is this man the King of Greed? Is the master of the House of Mammon really the King of Greed? Is it true that I was just held in the arms of the master of the Mammon family? Really? Why is he asking me to unbuckle my belt and in the middle of the battlefield at that? The queen's face turned red. Only then did Yong Ho realize his mistake and take action instead of correcting himself. He pulled out the godly energy of fury he was wearing on his right arm and gave it to the queen. He no longer concealed the godly energy of fury with the power of greed. He also did not hide the sin of gluttony. The Queen of Fury again had a blank expression on her. She instinctively understood it. The sin of fury roared fiercely in her heart. She hated the sins of greed and gluttony that appeared before her eyes. The Queen of Fury unbuckled the godly energy of gluttony. As soon as he saw it, Yong Ho said quickly, Let's exchange. What? Wedding gift. This time, Yong Ho was embarrassed. The queen, Dryderastra, hurriedly presented the godly energy of gluttony. Oh, it's nothing. He had no time. He wore the godly energy of gluttony around his waist while the queen of fury put the godly energy of fury on her right arm. The green flames that had been moving under Amun's command finally faded away. The king of lust began to rush to Yong Ho, breaking through the energy of gluttony. Yong Ho grabbed the air. After summoning Amun again, who had disappeared after turning into the flames of the Red Lotus, he stared at the King of Lust. The king grabbed his chest with his left hand as if suppressing his heart that was pounding. It was embarrassing that the master of the Mammon family had not only the sin of greed but also the sin of gluttony, but he could not afford to think about it. The King of Lust swung the godly energy of lust violently, which sent off the giant energy of the sword to him and the queen, which seemed powerful enough to rip apart the world. Yong Ho concentrated. He didn't need anything like an explanation. The Queen of Fury also understood it by instinct. Gluttony and Fury, the two sins that faced each other in a thousand years roared loudly and released the power of true sin. Gus Ion disappeared before his eyes. He was clearly in front of Oro Ba until a moment ago, but he suddenly disappeared. It wasn't magic. It was much simpler than that. When Oroba realized it, Gus Ion already appeared right in front of him. Oroba barely twisted his body and avoided his punch. Gus Ion punched the air with a big noise, and there was something like a knife cut left behind on the spot where he punched. Gus Ion and Oroba made eye contact with each other. Then they were engaged in fighting again. Gus Ion punched Oroba's upper body with his left fist, which made him hesitantly step back. Gus Ion once again disappeared from his eyes. He lowered his body and threw himself on the side of Oroba. Oroba gave up looking for him. At the same time, he released a lot of mana and triggered all his senses. In an instant, he could obtain information about Gyushin's location and motion. He now could feel in real time how Gus Ion was moving in front of him. Oroba began to move himself to defend against Gyushin's attack. He tried to shake his motion by releasing mana fully. Orobus's efforts were in vain. His release of magic did not shake Gus Ion. The moment Oroba thought he felt Gus Ion, Gus Ion was already done attacking him. A powerful impact several times as strong as the one earlier shook Oroba violently. Oroba felt like his body was shattering. He felt like the part of his body struck by Gus Ion was being ripped apart. But Orobus's body wasn't really broken. He endured it. The body of a red demon, possessing a powerful mana, was like steel that could never be broken. Oroba instinctively felt his opponent was strong. If he continued to let Gus Ion attack him, he would eventually collapse. He had to fight back. Oroba clenched his teeth and swallowed the pain. He felt it instead of seeing him. He clenched his right fist and concentrated all of his tremendous mana on one point. His opponent was obviously quick. However, even he had to stop for a moment. 
Oroba waited for that moment. Gus Ion punched Oroba's side again, but Oroba survived it again. This time, Oroba punched him without losing the crucial moment. When he rolled on the ground before punching Gus Ion, it was smashed violently. With such a gigantic force, Oroba threw his punch at Gus Ion. But there was no roaring sound nor was the blunt sound of punching. It wasn't that Gus Ion escaped his attack. Oroba felt terrible. He was stunned at the fact that his attack was intercepted. He found that Gyuzhin's left hand was blocking his punch. Even before Oroba managed to throw his punch, Gus Ion took preemptive action to stop it. Then Gus Ion pressed down on Oroba's terrifying power. Gus Ion wasn't just quick, but he was also really powerful. That was why he was called Gus Ion with Herculean power, the strongest physical force of Mammon's twelve spirits. Gus Ion looked at Oroba and made him realize what his strongest power meant. The sin of gluttony was like saying this, I want to eat him. I want to chew him. I want to swallow him. The godly energy of gluttony responded and let Yong Ho know how to do it. A huge energy of the sword released by the king of lust was trying to engulf Yong Ho. Its sharpness seemed to cut the heaven and earth. He stretched out his left arm toward the sword energy. The godly energy of gluttony he was wearing on his waist guided him. A vortex of magic arose on his palm. It happened in an instant. Something black and huge swelled from the palm of Yong Ho's left hand. At once, it became several times larger than Yong Ho and opened its mouth. Then it ate all the energy of the sword instantly. Something black disappeared. Yong Ho blinked his eyes before he knew it, and he felt his stomach was full. Now he realized the sin of gluttony unwittingly. The sin of gluttony was basically a being that devoured everything before it. Chapter 253 The Queen of Fury hit the ground. A red aura rose from her whole body. Intense mana radiated from the godly energy of fury equipped on her right arm. It was really red lightning. Her fist, which was thrown like a thunder, hit the ground. The King of Lust tried to step back hurriedly, but it was hard because the ground about a dozen meters in diameter around her collapsed at once when she swung her fist. The power of fury was very simple. It was transcendental power that could even endure any Herculean power. A smile was on the face of the Queen of Fury. The constant rising power excited her. Stepping on the fragments of the crumbling ground, she soared and clenched her fist again. She looked at the King of Lust who also soared like her, stepping on fragments as she did. The King of Lust disguised as a woman was still beautiful. He had an absolute beauty that even the Queen felt tempted to fall in love with as a woman. But that was all. The Queen could not hear the King's tempting voice anymore. It seemed she could destroy the King right now. The power of fury neutralized the power of lust. She didn't allow the King to confuse her. Yong Ho brought out Catalina's mana and soared into the sky after spreading the wings of shadow. He smashed the ground and flew toward the Queen of Fury, who was pursuing the King of Lust. The King of Lust quickly swung his sword. A number of sword energies created in an instant stretch toward the Queen of Fury. But the Queen did not block or avoid the sword energy. She rushed to the King, and Yong Ho caught up with the Queen then devoured the sword energy with the power of gluttony. The Queen of Fury smiled. It was a smile as bright as the power of pure fury. Yong Ho passed her and swung Amun to attack the King of Lust directly. Amun and the godly energy of Lust clashed head on. Although his attack was blocked, Yong Ho looked at the King of Lust beyond the entangled Amun and the godly energy of gluttony. The King of Lust also saw him and looked into his eyes as if tempting him. Are you going to harm me? Are you going to harass me? Are you really trying to kill me? Amun shouted loudly and created a fierce flame by himself. Yong Ho came to his senses suddenly and fidgeted with his fingers urgently to block the godly energy of lust from raining down on his head. Amun said to Yong Ho quickly, You are not yet unfamiliar with gluttony and the godly energy. Gluttony does not completely invalidate the power of lust. It's just neutralizing it. Moreover, their match is not good. The power of your anguish is too strong. Hearing that, Yong Ho cursed it from the bottom of his heart. Yes, seriously. 
The seven horns of light that sprouted on the head of the king of lust vibrated then released the unprecedented power of lust that was incomparable to its past power. Yong Ho again felt tempted by the beauty of the king. He seemed to yield to his absolute charm at any moment. Stick it out. Yong Ho clenched his teeth not to be tempted. Recalling Catalina and Kai Wan, he brought out the power of Brigada. He was engulfed by Catalina's justice that inherited the power of Alun, and Kai Wan's passion that inherited the power of Magnadon. They protected him from the fatal attack of temptation by the King of Lust. I am coming. The Queen of Fury intervened between Yong Ho and the King of Lust. Her relentless attack forced the King of Lust to step back again. After catching his breath, Yong Ho looked straight ahead and realized something new. The place of their fighting, which was taking place in the spot within the influence of the power of gluttony, was suddenly moved to the vicinity of the defense line of the eight clans. The Queen of Fury attacked the King of Lust fiercely, but the King evaded all her attacks. The King even swung the godly energy of Lust violently and forced the Queen to move back for a while. He then unleashed all the power of Lust that he had condensed. It was like a wave the power of Lust that was unleashed by the King charmed the remnants of the eight clans. It captivated the hearts of everyone who was there, regardless of age or sex. Dozens of them changed the target of their attack to their master. Some of them rushed to the Queen of Fury that they had been following with respect, while others pierced their chests with their own weapons. A fountain of blood was gushing from everywhere. The Queen of Fury lost her mind momentarily as if she had been hit in the head with a hammer. The Queen of Fury. Yong Ho shouted at her and hugged her from behind. Then he soared into the sky vertically with her to avoid the attack by the tribesmen of the eight clans. But it was only the beginning. The tribesmen of the eight clans who started attacking their queen committed suicide all at once as if they admitted their own failures. The queen, who was held in Yong Ho's arms, wailed at the top of her lung. But the king of lust did not stop. They kept committing suicide everywhere. Ah! The queen of fury's mana increased drastically. It was the attribute of fury that the more intense the owner of fury became, the more power he could bring out. Yong Ho could no longer hold the queen of fury. As soon as she wriggled herself out of his arms, the queen landed on the ground and charged toward the king of lust ferociously. The ground collapsed in succession. Every time the queen of fury punched the king, it shook the ground. But the king of lust easily evaded her attack. Basically, he was the sword demon, though he had the title of the King of Lust. In fact, he was called the best and strongest swordsman in the demon world. The queen's attack, which became so simple in proportion to her increased mana, could never harm the king. Yong Ho once again blocked Catalina and Kai Wan from approaching by communicating telepathically with them. He ordered them to stop running toward him. It wasn't just the problem of the tribesmen of the eight clans who were killed, enchanted with the charm of the King of Lust. The Queen's attack broke their defense line. The battle between the forces of the King of Gluttony and the Eight Clans was still going on, although it was overshadowed by the fierce fighting between the King of Lust and the Queen of Fury. If this kind of fighting went on to the end, Yong Ho was supposed to be dealing with the corpses of the Eight Clans piled up like a mountain once the battle was over. Yong Ho caught his breath. He had to end the fighting as soon as possible even at the risk of consuming his power too much. He triggered the heart of the demon god. Its sixth claw penetrated Yong Ho's chest and a seventh horn of light sprouted above his head. He focused on the godly energy of gluttony. Then he threw himself toward the Queen of Fury and the King of Lust, triggering the power of gluttony again, and devoured the mana of lust released by the King of Lust. The King of Lust's mana that filled the surroundings disappeared completely. The momentary void of mana created a new distortion. The tribesmen of the eight clans who were dominated by the King of Lust lost consciousness and fell on the floor. It was never easy for Yong Ho's godly energy of gluttony to eat away the mana of lust that contained a powerful temptation. Moreover, since the target wasn't as clear as to when he first devoured the sword energy, Yong Ho had to even devour the mana of fury that had been in full swing. Two different mana were raging inside him as if they would explode any time soon, so he managed to suppress the explosion by pouring his own mana. It wasn't just gluttony and fury that neutralized the power of lust. 
The power of lust also neutralized the power of gluttony, which required more consumption of mana for that reason. However, the void of the mana on the part of the king of lust was definitely effective. The queen of fury, who paused her attack for a moment, rushed back to the king of lust, who stumbled because of a sudden loss of mana. At that moment, Yong Ho grabbed Amun and moved to help the queen. For the first time since dealing with the king of lust, he had demonstrated his full power without any hindrance. Yong Ho and the king of fury worked together perfectly to attack the king as if they agreed in advance for a long time. The queen, who restored reason while losing some of her terrifying mana, took the lead, while Yong Ho assisted her in attacking the king hard. Although the king was the finest swordsman in the demon world, he could not block the duo's combined attack timely. The battle between their pure power and tactics, rather than the clash of their sins, was fought dozens of times in an instant. And finally, the battle was over. Amun pierced the king's shoulders, and at the same time, its green flames that arose at that moment burned his shoulders and arms at once. Obviously, Yong Ho's attack was a fatal blow. However, he felt ominous. Rather than striking again, he released Amun from his hand and got him back into the flames of the Red Lotus. He then immediately restrained the Queen of Fury who tried to attack the King of Lust in succession. He hugged her from behind quickly and increased his distance from the king. Yong Ho's intuition was accurate. The flesh of the King of Lust suddenly exploded. Yong Ho defended himself and the Queen of Fury by devouring the explosion and shock with the power of gluttony that he hastily triggered. Chapter 254 The King of Lust blinked his eyes with a blank expression, but only briefly. The king realized what had happened before his eyes. He was just an ordinary master before he became the King of Lust. He had power as a demon king. It was not the flesh of the King of Lust that exploded. The moment the explosion occurred, his body turned into smoke and scattered in the air. The smoke that quickly moved away, carried by the fast wind, was reconstructed at a distant place. It was beyond the army of gluttony, which was at the exact opposite of where he was until a moment ago. The reconstructed king of lust looked at Yong Ho and the queen of fury for a while then turned into smoke again. He disappeared as if he had no regrets at all about the fierce battle until now. The king of lust fled, abandoning the forces of the gluttony. His escape was not incomprehensible, given the fact that he found it hard to deal with Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury at the same time, but Yong Ho didn't think so simple. Why was there only the King of Lust on this battlefield? The King of Pride was not here nor were the three other directors of the dungeon market. Were they all attacking the tribesmen of the Eight Clans? If that was the case, their attack was unreasonable. It was so inefficient. It would have been much more efficient if they had attacked the Queen of Fury altogether. Yong Ho thought about the situation from the viewpoint of the King of Pride. What if the purpose of the King of Pride was not to annihilate the Queen of Fury or the Eight Clans? Did he want anything more? What was it? What could the King of Pride value more? Would it have a greater value than the Queen of Fury who possessed not only the sin as well as the godly energy? Yong Ho turned his head to the west. He looked farther away than the west area where the main stronghold of the Eight Clans was located. Then he suddenly realized something. The one who had risen to the king's position even without one of the seven deadly sins. The strongest dragon in the demon world with a powerful dragon army. The king of violence. It was because of him, not anybody else. Yong Ho felt confused. He suddenly came to recall the king of violence, but he could not be sure whether his guesswork was right. So, he sorted out his thoughts quickly by reconstructing all the information he obtained until now. First of all, he thought about those that he learned through Samuel. First, the dungeon market was taken over by the King of Pride. Second, the territories of the kings that had been managed by the three directors Orobas, Abrasax, and Bifrons were wholly possessed by the King of Pride, but the territory managed by Samuel was not absorbed by the King of Pride completely and it was reasonable to assume that Citri's section was not absorbed. Third, as the King of Pride acquired the Dungeon Market, he could use the distribution network of the Dungeon Market freely. And this kind of distribution network made it possible for the King to conduct a Blitzkrieg operation. Kings were naturally wary of the movement of other kings' troops within their territories. 
For example, they installed the so-called invisible sky barrier intended to check outside in and out of their airspace, or sometimes, they attacked or intercepted them. However, the kings were not wary of the dungeon market. The dungeon market created several high-speed means of transportation within the territories of the kings. So, the kings didn't care about the dungeon market using their airspace to move their items fast. It was a trust they built over a thousand years. In some respects, they just forgot it for a long time, so much so that the dungeon market was considered as natural as water or air in the demon world. Of course, the kings did not completely trust the dungeon market. Although they tolerated the distribution channels of the dungeon market, they didn't allow the dungeon market to take control of the most important points in their territories. But Samuel said that there was a secret distribution channel for the secret transactions between the kings and the five directors of the dungeon market. And that sometimes, the secret distribution networks led to the important points because of their secrecy. The King of Pride ambushed all the territories of the Queen of Fury, including the Temple of the Eight Clans by using the secret distribution channel. Ophelia said the surprise attack was very effective. But the King of Pride would not be able to mount the same ambush again because he virtually revealed the drastic change of the dungeon market to the whole demon world by making such a large-scale attack with the help of the spirits of the dungeon market and its secret distribution networks. Samuel said that the King of Pride must have attacked the King of Envy on the day when there was a revolt in the dungeon market. If the King of Pride attacked the King of Envy, as Samuel predicted, it was more likely that he carried out the attack on a small scale more secretly and that he could have hidden it from others because he had been prepared for it for a long time. On the surface, the King of Pride was still at war with the King of Envy. It was clear that the King of Pride used this kind of deception trick to hide the change of the dungeon market from outsiders until he ambushed the Queen of Fury. If he had to ambush the Queen, this would be his only chance. That was correct. Only now could he attack the Queen without any prior notice. After today, it would be impossible for him to mount a surprise attack because the King of Violence, who noticed the coup at the dungeon market, would obviously destroy or seal the distribution networks of the dungeon market in his territory. Besides, the Dragon Corps on standby along the eastern borders would also move. In that case, an all-out war pattern would be inevitable. The King of Pride would have to wage a full-scale war with the King of Violence. Blitzkrieg The three directors of the dungeon market lost Citri and Samuel. The King of Pride now discovered that Citri was the Queen of Sloth. He also knew that the King of Gluttony was killed. The only enemies confronting the King of Pride were three, namely, the King of Violence, the Queen of Sloth, and the Queen of Fury. Given that Citri, the Queen of Sloth, was in charge of the southern part, she would throw her weight behind the King of Violence if the King of Pride would wage a full-scale war with the King of Violence. Yong Ho seemed to put together the puzzles in his mind correctly. According to the logic of the King of Pride, he would have the King of Lust beat the Queen of Fury. Then, he would dispatch Oroba and the elite forces of the dungeon market to strike the major dungeons of the Queen of Fury. After that, the King of Pride himself would lead his elite forces to attack the Queen of Fury in person. Most of the Dragon Corps were on standby along the eastern borders, not near the King of Violence's hideout at the far west end of his territory. Moreover, the territory of the King of Violence was maintained by Abrasax until now. Since Abrasax was the first to have come under the command of the King Pride, he could have built a secret passage without the King of Violence knowing it. This was just Yong Ho's assumption of course, but there was a real possibility that could happen. He imagined the situation where the King of Pride carried out all of these plans. In that case, he would have to face a truly terrifying situation. Under that scenario, there would be only one, namely the Queen of Sloth, who could confront the King of Pride. All the King of Pride could do was to absorb the groups that lost their central figure, namely their king, one by one over time. And the process of him taking over their remnants would be much easier than a full-scale all-out war. That was the completion of the domino in the demon world that Samuel feared. Of course, the reality was different. Yong Ho himself, the King of Greed, existed. He saved the Queen of Fury from the King of Lust and saved Samuel and Citri as well. He was not sure how much the Queen's forces were damaged by Oroba's surprise attack, but no matter how severe it had been, he would not have devastated them. 
In other words, the Queen of Fury and her forces were largely left intact. If the King of Pride really ambushed the King of Violence, at least, there was one premise. Namely, the King of Pride should be stronger than the King of Violence, and he should be able to defeat the King of Violence by a surprise attack. Could he? Yong Ho closed his eyes tightly. There was a dearth of information about it after all. He kept making too many assumptions. Maybe he made the wrong assumption from the beginning. What if the King of Envy was not killed yet? What if the King of Pride was really fighting rather than pretending to fight the King of Envy? What if the King of Pride defeated the King of Envy, but the latter is now in recuperation after suffering a major injury? At this point, Yong Ho stopped thinking. It didn't make sense for him to think more about it. He thought a lot about it in a surprisingly short time, but his conclusion was simple. All he had to do was to check it by himself. He faced the reality again. And he felt something wriggling in his arms. Ah, uh, um please. A woman's sweet voice was added to her sweet smell. He heard it again from his chest. He quickly released his hands and let go of the Queen of Fury. After trying to forget her sweet smell on his arms, he said while stepping back, sorry. Chapter, 255 In fact, Yong Ho had been hugging her all along while he was absorbed into thinking about the King of Violence. Probably, he would have been embarrassed and made a big fuss over what was happening before his eyes if he had just got here in the demon world for the first time, but he acted with composure this time. Hmm. It's okay. I felt good. Oh, it's nothing. So, just forget it. Hmm, said the Queen of Fury. She cleared her throat in embarrassment. Yong Ho quickly rummaged through his magic pocket and pulled out a cloak he used to wear usually. While she was looking at him in confusion, he gently wrapped his cloak around her. As a matter of fact, her short and thin clothes were literally messy because of her fighting. Her attire was in tatters because her arms and legs were covered with blood during the fight. Rather than clearing her throat, she bit her lips slightly. She then grasped the hem of the cloak that he wrapped around her and shook her head hard as if she was trying to come to her senses. Although the King of Lust fled, the battle wasn't over yet. Moreover, she had to do some other urgent things since she had taken care of the most urgent task. I guess I've got a lot to discuss with you, but I would like to. After blurring at the end of her words, she corrected her posture and said, I would like to express gratitude to you formally. Thanks for saving me. If you had not come, I would have been in big trouble. Yong Ho, who was afraid she might blame him for hiding the fact that he was the king of greed, felt relaxed before he knew it. The queen's smile was pure and bright, so much so that he was embarrassed by her pure gratitude. You're welcome. I am just sorry for hiding the fact that I am the king of greed. Yong Ho also responded honestly. The queen of fury knitted her eyebrows and asked, Did you also defeat the king of gluttony? That's right. The queen of fury was never stupid. The godly energy she exchanged with him proved everything. The master of the house of Mammon was the king of greed. He defeated the king of gluttony and saved the queen of fury. Although it was an exchange, she handed the godly energy of fury to him without hesitation. It was only when the godly energy paired with the sin of its corresponding sin that anybody could exercise the true power of the king. Not only the queen of fury, but also Yong Ho realized it keenly. Yong Ho felt a big difference in power while he was confronting the king of gluttony, the first King Yong Ho encountered, and the King of Lust who he defeated this time. The King of Gluttony was dealt a big blow because his subordinate spirits were annihilated, but he was still powerful in terms of the number of horns and combat skills. But Yong Ho really felt the impact of the King's power was powerful when he possessed the godly energy of fury that he had exchanged with her. The Queen of Fury wiped her left hand, not equipped with the godly energy of fury, on her thigh instead of the cloak and reached out to Yong Ho. You lied to me a bit, but I still want to trust you. Can I believe that our alliance against the King of Pride and the Northern Region will continue? Actually, that was what Yong Ho wanted. He grabbed her little hand then shook hands with her. Then a smile was back on her face. It was so beautiful that he wanted to keep looking at it, but now was not the time to be complacent like this. 
Given that there was no such problem with getting connected to his subordinate spirits who had been dispatched to save the tribesmen of the eight clans. It seemed they were safe, but he had to inform the queen that many places including the temple were attacked. He also had to take into account the possibility that the king of violence might be in danger. Dhritarashtra, I have something important to tell you. While looking down at his hand, the queen of fury raised her head. At that moment, several men called them in a hurry. Your Majesty. Your Majesty. We're in big trouble. Yong Ho. Not only Kurtamukha but also Catalina and Kai Wan were rushing toward them. The Battle of the Red Demons, who were well known as a combat race in the demon world, was special. They did not use luxurious and dazzling magic or superpower like other strongmen in the demon world. They have fought with their physical strength since they were born. They smashed the enemy with their clenched fists, and destroyed the enemy with a sharp and strong blow. Because of this, the fight among the red demons was a pure physical fight. Their fierce fighting, which could not be more violent, could be called the essence of violence. The area near the entrance of the Temple of the Eight Clans was completely ruined, with no traces at all. It was the result of the two monsters' clash, whose physical power outdid the dragons. Namely, Gusion and Oroba were engaged in deadly fighting. Oroba was destroyed. All of his six horns he was so proud of were broken, and his left arm was torn off. The bones of his body were crushed to pieces. Gusion, whose body was covered with blood, let out a rough breath. He opened his fists stained with his own blood and Oroba's and placed them on his chest. He took Oroba's essence and kept it. After taking a deep breath, Gus Ion moved his right hand again instead of his immobile left arm and pulled out the elixir from the pouch on his waist. It was a precious item that he had kept at Mammon's treasure storage, but now was not the time to spare it. When he gulped down one bottle at once, he felt his physical strength and mana recovered. He stretched out his left hand, which began to move again, and closed Orobaza's eyes who were killed with his eyes open. There was no end to the journey to martial arts, and there was no limit to the honing of martial arts skills. Oroba missed it. He was obsessed with strengthening his body by increasing mana, but he was defeated by Gus Ion, who continued to improve his skills and pursued martial art for a thousand years. Gus Ion, who raised himself completely, wiped the blood off his face. As a subordinate spirit, he knew Yong Ho was safe. Although he was not sure how the fight on the Eastern Front was going on, it seemed that there was no situation he was concerned about. If he could have his way, Gus Ion wanted to run to the Eastern Front right away, but it was unreasonable. They already reached the limit of daily use of the Door of Space. Besides, Gus Ion had some other work to do. What about other places? Gus Ion asked someone behind his back. Although he didn't rely on his superb ability to gather intelligence, he could find Ophelia's whereabouts through his keen sense that he sharpened while fighting Oroba. Looking at Oroba's body blankly at a distance, Ophelia came to her senses suddenly and approached Gusion. We have secured the Temple of the Eight Clans. We could recapture it thanks to the great fighting of the King of the Azura Clan and the King of the Dragon Clan. It was crucial that you defeated Oroba. Although they were the kings of their own clans, they were no more than the head of their own clan. Some of them were specialized in battles, such as King Azura and King Yiksha, but others were not related to battles, such as King Maharaga. If Gusion had not defeated Oroba, they would have been annihilated. Ophelia flapped her tail as if she was resembling Catalina. Gusion kept asking, setting his dislocated bones. What about the damage on our side? No one was killed. That means some of our soldiers were wounded. Give me a list of the wounded later. Let me give them a harder training. Cracking a joke like that, Gus Ion again let out a long sigh. Thanks to the efficacy of Elixir, he felt like he already recovered his stamina a lot. Is there any dungeon being attacked at the moment? Yes, there are several dungeons under attack right now. Gardamundi is collecting the relevant intelligence now. Because of what happened a thousand years ago, Gus Ion was reluctant to trust outsiders like Gardamundi. However, Yong Ho made an alliance with the Queen of Fury, and he ordered Gus Ion to protect the Queen's dungeons. So, he faithfully followed Yong Ho's order, the King of Greed. The King of Pride. 
Although there were many generations before his family, Gus Ion still hated that name. Looking north, he roared once again then turned. He egged on Ophelia who said she saw something strange to find out the dungeons that needed his support. The King of Lust sat down on the floor, clutching his chest. It wasn't just because he was injured while fighting Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury. His subordinate spirit just died. It was none other than Oroba, who he made his subordinate spirit only two days ago. His plan went wrong. Something unexpected happened. The King of Greed was back. Moreover, he had the sin of gluttony and the godly energy, in addition to the magic spear of the Red Lotus. He was not Mammon. But he looked like Mammon. Amun in the hands of the new King of Greed proved that he was Mammon's true successor. Maybe Amun wasn't the only one who survived. At first glance, he felt like he saw Skathak on the battlefield. It was probably one of Mammon's twelve spirits that defeated Oroba. The King of Lust raised his head. Sitting in a bush far from the battlefield, he looked southwest. As if he was overwhelmed by the sense of guilt and regret that weighed heavily on his mind, he called out his lover's name, Belial. He had no time. The Dragon Corps must have moved by now. He was not sure what kind of trick the King of Greed who returned might use against him. So, he had to fight it out as soon as possible. The King of Lust turned into smoke again. Then he headed north, wishing the King of Pride victory. Chapter, 256 Yuria was depressed for the past several days. She was very happy when Sister Skathak made a pinky promise that she would sleep with her at night, but something wrong happened after that. Everyone was serious. Master Yongho was also serious, so was Sister Kaiwan. Even Sister Catalina, who looked so cute when she flapped her tail like Baduk, was also serious. Old butler Eligos, who was always nice and kind to her, didn't say anything with his lips tightened, so she didn't dare to ask him what happened. The situation did not improve even after Yongho brought a woman with wings and a very pretty sister to the house. She thought everything would be okay until tonight, but the situation was still the same. Skathak was busy taking care of the winged sister and the very pretty sister all night long. In Yuria's eyes, it seemed that Skathak completely forgot her promise to sleep together. Yuria was upset, but there was nothing she could do because something really important happened. Yuria squatted down in the yard of Skathaka's mansion and looked up at the artificial sun. Her back hurt because she dug up potatoes with skull all day long. The dragon soldiers also complained that their back hurt all the time, but she didn't know the reason. Nonetheless, she was happy when she thought she could make delicious French fries with the potatoes. Two nights had passed since the winged sister and the very pretty sister came here. Master Yong Ho and some others hurriedly went downstairs in droves but didn't come up. It looked like they went out of the dungeon. What happened? Did something bad happen? Whining, whining. When the baby dungeon meerkat called her, Yuria stopped looking up at the sky and turned her head to the baby meerkat. The meerkat, who was sitting almost like Yuria did, handed out the chicken voucher to her with both hands. It was crumpled all over because she carried it in her arms, which was as large as her body. Upon closer look, it was a voucher for the master's fried chicken that was very valuable even inside the dungeon of the Mammon family. Are you giving it to me? Whining, whining. The meerkat quickly nodded. It seemed like she wanted to cheer Yuria up with the voucher. Watching them, Baduk swallowed, even though the voucher belonged to Yuria. Yuria giggled then hugged the meerkat. She pressed down the voucher before opening and lifting it high. I hope our master can come quickly, as well as our sisters. Isn't it better for us to enjoy the fried chicken together? Baduk answered ahead of the meerkat. Right at that moment, there was a big noise inside the mansion. Yuria suddenly got up and looked inside the mansion through the window. The baby meerkat climbed and stood upright and found out what happened inside the mansion with her unique ability to observe something. The winged sister got up from the bed and shouted something. Grandma Yuscha, dressed in a black dress, who the meerkat was not familiar with, was also looking at the same place like the winged sister. Yuria and the dungeon meerkat rolled their eyes at the same time. They saw a very pretty old sister sleeping quietly in the blue water in the middle of the mansion. 
the blue water was split automatically. The winged sister, Samuel, raised her voice again. Citri. Citri responded to her call and woke up from a deep sleep. Typically, dragons were rarely conscious of the concept we. As the descendants of the dragon king, they could exist alone, so they were often indifferent to their own race as well as to the world. In that respect, each of them could be called a lazy individualist. The dragon army under the king of violence was a quite mysterious group from a dragon's point of view. It was strange that they formed the army, but it was even more strange that its members were from different clans. The dragon army was led by the giant dragon Ankyblosa, called the Farthest Watcher. As a blue dragon, she was positioned with her forces along the eastern border at the order of the King of Violence. Her primary duty was to keep the King of Gluttony in check. Ankyblosa sensed the movement of the King of Gluttony's forces during the night. However, she did not move recklessly because her duty was to keep them at bay rather than striking them first. It had been a while since the forces of the King of Gluttony moved. By now, they must have already confronted the forces of the Queen of Fury. Ankyblosa finally spread her wings and stood up. But she didn't head north where the fight was going on. Rather, she looked to the west, where there was no fighting whatsoever. She received no order from the King of Violence. She didn't receive any new message from him either. However, she looked west for a while. Feeling ominous enough, she activated the communication magic. There was no response. No, it didn't work at all. As if there was something interfering with the communication, the magic that was transmitting to the west broke down suddenly. She did not delay any more. After ordering the flying monsters to stand by, who consisted of the majority of the dragon army, she soared into the sky, accompanied by her close aides. Something unusual happened. Otherwise, there was no reason for the communication to fail like this. She hastily flapped her wings, hoping her gloomy foreboding would not be true. The distribution channels of the dungeon market were connected everywhere in the demon world. Compared to other areas, however, there was only a small number of distribution channels in the territory of the King of Violence in the west of the demon world. Dragons were less dependent on the dungeon market than other masters of the demon world. They liked to command several races living in their territory rather than buying them from the dungeon market. Since the number of their distribution channels was small, they had fewer options. Abrasax chose the distribution channel closest to the King of Violence's hideout place called Rare. The moment the King of Gluttony's army attacked the forces of the Queen of Fury, the door of space at the end of the distribution channel opened. It was the door of space that Abrasax had prepared to use just one time for the attack today. A lump of blue mana spread out through the gap of the split air. Led by Abrasax, quite a number of his men arrived in the land of the King of Violence. The time during which the door of space was open was very short. At best, it was only a minute or two. Moreover, the door of space was more than a few kilometers away from the King of Violence's rare. However, the moment the door of space was closed, Abrasax realized that he was spotted. He was caught opening the door of space in the territory of the King of Violence. Abrasax hastily opened his arms without any delay, he freely released an enormous mana from the seven horns on his head. During the surprise attack this time, Abrasax had only one mission. Namely, he was supposed to scatter mana in the air to isolate the King of Violence by interfering with all kinds of communication magic and space-moving magic. When the tremendous mana was released, the forest filled with trees shook violently. Abrasax clenched his teeth, but his mana didn't pay off. The forest didn't shake because of Abrasax's mana. Some other movements were taking place throughout the forest. Not content with erecting his six horns, Bifrons turned into a giant spider his original body. He rolled his eight eyes to grasp the surroundings and sensed the vibrations of the ground with his eight feet. Dragons with huge bodies rarely created underground dungeons like demon kings. They built their dwellings in open basins or high mountains where they could fly at any time. Therefore, the dragon's dungeons were not limited to the rare like the king of violence. The entire estates around it could be called their own dwellings. However, the size of their dwellings was usually hundreds of meters in diameter around the rare. Even the dwellings of the ancient dragons who lived for a long time didn't exceed one kilometer in diameter. 
but the king of violence's dwelling was an exception. Bifrons shuddered with fear. If he had been in the form of a humanoid, not a spider, obviously, cold sweat would have broken out on his back. They were already inside the rear of the king of violence. The entire forest was the dungeon of the king of violence. Even the five directors of the dungeon market were not aware of this fact, something so embarrassing to them. The reason why the entire forest shook violently was because the subordinate spirits of the king of violence started to move their operation. As soon as the door of the dungeon was opened, numerous spirits with powerful mana poured out in succession. It was natural that they responded to the opponent's hostile attack. There were many clans who were living under the protection of the king of violence. Bifron sensed through the vibration of the ground that thousands of spirits were moving toward him. His eight eyes spotted flying monsters rushing toward him from all directions. While Abrasax's duty was to obstruct the movement of the King of Violence's forces interfering, Bifron's mission was to command his troops. Although the enemies were larger than he expected and their response was quick, Abrasax and Bifrons came into the King of Violence's territory with a war with him in mind from the beginning. Most of the spirits who accompanied the two were magic summoners. Prodded by the two, they hurriedly completed the formations of their summoning targets. When the thirty-six summoners recited the spell at once, a pile of bright light was formed in the red sky, and a new light spread from the pile of light in no time. In the blink of an eye, several giant formations of spirits in the shape of light were drawn in the air. Chapter 257 Three zombie dragons and four bone dragons stuck their heads out at the same time. Each of them was a giant monster who was dozens of meters tall. After that, flying spirits appeared in a row, following seven undead dragons. Griffin and Pegasus carrying the warriors of the alien world soared into the sky, and the beasts that did not carry the monster screamed wildly. Their summons did not happen only in the air. Brainwashed elf spirits summoned all kinds of spirits, and the elder lich raised up golem's vampire lords summoned the undead spirits such as skeletons and zombies. Dozens of groups quickly swelled into thousands now. The majestic posture of the seven undead dragons that filled the sky was terrific. Watching them, Abrasak smiled a pleasant smile again. Bifrons also regained confidence again. There was also movement on the part of the king of violence. The forces that shook the entire forest finally appeared. Drakes and wyverns, called the dragon subspecies, covered the sky. They numbered at least one hundred. Dark elves armed with magic bows and spirit magic became united with the forest and surrounded the forces of the dungeon market. The dragon soldiers escorted them, and mountain giants and other giants stuck their heads out over the bushes suddenly. Heavily armed dwarves and orcs were on standby at major crossroads. Dragons were also mixed with them. They were the young men of the Red Dragon clan who inherited the blood of the King of Violence. The largest ones among them were only about twenty meters tall because they hadn't fully grown yet, but they numbered more than twenty. Only a few minutes had passed since the door of space opened. Nevertheless, there was already a war looming in the surrounding area. It seemed like a huge battle would begin any time soon. But the war didn't start yet because the most important person didn't yet appear. Someone was crouching down in the dragon rare over there. He rose to the position of a king by using his power only when he had nothing like the seven deadly sins. The atmosphere was torn hard with a roaring sound like an explosion. It took place right after the great being soared into the sky. Even though he was a few kilometers away, his presence seemed to fill the whole sky. The ground turned black under the red sky because of a huge shadow. The scene of a creature several times as large as a fully grown ancient dragon, with its body over 200 meters long soaring above the sky, was very unrealistic. Once again, the atmosphere shook violently. The wind caused by just flapping his wings once made the whole forest howl. The king of violence was flying over his forces on the ground. Red and huge being, who looked like a god. All of them on the ground couldn't help but be overwhelmed by his magnificent grandeur. It took tremendous courage for them to dare to face the king of great dragons overlooking the ground. The king of violence looked down at the army of the dungeon market. He did not warn them. He opened his mouth to those who were overwhelmed by his presence. Then he exercised the power of the great dragon king. Dragon breath. 
light colored the world. It looked like the whole world was shaking. The power of the greatest dragon traversed the space, crushing everything in front of it. One bone dragon that was exposed to dragon breath was smashed even before he could avoid it or block it. A huge line was drawn on the surface, and all the beings within that huge line disappeared. The remains of the smashed bone dragon fell on the ground. There were quite a few vibrations, but no one looked back. Abrasax couldn't breathe properly. The dragon breath passed by only a dozen meters away from him. What would have happened if that strong power had hit him? He would have stopped it. He would have protected himself somehow because he was called the strongest mana of the dungeon market. But he could not immediately imagine himself defending himself against such an attack. The king of violence's mighty images stopped him from even imagining it. Abrasax finally realized that he was the king of violence. He was a being that had to be called that way. The king of violence, who claimed to be an observer, never went out of his territory. His battle against the former king of gluttony over 200 years ago was his last battle in the history of the demon world. Perhaps, that was why Abrasax ignored that fact. Abrasax breathed with an effort. One second was like an eternity to him. This land was the dungeon of the king of violence. All the masters of the demon world showed their strongest power when they were within their own dungeons. Maybe they made the wrong choice. Maybe they should have never touched the opponent from the beginning. Abrasax momentarily thought so, but in no time, he regained his reason. By generating mana, he shook off the feelings of overwhelming fear that paralyzed his thinking. The king of violence's dragon breath missed him. Someone twisted that terrifying force in front of him. That was why the dragon breath drew a diagonal line on the surface. That guy twisted the trajectory of dragon breath with the power of envy, which was in the shape of black smoke. An enormous mana swirled from the godly energy of envy in the form of a ring. The owner of the godly energy let down the godly energy of pride in the form of a longsword. The king of pride smiled feebly then looked at the king of violence with the three-eyed telescope on his head. This was the first time he actually faced the king of violence. However, the moment he encountered the dragon king, he could find out lots of things. The king of violence was not surprised to see the king of pride handling the godly energy of envy. The king of violence had something more important in his mouth, which was his own voice. The voice of the king of violence, which could be called thunderous, echoed from heaven down to earth. It was a voice that seemed to resonate directly from his head. King of Pride, or the the royal family of pride. It was a weird title. A smile close to a big laughter was on the king of pride's face, who asked without any hesitation. His voice was so small, compared to that of the king of violence, but everybody could hear it. Did you know about it? I was suspicious of you, and now I have become convinced. Abrasax could not understand what they were talking about. But Bifrons understood it intuitively. He looked at the King of Pride before he knew it. Unlike the other kings, the King of Pride inherited the sin of pride to form a royal family. What if he didn't form a royal family? What if he was just one of the kings? Such a possibility didn't exist. Bifrons had met the former King of Pride. He was different from the current king of pride. He was a completely different person. But the king of pride did not deny what the king of violence said. He took control of the godly energy of envy and that of pride at the same time. The black smoke and pure white light, the result of his intense emotions, engulfed the king of pride. The power of sin was the power of the soul. Thousands of years weighed upon the power of both sins. The king of violence did not ask about his situation. He soared high and prepared dragon breath for the second time. The king of pride raised his head high. He released the mana from his body that he had completed as the best possible one over a thousand years. Shaking off all his doubts, Bifrons ordered his subordinate spirits to attack the king of violence. Six undead dragons flew at the same time, and the forces of the dungeon market launched an attack against the forces of the king of violence. They clashed in the sky and on the ground at the same time. The war between the king of violence and the king of pride finally began. No one knew who was the first who possessed the seven deadly sins. It was unclear when the spirit of the demon god was divided, 
or when the divided soul was conceptualized as the seven deadly sins. Perhaps, the first person who possessed the seven deadly sins did not know that he had them. But there was a man. He was not convinced that he was the first who possessed the sin of pride. However, it was clear that he was the first who had been called the king of pride by the majority of men. The first king of pride. Belial, the demon king of rule. The royal family of the king of pride began with him. The king of violence soared into the sky. Four of Bifron's eight eyes turned to the sky. He quickly moved his fingers to control the undead dragons. Although one of them was killed, there were still six left. The way the six undead dragons, who were dozens of meters long, flew at the same time was enough to cause fear among the forces on the ground. But Bifrons couldn't feel relaxed. Those on the ground who looked up to the sky shuddered at the terrifying posture of the king of violence, who seemed to press down the six dragons with his giant body covering the sky. The giant body of the king of violence was two hundred meters long. The distance between the ends of his full wings was even longer than the length of his entire body, so much so that he could easily wrap all the six undead dragons soaring toward the sky under his wings. Zombie dragons under the command of the King of Pride let out their own breath toward the King of Violence all at once. Bone dragons flew higher as if they were trying to make a suicidal attack. Chapter, 258 The zombie dragon's breath surging up toward the King of Violence took on lots of forms looking down at them, the King of Violence released mana, which alone brought about a strong resistance. The breath targeting the king was distorted or sent off in the wrong direction that they had originally targeted. What the king of violence used was called secret dragon magic that had been passed down only among dragons. Three types of breath containing light, flames, and lightning scattered everywhere, dazzling the eyes of those looking at them. Three bone dragons that discerned the scattering fragments of the breath attacked the king of violence at the same time. Each of the bone dragons was dozens of meters long. But the king of violence was several times as large as them. It was like a child attacking an adult. The king of violence rotated his body in the air. Then, his huge and long tail, one third of his long body, showed a terrifying movement. It struck one of the bone dragons after tearing the atmosphere. It was a tragedy. The bone dragon plunged to the ground faster than he soared. At the moment he crashed on the ground, the fragments of his broken body also poured down like a meteor. Zombie dragon stumbled because of the torrent of the atmosphere created by the king of violence's tail attack, which could be called the strongest strike ever. One of the bone dragons that escaped his tail attack bit the king's neck. Another dragon struck the king with its tail as violently as possible as if he was imitating the king. At that moment, Bifrons felt hopeless, watching them fighting the king. The bone dragon's teeth could not penetrate the king's red scales. Despite an attack by another dragon backed by its massive weight, the king of violence did not move. The king of violence bit one of the bone dragons. Even though he was already an undead, the dragon screamed. The sharp, powerful teeth of the king of violence crushed the bones of the bone dragon to pieces. The energy of death exploded at that moment. It was the power Bifrons created by making the bone dragon explode when he was bitten by the king of violence. An intense energy of death engulfed the king of violence, but it was again useless. The energy of death that tried to curse the king could not penetrate his might. When the bone dragon exploded, its bone fragments bounced off and messed up the king's mouth, but that was it. When the king of violence again used the dragon's secret magic, his damaged mouth was restored to its original condition. Bifrons gave up the hand to hand fight. The zombie dragons and one remaining bone dragon dispersed. Those bone dragons that crashed on the ground shuddered, unable to stand up again. Four undead dragons wandered around the king of violence and fired magic and breath. Instead of dealing with them one by one, the king of violence flapped his wings once again. In an instant, he raised his altitude more than a few hundred meters high. He then opened his mouth wide toward the ground. He let out dragon breath for the second time. The king of violence's breath was like a huge pillar of light. The undead dragons flapped their wings desperately, screaming. Dragon breath penetrated through them and headed for the ground. The original target of the king of violence was not the undead dragons. It was Bifrons who commanded them all on the ground. 
looking up at the disaster pouring out from the sky, Bifrons kept swallowing. He didn't close his eyes to the end, and a miracle happened at that moment. Dragon breath was distorted. Pitch black smoke, a symbol of an intense emotion, distorted the trajectory of dragon breath again. Light covered the ground. Dragon breath, which penetrated the ground, exploded, eliminating the surrounding area. A powerful earthquake shook the entire forest. However, Bifron survived. Gasping for breath, he looked at the sky. The king of Pri, the owner of the black smoke, was standing in the air alone. Those who were in the realm of the power he created were not swept away by the explosion of dragon breath because of the black smoke from the godly energy of envy that neutralized the explosion. The king of pride no longer looked up at the king of violence. He took off into the sky. The broad wings spread behind his back made the king of pride soar high in the sky with just a flap of his wings. The king of violence hurriedly raised his head and looked up at the king of pride, who was now rising over his head. The king of pride looked down upon him now. At that moment, the king of violence triggered powerful magic. The scorching heat that the king of violence brought about with his determination struck the king of pride. But the black smoke of envy surrounding the king stopped the heat. At the same time, the powerful gravitational magic of the king of pride pressed down on the king of violence. The king of violence flapped his wings. His strong will broke the gravity magic. Although he lowered his altitude slightly, he never plunged to the ground. Four undead dragons charged at the king of violence again. The king of pride lifted the godly energy of pride. Once again, the light and their roaring noise shook the sky. Like all the lords of the demon world, the first king of pride had one power. The demon king of domination. The power of domination. He could freely dominate those who inherited his blood and his subordinate spirits. Not only their bodies but also their souls belonged to the king of pride. Time passed. The king of pride, who used everything around him as a tool, could not avoid death. The king did not properly remember what happened at that time. He couldn't tell whether it was his will or just the instinct of the living that he didn't want to die. Maybe none of them was true. When the king of pride became aware of himself again, it was all over. The king of pride looked down on his body only when he was old, weak, and eventually died. The king of pride ruled his successor. He robbed the successor's body, not content with ruling him. Then he swallowed up the successor's soul. The seven deadly sins were to dwell in the soul, not the body. Although he acquired a new body in the successor, he was still the king of pride. The king of pride lived that way. For him, his descendants were no longer the heirs who could inherit everything he possessed. His successor was just a tool to be taken away by the king of pride. The king of pride was independent. Those who did not know the situation thought that the sin of pride would be inherited through generations through his bloodline. They called it the royal family of the king of pride. Time passed again. One day, the king of pride met the person. The person lived in eternity like the king of pride. If the eternal life of the king of pride was based on his power, his or her eternal life was based on sin. The person was freed from time because he could be anybody, old or young, man or woman. A woman with the sin of lust. The king of lust, Asmodeus. The war did not take place only in the sky. A deadly fight was going on in the entire forest. Although it was the battle between the two giant kings, their subordinate spirits were actively engaged in the battle, helping their masters. They had a role to play on their own. The army of the dungeon market aimed at the king of violence's hideout, rare, but the king of violence's subordinate spirits tried to block their efforts. Their individual attack was obviously weak. But what if 100 spirits cast their magic at the same time? What if 100 healers heal the king of violence? What if the huge flying weapons attack the undead dragons and the king of pride? The forces of the king of violence aimed at Bifrons and Abrasax. At the same time, they defended their master's rare. They wanted to help their master, roaming in the sky. While the fight in the sky was magnificent, the fight on the ground was desperate. Thousands of troops on both sides fought for their own lives. Dark Elf Yurdiger shot a magic arrow. He was an excellent sharpshooter. 
As if to prove his excellent competence, the magic arrow accurately hit the target. The vampire woman who controlled ghouls grabbed the magic arrow stuck in her neck and screamed. White smoke soared from the wounds on her neck. The ghouls went around even more violently. Yurdiger was about to hurriedly shoot his second arrow when a rock as big as a house falling from the sky struck the tree on which Yurdiger was sitting. The huge earth spirits controlled by brainwashed elves were responsible for the attack. Yurdiger rolled on the ground, and the dragon soldiers, the defending warriors of the rare, ran over him. Armed with magic weapons, they chopped up the ghouls and rushed toward the brainwashed elves. Orc warrior Ur's axe cut the neck of a griffin who fell on the ground. The alien warrior who was lying on top of the griffin quietly hurriedly moved his hand and stabbed Ur's chest with a spear. Ur collapsed with a scream, and the orc warriors behind Ur swung their axes on the alien warrior's head. Blood splattered with a cruel hitting sound. Drakes breathed out fire from their mouths. The alien warriors aboard Pegasus and Griffin cut drakes and wyverns while crisscrossing the flames raining down on them from all directions. The young red dragons expressed their anger. Although they were not good at magic because they hadn't grown up fully, they were still dragons. They were already born with the weapon of a strong body. The red dragon's flames were much more powerful than Drake's fire. The alien warriors who were blocking the flames with their magic shields were burned, and the red dragon struck them hard with their tails. Chapter, 259 However, they were not invincible. Huge steel golems grabbed the tails of the young red dragon, who were in the thick of slaughtering the alien warriors in succession. Using their mighty power, the golems smashed the young dragons on the ground and trampled on their necks. The elder liches killed the weakened dragons using powerful curse magic. Some of them resurrected young dragons who were just killed as the undead. It was a fierce battle. Both the forces of the King of Violence and the Dungeon Market were attackers as well as defenders. The war situation was so tight that neither side had the upper hand. But time was on the side of the forces of the King of Violence. Abrasax, who interfered with various communications and the magic of space, felt nervous. He could sense it because he was covering the entire surrounding forest with his own magic. Somebody was coming toward him from a distance. They were not the dragon core located in the east. They were dragons nesting not far from the rear of the King of Violence. They also had eyes. The battle between the King of Violence and the King of Pride in the sky was so spectacular and dazzling enough to be noticed from tens of kilometers away. The storm of lightning swept the sky and the ground at the same time. A zombie dragon, who could not withstand the magic torrent, fell to the ground, and Bifrons cursed in dizziness. It was not because there were only three undead dragons left. The king of violence's huge body in the sky suddenly headed to the ground. He flew down faster than a falling zombie dragon. Landing in the middle of the dungeon market's forces, he caused an earthquake due to the impact of his landing. And that wasn't the end. The king of violence rotated his body. His tail, which struck down the bone dragon, swept the ground. Although the way they lived was different, they were two men living in eternity. They were naturally attracted to each other, and they shared a long time together. The king of lust, who was identified as a woman, loved the king of pride. The king of pride doled on his new tool, namely the king of lust. Time had passed again. Seven kings with the seven deadly sins ruled in the demon world. The king of pride ruled as the king of the northern area. He was clearly different from the king of lust who changed his identity every now and then, building his own forces and secluding himself from the real world. Because of this, only the king of pride formed a royal family, although they lived in life. Therefore, they were two people living for eternity the same way, but only the king of pride formed a royal family. The king of pride was a superior being just like the king of lust became the best swordsman in the demon world. The king of pride had so many experiences and skills over a long period of time. All the people said that the royal family of the king of pride was the best among the seven kings. But that was it. Just because he was the king of pride, he could not easily subdue other kings. Actually, he was not powerful enough to overcome the combined attack of other kings. But the king of pride was satisfied with it. 
Even if he alone couldn't overpower the two kings, he was the best demon king. Even those kings who were in rivalry with the king of pride admitted it. There was no other king in the demon world who was above the king of pride. Then one day, the man appeared. He was the man who realized anything without any problem that the king of pride only imagined. He was the man who defeated the queen of fury and the king of gluttony, took their sins, and unified the southern area of the demon world. Mammon, the king of greed. The king of pride could not recognize his presence. It seemed as if the world was splitting apart. The army of the dungeon market felt like a huge cliff was being thrust against them. By twisting his body only once, the king of violence broke the ranks of the dungeon market's troops. The king of violence didn't stop there and flapped his wings using the power of rotation. The scene of his huge body flying in beautiful curves caused another surreal horror. The king of violence bit the zombie dragon's neck. He thrust the dragon struggling with his limbs into the ground violently then burned the surface of the earth with flames. The ground where the dragon fell melted immediately. His bones and skin were stuck to the ground. The forces of the dungeon market, who were near the dragon, turned into a handful of ashes. The king of violence repeatedly soared into the sky then headed toward the ground. He was fast and agile like a feline beast. He stopped the breath of the zombie dragons with his secret dragon magic. This time, he crushed the head of one of the two remaining dragons with his hand then blasted out the wave rather than the flames, disrupting the flying of the last zombie dragon. When he was caught in the wave, the dragon struggled in the air before falling back to the ground. Once again, his fall caused great shock and vibration on the ground. After defeating all the zombie dragons, the king of violence kept vigilant against the sky. The king of pride, who was still standing alone in the sky as if he didn't want to get involved in the fighting on the ground, swung his hand slightly toward the king of violence. Suddenly, the sky was split, and a burning meteorite emerged through the clouds. The disaster of the sky, which came to this world, enchanted by the king of pride's power, was divided into numerous fragments and turned into a rain of fire. The burning fragments turned everything on the ground into hell, regardless of the force of the king of violence and the army of the dungeon market. The king of violence once again flapped his wings. After crushing the head of a zombie dragon in his hand, he activated telekinetic power by releasing mana. After using the body of the zombie dragon like a shield, he soared over the king of pride. The king of pride laughed. This time, he fidgeted with his left hand. A bolt of huge lightning struck from a completely different angle from the meteorite, and it hit the zombie dragon hard. The skin of the dragon, tattered by the rain of fire, was smashed at once, and the king of violence flew through the remains of the dragon. He opened his huge mouth toward the king of pride and released dragon breath for the third time. He was now close to the king of pride. Moreover, dragon breath this time was so strong that it was hard to even compare it to the previous two breaths. That was why the king of pride didn't avoid it this time. He swung the godly energy of pride in his right hand. The blade of light soared above the sword-shaped blade of the godly energy of pride. As long as dozens of meters long, it split the dragon breath squarely. Now dragon breath was split into two. Split by the godly energy of pride, it pierced the sky then the scattered fragments got mixed with the rain of fire, and it faded. The pillar of light completely disappeared. The king of violence, who had exhausted his mighty power at once, stumbled for a moment, and the king of pride swung his left hand wearing the godly energy of envy violently. Then, the black smoke that was surrounding the king quickly formed the shape of a giant. He struck the king of violence by wielding an axe made of black smoke. For the first time since the fight began, the king of violence moaned in pain. His giant red body shook momentarily, and the black smoke scattered, losing the shape of a giant. Then, it penetrated into the body of the king of violence and exploded. But the king of pride also felt it hard to confront the king of violence, but he didn't fail to smile. A sense of great satisfaction surging deep inside his heart made him pleasant. Mammon, the king of greed. The man who died over a thousand years ago. The man who was now gone. He insulted the king of pride a lot. He first reached out, suggesting they join hands to stop the invasion of the celestial world. 
He sincerely moved to save the demon world and acted as if he was the king of the whole demon world. However, the king of pride could not defeat Mammon. The king of lust described Mammon, the king of greed, as something like a miracle. The king of envy was jealous of Mammon more than he was jealous of the king of pride. So, he betrayed Mammon. In fact, he had Mammon pay the price suitable for him. He pushed Mammon, who was running wild like the king of the demon world, into the threshold of death. But the king of lust was fiercely opposed to this. He begged the king of pride to change his plan to close the door of the celestial world by joining hands with the only three remaining kings after Mammon's death, arguing it was too risky. But the king of pride made up his mind. He wanted to see Mammon's fall. He wanted to see Mammon giving up the celestial door to survive while struggling after he was betrayed. The sin of pride craved for it. At the end of the day, however, the king of lust eventually followed the king of pride's decision. The king of envy got even more enthusiastic about the king of pride's decision. And when his last minute finally came, Mammon humiliated the king of pride more than ever. He remained alone and shut the door of the celestial world. Professing he was the lofty king of the demon world until the end, he saved the demon world from the attack of the celestial world. The king of lust suffered from a great sense of guilt while the king of envy was delighted, saying they got the best results. However, the king of pride fell into a pit from which he could never escape. Chapter, 260 Although the king of pride devastated the house of Mammon and its labyrinth of greed, he couldn't feel happy at all. It was just meaningless for him to trample on the Mammon family without Mammon. He had to surpass Mammon. He thought he had only one way to overcome Mammon who was already dead, no matter how hard he pondered over it. The royal family of the king of pride had changed since the day Mammon, the king of greed, died. The king of pride, or the sin of pride, was not satisfied with simply acquiring a new body. Like the king of lust said, Mammon was something like a miracle. It was a monster born by sheer coincidence. The king of pride wanted to recreate the monster. Just like farmers improved their crops and hunters worked hard to raise hounds and falcons suitable for hunting, he continued to improve his descendants. To the king of pride who valued only himself, his descendants were nothing more than tools that he would throw away after using them. He badly treated those who inherited his blood as if they were a dog or a pig, focusing solely on creating beings with a stronger DNA. As a result, the generations of his descendants changed so quickly over a long period of time. People thought the number of the previous kings of pride who ruled the northern area over the past 1,000 years was around five at most, but it was not true. There were hundreds of experimental beings during the intervening years of the former king of pride that Bifron said he saw directly, and the current king of pride. And he finally created a superb being that surpassed Mammon's qualities and potential, which could be called a perfect fit for the king. The king of pride faced the reality now. While the king of violence was falling down, he was staring at the king of pride squarely. Looking down at the king of violence, he tightened his arm, holding the godly energy of pride. The sin of pride dwelled in his soul. The power of the demon king also dwelled in his soul. The king of pride could rule the soul as well as the body of his descendants. Because of this, he always had two powers. He kept picking various forms of power until he finally chose the best one the demon king of magic. Its power was simple, clear, and best. All the seven horns that sprouted on the king's head disappeared. He cultivated the power over a thousand years, to which the power of the king of envy was added now. Thus, his power was now sublimated into that of a god. Eight horns of light sprouted on his head instantly. Besides, six wings of light spread behind the back of the king of pride. A huge halo formed over his head. It was truly powerful like a god's power. So, the king of pride was convinced that he was equal to Mammon of yesteryear. Rather, he surpassed Mammon and became the strongest being in the history of the demon world. The king of pride looked at the king of violence's eyes. Hoping that his huge eyes would be filled with fear and despair, he stabbed into the air with the godly energy of pride. Then a sword of light, whose length would exceed 100 meters, was formed in the air. A giant in the shape of a black smoke grasped the sword of light, and it threw the king of violence on the ground after piercing him with the sword. 
Now, this was his plan of action. First, he would kill the king of violence and take away his godly energy of greed as well as the dragon heart of this monster who was the most powerful dragon in the history of the demon world. Then he would kill all the remaining kings and take away their sins, so he can put together all the seven godly energies as well as the seven deadly sins except for the sin of greed. Finally, he would rise to the throne of the true demon god. After that, he would close the door of the celestial world that showed signs of reopening. Or he would fling it open and subdue the celestial world with the power of the demon god. If his action plan were realized, he would surpass Mammon beyond comparison. All of Mammon's achievements would look trifling, compared with the true demon god's great achievements. The king of violence who was thrown on the ground saw the king of pride indulging in daydreaming like that. He made up his mind at the moment he, who had remained only as an observer of the demon world for a long time, witnessed the enormous mana being released by the king of pride's eight horns and his madness. My subordinate spirits, fight with me until the end. His voice reached all the forces under his command. It was the king's order, and they had no power to reject his order. The king of violence became a tyrant for the first time since he ascended to the throne and squeezed out the power of his subordinates. This land was the dungeon of the king of violence. But the king's forces confronting their opponents under the command of the king of pride collapsed helplessly. Those who fell to the ground were not just the races of dark elf or orcs. Dragon soldiers and other dungeon warriors who were empowered by the king of violence also collapsed let alone the descendants of the king of violence who were fighting in the sky. The power of the dungeon was united together. After swallowing the power of all the spirits of the dungeon, the power was delivered to the king of violence, the owner of the dungeon. The king of pride felt that power, too. The king of violence laughed fiercely. He soared in the sky, ignoring the sword of light that pierced the middle of his back. The sword of light split his body and caused tremendous pain, but he ignored it. The king of violence flapped his wings. The king of pride hastily pressed down the king of violence with a gravitational field. But the king of violence did not stop attacking. He triggered the vortex of mana and disrupted the gravitational field. With the red sky being stained with blood, the two kings narrowed their distance. The king of pride swung the godly energy of pride again. A huge sword of light pierced the king of violence, but he didn't reject it. Hitting against the sword of light with his chest, he further narrowed his distance with the king of pride. The power of envy wrapped the king of pride and became a black giant. But the king of violence immediately rushed and chewed it hard. His target was only one from the beginning. Bifrons also realized it. He deactivated the mana with which he was controlling the forces of the dungeon market. Then he hastily laid a barrier to protect himself. Abrasax did the same thing. He could not afford to stay fearful of the dragon army now. He withdrew all the mana directed toward the sky. The teeth of the king of violence had cut the black giant. The king of pride again swung the godly energy of pride inside the black giant. The sword of light pierced the heart of the king of violence. The king of violence no longer delayed. He could easily narrow the distance with the king of pride and bite the black giant's neck. The strongest red dragon ever. The power of all the dungeon spirits concentrated on the king of violence. All of this exploded at once. It turned into one light and covered the whole world. The commander of the dragon corps, Ankablosa, called the farthest watcher, stopped flapping his wings because she sensed something unusual. Although it was taking place far away, she could see what was happening. The king of violence's last order was delivered to her. Instead of heading west, she headed east again. The king's order was as follows, gather all the dragon armies scattered all over my territory and look for the king of Jeed. Then help him block the worst demon god because only the king of greed can save the demon world again. Ankablosa showed no tears. Like a strong dragon, she thought of revenge. She headed east at full speed. The queen of fury, who was crying over the tragedy that happened at the temple of the eight clans while she was absent, turned her head before she knew it. She began to shed tears again, although her eyes were swollen because of her crying too much. She could not know the reason exactly, but her heart ached a lot. She grabbed her chest. Citri finally recovered and stood up, supported by Samuel. 
the king of violence was her contractor. That was why she could learn what had happened to the king of violence. She saw how the king of violence was killed during his last moment. He left behind a mental message for her. She clenched her teeth, and made up her mind like the king of violence did. The king of violence's hideout, rare, was now gone. His vast dungeon disappeared without leaving behind a handful of ashes. It was as if the god who created the world took away part of the western area. The short time that the king of violence needed to narrow his distance with the king of pride. During that short span of time, the king conveyed his last order to the dragon corps and a mental message for Citri. It was the land that determined the fate of the demon world a thousand years ago. It was the land where Citri, the queen of sloth, stood beside the king of greed until his last moment. It was the land where the grave of Mammon, the great king of greed, was located, which only Citri in the king of violence knew. The godly energy of greed located there like a tombstone wriggled. The godly energy of greed, which the king of violence had placed there in honor of Mammon, soared into the air. It was the last secret weapon of the king of violence. The godly energy of greed soared into the air and raced toward its other half. Chapter, 261 Several things happened at the same time. At the moment when the forces of the king of gluttony clashed against the forces of the queen of fury, the army of the dungeon market led by Oroba, the strongest Herculean power, hit the temple of the eight clans and other important areas. Right at the moment when the queen of fury clashed with the king of lust, the king of pride led by Franz, the best intellect, and Abrasax, the strongest magical power, to attack the king of violence. When Yong Ho, the king of greed, saved the queen of fury from the king of lust, Gus Ion, regarded as the strongest among Mammon's twelve spirits, defeated Oroba. In the meantime, there was a final battle going on between the King of Violence and the King of Pride in the western region. All three battles were over finally. But Yong Ho did not move, leaning back in the captain's seat of the giant red dragon Tiamat. Shortly after Yong Ho led his subordinate spirits through the door of space to support the Queen of Fury, Tigrius headed north with Tiamat, the giant red dragon. Whatever the outcome of the battle, he needed to pick up Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits immediately. The 24 hours required for the reopening of the door of space were too long. When Yong Ho drove out the forces of the King of Gluttony by joining hands with the Queen of Fury, Tiamat led by Tigrius arrived timely. Despite the tragic massacres at the temple and elsewhere, the Queen of Fury fought it out tenaciously. She belatedly cried out at the tragedy, but she wept behind Yong Ho's back. Tears were all over her face even though she tried to hide it. She also got aboard Tiamat, trusting Yong Ho's hypothesis that the King of Violence might have been ambushed. Some representatives of the eight clans were strongly opposed to her riding Yong Ho's flying vehicle, Tiamat, only with her bodyguards, she didn't give up. Dhritarashtra, the Queen of Fury, trusted Yong Ho as an ally as well as a man. Besides, the giant red dragon, Tiamat, was essential in supporting the King of Violence. Tiamat, Mammon's flagship flying vehicle, which was completed by Citri, could fly in the sky several times faster than the giant wild bird, Astra. But everything was too late. Shortly after Tiamat headed west, Yong Ho heard several other news. Citri woke up after recovering. The King of Violence's secret hideout, rare, disappeared from the ground. Citri didn't say much perhaps because the Queen of Fury was right next to her or perhaps because she was still feeling unwell. Citri only said that the King of Violence made himself explode to defeat the King of Pride, adding that she would talk more at the Garden of Life. Now, about thirty minutes had passed since Yong Ho was briefed about the war status. Master, you have arrived at the Temple of the Eight Clans. The Queen of Fury is preparing to get off Tiamat. Lucia whispered to Yong Ho in a cautious voice. Feeling a bit heavy, Yong Ho raised himself. When he got out of the captain's door, Catalina, who was sitting in the hallway, quickly stood up. Why don't you come inside? said Yong Ho. When he expressed sympathy, Catalina laughed awkwardly and said timidly, Because I thought you wanted to stay alone there. She let down her ears as if she was blue, but her tail fluttered slightly. He felt light-hearted when he noticed her lovely posture. After patting her hair pleasantly, he stepped forward hurriedly. There were already lots of people gathered when he got off Tiamat. 
The Queen of Fury and her bodyguards including Kurtamuka were in one place while Kaiwan and the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon were on stand by across them. The Queen of Fury, standing with her shoulders drooping as if feeling melancholic, quickly corrected her posture when she saw Yongho. She first walked to him with strides and reached out. He did not hesitate to shake her hands again this time. He held her little warm hand. A smile was once again on her face. Thank you for helping me a lot today. I think I owe you so much that I can't pay it back easily. In fact, it wasn't just that he saved her from the King of Lust. Gus Ion and other subordinate spirits he dispatched saved the Temple of the Eight Clans and their representatives. Although half of them, including King Yiksha and King Maharaga, were killed, she had to give Yong Ho the credit for the survival of other representatives. Her sincere look and voice also boosted Yong Ho's morale. He said, tightening his hand holding hers, You're welcome. We are allies. The Queen of Fury laughed again. Not only the King of Violence and the heads of the eight clans were arms were like adult protectors that she could rely on. Despite the loss of half of them, she could not lose her courage not because she was the queen, but because of her alliance with the House of Mammon, which they formed without any detailed plan at first. I look forward to seeing you again sooner or later. It's time for us to really work together. It was certain that the King of Violence made a suicidal attack against the King of Pride, but it was unclear what happened to the King of Pride and the two directors of the dungeon market. Moreover, the King of Lust was still alive. I look forward to working with you, too. Goodbye, Yong Ho said goodbye to her. The Queen of Fury let go of his hand reluctantly. Looking back at him once more, she got off Tiamat with her bodyguards. Watching all this, Kaiwan narrowed her eyes with suspicion. She pointed at the queen with her chin. She whispered to Catalina next to her, Hey, don't you think she is openly trying to woo him? What do you think as a seasoned expert in this field? Catalina opened her eyes wide at her unexpected question because she recalled Yusha's love horoscope. The owner of the third card. A pure virgin. Like Catalina, she was born under the same star sign and was protected by a drunk dragon. While blinking her eyes, Catalina quickly raised her tail as if she was a bit upset. Why was she called a gullible pure virgin like her? But she admitted the reality easily and pondered over her question. While Kaiwan and Catalina chatted like this, new passengers appeared at Tiamat, the red giant dragon. They were Gus Ion and the arena spirits under his command. Gus Ion. Instead of shaking hands, Yong Ho and Gus Ion lightly touched their palms just a quick look at their body could confirm how violent and intense their battles were. How about Oroba? Was he strong enough? Well, he is a level lower than you, master. Cracking a joke like that, Gus Ion stepped aside. Ophelia and Eligos, who appeared behind this giant monster Gus Ion, once again got a lot of load off Yong Ho's heart. Thanks for your great work, Eligos and Ophelia. I, Ophelia, the daughter of Endyrian, am honored to see you, our master of the Mammon family. Master, it's nice to see you back. Ophelia greeted Yong Ho politely while Eligos, who was momentarily embarrassed by Ophelia's verbose greetings, replied as usual while trying in vain to come up with some nice greetings. Yong Ho tried to appreciate the great fighting of the arena spirits. In fact, he felt a bit awkward to do so because there were some previous masters of the Mammon family among them. But none of them complained to Yong Ho because they had been in the arena for so long, and they recognized him as the King of Greed. Right at the moment when Yong Ho was about to praise the arena spirits, he shuddered with some moaning. King of Greed. At that moment, all their voices, including Gyuzhan's, were silenced by a big shouting. It was the shouting of the Queen of Fury who got out of Tiamat, the giant red dragon. Yong Ho felt his heart was beating. It was pounding more violently than ever. When he got the godly energy of gluttony or faced the Queen of Fury right before his eyes, his heart didn't beat so violently as it did now. Breathing out roughly, he hurriedly jumped out of Tiamat. He saw the Queen of Fury and her bodyguards waiting for him outside. All of them were pointing in one direction, and the Queen of Fury laid her hands on her chest as if she felt something strange. Yong Ho also looked at the sky. It was approaching him. 
the more he closed the distance with it, the more his heart was pounding. It's the godly energy of greed. He said spontaneously. Cain. Catalina, who had the strongest eyesight among them, spoke. But it was only a moment. Catalina witnessed the object flying from a distance change its shape. Initially, it looked like an old-fashioned magic wand, but it now turned into a simple stick. Then it transformed itself again and finally took the form of a spear. Yong Ho raised his hand. He held the spear that flew through the sky in his hand. It was such an exquisite crossover that nobody knew whether he caught it, or it landed on his hand. But not only Yong Ho, but everyone else knew what it was. The Queen of Fury, who had the sin of fury and the godly energy of fury, clenched her chest. Both sins were resonating violently at the moment. The sin of greed. The godly energy of greed. The godly energy of greed was crying in his mind. It was truly a curious experience for him. Perhaps it was because he obtained it only a moment ago, but the godly energy of gluttony had never expressed its feelings like this. The crying of the godly energy of greed never expressed itself with concrete words. So, Yong Ho just felt it. It seemed like it was complaining why he changed the flying direction. He laughed unwittingly. The complaint of the godly energy of greed was very brief, but it conveyed a due message to him that it should. It was none other than the godly energy of greed that the great king of greed Mammon had used over a thousand years ago. This was the godly energy of true greed. It was also the last gift of the king of violence to Yong Ho. It was an object that he put up like a tombstone in Mammon's grave to pay homage to his master. That was all. All kinds of color radiated from the magic field mounted on Yong Ho's left arm, which had been called the new godly energy of Mammon or new greed. It wasn't just a simple resonance, and Yong Ho noticed it. The magic field that he needed to get the recognition of Mammon's twelve spirits was not something like the godly energy of new greed. Scathack was mistaken about it. Chapter, 262 The purpose of this artificial godly energy, which Mammon had designed but never completed, was never a substitute for the godly energy of greed. It had a different purpose. Yong Ho didn't know what the purpose was, but it was now clear. He sorted out his complicated thoughts. His heart, which was beating so violently as if it would burst at any moment, returned to normal. The true godly energy of greed that was held in his right hand turned into a bracelet and was placed on his wrist as if to imitate Amun. It was just next to Amun. The godly energy of greed. She is finally back. Amun spoke in a wistful voice. Yong Ho could feel the godly energy of greed responding to Amun's voice. At that moment, he remembered something that also had remained in both Amun and the godly energy of greed. Mammon, the king of greed, didn't deal with Amun alone, the magic spear of the red lotus. What he dealt with was Amun that became one with the godly energy of greed. When Mammon was climbing the stairs of the celestial world alone, he separated Amun from the godly energy of greed. After leaving Amun behind, he headed for the celestial door with the godly energy of greed. Finally, Amun and the godly energy of greed became one again. Amun regained its true power as the magic spear of the red lotus that could burn heaven and earth and evaporate the sea by wielding it only once. Are you the king of greed? The queen of fury called Yong Ho. He hesitated for a moment as to what to say, but he made up his mind to tell her. He spoke confidently to his ally, the godly energy of greed has come back. Now, Yong Ho had not only the two sins of greed and gluttony but also two godly energies pairing with them. Even though she was his ally, he was now a formidable partner for her. But the Queen of Fury was not afraid or jealous of him. Rather, she was really pleased. Kaiwan and Catalina murmured, yeah, she is behaving as expected. Yong Ho quickly spoke to the Queen, I will be back soon. Please take care of your own people and wait here. She didn't expect it, but she nodded cheerfully. Okay, I will wait. He turned right away. He had to hurry back to the labyrinth of greed. He needed to meet Citri and talk a lot with her, but he couldn't because he still had a lot of work to do. Master. Giant flying vehicles are approaching this way. Lucia shouted through Tiamat's terminal. The surviving representatives of the eight clans, 
whose invisible air barrier system was broken by some director's ambush of the dungeon market, belatedly discovered them approaching their way. Catalina identified the flying creatures first this time again. They were so enormous that she could discern them from a far greater distance than when she noticed the godly energy of greed. They were blue. It had big wings, a big tail, and gorgeous scales. A dragon? It was Yongho's first time seeing a dragon. Shortly after Catalina shouted, others could also confirm the dragon's appearance. Moreover, it was not just one. Behind the giant blue dragon's back was a red dragon and another was a black dragon. Extremely wary of dragons, Kurtamuka urgently triggered an urgent alert. Then the Queen of Fury's bodyguards were on a combat mode immediately, and the spirits of the Mammon family that were on tense alert took their own weapons. But Yong Ho didn't show any concern. The Queen of Fury knew who was flying toward her. Ankablosa. As if responding to the Queen's call, the huge blue dragon landed on the ground. The overwhelming presence of her giant body, which was dozens of meters long, dwarfed bone dragon. Landing in front of Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury, she took the shape of a human by casting the spell of transformation, one of the dragon's strong merits. She now turned into an Afsaras with impressive dark hair. An Afsaras was characterized by her slimness, but given the attribute of Ankablosa, she was more tough than slim. She showed due manners to Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury, accompanied by two other dragons who turned into an orc and a dark elf respectively by triggering their own magic. Commander of the Dragon Legion, the farthest watcher, Ankablosa, is honored to meet the King of Greed and the Queen of Fury. She looked at them alternately and soon realized that they were the ones that the King of Violence referred to in his final message to her. Ankablosa was a woman by any standards. As soon as she exchanged greetings with them, she immediately got down to the point without giving them any background explanation. His Majesty the King of Violence referred to the King of Greed in his last will. Can both of you lend me your hands for a moment? I would like to convey his last will to you. Although she was using honorific language to them, it seemed she was talking informally perhaps because of her lofty and stately atmosphere unique to Ankablosa. Yongho didn't hesitate to take the hand that she stretched out. The Queen of Fury was about to reach out to Yong Ho too but withdrew it behind her back, noticing she didn't have to. It seemed she was mistaken that their hands including his would form a triangle shape. It was an interesting situation at the moment, but Ankablosa was so serious that both Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury just focused on holding their hands. Ankablosa immediately conveyed the late King of Violence's will to them. The voice of the King of Violence was echoing in the heads of Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury. Mobilize the dragon army. Find the king of greed and help him. Stop the worst demon god with him. What the king of violence meant by the worst demon god was the king of pride. Yong Ho could figure out why the king of violence didn't refer to the king of pride merely as a king but the demon god. The king of pride had strength, terrifying mana, and godly posture. After conveying his message, Ankablosa first let go of her hand. She explained what she knew because as the same dragon as the King of Violence, she had the direct chance to listen to the King's last will. The King of Violence made a suicidal attack on the King of Pride as soon as he conveyed his last will to me. I think he had two reasons for that. First, he wanted to damage both the King of Pride and the dungeon market. Secondly, he didn't want to have his essence taken away by the King of Pride. The King of Violence was recognized as the strongest dragon in the demon world. As such, it would bring about the worst situation if the King of Pride took his essence. Ankablosa continued, We don't know the condition of the King of Pride, but he must have been dealt a fatal blow. In fact, when the King of Violence made a suicidal attack, not only his hideout, rare, but also its surrounding area disappeared without even leaving any trace. Given such a strong explosion and its impact, it was highly unlikely that the King of Pride avoided his fatal attack. Ankablosa said, Currently, the generals of the dragon are gathering their troops scattered across the territory of the King of Violence in one place. And at the same time, they are destroying the facilities of the dungeon still left intact within the King of Violence's territory. I came here to meet you, the King of Greed, ahead of my main troops. Ankablosa paused for a moment and gazed at Yong Ho for long. Her gaze was as sharp as a blade. 
If you have anything to order me, please tell me. I and my dragon army will obey your command. She made a simple declaration, but at first glance, it felt like a test to him. So, he responded naturally after making eye contact with her. Help the Queen of Fury destroy the distribution channels of the dungeon market and its branches in her territory. Besides, I want you to protect the territory of the Queen of Fury. In fact, he discussed the matter of destroying the various facilities of the dungeon market within her territory. Since his order was rational and reasonable, Ankablosa accepted his request readily. Sure, I will. Let me get down to the business right away. The orc behind her turned into a red dragon again and flew away. It seemed that the orc wanted to convey Yongho's order to the Dragon Legion. Yongho looked at the Queen of Fury again and said, Drydarastra, I would like to repeat it, if I may. The current situation was obviously not good. However, it didn't mean the situation was necessarily bad for Yongho because he could combine all the troops under his integrated command. I'm going to meet the Queen of Sloth. See you back soon. Citri, the Queen of Sloth. Yongho did not hide the fact that she was with him and his subordinate spirits at the moment. It was nothing new to the Queen of Fury, but the Queen smiled at him warmly. Although she was exhausted by the tragic happenings in various parts of her territory, she tried not to look weak to him. I will be waiting for you. At that moment, Yongho wanted to touch her face, but he quickly controlled the urge. She was not Catalina or Kaiwan. Yongho wrapped up the meeting with Ankablosa politely then hastily returned to Tiamat, the giant red dragon and his main base. Although he had the strong support of the powerful Dragon Legion, he was rather nervous and uncomfortable because of the King of Violence's last will to him. His subordinate spirits including Catalina gave Yongho some time to think alone. Rather than thinking about the King of Pride, he leaned deeply back in the captain's seat and pondered over other things. He lifted his right hand where Amun and the godly energy of greed were embedded. Although he received it so suddenly, the true godly energy of greed was finally in his hand. Since he had the experience of exercising the true power of gluttony through the godly energy of gluttony, he became curious about the power of greed. Chapter, 263 The sin of fury turned its owner's anger into strength. The angrier the owner of the fury was, the stronger her power was. The power of the sin of lust was temptation. All those who could not overcome the temptation became slaves of the king of lust. The power of gluttony was eating. Using the power of gluttony, Yongho could eat not only pure mana but even the magic once processed or the energy of the sword. Then, what was the power of greed? I do not know either. Yongho blinked his eyes before he knew when Amun replied. Amun continued, Mammon used the power created by the mix of greed and the godly energy of greed only to neutralize and weaken the power of other kings. I don't know why. Maybe he did so because of the peculiarity of greed or because I may have not grasped the true power of greed. The more he heard it, the more confused he was. So, he focused on the godly energy of greed just like he did when he exercised the power of gluttony. But its reaction was different. Unlike the godly energy of gluttony that he could instinctively understand how to use, the godly energy of greed did not tell him anything. I wonder if it has no power at all. But the godly energy of greed immediately responded to his thinking like that. To be exact, it must have been mad at him. The power of greed is the power of possession. Maybe there was a clue there. Maybe the power of greed was somewhat irrelevant to the battle just like the power of evolution. Master, it seems I'm pushing you hard, but I have something to tell you by all means. Amun changed the topic. When Yongho concentrated on something else, Amun kept talking, when you fought the king of lust, you used only the power of gluttony while forgetting your greatest power and the power of greed that you have been using for a long time. The special ability that is activated by combining sin and magic is obviously powerful. But that's not all. I believe the owner will know it well. Amun was right. When fighting the king of lust, Yongho did not properly use the power of greed. It would be more correct to say he didn't put it to operation. Yongho had two sins greed and gluttony. In terms of a car, it was like having two engines. If so, he had to exert the power of both engines. 
the king of pride acquired the power of envy. Unlike Yong Ho, he used both the power of pride and the power of envy at the same time. The synergy effect of the combined powers was much more powerful than he thought. Yong Ho immediately understood what Amun was trying to remind him. He had to learn to use two sins at the same time to confront the king of pride properly. After he was done talking with Amun, he cleared his mind in a break with what he used to do. While Tiamat was carrying him to the labyrinth of greed, he wanted to take a break, so he closed his eyes. Apparently notified by Lucia, all the spirits of the House of Mammon including Yuria came out to welcome Yong Ho even though it was very late at night. He stroked Yuria's hair, whose eyes were shining brighter than usual, then headed straight to the Garden of Life. Yuria seemed a little disappointed when everybody including Yong Ho was busy, but he could not afford to pay attention to her now. The closer he got to the Garden of Life, the more impatient he was. Even though he already heard from Lucia that Citri was in good condition, he was still very worried about her health and safety. He needed to check her condition by himself before he could feel relieved. Kaiwan was as impatient as Yong Ho, so the two quickened their steps in no time and almost ran to the Garden of Life. So, they finally arrived at Skat Hakka's mansion. As soon as he opened the front door, Yong Ho gasped for breath while Kaiwan rolled her eyes to look for Citri. They saw Yescha and Samo momentarily, but they didn't care. They were looking at only the red-haired woman buried deep in a chair made of blue waves. Citri! He shouted. The red-haired woman responded to his call like the way she did, as always. My beloved customer. Her familiar and simple greetings were more than enough to make him feel so much relieved. He smiled broadly at her response. Then he stepped forward and approached her. Citri opened her arms to him, and the two naturally hugged each other. He felt warm when he hugged her. He could see what made her different from Catalina and Kai Wan. The difference wasn't that he was holding her but that he was being held in her arms. He called her again, and Citri tapped him on the back lightly. Their short but friendly hugging ended. What a relief, he said. Citri nodded quietly. Then she hugged Kai Wan, who approached her hesitantly. Only after she hugged them did others exchange greetings with her. I, Samuel, director of the dungeon market, am pleased to greet you, master of the Mammon family. She still used her title as a director of the dungeon market. He looked at Samuel. Seeing her severed left arm, he agonized a bit but said softly, I am glad to see you in person like this. Skathack can heal your wounded left arm. Thank you for your consideration. After bowing to him politely, she sat next to Citri. Right at that moment, Yongho's subordinate spirits including Catalina, Skathak, and Gus Ion arrived at Skathaka's mansion. After greeting them all, Citri started talking again. My beloved customer, as you know, so many things happened during the last few days. It is no exaggeration to say that the balance of power of the demon world has completely collapsed. Three of the six kings died. The king of violence, the king of envy, and the king of gluttony no longer existed. The king of pride absorbed the power of the king of envy, and the king of lust helped him. Yong Ho, the king of greed, took away the power of the king of gluttony and joined hands with the queen of fury and the queen of sloth. Besides, there was a realignment of various forces under various kings. The king of pride had the support of the dungeon market, with the addition of the territories of the king of envy, king of lust, and king of gluttony. On the other hand, Yong Ho had the support of the forces of the King of Violence led by the Dragon Legion and the Queen of Fury, his ally. He also owned the unclaimed lands in the South, his stronghold. The South and North were divided. This kind of ambiguous power structure would be changed completely within a few days. I don't know why the King of Pride gained so much power. However, he is both the enemy of the Mammon family as well as the demon world. So, you have to stop him. The last will that the King of Violence left behind just before his death was truly strong. The current King of Pride could be said to be the worst demon like the King of Violence pointed out. Citri paused for a moment to catch her breath. She had a lot to talk about with Yong Ho, but what she had to tell him and others right now was the forces of the King of Pride. Three directors of the dungeon market were all under the command of the King of Pride. 
As a result, various resources of the dungeon market, such as its spirits and distribution networks also fell into the hands of the King of Pride. But this area in the south was not occupied by the king. It was only been several days since the coup happened at the dungeon market. The three directors didn't touch Citri's territory at all. I did not form any separate force. But that doesn't mean that I didn't care at all. My beloved customer, I understand you have already peeked into my warehouse, right? Yong Ho recalled what he saw in the virtual space of the dungeon market. He saw dozens of large flying vehicles including the giant red dragon, Tiamat, and mammoth flying spirits in her warehouse. Citri gently reached out and grabbed Samuel's left hand, who was seated next to her. Samuel said to Yong Ho, I also have some power that I hid somewhere. The traders didn't take away all of my power. Some of the distribution networks in the territory of the King of Gluttony are still in my hands. The most valuable items in a special auction house are also in my possession. It was not that all of the properties of the dungeon market were stolen by the three directors. Neither Citri nor Samuel were easy targets to them. When Samuel was done talking excitedly, Citri touched her hand again. After pausing for a moment, Citri continued, My beloved customer, I am the Queen of Sloth, but at the same time, I'm the founder of the dungeon market. So, I can do something. I would say it's the kind of insurance that I have prepared for myself. Citri quietly fidgeted with her fingers. Then there appeared in the air a light map of the demon world. Citri pointed to the northern part of it and said, I have a master key to freely use all distribution channels and warehouses at the dungeon market. Of course, Abrasax and Bifrons do not know this. The distribution network of the dungeon market was drawn above the map of the demon world. Distribution channels connected to each other like a spider web were located widely not only in the territory of the King of Pride but also throughout the northern part. Besides, there was specific information about the location of several warehouses and facilities. All this was very valuable for strategic purposes. And Citri said clearly that she could use all those distribution channels and warehouses with the master key. Perhaps, you have only one chance to use it properly because Bifrons will notice the existence of the master key after you use it. But how fatal your one-time use depends entirely on you. The balance of power of the six kings was broken, while there was formed a new balance between the north and south. And Yong Ho now possessed a dagger that he could stab into the heart of the north, although he could use it only once the master key. Citri continued to talk about what Yong Ho had to do next. Chapter 264. Citri went on, the king of violence was not deprived of his essence by the king of pride. The king of pride's plan to defeat the king of violence may have been successful, but his plan to go to a higher level through the king of violence failed. Moreover, he must have been hit hard. Although the king of violence's suicidal attack was very unfortunate, Yong Ho didn't think the king of pride was killed by his attack, for the power of the king of pride was too powerful. The King of Pride had eight horns of light, six wide wings of light, and a huge halo of light rising above his head. Indeed, it was godlike power and majesty. Citri's relationship with the King of Violence wasn't that deep by nature. It was more than a thousand years that they existed in the demon world, but they met face to face for a dialogue only a few times. And even in that case, she talked to him as one of the five directors of the dungeon market, not as the Queen of Sloth. It was only a few months ago that their relationship changed. Knowing what happened to Mammon in the past through the godly energy of greed, the King of Violence also discovered the true identity of Citri. The King of Violence had no ambition to rule the demon world. He simply sought knowledge as an observer of the world. The King of Violence first contacted Citri. He did not covet the sin of sloth or its godly energy. He just wanted to meet her to hear from her more about what had happened on that day and the place where Mammon's last fight took place. Meeting the King of Violence, Citri realized that his pure respect for Mammon was genuine. Thus, Citri signed a contract with the King of Violence. Through a special magical contract, she told him specifically about what happened on that day, and the King of Violence granted her request in return. The reason why he made the King of Gluttony restless by suddenly moving the Dragon Legion to the eastern border was because Citri wanted it. It wasn't just because of Citri that the King of Violence told the Queen of Fury to use him more actively, 
but Citri played a role to some extent. Her conversation with the King of Violence gave Citri an unexpected joy. She found it was not as painful as she thought to share Mammon's last moment with him. While talking with the King of Violence about it, Citri felt that her wounded heart was healed. That was why she could maintain her relationship with the King of Violence. And their contractual relationship was useful in unexpected moments. The moment when the King of Violence was ready to attack the King of Pride at the risk of his life, and Abrasax, terrified in advance. Deactivated the disturbing magic he had cast in the air, Citri could receive more information than expected through her contractual relationship with the King of Violence. Citri thought of the King of Violence. Reminiscing about the King, who was wise and intelligent unlike his nickname of Violence, Citri continued, You should not neglect the death of the King of Violence. You have to use the Dragon Legion he left behind and the time he gained for you. She seemed to be tired after talking long, so she paused for a moment and caught her breath before continuing. Under the best scenario, the King of Pride was severely injured, and Abrasax and Bifrons were killed. But that would be an overly optimistic scenario. So, let me tell you under the assumption that the King of Pride was injured heavily, and we have gained time because of his wounds. The territory of the King of Gluttony was expanded in the light map of the demon world. Samuel raised her left hand to point to the king's territory. A surprise attack through the dungeon market is now impossible. So, there will be an all-out war between the south and north. If that's the case, the first thing we need to attack is the territory of the king of gluttony. There is currently no king in that territory, and there is a big turbulence in the country at the moment. Moreover, you can mount a surprise attack through the distribution channels that are still in my possession. It's time for us to ambush the King of Pride now. The King of Gluttony's territory changed its hand overnight. Even though the King of Pride tried to attack the forces under the command of the Queen of Fury by mobilizing a huge army, he didn't get anything. Besides, the Supreme Commander, King of Pride, was severely wounded. It was no exaggeration to say that the territory of the King of Gluttony was in turmoil. Catching her breath, Citri spoke again, you don't have to occupy the territory of the King of Gluttony. Like you did before, you can launch a hit-and-run strategy of dungeon attacks on a larger scale. The important thing is to gather the essence of the dungeon and grow your beloved dungeon soul, Lucia, so she can take full control of the Labyrinth of Greed completely. What? As if she was surprised by Citri's sudden mention, Lucia shouted. Citri looked at Yong Ho after smiling for a moment. Complete Mammon's godly energy. Completely occupy the labyrinth of greed to be the true owner of the dungeon and unleash all its power. You have to be on par with Master Mammon of the past in order to confront the King of Pride who boasts of the most mighty power. The power of the dungeon was its master's power. The growth of the dungeon soon caused the master's growth. The labyrinth of Jeed was the dungeon of Mammon, who could be said to be the strongest demon king ever. So, it was the strongest dungeon. Yong Ho could understand fully why Citri told her to completely conquer the Labyrinth of Greed. He had to conquer it to complete the godly energy of Mammon. But Citri's last words provoked Yong Ho. Wait a minute, wait, Citri. She clearly said he needed to be on par with Mammon to confront the King of Pride. Yong Ho felt something different when she mentioned it. Not only Yong Ho but the others that were also gathered there felt the same way. This time, Gusayan whispered to him. He intensely glared at Citri with an angry expression, so much so that everyone in Skathaka's mansion turned their eyes at him. Gusayan. Citri calmly called him, which made him even angrier. Our master Mammon had three sins. And now, Yong Ho, our new master, has two sins of greed and gluttony. In other words, Yong Ho needed another sin and godly energy to be on par with Mammon. Although it might sound weird, obtaining Mammon's godly energy was easy. Since it was a tool, all he had to do was just obtain it. But in the case of the sin, it was different. To obtain another sin, Yong Ho had to kill the owner of the sin. If so, who should he kill to obtain another sin? King of Lust? King of Pride, his greatest enemy? Catalina, who belatedly grasped what was going on, uttered an exclamation before she knew it. Kaiwan looked at Citri, clenching her fists. Gus Ion opened his mouth again, 
almost growling. If you are going to say you will sacrifice your life to our master, I'm not going to forgive you. Citri's soul is broken. But she was still a queen with one of the seven deadly sins, with as many as seven horns. If Yong Ho could kill her and take her essence, he could obtain the third sin and rise to a higher level than now. With everybody keeping silent, Citri faced Gus Ion. Faced with him who was like an angry bull at the moment, she didn't lose her composure. Gus Ion, you hate me, right? Citri! shouted Gus Ion. His loud shouting shook Skathaka's mansion, let alone the Garden of Life. It was not just Gus Ion who reacted violently. Unlike Gus Ion, Yong Ho was upset, too. He could not take her essence by killing her. Citri looked at Yong Ho. She saw Skathak, who was about to cry at any moment, and heard Amun who already arose into the flames of the Red Lotus. Citri shook her head and held Yong Ho's hand gently. She didn't want to create a sad atmosphere like this, but she was touched by their violent reaction or resistance to her insinuation. She said in a tearful voice, My beloved customer, don't worry. I don't want to die comfortably as if I was running away from you, leaning all the dirty work to you. I was Mammon's former lover. I'm very greedy like him. I would like to see my beloved master happier than now with lots of children in the future. Then she turned her eyes at Catalina and Kai Wan. Catalina flinched the moment she heard it, and even Kai Wan blushed. Citri smiled, looking at them. The power of greed is possession, so it's something that only the king of greed can do. Besides, Yong Ho had the godly energy of greed. The basic function of the godly energy was to reinforce the power of sin. My beloved customer, you can use Kai Wan's power of distortion and Tigrius's power of unity because you have made them your subordinate spirits, who had such power for many years. However, not all the masters can use the power like you. Even if they obtain power in the same way, they can't exert their power properly because the moment they become another master's subordinate spirits, their power becomes very weak. Over time, it may even disappear. Yong Ho was different from other masters. Even now, Kaiwan and Tigrius could use their power as well as they did before they were made Yong Ho's subordinate spirits, and Yong Ho could also make good use of their power. The only thing that Yong Ho lacked was his skill in using them. Greed never missed out on the power that came into its realm. Power is the power of the soul that the master has. It's also the same with sin. If power is the power of the master, sin is the power of the king. Yong Ho now could understand what Citri was talking about. Everybody was surprised. My soul is still poisoned by the celestial power. Because of this, if you get connected to my soul, it can hurt you, my beloved customer. Citri grabbed his hand tightly and said, looking straight into his eyes, take the Queen of Fury as your subordinate spirit. Just obtain not only her body and soul but also her sin. Citri's suggestion was ridiculous. The Queen of Fury was the head of the eight clans. She was Yong Ho's ally. She obviously had a favorable opinion of him, but it had nothing to do with her becoming his subordinate spirit. But Citri didn't back off. When Yong Ho was embarrassed, she continued to persuade him. You don't have to do it right now. Yong Ho still had some time. He could make her his subordinate spirit even after defeating the King of Pride. You are the King of Greed. You're the most greedy man in the demon world. So, I believe you can do it. Can you do it? Letting go of his hand, Citri smiled playfully and even winked at him. Gus Ion, who got sullen and upset because of Citri, was dumbfounded, while Skathak blinked. Kaiwan and Catalina sighed at the same time. Yustja rummaged the fortune cards again. Skull burst into laughter after a long time. And Amun whispered alone in flames, making everybody confused. Is it because of your anguish in the end? Yong Ho didn't reply. Only the sin of greed and its godly energy gave off a subtle power. Chapter, 265 The light that the king of violence created by sacrificing himself eliminated the western area from this world. Not only the king of violence's hideout, rare, but also the surrounding forest and its inhabitants were also eradicated without any trace from this world. The dragons did not go back to the area where everything was gone. 
The dragons that were living near the king's hideout moved north and east according to the king's last will, preparing for the upcoming war. The night of the demon world was dark blue. The sun, coming from the east, turned the whole world blue or almost black, with its red ray. The sunlight reached the land that was gone now. The sun drove away the full night in that place where even small birds didn't come back because of their instinctive fear. The wind blowing from the east wandered around on the empty land, and it soon turned into a little whirlpool. There was nothing or nobody in the land. So, no one witnessed the tiny whirlpool created by the wind quickly transforming into something else. It was a twist. Mana raged in the whirlpool created by the wind, which created a passage to a place that would have been impossible normally. Only mana would swirl in a small twist. But in a slightly larger twist, some other beings from other places descended through the passage. But this time, nothing special came out of the twist. It was neither mana nor any special being that came out of the twist. It was something different from mana, or something that could be called a force. The mana scattered around the twist had been altered or rather contaminated. It was an unusual distortion. Actually, it happened everywhere in the demon world a long time ago. A strong wind blew again, passing through the traces that the cracks of the world left behind, which could no longer be called a twist. Yongho didn't want to open his eyes. He didn't want to wake up to face the reality. It was always dangerous outside one's blanket. But unfortunately, he opened his eyes wide before he knew it. Half asleep, he looked at the ceiling with a blank expression. His bedroom was on the first floor of the Labyrinth of Greed, namely, on the first basement level, so there was no window or sunlight. But the room was bright because Lucia turned on the lighting device of the room at the scheduled time. Sleepyhead, it's time to wake up. Please tell me if you want to sleep a little more. Let me tell your subordinate spirits including Gusion and Scathack that you want to put off today's schedule a little later. Of course, Yongho could not sleep any longer. He moved his fingers after overcoming the temptation to stay a little longer on the bed, which was stronger than the temptation of the succubus. In the corner of a bed which was spacious enough for a mixed martial arts game, though not for running, Catalina was crouching with the blanket all over her body. She usually slept late in the morning. He reluctantly got up from the bed and looked at the other side of Catalina. Unlike Catalina, Kaiwan was an early riser, but she was not seen on the bed. Apparently, she got up early and went out to wash. A long and tedious day passed and another day broke. It was no exaggeration to say that the world was overturned by the King of Pride, but Yongho didn't need to be obsessed with the new reality. He needed some break to fight back. Finally, he got up from the bed. After taking off Catalina's blanket, he left the bedroom with her on his back, who was still half asleep. It was time for him to start the day. This is the essence of the guy called Oroba. I've brought it here because I thought it would be better for you to take it than me. Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits gathered at the gate control station in the space located on the ninth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed, not Skathaka's mansion. Yong Ho looked at Samuel for a moment after receiving the essence of a brilliant color from Gus Ion. Having lost all her subordinate spirits to the three directors of the dungeon market, she made eye contact with Yong Ho with a calm expression. In fact, she already expressed gratitude to Gus Ion for taking revenge on Oroba. Without hesitating any more, Yong Ho grabbed Oroba's essence. As the strongest power of the dungeon market, he had six horns. As a red demon, his mana was clearly one level below Yongho's maximum mana, but it was still very powerful. Oroba was much stronger than Kaiwan or Catalina who had six horns like him. Oroba's essence looked really tasty. Not only greed but also gluttony was craving for it in Yongho's soul. However, Yongho did not immediately take it. He overcame the temptation even by exercising patience, the power of Yuscha embedded in Mammon's godly energy. Of course, it was because he wanted anything like an ordeal that he suppressed the temptation. It was because he wanted to create a synergy effect for an instant big growth. When he raised his right hand that didn't hold Oroba's essence, Skathak and Samuel stepped forward at the same time. The two women knelt in front of him and raised their hands to hold his hands. From now on, the ceremony of making Skathak and Samuel Yongho's subordinate spirits will take place. 
the current subordinate spirits of the Mammon family, please unleash your power to help our master. In fact, Yong Ho planned to make Scathack his subordinate spirit a long time ago. In the case of Samuel, Samuel herself strongly requested it, while Yuscha politely refused it. Yuscha said she could give Yong Ho advice freely as an ordinary spirit, not his subordinate spirit. But Samuel, craving for revenge, needed more power. It was only Yong Ho who could give her more power than when she was a director of the dungeon market because she lost her own dungeon and her subordinate spirits. The directors of the dungeon market were considered to be on par with the kings in terms of power, although they didn't have sins or godly energies like them. Even from Yong Ho's point of view, it would be greatly helpful if he could make Samuel, the fastest wing, his subordinate spirit. Despite a decrease in her mana, she still had six horns. He closed his eyes. All of the subordinate spirits shared their strength through Brigada. Lucia registered Skathak and Samuel as Yong Ho's subordinate spirits at the same time. He took Oroba's as essence at the moment when his mana was about to increase as a result of their registration. By simple calculation, Yong Ho now had three types of mana that was equivalent to six horns. His gluttony devoured all of its power. His greed did not allow even the slightest leaking of power out of his body. Soon, his body changed. The six horns on his head disappeared at once, and instead, seven horns of light appeared. Like the king of lust, he now had seven horns. It meant that his mana now went beyond the power of a seven-horn mana. I can feel the power. Ah ah. Lucia screamed in a mixture of pain and pleasure so did his subordinate spirits who gathered in a circle around him. Elagos, Ophelia, and Tigrius enjoyed a remarkable increase in their power. A sixth horn soared between the five horns that sprouted over their heads. Samuel was thrilled. She now felt a stronger force than she was as a director of the dungeon market. Kaiwan and Catalina, who already had six horns, gained mana that was close to the average mana of Mammon's twelve spirits. Despite the rule that as the number of subordinate spirits increases, the amount of mana that they could gain would diminish, Yongho's subordinate spirits' mana increased remarkably. Yong Ho thought it was possible because of everybody's cooperation. Orobaza's essence that Gus Ion obtained, taking Skathak and Samuel as Yong Ho's subordinate spirits, the synergy effect of the sin of gluttony and the sin of greed. Tigrius's synthetic union in Yehoyuan's power, harmony, and the subordinate spirits' sharing of their power through Brigada. As soon as they were done, they gasped for breath. As the moment that seemed like an eternity passed, the mana filling the space door control station scattered in search of its owner. Catalina and Kaiwan squatted down, and even the strong red demons Ophelia and Elago trembled their knees. Tigrius broke into a cold sweat, leaning against his cane. It was only Skull and Gus Ion who were standing without moving at all. Wet with sweat, Samuel raised her body and said after bowing to Yong Ho, master of the Mammon family as well as my body and soul, I'm going to attack the territory of the King of Gluttony. Please give me a go ahead. In fact, Yong Ho set up the attack plan yesterday. The more quickly she ambushed them through her own distribution channel, the better. Moreover, it would be possible to check out the situation of the King of Pride's camp through the surprise attack. Sure, let me approve it. Go and strike them as much as you can. Responding to him with a smile, Samuel magically connected the space door control station to her dungeon distribution channel. In the meantime, Yuria and Baduk, who was watching from a distance, ran quickly and handed out the energy recovery potion to all of the subordinate spirits. Yong Ho devised two teams for the attack on the territory of the King of Gluttony. Gyuzhin's team included Eligos and Ophelia while Samuel's team included Skull, Skathak, and Tigrius. Since they were going to attack through the distribution channel of the dungeon market, not just the door of space, Yong Ho could mobilize a large number of troops. Each team included the exclusive spirits of the arena, Skull's unit as well as the spirits of the dungeon market taken from the warehouses of Citri and Samuel. Headed by Skull abroad Bucephalus, all the subordinate spirits except for Amon, Catalina, and Kai Wan left the labyrinth of greed. Yong Ho couldn't figure out how many times he would dispatch them in the future, but he felt he could evolve all of them once more before having it out with the King of Pride. Given the synthetic reinforcement, he could strengthen them much more than now. 
After seeing them off, Yong Ho got down to the next job right away. The reason he had Kai Wan and Catalina with him was he had some work to do with them. Chapter 266 The Eleventh Floor of the Labyrinth of Greed It was the place guarded by Yuno in Virgo, the last one of Mammon's twelve spirits. The Eleventh Floor, where the Mammon family's large banquet room and various living spaces were located, had a huge number of dungeon monsters. Moreover, as if to prove their power, even the weakest monster was powerful enough to be a four-star spirit by the standards of the dungeon market. However, it was the King of Greed, his guardian knight, Catalina, and his companion, Kai Wan, who entered the eleventh floor now. Even the dungeon monsters that drove the masters of the Mammon family to the upper floors couldn't be their match. Amon, who became one with the godly energy of greed, proved that all the old legends of the demon world were true. The green flames full of the energy of greed spread ferociously to burn the dungeon monsters all at once. Catalina and Kaiwan also unleashed their new strength freely. A dark shadow and the whirlpool of the sword swept the dungeon monsters. There were only three on the eleventh floor, but it took less than an hour for them to destroy all the dungeon monsters on the eleventh floor. As the attack was done so quickly, Salami, who followed Yong Ho's party as a possible reinforcement, just looked at his master and companion blankly, not knowing how to help them. We have intelligence given by the dungeon spirit Yuscha. You know in Virgo is currently located in the large banquet hall. If you go straight ahead, you will see the door of the large banquet hall. As Lucia said, the grand banquet hall where Mammon used to hold a banquet with not only the twelve spirits but also all the dungeon spirits of the Mammon family was vast. When Yong Ho opened the door, he saw a much larger and wider space than the Garden of Life. There were lots of white tables and chairs under the blue sky and green trees. Guided by greed, Yong Ho crossed them all and stood in front of a small white building resembling Skathaka's mansion. A round blue door opened automatically. The colorful mosaics shining in the sunlight and the beautiful yet elegant interior where white doves seemed to come out didn't draw Yong Ho's attention. Yong Ho, Catalina, and Kai Wan all looked at the woman with silver hair sitting in the middle of the house, with their eyes closed. The legendary story about her was true. She was a surprisingly beautiful woman. She was the woman who could be compared with Citri, the most beautiful woman Yong Ho had seen in his lifetime. While Citri was a living beauty, the woman in front of him was a mystery itself, who seemed to disappear any time soon, as if she was a woman taken out from a painting. Unlike the sin of gluttony that was quiet at the moment, the sin of greed once again raised its voice. Then, as if responding to this, the woman in Virgo slowly opened her eyes. Yong Ho and his party were reflected in her eyes that changed colors according to the direction she looked at. Extremely tense before she knew it, Catalina swallowed, and Kai Wan also looked at the woman with her lips tightly closed. The woman blinked and soon tilted her head. Then she said in a voice which was as beautiful as her appearance, Elun. No one expected her to mention that name. That was why none of them could respond immediately, and the woman who got up from her seat, you know in Virgo, approached Catalina. She said, you can't help it, too. Were you born again under the same star sign as before? Did you get the drunk dragon's bliss? Besides, this time, you have become the guardian knight of the Mammon family. Ah, uh, pardon? Catalina was embarrassed when Yuno asked a barrage of questions unexpectedly. She couldn't understand what Yuno was talking about. Yuno looked straight at her with her unshakable eyes and said, grabbing her hand, I'm Yuno who is counting the stars and who discerns one soul. You have been born with the spirit of Elun. I can tell you that the souls that went through the astral line were all the same, but I can say clearly that you can still be called Elun's reincarnation. Please forgive me for treating you informally. I was so happy to see you that I didn't take into account your situation. Catalina's eyes twinkled violently. At that moment, Kaiwan cut in quickly, wait, wait a second. Did you say Catalina is Elun's reincarnation? Then, Catalina's previous incarnation was Elun. Even Kaiwan was apparently dumbfounded, unable to put together the mysterious puzzle. You know said calmly, as I said before, I can't equally treat the soul that passed through the astral line, the vast sea of souls wrapping around the stars, and the soul that didn't. 
However, there is something left behind after the soul passes through the astral line. You can call it the essence of the soul. And in that sense, this woman can be rightly called Alun's reincarnation. Of course, she is a bit different from the reincarnation you think of. Catalina and Kaiwan found it hard to understand her explanation. However, what she kept repeating shocked Catalina. I am Alun's reincarnation. Catalina raised her hands unwittingly and covered her blushing face. If someone had said it, Catalina would have ignored it out of hand, but it came directly out of Yuno's mouth, one of Mammon's twelve spirits. So, she trusted Yuno, and her heart was full. How could she not be thrilled when she heard that Alun, the object of her admiration, was her own past life? Her ears and tail flapped violently. Yuno looked at her very curiously. She continued, I'm just amazed to know that you are born under the same star sign as Alun not only in your past life but also in your current life. Besides, you have the blessings of the drunk dragon. I've never seen a soul like you. You really deserve to be Alun. While she got carried away with the uncontrollable thrill, Catalina recalled the alter ego of Alun on the third floor of the labyrinth of greed and soon covered her face fully with both hands. Somehow she blushed and felt shy. Her flapping ears and tail drooped. At that moment, Kaiwan cut in again. Hey, what about me? How was my previous life? She spoke in a very excited voice, something Yong Ho hardly noticed before. Yuno replied after tilting her head, I really don't know. I don't think you are included in the list of people that I know. In fact, this was normal. After throwing cold water on Kaiwan's high expectations, Yuno finally turned to Yong Ho. She gracefully expressed due manners by slightly lifting the hem of a pure white dress that matched her silver hair and neat look. Please forgive me for introducing myself to you. You're the new king of greed. Heir to the great Mammon family. I, you know, one of Mammon's twelve spirits who is counting the stars, am honored to meet you. Her calm introduction made Yong Ho feel less embarrassed. He looked at the last of Mammon's twelve spirits, and she looked at him calmly. Then she said in a voice mixed with yearning and wistfulness. You look very like him. Yong Ho didn't even have to ask who he was. Catalina, who seriously thought about sticking her nose in the dish with her face covered with her hands, raised her head suddenly. She seemed to expect something new. Really? I can't believe it. Wasn't Yong Ho the reincarnation of Mammon, the great king of greed? Yong Ho was born with the sin of greed for the first time since Mammon. Moreover, he had the power of evolution like Mammon. He also knew how to use Amon, who used to be Mammon's best friend. Besides, there were lots of things that Yong Ho achieved. It was no exaggeration to say that each of Yong Ho's achievements was a miracle. He was a special being, no matter what anyone said. Kaiwan kept swallowing with her fists clenched. Then she suddenly shook her head. Oh, no. I can't. Come to think of it, there was Citri. If Yong Ho was Mammon's reincarnation, what would be his relationship with Citri? Yuno said that the reincarnation she mentioned was different from what Kaiwan or Catalina thought of, but she did not specifically explain what was different. Moreover, the question was how Citri would take it. Kaiwan looked at Yuno with an expression mixed with anticipation and worries. Yuno shook her head then said in a voice mixed with wistfulness and regret from the beginning. You look like Mammon a lot, but you are not him. The one who is right in front of me is the completely new king of greed. Having said that, she turned to Kaiwan. It seemed that she mentioned it with Kaiwan and Catalina in mind, in particular. Catalina blinked her eyes and slowly flapped her ears while Kaiwan let out a sigh of relief for some reason. Yong Ho also felt strange at that moment. She said he was not Mammon's reincarnation. In a way, what she said was right, but it seemed that he was expecting to hear something like a special secret of his birth from her. Yuno smiled again and said, but it's very strange. I feel like His Majesty Mammon is right now with the new king of greed. This time, Yong Ho was also persuaded by what she said. Indeed, he had lots of Mammon's legacies, so much so that he was another Mammon. When Yuno was done talking, the flames of the Red Lotus arose right next to Yong Ho. Yuno, who was talking to them in a small voice, 
spoke up for the first time, Amun. It's been a while, you know. I want to share my joy with you slowly, but the time is not good. Currently, the House of Mammon is faced with a very grave danger. Amun briefed her about the current situation shortly and clearly. Yuno's fine eyebrows frowned. She realized the crisis of the Mammon family, but some other factors made her feel unpleasant. The King of Pride who took possession of the sin of envy, and the King of Lust helping the King of Pride. It was exactly the same political situation as it was a thousand years ago. Among the seven deadly sins, greed, fury, and gluttony were with the Mammon family, while the sin of pride, the sin of envy, and the sin of lust were hostile toward the Mammon family. Chapter 267 Yes, she is still alive. She is with us now. But she has been poisoned by the celestial world. Yuno's face hardened even harder when she heard the expression poisoned by the celestial world. Instead of asking for further explanation, she immediately said to Yong Ho, the new king of greed. It would be useless for me to test your majesty in the current crisis. I recognize your majesty. I will provide you with power that the great mammon has secured for me. Since Yong Ho already experienced it several times, he immediately lifted up the magic field in his left hand. When Yuno gently touched the magic field, a light pink color filled the few remaining holes of the magic field. The power of Yuno in Virgo, who was counting stars, was love. She could be said to be a collection of all emotions. Amun had already belonged to Yongho, so now Yongho had to get the recognition of Richard and Leo. Once he recognized him, Yongho would finally get the recognition of all the twelve spirits of Mammon. Yuno looked at the remaining hole then raised her head again to see Yongho. But your majesty, I cannot be your subordinate spirit. My soul has been contaminated with the power of the celestial world like Citri. That was why she stiffened her expression when she heard about Citri. Yuno knew better than anyone how serious it was to have one soul contaminated by the power of the celestial world. The labyrinth of greed and the godly energy of Mammon are based on Mammon's twelve spirits. So, if you want to bring out the power of both completely, you must have all the twelve spirits first. Yongho currently has ten of them. He started off with Catalina and Eligos. Skull was his first subordinate spirit. Ophelia and Tigrius devoted themselves to Yongho when he was in the process of occupying the unclaimed land in the south. As Yongho's companion, Kaiwan laid the foundation for the Mammon family to stand tall. As Mammon's former deputies, Gus Ion and Skathak pledged their loyalty to Yongho. Samuel dedicated her body and soul to Yongho to get even with the King of Pride and the three directors of the dungeon market who destroyed her dungeon as well as her subordinate spirits. Amun, the magic spear of the Red Lotus, had been with Yongho anywhere. Now, the only one of Mammon's twelve spirits that Yongho had to obtain was Richard, who had mighty combat power comparable to that of Gus Ion. My job is to count the stars in the sky and check out people's relations. It seems that the person who is fit to inherit the power of love is already hovering around your majesty, king of greed. I can feel your bondage with her. Catalina quickly looked at Kaiwan, but Kaiwan nodded with a sigh because she could figure out who Yuno was referring to. I am wondering if he can really make her his subordinate spirits. Catalina, who was Alun's reincarnation, inherited her power, justice. Kaiwan herself inherited Magnadon's power passion while Ophelia took Asclepius's honor as her strength. Skull and Tigrius chose death and harmony that best suited them. Skathak and Gus Ion possessed life and courage, respectively, and Richard's strength was trust. Since Samuel inherited Baruna's creation, what was left for possession was Justina's patience and Yuno's love. It wasn't yet decided whether Eligos would inherit patience or love, but no matter how much Yong Ho thought about it, love was not suitable for him. Kaiwan connected love with Dryderastra, the Queen of Fury. To her chagrin, she felt it was a perfect match for the Queen of Fury. If Kaiwan could put aside her own ego and private feelings, she would welcome with open arms Yong Ho having the Queen of Fury as his subordinate spirit. In that case, Yong Ho would be able to add the power of the Queen in addition to the sin of fury. But is it really possible? The Queen of Fury was the head of the eight clans in her territory. There were countless people who trusted and followed her there. 
As the name suggested, a subordinate spirit was literally subordinate to its owner. Because of this, such a being was supposed to dedicate not only his or her body and soul but also their lives to the master. In the case of Kai Wan, she offered to be his subordinate spirit. Others in her position would not have become his subordinate spirit even at the risk of their lives. If the Queen of Fury became Yongho's subordinate spirit, it would mean that the entire people of the Eight Clans would also belong to him. Could the Queen of Fury, head of the Eight Clans, make such a decision? No matter how much she liked Yongho, that was something possible and something impossible in the demon world. Of course, there was one variable. It was the King of Pride. If not only the Eight Clans but also the whole Southern Land would be in danger of being taken over by the King of Pride, who the King of Violence even described as the Demon God, the Queen might change her mind. Of course, it could happen only under the worst scenario. Yongho thought there was something lacking. He needed some more to make the queen his subordinate spirit. Kai Wan, who also had a lot on her mind at the moment, frowned. Yong Ho put his hand on Kai Wan's shoulder and said, Let's do what we can do now. Uh. What is it? Instead of answering, Yong Ho ordered Lucia, staring into the air. Lucia, please register Yuno as a general spirit first. Okay, master. Lucia immediately started registering Yuno as a general spirit. Unlike the subordinate spirit, being registered as a general spirit didn't need to connect his or her soul to their master, so Yuno did not reject the registration. Moreover, she needed to be registered at least as a general spirit in order to leave the mansion where she was staying, just like Justina did. Yongho then looked at the ceiling and floor. Upstairs was the last one of Mammon's twelve spirits, Richard and Leo, and below were the twelfth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed and the thirteenth floor, the last one. Either way, there was no reason for him to delay things anymore. Catalina, choose it, said Kai Wan cheerfully on purpose. Catalina erected her tail. She pouted her lips and pointed at the ceiling. Yong Ho respected Catalina's wishes. Many things changed before and after the death of the King of Violence. The forces under the command of the King of Pride fought a fake war with the forces of the King of Envy no longer. The kingdoms of the demon world could survive because they had a strong central point called King. After realizing that the King of Envy was killed, those masters under his command didn't resist anymore. Just like the masters under the command of the King of Gluttony did, they gave up their loyalty to the late King and joined the forces of the King of Pride. The forces of the King of Lust, who had remained silent for a long time, finally revealed himself in the demon world. In addition to the succubus and incubus, several witches and lustful demons who organized and participated in Sabbat formed the main pillar of his forces. And those dungeon monsters and beasts who had been seduced by the forces of lust posed themselves as the vanguards. Although the forces of the King of Gluttony suffered great damages by Yong Ho and his party's ambush, their power could not be ignored. Among the three masters who surrendered to the King of Pride, the two surviving masters the third was killed by Samuel gave up not only the dungeons destroyed by the surprise attack of the Mammon family but also the whole southern territory adjacent to its unclaimed area. Then they gathered all their troops in the north and formed a solid alliance with the forces of the King of Lust. The King of Pride and the King of Lust were nowhere to be seen. However, the movement of their forces suggested that the two kings were still up and running. Even the dungeon market openly supported the King of Pride. As the forces in the north moved, so did their counterparts in the south. They moved their troops at the same time as if the cogs were meshing together. The forces of the Queen of Fury, which destroyed all distribution channels of the dungeon market in the Queen's territory, gathered at the border to confront the forces of the King of Lust and the King of Gluttony. The Dragon Legion that flew from the west also joined the Queen's forces. It seemed like a great war would happen any time soon. It was terrible tension and tranquility that dominated the borders that the Queen of Fury, the King of Gluttony, the King of Lust, and the King of Envy shared with each other. On the fourth day after the death of the King of Violence, one of the eight clan reconnaissance units from the Karvinka clan lost contact with the Queen of Fury. Since they were operating in the territory of the King of Pride, it wasn't unusual to lose contact with them any time. Because of this, the eight clans mourned the death of the reconnaissance unit but did not feel strange about their death. 
a small village on the periphery of the King of Gluttony's territory disappeared. Since everyone focused on the border areas, very few people noticed that the village had disappeared. Even those who noticed it were not interested anymore. They just thought it was only one of the many damages caused by the Mammon family's surprise attack. Several wanderers disappeared from the west of the unclaimed land destroyed by Embryo. Since they were literally wanderers, no one knew when and how they disappeared. Rather, it was not known at all that they disappeared. The Green Dragon, Kaedelian, shuddered. Though he tried to scream as hard as he could, all he could do after squeezing his voice was just murmuring. He was still very young, but he was a dragon. Since he changed to his original body, he was a dozen meters long. However, Kaedelian couldn't fly or kick off the ground. At that moment, a huge, white, glowing hand gripped Kaedelian's neck and did not let go of it. It was a bizarre scene. Although he twisted his body in the air, it was tightly held by the huge arm. One huge arm was filling the twist in the air. It was not known what was beyond the twist. But what was clear was that the being beyond the twist wanted to come over this way. Kaedelian felt instinctively that it wasn't just physical force that pressed him. His body and soul were being destroyed by the force that squeezed his neck. Kaedelian, who had been struggling for a long time, eventually closed his eyes and drooped. He didn't move anymore. The twist that was rotating while creating cracks in the air now diminished. The shining being beyond the twist, which struggled to increase the twist even a little more, soon withdrew the huge arm as if it gave up. The green dragon, Kaedelian, disappeared with the huge arm. And his extinction, just like other extinctions occurring simultaneously throughout the demon world, was not known to others. The twist has disappeared. The passage between the worlds that was open for a while was closed, and another passage was open from a distance. That number was still low. However, the speed at which the passage opened became slightly faster. A greater twist occurred. Chill wind from the north blew hard. At the moment when the south and the north started the war, some kind of erosion began in an invisible place. Chapter 268 Richard and Leo was a silent man who valued actions rather than words. And he kept his reticence even at the moment when Mammon's twelve spirits gathered together for the first time after a thousand years. Anyway, that guy's mouth is as close as an oyster. Gus Ion grumbled about him, but he was smiling though. Hugging Gyushin's arm, Skathak gazed at Richard warmly, who was always the same. The large banquet hall on the eleventh floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. Richard and Leo lowered himself on one knee in front of Yongho. Since he was so big, Richard could see him at eye level even though he lowered his posture deeply. Yongho also did not go to the trouble of explaining to him about the necessity to make him his subordinate spirit. So, he accepted Richard and Leo as his eleventh subordinate. A blue light was added to Mammon's godly energy. The blue light symbolized Richard's power, trust. The life of Skathak, the immortal witch. The death of Baphomet, the demon of slaughter. The justice of Elun who cuts the moon. The creation of the eight-handed Baruna. The honor of Asclepius, the knight of the sun. The harmony of Yuhuyuan in Yin and Yang. The courage of Gus Ion with the Herculean power. The trust of Richard, the silent warrior. The passion of Magnadon who scolds the earth. The patience of Yuscha who leads the way. The love of Yuno who counts the stars. Eleven soft lights radiated from the circular plate attached to the surface of the godly energy of Mammon. Amun whispered in the flames of the red lotus. I also acknowledge you as my master. The new king of greed. Finally, the twelfth light was added. It was bright red, symbolizing Amun, the magic spear of the red lotus. Those subordinate spirits who stayed connected with Yong Ho could feel it. Yuno and Yuscha, who signed a contract as Yong Ho's general spirits, knew it through the twelve lights. At this moment, Mammon's godly energy had been completed. Now that Elagos inherited Yuscha's patience, all he needed was his twelfth subordinate spirit who could inherit Yuno's love. Yong Ho reaped power from Mammon's godly energy. Yong Ho had Richard stand up by putting his hand on Richard's shoulder lightly. He then looked at the stairs leading to the twelfth floor. I'm now opening the twelfth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. 
Lucia spoke, and Yongho stepped forward. Mammon's twelve spirits and Yongho's new twelve spirits followed. Unlike previous floors, the twelfth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed was a space only for Mammon's twelve spirits. Whenever Yongho moved one step forward, darkness retreated automatically. There was no single dungeon monster on the twelfth floor which was filled with Mammon and his twelve spirits' power. Salami, who was following Bucephala's walking after Skull, looked around, blinking his eyes endlessly. Although Salami evolved into a spectacular spirit after being upgraded from Fire Elemental Dragon to Great Fire Elemental Dragon Emperor, he was still Salami. The omnipotent mana excited him. The structure of the twelfth floor was simple. There was a large rotunda in the middle, and twelve rooms were placed around it. Kaiwan nudged Catalina in the ribs with her fingers and asked, Don't you recall anything now? Something like the memories of your previous life. If each floor of the Labyrinth of Greed was an exclusive space of Mammon's twelve spirits, the twelfth floor was a private space. Accordingly, there must be more private memories embedded in this space than any other floor. Recognized by Yuno as Elun's reincarnation, Catalina struggled to recall anything, but eventually, she failed with her ears and tail drooping. Uh, I don't have any memory of this place. I can't think of anything. Was it really true that she was Alun's reincarnation? While Catalina was feeling gloomy, Mammon's twelve spirits, watching her feeling dejected, nodded almost at the same time. Obviously, she was like Alun's reincarnation. Since Lucia needed some time to take over the twelfth floor, Mammon's twelve spirits stepped toward their own room. The new twelve subordinate spirits belonging to Yongho also did not just stay in the hall. As if guided by their inherited power, all of them headed to the rooms of Mammon's twelve spirits. Watching Kaiwan heading to Elun's room while holding Catalina's hand, Yongho grabbed the air with a smile. Then he entered Amun's room in front of him, holding Amun in his hand. It was a spacious but desolate space. There were no proper decorations between the stone walls, the floor, and the ceiling. What was in the room was a low-sized altar, located alone in the innermost part. But Yong Ho couldn't take his eyes off the altar. Standing before it as if he was bewitched, he looked at the hole where he could put the spear and the decorations around it. He uttered exclamations before he knew it, Oh my God! Yes, my master! This is the place I met my master for the first time. Probably, you could have reached this place thanks to a special connection like the arena. Amun spoke in a low voice. His voice rang nostalgic as if he missed that day. It was only several days after Yongho became the master of the Mammon family that he met Amun. It was not that long ago, but it looked like a distant past to Yongho. I hugged you here for the first time, said Catalina rather proudly as if she was boasting to Kaiwan. Kaiwan frowned while Yongho chuckled. It seemed like Catalina talked about her going down the floor with him after falling down. Yes, I know. I hugged you for the first time here. It was true that he hugged Catalina and rolled over the floor, but it was also true that this was the place where he evolved her for the first time. To be precise, her evolution took place at a place that connected Amun's room with an unknown space, but he didn't have to mention it. Yong Ho, who recalled he touched Catalina's thigh for the excuses of strengthening her agility, acknowledged his lustful inclinations at that time. I think I know what you're thinking. Your anguish is rising. Ignoring what Amun just said, Yongho left Amun's room with Catalina and Kaiwan. As if he was waiting, Skull approached him. Skull was holding very large scythes in both hands. One was a long, sharp sword and a black blade all in one. Yongho had never seen it before, but he could see what it was as soon as he saw it. A purple color that symbolizes death rose softly from Mammon's godly energy. Is it Baphomet's sickle? Skull nodded. The pitch-black scythe wasn't just a weapon, but it was Baphomet's alter ego. Baphomet needed that scythe to exist as the incarnation of death. Because of this, Magnadon, who was wary of Baphomet's dangers, weakened his power by separating Baphomet from the sickle. Skull's request was simple. He wanted Yongho to unite him with Baphomet's sickle through synthetic reinforcement. But this kind of synthetic reinforcement, which combined Yongho's subordinate spirit with an artifact could only be done once, unlike Yongho's other evolutions. 
that was why it was best to do it with a good artifact, given the choice. But the problem was that Yong Ho could miss the right time for synthetic reinforcement while looking for the best possible artifacts. At a moment when his war with the King of Pride was around the corner, it was foolish for him to postpone the synthetic reinforcement, waiting for better artifacts. During the past few days, Yong Ho did a number of things at the same time, apart from taking a surprise attack on the territory of the King of Gluttony. One of his tasks at the moment was the selection of the artifacts for reinforcing the synthetic reinforcement of his twelve subordinate spirits. The treasure storage of the Labyrinth of Greed, the warehouse that only collected exclusive magic devices of Citri's dungeon market, and the auction items that could be called the Legend of Samuel's special auction house. Kaiwan chose the Dragon Heart, which she had been coveting all the time. It was the Dragon Heart of Ernasaga, the Silver Dragon Lord that became the material for the Silver Dragon Armor, Yong Ho's favorite. At that moment, Yong Ho did not forget to pay a silent prayer for Ernasaga who left it behind. Eligos and Ophelia each selected Green God's Fury and Green God's Wrath from Samuel's special auction items it was armor worn on each arm and leg. Both carried the power of a powerful god of the alien world called the Green God. Tigrius chose the magic cane that Magnadon used during his lifetime, and Catalina chose the Moonlight Sword, Elun's beloved sword after thinking it over. What Samuel chose was the heart of the ancient king, which was kept in Citri's warehouse. It was a magical device made of Brigada, but it seemed designed to increase the efficiency of the mana she received from dragons. Mammon's twelve spirits, including Gusion and Richard, were done with synthetic reinforcement or didn't want it, so they were just satisfied with acquiring new weapons. Master, I've taken control of the twelfth floor. Let me open the thirteenth floor, the last floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. All the subordinate and general spirits who were looking around the rooms gathered in the hall again. They looked down the stairs leading to the thirteenth floor. On the thirteenth floor was Mammon's room, which was the true heart of the Labyrinth of Greed. Even Citri, who was following quietly, found her eyes welled with tears. The door that was blocking the stairs opened. Upon arriving on the thirteenth floor, they stood before a steel door embossed with a giant dragon emblem representing Mammon. Yong Ho opened the door again. The heart chamber of the Labyrinth of Greed sensed the King of Greed immediately and welcomed the King gently. The heart room was monotonous. There was only a small passage leading to Mammon's room and an old stone throne. But it was by no means an ordinary throne. After all, Scathack couldn't control her emotions. She burst into tears like a child, and Gusion also tried hard to suppress his emotions, but he eventually showed tears. Yuno bit her lips. Yuscha made a densely emotional smile. Yong Ho slowly approached the throne. There was nothing on the throne, but Yong Ho could also feel it. Amon whispered to him. It is now a throne for you, master. Mammon must be very satisfied with you coming here. Chapter, 269 Yong Ho touched Mammon's throne. He was seated on the throne with the present and past twelve subordinate spirits of the Mammon family watching him. This time, Catalina and Eligos were choked with emotions, and Yong Ho also shared their feelings. He knew at the moment he sat on the throne. The Labyrinth of Greed was watching him, which remembered everything that had happened in the Labyrinth of Greed from the first day Yong Ho first came to the House of Mammon until all the happenings until now. Such as the days when Yong Ho had only two subordinate spirits Catalina and Eligos and the day when he put a straw mat on the red carpet in the Demon King's room eating and sleeping there. Later he added dungeon spirits starting with Goblin John and Ron to the House of Mammon. Eligos smiled brightly, watching the small makeshift trap and torture chamber, and Yuria and Baduk met for the first time through the jail bars. Skull rolled over the floor like a stone. Rikam and Bergrim joined hands with other dungeon spirits to improve the dungeon little by little. Many other things happened after that. It wasn't just Yong Ho who saw it. Everyone in the heart room could see their own memories. I, Ophelia, Indirian's daughter, am honored to see you, the great king of greed. Ophelia knelt in front of Yong Ho and expressed her courtesy. Eligos, who shed tears a lot, knelt before him along with her. He could not speak because his voice was hoarse, but his action a moment ago was enough. Instead of laughing heartily as he did, Skull also showed due manners to Yong Ho. 
It wasn't just the new twelve subordinate spirits of Yongho who bowed to him politely. Mammon's twelve spirits also did the same. And the last one of them approached him. My beloved customer, as the queen of sloth, Citri, am pleased to see you, the new king of greed that I admire. At that moment, everyone in the labyrinth of greed knew. Rikam and Bergrim, who were working on the ground floor of the house of Mammon, and Yuria, who was digging potatoes along with Baduk and the dungeon meerkat, also realized it. I have completely captured the labyrinth of greed. My beloved master, the labyrinth of greed is now completely yours. Lucia announced, and new mana was injected not only into the heart chamber but also into the entire labyrinth of greed. Now, the labyrinth of greed had returned to the Mammon family after a thousand and hundreds of years. The reason why the heart of the dungeon was called heart was not simply because it was the most important facility of the dungeon. Just as the heart of a living thing supplied blood to the whole body, the heart of the dungeon also injects mana into the dungeon. Until now, it was the heart of the dungeon located on the ground floor of the house of Mammon that supplied mana to the labyrinth of greed. But now it was different. Since Yongho completely took control of the labyrinth of greed, he could utilize the true heart chamber that had been sleeping for the last millennium. The relationship between the dungeon and its master was close. The stronger the dungeon was, the stronger its master was. When the master became stronger, his dungeon also became stronger. Lucia, the soul of the dungeon, was like Yongho's alter ego. Therefore, he vividly felt the process of everything about Lucia being transferred from the heart chamber on the ground floor to the deepest one as if it happened to him. On the day Mammon died, the soul of the labyrinth of greed also died. In order to prevent the destruction of his twelve spirits, Mammon terminated his contract with them. As a result, the labyrinth of greed was separated not only from Mammon but also from his twelve spirits. Lucia soothed the solitude of the labyrinth of greed. She became united with the labyrinth of greed on behalf of the soul of the dungeon where Mammon lived and died. The heart chamber of the dungeon was filled with Lucia's energy. A blue light, which was like Lucia's symbol, spread everywhere into the wall, the floor, and the ceiling. It was as if a new stream of water dipped the dry riverbed. A lump of blue light gathered before Yongho's eyes. It was the magic of space leap. The light immediately exploded, and a girl with blue hair appeared among the shattering piles of light. It was Lucia. Lucia, with translucent butterfly wings behind her back, rotated in front of Yongho. Lifting the white hem slightly, she smiled at him broadly. Ain't I cute like a fairy? Thanks to taking control of the labyrinth of greed, I have grown a lot, too. The way she flapped her large butterfly wings was pretty cute. However, Yongho expressed doubts about her look. You're still the same as before except for your wings. Lucia looked like a girl less than ten years old. Thanks to her young age, her butterfly wings looked well on her, but it had nothing to do with her growth. Lucia replied after clicking her tongue, I could have been a well-proportioned beauty, but if I do, I have to feel sorry for Yuria, right? She is my only friend in this dungeon, so we need to grow together. Lucia's original body couldn't leave the dungeon's heart chamber while Yuria couldn't go down alone to the innermost floor where the dungeon's heart chamber was located. Because of this, even though they became friends with each other, both had little time to play together. But it would be different in the future. Lucia, who became the true soul of the labyrinth of greed, gained freedom of movement. She could now freely move anywhere within the labyrinth of greed. Now Lucia could play together with Yuria. How much loneliness would Yuria feel if Lucia alone became an adult? Lucia wanted to be her friend, not her sister. Yongho was moved to hear Lucia talking about Yuria like that, so he looked at her warmly. It was the same with other subordinate spirits. However, only one, Amun, responded differently, well-proportioned beauty. This is the first time I'm hearing that, but I think I know what it means. Our master's anguish. But Yongho stopped him from talking any more by violently shaking his right arm where Amun was embedded. Then he took a deep breath. He quietly moved his fingers in the air and checked out the map of the entire labyrinth of greed. As expected, only one place was left for him to conquer. It was a place that Yongho hadn't been to yet. Even now, he didn't know what was in that place. Although he was the true owner of the dungeon. 
But he didn't have to mention it now because not only him but all his subordinate spirits knew where it was located. Yong Ho looked at everyone before he stood up from the throne. Then he asked Mammon's twelve spirits in a low voice, is it okay? He was asking them whether he could step into that place or make it his own. Skathak nodded first and said, the true owner of the labyrinth of greed is now our young master, oh, no, our master. Definitely, you can. If you come across anything that should not be seen, it's the fault of our master Mammon who died without hiding it, Gus Ion added. Yuscha and Yuno also showed approval by smiling at him. Lastly, Citri approached him and spoke while gently overlapping her hand on the back of his right hand, it's his room. But it's my beloved customer's room now. So, he wouldn't even care. Mammon's room on the thirteenth floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. The bedroom of Mammon who made the greatest achievements in the history of the demon world. Yong Ho stood up from the throne. At that moment, Catalina, who was standing side by side with Kai Wan, fluttered her ears. He didn't need to use the rapport between his status as the master and his subordinate spirit to talk to her. He read her mind immediately and ordered readily. Come on, Catalina. Just like my escort knight, come with me. Her tail flapped fiercely, like a puppy who heard she was okay to eat a snack. Kai Wan hugged her arm and said in passing, Well, I'm going with you because I'm his wife. It was none other than Mammon's room. Kaiwan definitely wanted to go in and look at it. Ophelia closed her lips tightly, barely holding up the urge to follow him, while Eligos wiped his tears as if he was touched by what was happening before his eyes. When Catalina and Kaiwan walked with him on both sides, he approached Mammon's door, located right behind the throne. He opened the door engraved with a red dragon, Mammon's symbol. It was not a very big room. Actually, it was large enough to house a whole basketball court, but it was never too big to be called Mammon's Room, who built the most powerful force in the history of the demon world. Besides, its interior was just plain, with luxurious furniture. His room had nothing like furniture except for a bed, a table, and a few chests of drawers. Only his bed was unusually large, which reminded Yong Ho of his own room. Nonetheless, Yong Ho felt the room was special because it was Mammon's Room. Catalina and Kai Wan began to look at the details closely, such as the walls and ceilings, one by one, like those who entered a museum. Did I expect too much? Yong Ho slightly let down his shoulders. Of course, he didn't expect any great treasure in Mammon's room. What Yong Ho wanted was a conversation with Mammon. Ilun, Yoho Yuan, and Magnadon left their own alter egos on each floor of the Labyrinth of Greed. Thanks to this, Yong Ho could chat with them, though briefly. Any possibility that Mammon left his own alter ego here? If that's the case, can I have a conversation with him? Of course, even if he could talk to Mammon, Yong Ho didn't want to ask him how to overcome the current crisis or any know how on increasing his power drastically. He just wanted to chat with the great Mammon with a pure heart. Well, come to think of it, it must have been pretty hard for him to send off his twelve spirits. Of course, like Elun, he could have left behind his alter ego before going to the battlefield, but it looked like Mammon would not do that. Chapter, 270 Actually, Yong Ho saw the memory Mammon left behind when he obtained the demon god's heart in the human world. Come to think of it, there was something strange about it. Mammon said he did not regret his choice. What was that choice that he mentioned at that time? Did it mean his alliance with other kings to prevent the invasion of the celestial world? Or did it mean his decision to block the door to the celestial world alone? The two choices didn't make any sense anyway. For example, as for the alliance, he would have mentioned anything like regret because the other kings didn't yet betray him back then. As for his decision to stand up to the celestial world alone, he had little time to do so. In fact, he was in an urgent situation where he had to return his twelve spirits back to the demon world. So, it was unreasonable for him to open the door to the human world in order to send the demon god's heart. If so, then what was it? Why did Mammon leave the demon god's heart in the human world? And why did he mention the qualifications of his successor? Yong Ho shook his head lightly and got all the doubts out of his mind. Maybe he was thinking too deeply. 
He was not quite sure if Mammon's regrets were necessarily related to the door of the celestial world or the other king's betrayal. Catching his breath calmly, he set about his next task. Invoking the power of greed, he found a passage to a secret room somewhere in Mammon's room. The room itself responded to his greed. The wall that Catalina was looking into suddenly cracked, revealing a secret door. Startled, Catalina looked at Yong Ho, and Kai Wan quickly approached the secret door. The steel door engraved with the dragon's head was tightly sealed. Yong Ho put his hand in his pocket then took out the key to the secret room the last reward that he obtained in Mammon's arena. The pure white sand in a large bowl formed various shapes high and low. A little bit of color was added to this, which soon created a great map of the entire demon world. The red sand moved over the three-dimensional map of the demon world. The sand was lumped together in four, all of which was inching toward one point. As if rising up against the red sand, the blue sand also moved on the map of the demon world, but its number was not even half that of the red sand. It seemed to be swallowed up by the red sand wriggling threateningly. Too many. The red sand was the northern forces, while the blue sand was the southern forces. Dhritarashtra, the queen of fury, stared at the map, with her teeth clenched. It was natural that the northern forces were overwhelming numerically. They were a combined army of the four forces of the king of pride, the king of envy, the king of lust, and the king of gluttony. Of course, the earlier fight between the forces of the king of pride and the king of envy reduced the number of their troops to some extent while the forces of the king of gluttony lost half its troops. Despite that, the four armies of the four kings formed a unified army with powerful military strength. On the other hand, the southern forces were a combined army of the Queen of Fury and the King of Violence. Although there was an unclaimed land in the south, it didn't build up a large army like other kingdoms because it had been divided for a long time. Comparing the military strength between them, the combined forces of the four kings were twice the number of their counterparts. Besides, they had the additional resources of the dungeon market's forces. So, they had a tremendous numerical superiority in the number of troops. Although we are numerically inferior to them, we are superior in terms of the quality of the troops and their military strength. Even if they have hundreds of thousands of skeleton soldiers or goblins, they won't be able to outpower our dragon army, said the blue dragon, Ankablosa, clearly, who was sitting next to the Queen of Fury. Even though she was in a polymorphic state of a slender Apsaras, she had a discerning judgment. The Dragon Corps numbered only 100. However, their combat power was recognized as the strongest in the demon world. Ankablosa didn't say that merely to comfort the Queen of Fury in this crucial situation. The northern forces totaled more than 100,000. It was the first time in the history of the demon world that such a large army was created as a group like that. However, most of the troops consisted of low-level soldiers such as Skeleton Soldier, Orc Warrior, and Goblin Rider. Accordingly, the Dragon Army could easily defeat them, given the choice. Besides, we do have the forces of the King of Greed, right? Asked Ankablosa. When she quickly moved her long and thin fingers, new green sand was added to the top of the map of the Demon World. The number of the sand was only a handful, so much so that when added to the blue sand, it didn't make much of a difference. But its quality was different. Ankablosa had learned over the past few days how the forces of the King of Greed led by Yongho smashed the forces of the King of Gluttony. The subordinate spirits under the command of the King of Greed, namely Yongho, were unusually strong. Although they numbered just a little over ten, all of them were strong enough to have more than six horns, which was literally incredible. Besides, some of them, whose power was almost equal to the king despite their lack of sin and godly energy, also belonged to Yongho's subordinate spirits. Indeed, they were an elite force that could be found in legends. When Ankablosa told her about the power of the forces of the King of Greed, the Queen of Fury, who was full of worries until a moment ago, made a relaxed smile. Watching her smile brightly, Ankablosa smiled bitterly. As a matter of fact, the King of Violence loved the Queen's pure and innocent heart. Ankablosa, you're right. Now is not the time for us to despair. It's time we found a way to win. As if she pulled herself, the Queen of Fury spoke energetically. As if on cue, Gardamundi opened the door of the Queen's barracks and came in. 
The spies of the Karvinka clan in the rear notice the reinforcement of the King of Greed. You can confirm it through the telescope. The Queen of Fury changed her expression once again. But she flinched a bit instead of standing up right away. Ankablosa understood her feelings. She expressed gratitude to the queen for her warm consideration then suggested, it would be nice if you could go out for fresh air for a moment and check the forces of the King of Greed coming to us. Hmm, do you really think so? After all, Ankablosa grinned at her instead of smiling bitterly. Then she said with a nod, yes, I think so. The Queen of Fury stood up from her seat and stepped forward with a bright smile. Shortly afterward, the Queen of Fury blankly looked at the big telescope directed toward the sky in the south. Kurtamuka opened her eyes wide, and Ankablosa was embarrassed to see the King of Greed's forces flying toward them. The King of Greed and his forces were overwhelming, to say the least, surpassing the Queen of Fury in her deputy's expectations. Ankablosa realized that some of the dungeon market's forces were included in the king's forces. It was a large combined army led by the giant red dragon, Tiamat. Dozens of flying vehicles and flying spirits were flying the sky with such a terrifying force that the Queen of Fury and her people on the ground were overwhelmed at their grandeur might. I, Drydarastra, Queen of Fury, would like to welcome the King of Greed. The Queen's voice was not heard in real time but in the video recorded through magic. Moreover, the background of the video was not on her fortress or her field barracks but on the back of the wild bird, Astra. Yong Ho, seated in the captain's seat of the giant red dragon, Tiamat, knitted his brows. The Queen of Fury in the video was hiding her tense look with a casual smile. She made this video on her way to the battlefield because she had no time to greet him in person due to the enemy's sudden attack. What is the status of the war? It seems that the battle is about to begin. Communication is not smooth because there is a strong magic field all over the battlefield. After replying, Lucia spread the light map of the entire demon world right next to the video of the Queen of Fury. The current battlefield was the plains in the northeastern part of the Queen of Fury's territory. The Queen chose to make a turn to stop the northern army that appeared out of the blue sky. As a matter of fact, the larger the size of the army was, the more difficult they could carry out a covert operation. Anyway, the northern army was a large army of hundreds of thousands of soldiers, so the southern army did not miss the movement of this huge northern army. According to the observation, their fighting should have broken out three or four days later at the earliest. But such a prediction was wrong. The forces of the King of Pride, the King of Envy, and the King of Lust were suddenly added to the forces of the King of Gluttony who were facing the southern army up close. About half of the northern army began their march at a terrifying pace and forced the southern army to confront them. This was possible because of various movement magics and the dungeon market distribution channels installed all over the northern area. Of course, Yongho himself used the distribution channels to ambush the forces of the King of Gluttony, but he could not hide his surprise at the massive movement of the northern army. There was a fundamental difference between moving 100 elite forces and moving tens of thousands of forces. Even Samuel, one of the five directors of the dungeon market, was also embarrassed. Yong Ho changed his strategy immediately. What was important now was the battle between the forces of the north and the south. Since the troops mobilized by both sides were so huge, the king of pride and the king of lust could appear. Yong Ho concluded that he could not leave the queen of fury confronting the two kings. I ordered the supply troops to be separated from the main forces. The main forces must move to the battlefield right away. The battle fleet of the Mammon family filling the sky was divided into two. The battleships headed by the giant red dragon, Tiamat, picked up their speed to head toward the north. Chapter, 271 The wind was strong. The Queen of Fury let down a huge axe of lightning on the floor, wearing armor with a powerful thruster. Behind her were the ground troops consisting of the eight clan soldiers that were staring north, fully prepared for the coming war. The squadrons of the Azura and Yiksha clans also lined up. Behind them were dragons that had subdued various huge beasts while the Garura and Karvinka tribesmen prepared to fly at any time, holding their spears and bows. The Deva tribesmen whose mana was particularly strong among the eight clans operated the magic guns that fired mana in the rear. 
and the tribesmen of the Maharagas and Gandharavas clans were mixed with other forces of the eight clans, depending on their specialties. The southern troops that the Queen of Fury hastily mobilized for the war totaled about 32,000. The number of the northern army was estimated to be about 70,000 to 80,000, so the southern troops led by the Queen were less than half of the northern troops. However, the southern army did not consist solely of the tribesmen of the eight clans. The Queen of Fury had a strong alliance called the Dragon Legion. Now, the Queen looked far away. She noticed the flow of magic swirling wildly under the red sky. It was caused by the magic field that the Northern Army activated to interfere with the large-scale magic of the Southern forces. On the battlefield of the demon world, magic was always a variable that produced miracles. Accordingly, the Northern Army with an overwhelming number of troops had to get rid of this magic by all means. The Queen of Fury noticed giant dungeon spirits among the skeletons, orc warriors, goblin riders, and other miscellaneous infantrymen. Cyclops, the one-eyed giant grasping a rock the size of a house, was so big that it looked like it was carrying the sky on its head. Chimeras with the heads of lions, Griffin and Drake cried out viciously, and the hydras with nine heads and potent poisons and many unknown beasts showed off their extraordinary presence. It was one of the reasons why the Queen of Fury gave up her dungeon fortress and took the lead to fight them. The high wall of her dungeon fortress was meaningless in front of dozens of super-large enemy spirits. Rather than being beaten unilaterally in one place, it was better for her to confront them on a wide plain. The Queen of Fury bit the big horn in her mouth. She was counting the numbers, staring at the northern forces that started marching toward her army. The dirt had risen densely everywhere. Even though she was far away from them, she felt as if the hot breath of the goblin riders seemed to tickle the tip of her nose. The roaring of the northern forces filled the sky. The earth was shaken by the clouds of tens of thousands rushing toward the southern army. But the southern army stayed patiently. Holding their weapons, they suppressed their growing tension and clenched their teeth. At some point, the Queen of Fury finally blew the horn. Its loud and magnificent sound penetrated through the northern army's roaring. The queen didn't order the army to charge at their northern counterparts. The southern troops were patient again this time. The sound of the queen blowing the horn reached the sky, and the second reason why the queen chose to fight became apparent. The dragon legion appeared suddenly in the sky. Ankablosa, who stood out among the dragons in the red sky, pierced through the clouds and appeared herself, and the dragon soldiers lined up behind her opened their mouths at once. It didn't matter that the queen couldn't use massive magic because of the magic field. The most powerful weapon of the dragons was never magic. Their huge shadows in the sky were cast over the northern army's heads. Then the dragon breath of the dragon soldiers from the sky rained down on the northern troops on the ground. Light, lightning, and flame struck the ground. At that moment, the queen of fury blew a second horn. Now, the southern army screamed violently and rushed toward the northern army. The queen threw the horn and stood at the forefront of the southern army, holding a huge axe of lightning. The queen knew her strength and weakness. So, she chose to fight at the front line instead of commanding the army in the rear. It was Biryabaka, the head of the Garura clan, in the sky that commanded the southern army. Biryabaka's order was issued to each unit of the southern army. Since this was a battle between tens of thousands of troops on both sides, it would not end up being a simple confrontation. Both the southern and northern forces had their own formations for the battle. The southern and northern forces finally clashed. The Queen of Fury, who was at the forefront of the southern army, wielded the huge axe of lightning with all her might. The ogre's upper body exploded when he was rushing toward her recklessly. With the ogre's blood gushing and the fragments of his bones scattering in all directions, the queen again swung the axe and struck the ground this time. The thunderbolt that occurred around the struck ground killed dozens of the orc warriors around the ogre. Screams and explosions filled the battlefield. A massive slaughtering war began on the plains. The queen of fury moved her eyes more than her hands. She tried to check out the fighting in the sky, let alone the fighting on the ground. In the sky, the Dragon Legion and the Northern Army's flying fleet were engaged in full-scale air combat. The giant eagles, which were said to live only in the north, attacked the dragons in groups, 
and the battleships apparently belonging to the dungeon market fired the magic flames. Just like the dragon soldier's dragon breath was a surprise attack, the ambush by the northern forces flying squadrons was something they never expected. Since both sides hid their secret weapons, they were startled by each other's unexpected strike. The Queen of Fury immediately rolled her eyes, briefly watching Ankablosa trampling on the back of the behemoth with seven heads and biting his neck. She wanted to find and support those soldiers of the southern army who were on the defensive at the moment. The whole battlefield looked like a chaotic mess with huge beasts raging from both the sky and the earth and tens of thousands of troops colliding violently. But it wasn't. Looking down from high in the sky, Biryabaka, the general commander of the southern army, knew that both the southern and northern forces were fighting as part of their grand strategies. The two armies pushed against each other in a strange balance, and many of their units on the left and right began a complex operation. Kurtimuka. Help them on the left. Shouting at her, the Queen of Fury swung the huge axe at the same time. Six orc warriors were smashed into pieces at once, and her bodyguards headed by Kurtimuka threw themselves toward the Queen. Some of the southern units on the left were crumbling. There were too many northern soldiers on the right who rushed to defeat them. Left neglected without any support, the southern units were certain to be defeated, which would change the tide of the battle. On the battlefield, the passage of time could be weird. As the moments between life and death continued, every minute and second felt much longer. Finally, the Queen of Fury grabbed the huge axe again then injected a stronger mana into the godly energy of Fury. At that moment, the Queen saw the head of the Garura clan shouting. A very good piece of news was delivered through the communication device attached to her ear. They are here. Skullkull. The sound of a bizarre roaring echoed into her ears clearly. The Queen of Fury swallowed. She shouted with joy at the arrival of the reinforcements in the rear that she forgot to notice because she was so absorbed in the fighting. They attacked the northern forces who struck against the left wing of the southern army. At the forefront of them was Skull, the incarnation of death on top of a pitch-black beast. Skull, the avatar of death, who was created through Yongho's final synthetic reinforcement. Skull's violet eyes flashed from his pure and white skull. A purple or almost black light sparkled between Skull's black armor, and his dark red cloak broke the surroundings. Then Skull swung Baphomet's sickle. He fully inherited the power of the incarnation of death that had come to the alien world in the distant past, dealing a fatal blow to all those who touched the tip of the sickle. It didn't matter whether they were orcs, ogres, and trolls. Even several huge beasts and demon beasts could not dare to block Skull. And behind that incarnation of death, the core of death made a silent roar. They were none other than Skull's unit with a dozen death knights taking the lead. All of them, armed with magic weapons, were in sync with Skull. They rushed without any hesitation. They crushed, cut, kicked, and trampled the northern forces. They had tremendous destructive power. The right wing of the northern forces was shattered by the Skull unit strike. Moreover, their striking speed was very fast. The Skull unit comprising of only several hundred were certain to annihilate the right wing of the northern army, which was more than ten times their size. Skull roared. His violet energy of death covered the earth, which brought about a terrible and surprising thing. The northern soldiers, who were smashed to pieces, became the undead and stood up. Then they rushed toward the northern soldiers who were their allies a little while ago. Many soldiers of the northern army died but stood up again as undead. The more the northern army's soldiers died, the number of undead also increased. More and more northern soldiers were dying accordingly. Indeed, it was a series of nightmares for the northern army. But that wasn't all. The Queen of Fury felt her heart was beating fast. She got thrilled, clutching her chest before she knew it. In great excitement, she turned her head toward the southern sky. The King of Greed. Salami, who was transformed into a huge heatwave dragon, flew behind the skull unit. And on his back Yonghoth King of Greed was standing. He was dressed in silver dragon armor, according to the wish of the Queen of Fury. Chapter, 272 Twelve lights symbolizing the twelve subordinate spirits radiated from the magic field fitted on Yongho's left hand. 
Besides, the green flames of greed arose from Amun who became united with the godly energy of greed. Yong Ho looked straight ahead. He then swung Amun toward the rear of the skull unit. He wanted to demonstrate its legendary force of the past once again. The magic spear of the red lotus. With just a single swinging Amun could burn heaven and earth and evaporate the sea. It could no longer be called a wave of green flames. It was a tsunami of flames. A huge and enormous flame engulfed the entire skull unit then passed by them and burnt the right wing of the northern army. Skull Cull. Skull ran through the flame. Skull and his unit were not injured in the flames of greed. They slaughtered the northern forces with the flames of greed that never extinguished. Shouting loudly, Salami rotated his body. Yong Ho broke through the air, led the beating of his heart and greed. Jumping off Salami's back, he landed next to the Queen of Fury. The Queen of Fury saw Yong Ho. Yong Ho also saw the Queen. At that moment, a storm of the sword caused by the shadow of a blade and a blade whip swept around Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury. The northern forces around them turned into ashes and almost evaporated, gushing blood. Catalina and Kai Wan joined Yong Ho, and ten bullets were fired from Yong Ho's main battleship, Tiamat, the giant red dragon. It was Gus Ion who flew like a cannonball and jumped into the middle of the northern forces. Next to him were Eligos and Ophelia, who were strengthened through the synthetic reinforcement like Skull. Each of them unleashed their beast brutality right next to Gus Ion, who could be called the final crystal of the Red Demon. The flying air unit commanded by Samuel, the fastest wing, supported the Dragon Legion's fight. The dragons that the King of Gluttony collected one by one to deal with the Dragon Legion now supported them. They fought the northern forces with them. Like Dragon Lord Ankyblosa said, the power of the King of Greed's forces could not be assessed simply by the number of his troops. Sorry I'm late, Yong Ho said to the Queen of Fury. But the Queen shook her head violently. With her face blushing, she shouted, It's okay. I would like to welcome you from the bottom of my heart. It looked like she wanted to hug him right away. If she had not met him here on the battlefield, she would probably have done so. The situation had changed a bit from the moment it was revealed that Yong Ho was the new king of greed. So Kurtamuka made a complicated expression, while Catalina, wearing shadow armor all over her body, was focusing only on the fight around her. Kaiwan grabbed her whip sword tightly, shaking her head. But this was a battlefield, and their fighting was still in full swing. She could not afford to chat with him leisurely. Yong Ho brought out the power of greed and gluttony at the same time then opened up the seven horns of light at once. Startled, the Queen of Fury turned around to see him. It was only fifteen days when they joined hands to confront the King of Lust. Now, his mana was much stronger than then. Instead of explaining, Yong Ho wielded Amun, and the Queen just smiled instead of asking questions. Listening to her heart beating again, she empowered the godly energy. She tried to get furious even while she was holding back the urge to smile. A fierce battle ensued. The blood of the troops was strewn everywhere as the fighting went on. How long did it pass? Yong Ho suddenly raised his head and looked far away. He did so, led by instinct, so did the Queen of Fury in Citri. The eyes of the three met at a distance. Yong Ho and the Queen did not know why, but Citri was thrilled. They screamed at the same time. The air split. There was a huge twist over the heads of the northern army. The twist was a torrent of mana. Mana was abundant in the sky and the earth in the demon world, and accordingly the inhabitants there were sensitive to the flow of mana. But even so, there were limitations. The northern forces already spread the magic field all over the sky on the battlefield. So, a couple of distortions at this point would not make any meaningful change. Moreover, they were engaged in the fighting now. Therefore, the reaction of everyone on the battlefield was abnormal. It didn't matter whether they were sensitive or not, nor did it matter whether they were fast or not. Some ogres who were trampling on the heads of the Yikshas who fell on the ground raised their heads before they knew it. The warrior of the Azura clan and the orc warrior who were staring at each other, equipped with their swords, took their eyes off each other at the same time. Even though they were facing each other, who could take each other's life at any moment, they just looked up at the sky as if they were bewitched. 
Even the goblin, who was dying while painfully squeezing the intestines protruding through his torn stomach, moved to see what was in the sky tearfully. It didn't take long for both the southern army and the northern forces everywhere to react the same way. It took only a few seconds at most then sudden silence fell to the noisy battlefield. It was creepy, indeed. The screams, shouts, and roaring that suddenly stopped made them feel as if time stopped. At first, it was a piece of crack. It was a crack in the sky. There was a hole when the crack opened, then mana swirled and distorted everything near it like any other twist. Almost everyone didn't know what the hole in the sky was. But those who witnessed the twist noticed it instinctively. That wasn't like a mere twist. Like everyone, Ophelia, who looked at the hole as if she was possessed, suddenly turned her eyes to the side because there was something that caught her eye in addition to the bizarre phenomenon in the sky. Gijin's fists were trembling hard. He was not fearful or angry. There was some intense emotion on his face that was difficult to define. Gus Ion moved his lips as if to say something, but he didn't say it. The Queen of Fury's heart was beating. She grabbed her own chest. She felt a subtle pain. A terrible feeling that she had never felt in her life seemed to grip her. The sin of fury was groaning. Finally, the hole was opened. It was a huge hole that was a dozen meters in diameter. Both the northern and southern forces stared at the black hole. Naturally, their eyes met. It was a huge eye. A shining eye looked out from inside the hole. Then it made eye contact with both the northern and southern forces. Yong Ho instinctively knew it. The eye was smiling. He had goosebumps on his back. And at that moment, the silence broke. The northern forces, who were right under the hole, fell on the ground like a broken marionette. Now, everyone on the battlefield who looked like they were possessed came to their senses. Then they screamed all at once. A glowing hand protruded from the hole. A giant's hand, wrapped by a pure white light, swept the ground. All kinds of light arose from the scattered bodies of the northern forces. Then they were sucked into the hole. It was as if their essence was being absorbed. Hundreds of them fell simultaneously. Hundreds of lights soared simultaneously. When the white giant's hand swept through the northern forces, more lights were sucked into the hole. The northern army ran away, screaming. The southern army was in a strange mood, watching them fleeing toward them rather than attacking them. The southern troops just saw the giant's shining arm trying to get out of the hole without even wielding a weapon at them. Biryabaka, the head of the Garura clan, thought about it. He was faithful to the basics because he didn't know what the hole was or what the glowing arm protruding from the inside was. The battlefield was wide. Although the hole was large, it was not comparable to the battlefield where tens of thousands of troops clashed. So, the Queen of Fury had to take advantage of this confusion. Rather, now was the time for the southern army to rush them. But she could not bring herself to issue the order. What came out of her mouth was something like a groaning of fear. The Queen of Fury turned. She looked at the sky, with her back against the northern forces. Oh, no. A line was drawn high above the heads of the southern forces. It was also a crack, and it quickly got distorted. It distorted everything around it and became huge. A shining eye from the inside of the black hole looked down at the southern army. No. The Queen of Fury shouted. The tribesmen of the eight clans right under the hole fell on the ground. All kinds of light soared, and a couple of hands protruded from the inside of the hole. Filling the hole, the mysterious being grabbed the hole instead of smashing those on the ground like they did to the northern forces. Then, it opened the hole wider as if opening a door. Then it stuck out its head suddenly. It was a pure white light. Not only its head but also its shoulders came out of the hole now. The giant of light, reminiscent of the king of violence, smashed the southern army with his flexible arms at the same time as the earth was shaken. Hundreds from the eight clans had their essence taken away by the giant of light before being scattered on the ground and died without even a single scream. It was a silent horror. The giant of light moved his arms without crying or roaring. In just a few seconds, while everyone was distracted by this unrealistic situation, the giant of light took the lives of hundreds of the southern soldiers. 
It was a catastrophe caused by their close formation. Run away. Biryabaka, have the troops retreat. The Queen of Fury shouted desperately. Chapter, 273 Biryabaka, the head of the Garura clan, came to his senses suddenly and opened his mouth wide again, but he could not issue an order. The northern forces were right in front of his eyes. If something went wrong, there would take place a major catastrophe. As a matter of fact, the majority of killing in battles occurred while they were fleeing. Biryabaka's hesitation delayed the troops' retreat by a few seconds. During that short span, however, more than a hundred southern soldiers were killed. It was no exaggeration to say that there were almost none who survived right under the hole. A huge blank was created in the middle of the southern army. Scatter to the left and right. Finally, Biryabaka ordered his southern troops. Moving his hands, he issued a more complex order this time. The southern troops located far from the hole got into ship shape immediately as if to show off the efficiency of their usual training, but those close to the hole did not. Those who fled in fear and confusion were wounded or killed in the process. Too many of them were trampled to death or injured by the same race, namely the tribesmen of the eight clans. There was big confusion in the sky. Ankablosa, who was commanding the Dragon Legion, was embarrassed. The dragons and beasts in the sky near the hole were visibly weakened as if they were poisoned. The flying monsters that followed the dragon army couldn't fly properly and fell down. After they fell, all of them had their essence taken away by the giant of light. The same thing was happening to the northern forces. So, the northern forces were not responsible for this whole bizarre phenomenon. If so, what the hell was it? The celestial world. Ophelia suddenly screamed. Elagos also realized it. It was the same situation that Gusion once described. You must stop it. Defeat the godly man and close the hole. If left unchecked, more godly men will appear. In the worst case, you will summon the door of the celestial world mammon closed. Amon shouted urgently. He had experienced fighting the guys from the celestial world directly. Yongho didn't know what Amon meant by the godly man. But it was clear that the godly man was far from an ordinary being. Awaken the power of sin. That hole is not a proper door of the celestial world. So, you can close it with the same trick as stopping the twist. Yongho focused on the current situation. He didn't think about why the celestial world got reconnected with the demon world or why the twisting occurred right above the place where the southern and northern forces were engaged in the fighting. The seven deadly sins, the fragments of the demon god soul, responded to the power of the celestial world. In particular, greed cried out more angrily than usual. Yongho stepped in the air. Instead of calling Salami, he brought out Catalina's mana to spread the wings of the shadow. He erected Amun and stepped straight toward the godly man. Kaiwan followed him without any hesitation. Catalina carried her on the back and took off. Skull riding on Bucephala started rushing backward. Skull, who had penetrated deep into the right wing of the northern army, led the death knights to lead the skull unit. He then injected Brigada with the power of death taken from Baphomet's sickle. Skull gave it to his master, Yongho. Ophelia and Elagos also turned to the southern army. Gusion gazed for a moment at the celestial hole above the northern forces' heads but soon raced toward the southern forces. He could not afford to care about the hole above the northern army. The giant of light, who was trying to stick his chest out of the hole after his head and shoulders, saw Yongho charging at him quickly. He shook both arms with which he smashed the southern soldiers. A wall of pure white light was shot toward Yongho. But the green flames that ran from top to bottom broke the wall of light. The flames of greed burned away the celestial power that formed the wall of light. Yongho did not stop for a moment. He read the flow of the mana. Just like the hole did, the celestial power arising from the godly man's body distorted his mana. Yongho could read the movement of the godly man through the twisting of the mana. The godly man's arm broke through the air at a terrifying speed. Yongho urgently lowered his altitude to avoid his arms before raising it again. Then Yongho burned the celestial power with the flames of greed when the latter rushed to demolish his mana. Finally, 
he reached the head of the godly man and met his eyes. There was a black hole in the pile of light where the silhouette was not clearly visible. And there were eyes shining in the hole again. The godly man opened his mouth wide. Yong Ho stretched Amun toward the head of the godly man. Then he strengthened his mana by activating the demon god's heart king's mighty power. He injected a tremendous amount of mana into the man through Amun. The power of the celestial world was scattered at once, and the godly man shuddered. He screamed silently and swung his arms recklessly. Numerous tentacles of light came out from the space between the man and the black hole. They were aiming for Yong Ho. But Catalina and Kaiwan did not let them attack Yong Ho. Catalina's blade of the shadow and Kaiwan's whip sword cut the tentacles of light. The Queen of Fury, who belatedly followed the two, struck the head of the godly man with the godly energy of fury. The power of the Queen of Fury, which became stronger when she got more furious, was terrifying. The godly man's head was shaken greatly then shattered and scattered light. Yong Ho withdrew mana then fired the green flames toward the godly man's chest, who was staggering at the Queen of Fury's attack. The godly man's chest was pierced by the ultra-high flames, and the godly man couldn't sustain himself anymore. He released enormous celestial power at once then slipped back into the hole as if he was running away. But the green flames arising from his chest destroyed his body. Now is the chance. Seal the distortion. Yong Ho now forgot the godly man. After turning Amun back into a bracelet, he concentrated mana on both hands. Just like how he closed the twisting in the past and just like how he stopped the mana of the swirling seven colors, which was Magnadon's last trap, he controlled the mana in the surrounding area. The horns of light that sprouted on his head radiated even more intense light. The hole was twisted again. It rotated in the opposite direction from the beginning. Then it began to get smaller. Then, the light tentacles poured out from the inside of the hole. But these tentacles trying to block him were stopped by his twelve subordinate spirits and the Queen of Fury who finally arrived at the right moment. Surround your body with mana. You have to shut down the power of the celestial world. Gus Ion shouted at the top of his voice not only at the subordinate spirits but also the whole southern army. The power of the celestial world was no different from poison to the demons. So, they had to avoid the situation where they were inevitably exposed to the poison. And finally, the hole was closed. The power of the celestial world was scattered by the mana before disappearing, and the swirling flow of mana was also stabilized by Yong Ho's control. Yong Ho breathed out roughly. Even though it wasn't a real celestial door but a kind of dog hole, he had to consume a considerable amount of mana to close it. But the fighting wasn't over yet. There was still another hold in the sky over the northern troops. Yong Ho turned and so did the Queen of Fury. The two felt some sharp chest pain. They felt the power of sin in the northern forces. It must be the power of the King of Lust. Besides, it wasn't only the King of Lust that was out there. Gusion gnashed his teeth. Scathack, who was healing hundreds of tribesmen of the eight clans at the same time, stared into the north. The sin of sloth was crying deep down in Citri's heart. Ankablosa was thrilled. She remembered the last will of the king of violence. The king of pride, said Yong Ho. At that moment, tremendous mana occurred in the northern army as if it exploded. It swallowed up the torrent of mana created by the whole of the celestial world. The godly man, who was sticking his head and shoulders out of the hole, groaned, trampled down by mana. The Queen of Fury finally knew the King of Violence's heart. She truly understood why he chose to make a suicidal attack against the King of Pride. There was a godlike being beyond that world. The title Demon God used by the King of Violence when referring to the being was by no means an exaggeration. As if he was desperately struggling, the godly man released the power of the celestial world. And at that moment, another hole began to open above the heads of the northern forces. Yong Ho concluded that it was not time for him to just stand as an onlooker. Dhritarish Shutra. Withdraw the southern army right now. You have to retreat. It was not the time for him to deal with both the northern army and the celestial world. There was no guarantee that the King of Pride and the King of Lust would give priority to closing the door of the Celestial World like Yongho. 
There was a high possibility that they would rush toward Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury, totally ignoring the safety of the northern and southern forces. Now was not the time for Yong Ho to fight against the northern forces. He had to concentrate on saving even one more southern soldier. Fortunately, the Queen of Fury understood his intentions right away. She was a queen who loved her people more than anyone else. So, she ordered the head of the Garura clan, Biryabaka, to withdraw the southern forces immediately. The northern army could not pursue them. Although Yong Ho felt the presence of strong mana beyond the hole, the King of Pride and the King of Lust didn't show themselves. Chapter 274 The retreat of the southern forces was quick. They had to retreat urgently in a situation where their core forces collapsed because of the godly men's attack. However, they could overcome the chaotic situation in no time because there were virtually none who chased them. As soon as they arrived at the dungeon fortress located on the eastern border of the Queen of Fury's territory, the Queen and the heads of the eight clans convened a meeting. Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits also attended the meeting, which was held at the conference room on the top floor of the Queen of Fury's dungeon. Since they came to the meeting from the battlefield without taking any break, everyone was in combat uniform. They could not afford to delay things. The main topic of the conference was definitely about the twist that suddenly appeared on the sky of the battlefield and the giants of light that suddenly came out of it. It was Citri who took the lead in the discussion, while the Queen of Fury and the heads of the eight clans were silent. Only after they were done talking did the head of the Azura clan open his mouth. I really can't believe it. His voice was weak. He didn't take issue with Citri or Yong Ho, of course. There were so many alien zones in the demon world, which had numerous small and large passages that were connected with each other. For example, there were dozens of alien spirits traded at the dungeon market every year. So, the existence of the celestial world was nothing new. However, when they talked about other kings, seven deadly sins, and other stuff, the heads of the eight clans were thrown into confusion. Mammon, the king of greed, who saved the demon world by sacrificing himself a thousand and several hundred years ago. The king of pride, the king of envy, and the king of lust who betrayed Mammon and concealed the relevant facts in history. One thousand years was a long time for the dragons. Moreover, the dragons who went through the times of Mammon, the king of greed, thoroughly lived as outsiders. Dragons were and now were lazy individualists. So, the current situation in which the dragons formed a legion and participated in the war was very unfamiliar to them. Perhaps if they could scrutinize the records of the previous generation or the generations prior to that, they would be able to find some records about the celestial world or the godly men. Nothing would be more detailed than what Citri had to tell right now. The Queen of Fury decided to recognize what Citri was going to say from now on. Otherwise, she couldn't take a step forward. Okay, let me sort out my thoughts for a moment. Please confirm what I'm about to say, Queen of Sloth. Citri nodded slowly. The Queen of Fury caught her breath and said as calmly as possible, First, the power of the celestial world is no different from poison to the demons. Weak demons can die just by being exposed to that power, and even those who are strong can become debilitated when exposed for a long time. The moment the hole was opened, a huge amount of celestial energy was released. The reason that the soldiers of the northern and southern armies right under the hole lost their lives en masse was because they were unprotected and exposed to the celestial energy. Second, it's the door of the celestial world that connects the demon world and the celestial world. As the celestial door opens little by little, distortions take place throughout the demon world. The more the celestial door opens, the more distorting takes place on a large scale. Citri nodded again. The Queen of Fury said finally, third, the giant of light that appeared this time is a godly man. The appearance of a godly man means that more than a third of the door of the celestial world has already opened. The godly men were by no means ordinary beings. Amun added right after the Queen of Fury was done talking. We saw several celestial beings while we were fighting against the celestial world. And we divided them into two main types. One of them are those who are considered to be general inhabitants of the celestial world. They have covered their entire bodies with a dim light close to grey. Small ones are the size of goblins, and large ones are equal to ogres. 
They are not very strong, except that they have celestial energy. We judged these godly men as the celestial soldiers. Those they saw in today's fighting had never been caught by Yongho's party. However, Catalina and Kaiwan remembered the beings behind the tentacles of light when they attacked Yongho. Perhaps, they were the godly men. The godly man is covering his whole body with a bright white light. He emits not only an enormous amount of celestial energy but also, he is huge in size. As we saw him today, the way he attacked us is not that powerful. In some respects, he is just a huge monster. What matters is his celestial energy. The number of soldiers killed by just two godly men who appeared in the camps of the northern and southern armies was huge. But what mattered was the way they killed the soldiers. The godly men killed the soldiers that were gathered in close formation with their huge bodies. If there were any giant monsters as huge as the godly men today, they could fight as well as the godly men in today's fighting. However, the godly men could not defend the strike of the Queen of Fury and Yongho. Just like Amun said, they were no more than huge monsters when their celestial energy was removed. Of course, their huge size itself was a tremendous weapon, and separating the celestial energy from them was unthinkable, but the important thing was the fact that they were not absolute beings like God. This meant that the Queen of Fury and Yongho's forces could easily confront them. There are not so many godly men. Usually, one godly man appears when a mid or large sized hole is opened. Even in the final and decisive battle in front of the door of the celestial world, there were only a few dozen goldy men. Kritamuka opened her mouth wide as if she could not believe him. Amun said there were only a few dozen, but each of them was a giant over a hundred meters tall. She seemed to now know why the kings of the olden days joined hands to fight against them. What we should be vigilant against most is not the godly man. There are godly men who are almost as large as ogres. Mammon, the king of greed, called these godly men godly generals. Like the godly man, they not only emit a huge amount of celestial energy, but they are also very strong. They show up only when a supersized hole is made, and among Mammon's twelve spirits, there are only three who can confront these godly generals. They are Gusion, Richard, and Elun. As a matter of fact, Gusion, Richard, and Elun could be called the three greatest powers of Mammon's twelve spirits. Fortunately, there weren't many godly generals. The number of godly generals that Amun witnessed during the battle with the celestial world a thousand years ago was around twenty. Amun was silent for a while. Only after everyone around him recognized the existence of the godly man and godly generals did he continue. It is not known what the purpose of the godly man is. We have made several attempts to communicate with them, but we have never had any meaningful conversations with them. One thing is clear though. It is the fact that the power of the celestial world is in direct opposition to the demon world. If all the doors of the celestial world are opened and a connection between the celestial and the demonic world is fully secured, no one can be sure what will happen in the future. There might be a possibility that the demon world itself will perish. Everybody was silent while Amun was speaking. The faces of the heads of the eight clans turned pale while Kurtamukha gulped in a tense mood. Gusion, who was listening to Amun quietly until now, spoke in a rather harsh voice, we don't have to be scared too much. We can confront the celestial energy with our mana. As long as we can block or endure the celestial energy, we can confront them without any problem. This time, Skathak added, the power of the celestial world acts like a poison not only to those in the demon world, but also those from alien worlds. However, its effect on these alien beings is weaker than that of those in the demon world. So, I think if any of those among the eight clans come from the alien world, they can more effectively deal with the godly men. In fact, there were more northern soldiers than their southern counterparts who lost their lives right after the hole was opened. Even though both sides were exposed to the celestial energy helplessly, the southern soldiers were killed much less than the northern soldiers because they were from the alien world, not from the demon world. When she finished speaking, Skathak turned to Yongho who was listening to her seriously. Yongho was not purely from the demon world, of course. Although Mammon's blood was flowing in his body, the blood of the human world was also flowing in his body at the same time. The Queen of Fury was not also purely from the demon world. 
Of course, it had been several hundred years since the eight clans including her came to the demon world, so they could be recognized as pure demons, but strictly speaking, they could fall in the category of alien beings. Scathack found hope in such a fact. How much time is left for the celestial door to fully open? The head of the dragon clan, Circa, asked with a nervous expression. Scathack didn't bother to lie to him. I can't be sure. But if I look back at what happened during Mammon's times, would say there are only a couple of months left before the celestial door is fully opened. The head of the dragon clan closed his eyes tightly. Chapter 275 At that moment, Amun spoke again, I am not trying to create anxiety or fear among you. However, the fact that the godly man has appeared means that the situation has already become quite serious. If you consider that you haven't noticed the existence of the twisting until the godly man appeared, I think it's possible that the celestial door will open faster than it did a thousand years ago. This time, there was a more chaotic silence spreading among the participants in the meeting. Dragon Lord Ankablosa, who did not lose her composure amid such a chaotic mood, asked Scathack, why don't we close the celestial door just like Mammon, the king of greed, did a thousand years ago? Yes, that's the solution. It will solve everything, said Scathack with a light smile. That was what not only Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury but also Ankablosa and the Dragon Legion wanted badly. The dragons of the past were not united as one, so their fight against the celestial world was not very helpful. However, the current Dragon Legion was different. Everyone was calculating the gains and losses of this option. Biryabaka, the head of the Garura clan, said with a sigh, is it unreasonable for us to ask for a ceasefire with the Northern Army? You know what? These are the bastards who betrayed Master Mammon one thousand years ago. We can never believe them, snapped Gus Ion angrily. Gus Ion, who felt the sin of pride directly on the battlefield, was convinced that the guy in the rear of the Northern Army was the King of Pride. He was definitely the King of Pride of the past who betrayed Mammon, not the current King of Pride. Gus Ion wasn't curious about how that king was still alive or how he gained such great power. The only thing that mattered to him was to take revenge on the king of pride. His desire to take revenge on the king, which had been dormant deep down in his heart for the past one thousand years, was strongly rekindled. With the atmosphere getting more and more serious, the head of the dragon clan asked again in a weary voice, is there any possibility that the king of pride will shut the door of the celestial world again? If we don't act, all of us in the demon world will have no choice but to perish together. What he said was a real possibility. But Citri shook her head and said, Well, I think the King of Pride would rather choose to kill us first even before the celestial door opens. He will try to close the door after taking away the powers of the King of Greed, the Queen of Fury as well as mine. Citri was also convinced of the existence of the King of Pride of the past. He was a lunatic. Despite the possibility that Mammon could not close the door of the celestial world, he betrayed Mammon because he put more priority on Mammon's death than preventing the destruction of the demon world. Because of this track record, it was impossible for Yong Ho to close the celestial door in cooperation with the King of Pride. If he were the same King of Pride of the past, he would prioritize defeating Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury over closing the celestial door. So, this is our best option. We have to defeat the King of Pride first then fight the godly men of the celestial world in order to close the celestial door, shouted Gus Ion loudly. The head of the Dragon Clan and the head of the Garura Clan felt averse to Gyuzhin's declaration at the moment, but they soon understood him. In fact, the King of Pride had been advocating the annihilation and enslavement of different races from the alien world by promoting the supremacy of pure blood of the demon world. He was a guy who could not coexist with the eight clans from the beginning. The Queen of Fury closed her eyes. She let out a long breath then said with a smile, I'm going to take a short break. Queen of Sloth and Mammon people, thank you for your precious comment and insight. In fact, like the southern forces, the northern army also retreated in the face of the godly man's unexpected attack. So, she could take out some time for a break. When the Queen of Fury left the meeting room, Kurdamukha and Gardamundi hurriedly followed her. The head of the Dragon Clan and the head of the Garura Clan also expressed due manners to Yong Ho and Sitri before leaving. 
some representatives from the eight clans who were waiting outside the conference room approached Yong Ho and his party to show them to a break room. Sitri looked at Yong Ho silently, who nodded to her slowly. The Queen of Fury sat blankly in the sky garden on the top floor of Vimana, her dungeon. The night air was cold, but she didn't think it was cold. She just wanted to be united with the darkness of the night. But she could not if she wanted to. No matter how much she closed her eyes to try to forget the situation, she had to face the cruel reality. Not only the Northern Army but also the Celestial World were both a tough challenge for her. The Queen of Fury went to the trouble of humming a song. Although she hummed it lightly, her singing created a beautiful melody, just like the head of the Gondorf clan who were good at singing and dancing. The moonlight and starlight seemed to melt into her singing. After she was carried away with the excitement of her singing for a moment, she quickly closed her lips and stopped humming. Vimana was her dungeon, so she could know all the little things that were happening in Vimana. She noticed there was a visitor waiting in front of the sky garden. Her heart was pounding. By now, she could have gotten used to his visit, but she could turn to the visitor only after she took a big breath. The visitor said with a gentle smile, can I talk to you for a minute? Of course. As I told you many times today, I would like to welcome you very much. Rather than overreacting to him in an excited voice, she sat down on a large rock. Yong Ho settled next to her casually. Because of an awkward atmosphere, either Yong Ho or the Queen needed to break the ice first. The Queen of Fury hesitated nervously while Yong Ho moved his lips several times. At last, he said, looking at her, Queen of Fury, or let me call you Dhritarashutra. The queen flinched for a moment then nodded obediently. She turned slightly to face him. He looked at her briefly. In fact, it was quite surprising that the two met face to face like this in the queen's dungeon. Yong Ho himself was now in the dungeon of the Queen of Fury, and the queen faced him without her bodyguards. This kind of casual meeting was possible because they trusted each other as allies. I would like to tell you something as your ally and strong friend. You may feel unpleasant or offended by what I have to say, but I hope you can hear me out. At that moment, he was very serious. Looking at him squarely, the queen corrected her posture immediately and said, please give me a second. The queen of fury put her hand on her chest. She then closed her eyes and took a deep breath. After taking a deep breath several times, she faced him again and said, Now you can go ahead. I am ready to hear what you have to say to me. The Queen of Fury was also serious. It wasn't Rider Ashutra, the woman who was in love with him, but the head of the eight clans in her capacity as the Queen of Fury, who was facing him. Instead of beating around the bush, Yong Ho put it bluntly, The King of Pride is very strong. It would be difficult for us two to confront him together. As you know, he is accompanied by the King of Lust when he is fighting. Most of the southern forces did not see the King of Pride, overwhelmed by the sudden appearance of the celestial holes and the presence of the godly men, but Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury certainly saw him. While fighting on the battlefield today, the two clearly realized why the King of Violence made the extreme choice of suicidal attack against the King of Pride, and why he called the King the Demon God. The amount of mana that the King of Pride unleashed at the last minute exceeded that of Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury. Moreover, the King of Lust was also very strong. Although Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury didn't yet fully get used to their godly energies, the King of Lust not only blocked their attack but also escaped from the scene. The Queen of Fury nodded at Yong Ho's explanation. She wanted to forget about it, but as the Queen of the Eight Clans, she could not turn away from reality. The King of Pride was strong. The Queen of Fury knew she could not confront him alone, let alone the King of Lust. Instead of comforting the Queen of Fury who seemed to have resigned to reality, Yong Ho changed the topic. He said, looking at the godly energy of greed fitted on his right arm, the power of greed is possession. I never let go of what I have in my hand. You know Kaiwan and Tigrius, my subordinate spirits, right? Of course, I know them. The Queen of Fury nodded quickly. In particular, she was familiar with Kai Wan because she met her several times. Both of them are former masters of their own houses. As you may know, when the master becomes a subordinate spirit, his or her power is greatly weakened. 
It may disappear altogether after a long time. But they still have their own power. Moreover, I can use their power as if it were my own. I can do all this because I have the power of possession by way of greed. Chapter, 276 The Queen of Fury stiffened her face. Although she was naive and innocent in some respects, she wasn't foolish. While she was listening to what he was trying to explain to her, she instinctively found out something that she could not ignore. Yong Ho did not stop talking. As if holding on to the Queen of Fury eagerly, he said something important, power is the power of the soul. Sin is no different. Yong Ho's words were no different from his announcement to her. It seemed as if some violet light peculiar to the queen's eyes was twinkling. The queen of fury was suppressing herself. She held back the urge to get up right away and shout at him but listened to him respectively. He was not done talking yet, and the queen of fury clearly promised him that she would hear him out. I don't want to fight you. I'm not threatening or blackmailing you now. I'm serious. Even after I defeat the king of pride, I would like to maintain a strong alliance with you. Of course, he didn't think so from the beginning. He didn't think of being lenient toward her because she was a beauty. He fought several masters in the process of unifying the southern areas. Of course, there were also female masters among his opponents. It was by necessity that Yong Ho made an alliance with the Queen of Fury. Therefore, he hid from her the fact that he possessed the sin of greed, and that he killed the King of Gluttony. He was not sure what would happen to his alliance with her after he defeated the northern troops. However, after fighting the king of lust, he changed his mind when he revealed to her that he was the king of greed. The queen of fury still regarded Yong Ho as a strong ally. Instead of blaming him and doubting himself for hiding the facts, she reached out to him again. Of course, she might have done so because she also needed his help. But he didn't think so. He could feel she was sincere toward him so he wanted to respond sincerely. He didn't want to fight the Queen of Fury. He wanted to take her as his strong ally. He didn't even think of killing her and taking away her sin and essence. Please be my subordinate spirit. The Queen of Fury clenched her teeth at that moment. He looked straight at the Queen. After I defeat the King of Pride and stop the advance of the Celestial World, I will release you from the status of my subordinate spirit as soon as you wish for it. Let me promise it under the swear of a dragon. It was the suggestion offered by Yuno who counted the stars. The subordinate spirit was fundamentally created by mutual contracts. Even if one became a subordinate spirit and devoted one's body and soul to one's master, it was impossible for the master to completely control one's heart. Yong Ho's pledge was a particularly powerful one among various contract magics that existed in the demon world. Even if Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury were in a relationship between Master and the subordinate spirit, his pledge remained strong. If he broke his pledge, it would punish him because of the strictness of the contract. And there was only one punishment, which was death. In that respect, Yong Ho's request to her to be his subordinate spirit was risking his life. That was why he also offered his life as collateral. If Yong Ho rejected her request to break out of the contract of being his subordinate spirit when she wanted it, he would have to lose his life. Since the dragon's pledge was activated only when the contract was broken, the Queen of Fury could not kill Yong Ho. This would be an ideal situation when Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury focused on the contract alone, aside from the scrutiny of those around them as well as their status. Armed with greed, he could obtain the power of fury. By making the Queen his subordinate spirit, he would obtain more power, and so would the queen. The contract of the master and subordinate spirit relationship brought about the growth of both. However, this was only possible when they completely trusted each other. The queen of fury was not alone. She was the leader of the eight clans. Will you give me some time to think for a moment? The queen of fury said, straining her voice. He said, with a nod, I am sorry for making such a tough request to you. The queen replied, I think today is probably the hardest day since I became the queen. Having said that, the queen smiled with an effort then stood up from her seat. She felt the night air was unusually cold. Take a break. I think you are also exhausted, she said. Then the queen left the air garden of her dungeon. He noticed Gardamundi and Kurtamukha silently following her. 
Fortunately, the two women quietly listened to his request to the queen without balking at all. You conveyed your sincere message to her. Now is the time for you to wait until you hear from her. Amun whispered to Yong Ho. He closed his eyes. Master, wake up. Yong Ho blinked his eyes. It seemed that he fell asleep after closing his eyes briefly. He was still in the air guard of the queen's dungeon. No one came to pick him up as if Amun already informed his subordinate spirits about his location. Not long after opening his eyes, Yong Ho understood the situation. The Queen of Fury was standing at a distance from him. Dressed a little more loosely than last night, she walked toward him and stood in front of him. She had bloodshot eyes at the moment. Probably, I've never been in greater agony than today since I was born. The smell of her fragrant flesh peculiar to the Gandharva clan tickled the tip of his nose. The Queen of Fury boldly took a seat next to him and said, I've been thinking about it all night. The Queen breathed in the cold night air. Then she covered her face with both hands and raised her head after a while. I've a couple of conditions. Yong Ho was silent. She turned to him with her jewel-like eyes shining in the dark. First, you have to keep it to yourself that I'm going to be your subordinate spirit. Of course, I understand you can't hide it to the Queen of Sloth and your twelve subordinate spirits, but you should not reveal it to anybody else. What I mean is the ordinary tribesmen of the eight clans as well as the general dungeon spirits of the Mammon family should be kept in the dark about it. This is the condition Garda Mundi wants you to agree to. Of course, she set out the condition, keeping in mind the situation where she would be freed from the status of his subordinate spirit. Yong Ho thought the condition was reasonable. He could understand that her people would not easily accept the fact that she became another master's subordinate spirit, no matter how strongly she felt the necessity. Anyway, she thought it would be better to deal with the contract secretly if it was needed for Yong Ho's short-term battle with the King of Pride. And the next condition is she slurred. Only after she moved her lips hesitantly did she face him again and said sharply, Okay, this is my second condition. Take responsibility for me and my people. Dryder Ashutra. Yong Ho immediately asked before he knew it. There was no more shame or shyness in her face. She said in her capacity as the Queen of the Eight Clans, King of Greed, You are the one who has got here alone from the alien world, without relatives or friends. So, you don't have your own people or family here. As she said, Yong Ho was from the human world. Based on Gardamundi's background investigation of Yong Ho, only Kaiwan had a kinship with Yong Ho and the House of Mammon. The Queen of Fury admitted calmly that the King of Greed was strong and that the balance of power between them was broken a long time ago. When it was revealed that Yong Ho was the King of Greed, Kurdamukha thought that the queen should give up the political marriage of the Mammon family and the eight clans, but Gardamundi and the heads of the eight clans didn't agree. They believed that Yong Ho was the perfect candidate for the queen. In a situation where the balance of power among the kings collapsed, it was best for the queen to cultivate stronger power or acquiesce to the stronger power in order to survive. Treat the eight clans as your race. By defeating the king of pride in the celestial world, Please let the eight clans live in a peaceful demon world. Please cherish and love them. That was her most important condition. She did not ask him for anything more. If so, I, Dryder Ashutra, will live with you for the rest of my life. Of course, I'm going to make the dragon's contract with you, just in case. At the end of her words, she suddenly got shy. Yong Ho was happy and embarrassed at that moment. He said, Oh, wait a moment. So, what you mean is? Oh, not yet. I am willing to be your subordinate spirit temporarily to help you defeat the King of Pride, but I need time to be on more intimate terms with you, so I can confirm whether you can really care about my people. After babbling quickly like that, the Queen stood up suddenly, then reached out to him, looking at him gently. I will trust you, King of Greed. She really offered her real trust in him. He took her hands and said, Thank you, Queen of Fury. I'll surely pay back your trust. This time, his promise to her was different from what Mammon made to the King of Pride and the King of Lust. In some respects, it was like the promise between Mammon and Citri who would never betray each other. By the way, the Queen, who was fidgeting with her fingers on his big hand, turned her gaze from him. 
Then she said shyly, Now, how about talking to each other informally? We have become closer than before, and we're going to be much more closer. He chuckled at her suggestion and nodded cheerfully. Sure, Dridera Shutra. The queen smiled brightly. Instead of replying, she grasped his hand once again. Chapter 277 Mammon, the king of greed, shut the door of the celestial world. He sacrificed his life to save the demon world. Mammon's twelve spirits did not see Mammon's last moment. Even Amun, who was always with Mammon, didn't see it either. They saw him last when he was climbing the stairs to the celestial door alone. But Citri was beside him during his last moment. Even when Mammon forcibly sent back his twelve spirits to the labyrinth of greed, she was with Mammon. That was why she could see what happened to him more than anybody else. Citri saw Mammon, the king of greed's last moment, and what he did after closing the celestial door. Citri remembered them all. She never forgot them. Rather, she could never forget them. All of the major figures of the Mammon family and the eight clans gathered at Tiamat, the giant red dragon. It was a secret meeting. There were only a few among them in both camps who knew why they gathered in one place early in the morning. By using the core of the giant red dragon, Tiamat, as a terminal, Lucia spent hours creating a mana-sharing passage between the Labyrinth of Greed and Tiamat. Since the Labyrinth of Greed at the southern end of the demon world was very far away from the dungeon fortress of the Eight Clans where Tiamat was currently located, it was a really tough job for Lucia, but she made it in the end. It was literally the result of her sweat and hard work. Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury stood, facing each other. Behind him were his twelve subordinate spirits, headed by Catalina and Kai Wan, while the queen was accompanied by her subordinate spirits, Gardamundi and Kurdamukha. As well as the surviving heads of the eight clans, namely the head of the Azura clan, Rukshika, and the head of Dragon clan, Sukura, and the head of the Garura clan, Biryabaka. Yongho's subordinate spirits and the heads of the eight clans did not stand up randomly. Under their feet was a magic circle drawn by Yuno who counted the stars and Yuscha who led the way. It was in the shape of a huge magic circle consisting of lots of small magic circles. Come on, please feel relaxed. I think I should do something like a speech, but let me skip it. When Lucia spoke in a somewhat exaggerated voice, the twelve subordinate spirits as well as the heads of the eight clans grimaced at her suddenly. The Queen of Fury blushed. She rolled her lips into her mouth once then gently raised her head and looked at him. They were faced with a situation where there was an imminent attack from the celestial world. Besides, the King of Pride's forces were still active in the northern area. But it would be no good at all if they shuddered with fear, doing nothing. The Queen of Fury only concentrated on what was going to happen now. She was there to make the contract with Yong Ho on her being his subordinate spirit, but it was of greater significance to her personally. Her two eyes were bloodshot because she agonized over it all night. Yong Ho finally made eye contact with her. After smiling at her gently, he ordered Lucia to proceed with the ceremony. We are going to begin the ritual. I hope you can relax and release your mana naturally. All twelve subordinate spirits opened up their horns. Since the weakest of them had six horns, a huge amount of mana filled the space. The heads of the eight clans, who were about to release as much mana as them, once again keenly felt the power of the House of Mammon. Convinced that their choice was right, they injected power into the magic circles. A bright light came from the magic circles that swallowed up not only the mana transmitted from the labyrinth of greed but also the mana of the twelve subordinate spirits and the heads of the eight clans. Mana was concentrated on the place where Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury met. What Yong Ho was trying to do wasn't just a simple contract on making her his subordinate spirit. Typically, any master who became another master's subordinate spirit had to give up many things, such as freeing his or her own subordinate spirits and cutting off the connection with the soul of the dungeon. But Yong Ho did not want to force all of those things on the Queen of Fury, so he prepared a special contract. This was possible because Yuno and Yuscha, who made the first contracts for the master's subordinate spirits in the demon world, were present at the ceremony. Instead of drastically increasing the mana required for the contract on the queen's subordinate spirit, they made sure the queen kept many of what she currently had. For example, it was impossible for her to increase a new subordinate spirit, 
but she was not supposed to lose her existing subordinate spirits. She could also get connected with the soul of the dungeon. Their collected mana was refined. A white ray of light wrapped around Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury. We're proceeding with the ceremony on the contract on her subordinate spirit. Master, please give her the certificate on her subordinate spirit. He gently raised the queen's hand then put a brigada bracelet on her white, thin wrist. Then he put a ring on her finger, which Bergrim made skillfully. The light completely covered him and the queen completely. When he gave the ring to her, the contact was fully effective now. Soon they felt a change. The twelve subordinate spirits felt a new figure was added between them and Yong Ho. The Queen of Fury was thrilled to know she could get connected with the soul of her dungeon immediately. She unwittingly let out an exclamation of surprise. Both Yong Ho and the Queen of Fury had experienced executing this kind of subordinate spirit contract before. As a result, he had as many as eleven subordinate spirits, while she had Kurtamuka and Gardamundi. But it was different this time. It was no exaggeration to say that the difference between the past contract and the current contract that the two executed was night and day. This was a contract that required the Queen of Fury with one of the seven deadly sins to become another king's subordinate spirit. It was the first time that the King of Greed created a contract on his subordinate spirits since the opening of the demon world. Yong Ho felt the power of fury. Drydera Shutra, the Queen of Fury, trembled with thrill when she felt the mana of greed and gluttony transmitted through Brigada. She was letting out a breath full of pain and pleasure. Greed, gluttony, and fury. The three sins had become one under the king of greed. Mammon's body and soul were put together once again. The demon god's heart was beating violently. Mammon's godly energy also responded. It delivered the last power that could not find its original owner, namely the love of Yuno who counted the stars, to Drydera Shutra. Skathaka's life, Skull's death, Catalina's justice, Samuel's creation, Ophelia's honor, Tigria's harmony, Gyuzhan's courage, Richard's trust, Kaiwan's passion, Elago's patience, and Drydera Shutra's love. And Amen. Finally, Yong Ho had a complete set of twelve subordinate spirits. Only now did he complete Mammon's godly energy. Yong Ho realized the real reason why Mammon, the king of greed, created his godly energy, and what he wanted to achieve with it. Mammon's godly energy united the three sins into one. It reminded them of the fact that they had been originally one but scattered for so long. Citri grabbed her chest. She felt the sin of sloth that wanted to be united with the three sins. She looked at Yong Ho, suppressing her pounding heart. A new horn of light sprouted from Yong Ho's head. It started with one. It then grew to seven at once. Moreover, it didn't stop there. He had an eighth horn now as the result of the enormous power created by the three sins as one. The twelve subordinate spirits screamed all at once. Even the Queen of Fury hugged her shoulders and screamed. Yong Ho roared, too. He peeked into the great achievements of Mammon, the King of Greed. The tribesmen of the eight clans who gathered at the dungeon fortress realized that something tremendous happened. However, they couldn't figure out what it was. All they could do was take a glimpse of the moving dungeon, the mana, and the giant red dragon, Tiamat, which the king of greed got aboard to come here. The ritual of the queen becoming Yong Ho's subordinate spirit was over. Yong Ho's twelve subordinate spirits, who consumed enormous mana during the ceremony, lay down without exception, and it took nearly half a day for all of them to recover. As you may already know, my name is Drydera Shutra. I hope I can get along with you well in the future. Three women gathered in one of the cabins of Tiamat, the giant red dragon and Yong Ho's main battleship. Since she was born and raised in the culture of polygamy and polyandry among the eight clans, the Queen of Fury didn't seem to be conscious of Catalina or Kaiwan. Kaiwan was nervous when the queen held out her hand in a friendly manner with a bright smile. She cleared her throat then replied in a bit of a sulky voice, Well, I'm your senior in terms of Yong Ho's subordinate spirit. So, when we are together like this, I won't treat you as the queen of fury. Got it? No problem. The queen responded readily again this time, and Kaiwan felt somehow defeated. She felt even ashamed of herself because she knew what she just said to the queen was immature and rude. 
Although the queen responded kindly, she was still the head of the eight clans anyway. Above all, she was the queen of fury who was much more powerful than Kaiwan had thought. At that moment, Catalina, who was quietly standing next to her, touched Kaiwan's arm. Why? Hmm. I'm your senior in terms of Yongho's subordinate spirit Catalina said timidly. As soon as she heard that, Kaiwan glared at Catalina, who let down her ears and tail without ending her words. Silencing Catalina immediately, Kaiwan looked back at the Queen of Fury. She said, gently holding her hand, It's nice to see you. I'm Kaiwan. And this girl here is. Oh, my name is Catalina, our master's escort knight, Catalina answered immediately, correcting Kaiwan's funny introduction. Given that she erected her tail, she was obviously upset with Kaiwan. The Queen of Fury opened her mouth for a moment then stroked Catalina's head. Then she said with a bright smile, I feel like we can hit it off very well. Don't you think so? Chapter, 278 Catalina, who was blinking, immediately nodded. Her reaction was almost instinctive. Kaiwan groaned at the fact that Catalina and the Queen of Fury got along so well so quickly. Oh my god! Aside from the Queen of Fury, what was Catalina flapping her tail at? Kaiwan quickly reached out and pulled Catalina toward her then said, hugging her tightly, No, Catalina, you're mine. You're on my side. Kaiwan called her urgently before she knew it. The Queen of Fury looked at Kaiwan this time then nodded gladly. As she was advised by Gardamundi in advance, the Queen said after changing her tone a little, All right, no problem. Kaiwan once again gulped, aghast at the Queen's unexpected action, while Catalina flapped her ears and tail. On the day when the ceremony was held, the northern forces did not show any movement. As far as they could detect to the best they could, the new whole of the celestial world was not opened either. This development was fortunate for the southern forces. All of the celestial holes except for the celestial door are incomplete. The larger the size, the longer it will take, but if left unattended, the door will close someday. That was a characteristic of general twisting. The hole in the celestial world was special in that there was a celestial world beyond it, but the fact that it was a temporary passage to the alien world was the same as the other twisting. So, it might sound a bit irresponsible, but it's best to leave the hole out of your reach just neglected as it is. If you close the celestial door as quickly as possible, you can minimize the damage. During Mammon's times, they responded a little differently. Not only Mammon, but his twelve spirits went out to close the whole of the celestial world. But they couldn't do it now. Unlike Mammon's days, Yongho and his subordinates were engaged in a war. Yongho could not disperse his forces recklessly now and when the northern army would resume their attack. The damage caused by the celestial hole would never be small. If a hole was opened enough for the godly man to come out, quite large places such as the free city or the master's dungeon could be destroyed. But Yongho had to refrain from taking any action now. Ending the war as soon as possible was the best option that he could take. When Amun was done talking, Gardamundi said, the course of the northern forces has changed significantly. Everyone, please look at the map. There was a sand map of the demon world in the middle of the conference hall of the mobile dungeon Vimana. When everybody focused on it, the red sands showing the northern forces began to move. The northern troops gathered near the eastern border of the Queen of Fury's territory headed northwest. Those who didn't join the northern forces also moved with them. It doesn't seem like they're trying to stop fighting and retreating. If so, the forces of the King of Lust and the King of Gluttony would have returned to their territories respectively. The amount of red sand that was united as one was truly enormous. Gardamundi continued, it seems that the northern forces are trying to force us to fight them on a large scale instead of dividing themselves into several units to attack us. Based on the information collected until now, the expected path of movement of the northern forces is as follows. A line of light was drawn over the map of the demon world. The line was passing through the collective residences of the eight clans located throughout the territory of the Queen of Fury. It was a fairly reasonable prediction. However, there was something dubious about it. If they wanted to force Yongho's army to fight like this, they didn't have to go to the trouble of changing their infiltration route. 
Were they scared of the possible opening of the celestial hole again? I think I know their intention to some extent, said Gus Ion suddenly. Scat Hack nodded. She fidgeted with her fingers in the air on behalf of Gus Ion, who was poor at magic skill. Then a new line of light was drawn over the line that Gardamundi drew. It was slightly different from the path of infiltration that Gardamundi anticipated, but it passed through the unclaimed land between the territories of the Queen of Fury and the King of Envy. There was no dungeon or free city there. So, there was no reason for the northern forces to pass through it. But Mammon's twelve subordinate spirits thought differently. Yuno and Yuscha groaned while Skathak realized once again that it was the King of Pride who led the northern forces. The unclaimed land without any people or resources. Yongho knew it instinctively. Sitri said to him on behalf of Mammon's twelve subordinate spirits, on that day, one thousand and several hundred years ago, it's the place where the celestial door opened. The northern army was a huge army unprecedented in the history of the demon world. Even though all of them were not yet gathered, the number of spirits included in one large group exceeded one hundred thousand. The movement of the large army was like a mountain and a forest walking on the ground. Moreover, the northern army was not composed solely of ground forces. Several flying monsters and giant monsters filled the sky. Regardless of the enemy or friendly forces, their massive movement was a spectacular scene. In fact, the scouts of the Karvinka clan who observed the movement of the northern army from a distance were overwhelmed with awe and fear. Asmodeus, the king of lust, was in the midst of such a large army. He was inside a battle wagon pulled by a giant hydra with seven heads. It was huge, befitting a carriage pulled by the hydra. It looked like a palace on the move. The king of lust stood by the window. Instead of the red sky of the demon world, a grey cloud fell over his head. A cold wind was blowing through the falling rain. The celestial hole opened again. The look of the godly man was the same as before. The celestial power still acted as a deadly poison to demonic beings. It was a thousand and several hundreds of years ago, but the king of lust didn't feel like that. It wasn't just because he had lived so long. Even now, if he closed his eyes, he felt like he would go back to that time, when the kings with the seven deadly sins gathered together for the first time in the history of the demon world. And when they were united against an external enemy called the celestial world. But the king of lust did not close his eyes because he knew it was just feudal sentimentalism. More than a thousand years had already passed. Even if he recalled the past, nothing would change, just like one's past would not change no matter how often one regretted it. When the King of Pride's surprise operation to subdue the demon world overnight failed, the King of Lust had a different idea from the King of Pride briefly. What if I just stopped fighting like this? Do we have to subdue the South? The King of Violence was dead. The King of Gluttony and King of Envy were long gone as well. The King of Pride had risen to the position of the King of Greed, Mammon, of yesteryear. In terms of mana alone, the King of Pride had already surpassed Mammon. Of course, there was the Queen of Fury, the Queen of Sloth, and the King of Gluttony, but none of them were strong enough to beat the King of Pride. The King of Pride, the King of Envy, the King of Lust, and the King of Gluttony had their own territory, but even Mammon could not obtain such a large land when he was alive. So, the King of Lust just wanted to stop fighting. He felt the masters in the south would never be able to target the north. If the king of pride made up his mind, he would be able to enjoy peace amid tension, just like he did a few months ago. The raindrops were cold. The king of lust woke up from a dream. It was stupid. He had lived for more than a thousand years, but he hadn't changed now or in the past. The days when he fought against the celestial world with mammon were never honorable. The king of envy was compelled to surrender, and the king of pride expressed a sense of intense inferiority. The king of lust didn't know what to do, looking at the two kings. It was impossible for the king of lust to stop the king of pride. Just like he acquiesced after he failed to persuade the king of pride not to betray Mammon, he couldn't stop the king of pride's determination to attack the south. When Mammon saved the demon world by sacrificing himself in the end, the king of lust keenly realized it. At the very moment, when the house of Mammon virtually collapsed, the king of lust understood it, looking at the vanity on the king of pride's face. 
The king of pride that the king of lust used to know was no more. The king of pride crossed the river of no return on the day when Mammon saved the demon kingdom. The king of lust turned. There was a large throne in the middle of the dark room. The king was asleep, half lying on the throne. He didn't even move as if he was turned into a statue. The current king of pride got rid of the royal family of his predecessor. This had nothing to do with any figurative meaning. Heavily wounded by the king of violence's suicidal attack, the king of pride brought together all the royal members that he had given birth to and raised over the past 1,000 years and killed them all overnight. Then he devoured all the essence they had. He didn't even miss those failures that came out in the process of making the best one. The total of essences absorbed by the king of pride numbered 1,000, and his power of dominance minimized the loss incurred in the process of him absorbing their essences. The king of lust approached the king of pride. Only Abrasax and Bifron survived among those who followed the king of pride on the day when the king of violence made a suicidal attack. And they were now somewhat at a distance from the king of pride because they were scared that the king might take away their essence any time if they were near him. Chapter 279 But the king of lust did not stop walking toward the king of pride. After reaching his throne, he looked at the monster named king of pride. What would have happened if the king of lust himself was on the side of Mammon, the king of violence one thousand and a hundred years ago? What would have happened if the king of lust rejected the request of the king of pride for help and helped the king of envy instead? The king of lust embraced the king of pride. The king of lust thought that he made an impossible assumption again. The king of lust never could disobey the king of pride. The king of pride was a monster that had survived by taking the flesh of his descendants for thousands of years. He was a maniac who made himself the best by treating his descendants like dogs and cows for a thousand years. He was a slaughterer who killed and ate his flesh and blood over a thousand years. Nevertheless, the king of pride did not covet the king of lust's essence and sin. In fact, the king of pride didn't even think of it, just like the king of lust himself could not leave him at the end of the day. The door of the celestial door was opening again. In the south were Mammon's twelve spirits and Citri, the queen of sloth who had experienced several kings' betrayal a thousand years ago. Because of this, they could not even think of anything like a great alliance to deal with their public enemy, the celestial world. The celestial door was like a time limit. It was good to compare it with the water that rose up to one's ankle. They had to end the fight before the time was up. When this fight is over. What was the next task after they defeat the southern forces and close the celestial door completely? Would the king of pride be satisfied with that situation? Could he shake off Mammon's shadow and smile again? The king of lust thought no more. He buried his head in the king of pride's arms he pressed his face against his warm chest then closed his eyes. He dreamed about the future instead of recalling the past. The Garden of Life was quiet because the skeletons that were farming day and night under the blue sky disappeared. There was no Skull's hearty laughter, and there were no dragon soldiers who tried to slack off whenever they could. There was no sound of hundreds of them plowing the fields under the command of the Death Knights. It was already one month ago, which was too long for Uria, who just turned one year old. Treant, the chief guard of the Garden of Life, waddled to the potato field and stood. He was standing there to make a shade for Uria, who was absorbed into farming today, just like she was yesterday in the Garden of Life where even Scathack had left. While squatting down and digging for potatoes, Uria put down the hoe before she knew it. Then she looked around, raising her head. It was vast. When she was with the Skull Unit, she had never thought of this, but today, she felt it was too vast and wide. Whining. Whining. Baduk and the baby dungeon meerkat looked at Uria at the same time. Instead of responding to the two, Uria rummaged through the pocket she had around her neck and pulled out a piece of paper. It was a chicken voucher the baby dungeon meerkat gave her last time. She planned to use it immediately when Yong Ho came back, but she couldn't. Even after Yong Ho and his subordinate spirits came back, they were all busy. Uria was quick witted, sensitive to what was going on around her. She also heard something from Uncle John and Ron of the Goblin Ranger, one of the elders of the dungeon spirits of the House of Mammon. Yong Ho and the Mammon family members were facing a big fight that would control the fate of the entire demon world. 
so, she knew she should not overstep. She decided to wait quietly until everything was over. She thought when the fight was over, everything would go back to normal like before. She decided to be a little more patient. I wish our master could come back as soon as possible. Yuria showed a big smile on purpose. Baduk and the baby dungeon meerkat smiled like her. The three started hoeing once again. Treant shook its branches to make a cool breeze for them. Burgrim worked sincerely, as always. After leaving the labyrinth of greed and joining Yongho's northern expedition, he was finally checking the weapons that the elite forces of the Mammon family would use. Rykam, the garrison commander of the House of Mammon and the leader of the Black Orc Squadron, sat face to face with Burgrim and inspected his armaments. Burgrim was reticent by nature, while Rikiam said a few words while fighting. Because of this, there was silence between them now. Burgrim struck the hammer. Suddenly, Rykam raised his head and tried to say something to him, but he immediately stopped and looked at his sword again. It seemed like yesterday that Rikiam stormed into the house of Mammon at the order of Poras, but a lot of time had already passed. But I felt pretty close to him back then. Suddenly, he recalled the time when he visited the free city with the master of the Mammon family. He also remembered when he opened his eyes wide, watching the master smashing the land worm. Rykam smiled before he knew it because he recalled the time when he fought against Embryo's large army. He felt he was going to be killed back then. It was terrific. It was the first time he saw a bone dragon. He also watched Yong Ho smashing a bone dragon alone. Yong Ho, his master and the king of greed. Rykam shook his head. He got the useless thoughts out of his mind. What he felt long and distant was not important to him. Rykam himself was the proud garrison commander of the House of Mammon. That was enough for him. Burgrim struck the hammer again. The sound of his hammering was rhythmical. The top of the deck of the giant red dragon Tiamat commanded a view of the camp of the southern forces. Standing alone against the sky that was gradually turning black, Tigrius had a cigarette in his mouth. The wind from the north was particularly cold because of the heavy rain pouring down in the far north. Tigrius said, What about Eligos? Eli brother is meeting Yong Ho right now. The night is long. I'll see him later anyway, so it's okay. Ophelia, standing next to Tigrius, had a cigarette in her mouth as well. Unlike Tigrius's, she was using a short pipe with a classical atmosphere. Since the days when the Mammon family badly needed a hand, they had been taking care of the housekeeping of the Mammon family day and night. Besides, they worked together to build a fortress city in the unclaimed area in the north, so they were close to each other. In some respects, they had something like a grandpa and granddaughter relationship. Tigrius politely smoked a cigarette, and Ophelia puffed out a long white smoke. She said as if she suddenly remembered something. A lot of things have changed, and that in a short time, right? In the meantime, Yongho did exactly what the King of Pride wanted. Just like the northern forces, the southern forces were on the march to the place where the celestial door was opened a thousand years ago. They would arrive there in several days. In a few days, the fate of the demon would be decided. Fixing his eyes on the north, Tigrius opened his mouth. History. He blurred at the end of his words. Ophelia looked at Tigrius, who then made a gentle smile worthy of an old gentleman. I thought I could see it in a history book. Ophelia also laughed. Chuckling like a girl, she grabbed the short pipe again. I agree. Who would have thought that the hostess of a remote southern tavern would be here with you? If her father, Indirian, saw her with six horns, what would he say? Would he be happy, saying he was proud of her? Or would he be jealous, saying he wanted to be like her? Don't you think we have met a very good master, do you? Although they were forced to join the House of Mammon in the first place, they didn't feel like that later. I can't deny what you said. Tigrius put the cigarette he smoked on a portable ashtray and turned. Since he was about to go down in the history of the demon world, he wanted to keep his name firmly known in the history books. Wow, you still look young. Look at that muscle. Looking at Tigrius's solid build, Ophelia shouted then put down the short pipe. She looked at the northern sky where there was the celestial gate. 
The arena spirits, one of the main forces of the Mammon family, were chatting, gathered in one place. They numbered over one hundred, but they were from different races over a thousand years old. Even if they could not feel the passage of time in the arena, a thousand years was enough time for them to build a strong bond among themselves. The former masters of the House of Mammon stood out among the arena spirits because they liked to group together, in particular. While they were chatting away, Eucrasian, the master ten generations ago, raised her head. She blinked her big eyes under her gray hair. Are you Kaiwan? Instead of answering, Kaiwan waved lightly and approached the former masters. Eucrasian tilted her head and said, Why aren't you staying with our master, full of desire? Another former master quipped, Aren't you feeling emotional if you have an upcoming battle and want to act cute before your lover? Their voices were cheerful unlike when they were in the arena. Kaiwan replied, Can you please stop paying attention to me? The battle is around the corner. Then she sat down by her favorite ancestor, Eucrasian. She looked around quickly and asked, How about Gusayan? Of course, she is flirting with her lover now. Don't look for him now. He will be greatly embarrassed. Were you dumped by our master? The former masters began to tease Kaiwan again. When they were in the arena, they just sipped their lips, but as soon as they were freed from the arena, they were so noisy. Please don't talk nonsense. I'm just staying away from him. Besides, he has someone ahead of me. Don't worry, I'm going to go back to him at night and have a great time. Grumbling like that, she lifted up one of the empty glasses before Eucrasian. Instead of filling her cup, Eucrasian opened her eyes wide and asked, Has Yong Ho really dumped you? Chapter 280 Kaiwan felt embarrassed when Eucrasian seemed to be sincerely concerned about her, unlike other masters who just enjoyed exchanging banter with her lightly. She pondered over how to respond to Eucrasian's question for a moment then just filled the glass instead of replying. In the meantime, the Queen of Fury and her bodyguards filled up their glasses. Kurtamuka, who was filling the Queen's wine glass, asked in a subtle voice, Aren't you going to see him? What do you mean? You know what I am talking about. Covering her mouth with a big hand, Kurtamuka laughed frivolously. Although the queen was innocent, she knew the meaning of Kurtamuka's loaded question. With her face blushing, the queen snapped, Hey, can't you stop talking nonsense? Kurtamuka said, shaking her head again, I know you haven't had a wedding ceremony, but... The queen was at a loss, not knowing how to respond. Gardamundi, who was watching them quietly, just smiled at the queen. Since the queen of fury became the king of greed subordinate spirit. The status of Gardamundi and Kurtamuka was also changed their master-subordinate spirit relationship with the queen was still maintained, but they could no longer influence each other. As a result, Gardamundi and Kurtamuka could not share the power that the queen newly gained after becoming the king of greed subordinate spirit. With the war with a fatal influence on the fate of the demon world just around the corner, Kurtamuka was busy bantering with the queen of fury. Even though the battle for the devil's fate was only a few days ahead, it was good to see Kurtamuka bantering with the queen, while the queen was struggling to get out of her embarrassing suggestion. Rather than shuddering with fear of the war, they tried to shake it off by spending their time as happily as they could. After agonizing for a moment, Gardamundi also decided to chime in with Kurtamuka, her long-cherished foe. She knew her behavior was rude to the queen, but at the same time, she found it so amusing to see the queen sweating, bungling, and shuffling when she was strongly asked to go to Yong Ho's bedroom. When her two faithful friends as well as subordinate spirits started teasing her at the same time, the queen was so embarrassed as to feel like crying any time. Gus Ion and Scathack said nothing, holding each other in their arms they enjoyed each other's warmth through close physical contact. They didn't need any new resolution. They cried bitter tears enough on the day when they had to see Mammon leaving alone to save the demon world. They didn't have to go to the trouble of renewing their determination that they had made during the past 1,000 years. Scathack kissed Gyuzhin's lips. Gus Ion hugged her slender body tightly. Yuscha didn't read the star sign cards. In a situation like this, she was just following her fate like she did a thousand years ago. Yuno didn't blame Yuscha. She went to see Richard, who kept silent all the time. He was tight-lipped, standing there like a rock as he had done a thousand years ago. But he was far from dumb. 
Yuno know, still remembered Richard's voice and his screaming back then. Mammon's twelve spirits didn't talk to each other. They just remembered the past and brushed up on the common goal they had shared. A red carpet was laid on the floor of the captain's seat of the giant red dragon Tiamat. Catalina and Eligos were by the side of Yong Ho, who sat down with a straw mat on it. Skull rolled on the floor here and there. Although Skull gained the status of Avatar of Death, something like a mythical being, he just enjoyed rolling on the floor like he used to. Yong Ho grinned, recalling the days when Skull was a skeleton worker. Eligos was baking pancakes directly in front of Yong Ho. That was a familiar scene Yong Ho was exposed to every day when he just became the master of the House of Mammon. Eligos had much fewer wrinkles than before, and his strong build looked good, but he had one thing that didn't change at all like Skull. He was still Yong Ho's butler at the House of Mammon. It smells good. It's almost done. Smiling warmly, Eligos slowly turned the frying pan on a simple stove that Yong Ho had bought from the human world. It was because of Yong Ho's request that Eligos suddenly baked pancakes. Although he was not in the room of the demon king at the House of Mammon, Yong Ho felt nostalgic, watching the straw mat on the carpet, skull on the floor, and Eligos baking the pancakes. Yong Ho always saw this kind of scene in the RPG games he had played or from the cartoons he watched as a child. Namely, right before the final battle, the fighters gathered together and chatted among themselves in a relaxed mood. At the time, Yong Ho grumbled, unable to understand why they looked so miserable before the final battle, but he seemed to understand now as he was in the same situation. When he was faced with a big, probably final battle with the fate of the demon world at stake, he wanted to chat with his subordinate spirits or his colleagues. On that day five years ago, or exactly six years ago, his father said something like this, the blood of the demon king flows through our family. And five years later, Catalina and Eligos visited Yong Ho himself. So many things happened after that. He survived life-threatening moments so many times. There were so many things that he would not have experienced if he had been a normal college freshman in the human world. Yong Ho turned his head to the side. Catalina, whose eyes were weak in the morning and strong at night, was staring at the pancakes with her eyes shining. Catalina, you're still the same. Pardon? Catalina looked back at Yong Ho, flapping her ears a bit. Watching her reaction, he clicked his tongue. At first, I thought you were really a cool knight here. But you were weak and dumb. He suddenly recalled her getting cold feet when he asked her if she could confront Crimson Ogre. Pouting her lips, Catalina touched his arm by flapping her tail. Since she was so timid, she expressed her protest and anger like that. Right at that moment, Yong Ho opened his eyes wide and raised his voice. Uh. What the heck? Catalina was embarrassed because Yong Ho was disturbed by her flapping tail, so she immediately calmed down her tail, pretending to be innocent. But it wasn't because she flapped her tail to touch his arm that he reacted like that. In fact, he would not be upset or feel bad even if Catalina hit him with her tail. Bursting into laughter, he said, is your evolution EXP already full? The evolution EXP could be acquired not only through combat but also through one's daily life. Actually, Catalina's evolution EXP was already full when she flapped her tail just once. It wasn't long before Yongho proceeded with synthetic reinforcement of Catalina, but her evolution was done a long time ago. Stay still. Yongho then activated the power of evolution. Somehow, he saw the window of her evolutionary status after a long time. Name, Catalina Female. Race slash title, Shadow Queen Mixed Demon. Category, Demon Superior. Attribute, Wind Level 4 slash Darkness Level 10. Individual Nature. Innocent, Dumb, Seductive. Individual Aptitude. Charm slash Mana slash Agility slash Skill. Evolution EXP. 100 out of 100. Attraction Specialization Level 7 5. 5. Fitness Specialization Level 5 4. 5. Agility Specialization Level 9 6. Mana Specialization Level 9 5. 5. Skill Specialization Level 8 5. 5. Attribute Enhancement Level 7 5. 5. 
Her evolutionary status was so splendid that it could not even be compared with when Yong Ho first met her. He couldn't help but laugh after checking her individual nature. Innocent, dumb, and seductive was the exact description of Catalina as she was now. Okay, let me have you go through evolution after a long time. Catalina was glad to hear him mention evolution. She flapped her ears and blushed when Yong Ho openly talked about her individual nature marked by innocent, dumb, and seductive. She erected her tail tightly as she was nervous at the moment. Your anguish is rising sharply. Skull laughed heartily, and Eligos also laughed warmly. With Catalina at a loss of what to do, Yong Ho put his hands on her thighs. It wasn't because he was sexually aroused. In fact, the day he first discovered Amun, he wanted to recreate the moment when he had evolved Catalina. After all, Catalina also laughed, but he focused his consciousness. Then he activated the power of evolution. It was late into the night. While everyone was sleeping, Citri woke up alone and looked into the darkness. She felt it was the same as in the past, but this time, she felt different. It was the same that a final battle was going on under the celestial door, but this time, the target and purpose of the battle were different. There was no unjust betrayal this time. It was a simple fight that they should confront the enemy, namely the celestial world with their might. Citri reflected on the past, as always. She recalled the bitterest and clearest memory in her life. Namely, the moment when Mammon died in her arms. The moment she herself ended Mammon's last breathing. Back then, Mammon had told her not to cry. He was even smiling during his last moment. Mammon. There was Mammon's tomb in the unclaimed area under the place where the celestial door was opened. It commanded a good view of Yong Ho's final battle with the King of Pride. Citri hugged her own shoulders. Recalling Mammon's last smile, she once again renewed her determination. She firmly decided that she would not repeat the same mistake under any circumstances. It was already very late into the night, but it didn't take long for Citri to feel that dawn was breaking slowly. The northern forces headed for the promised land. The southern forces also headed for the promised land. It was the land where the celestial door was opened one thousand and several hundreds of years ago. There was nothing left in the land after the great war on that day. The main pillar of the southern forces was the tribesmen of the eight clans. When the forces under the command of the Queen of Fury joined the southern forces, they numbered almost sixty thousand. The Dragon Legion now boasted of their strongest power since they were founded. The number of dragons was over 130, and among them, the number of fully grown ancient dragons was 23. The number of flying beasts and flying monsters following the Dragon Legion was almost 10,000. The flying fleet of the House of Mammon, backed by the main forces of the Dungeon Market with the support of Citri and Samuel, strongly reinforced the Dragon Legion. The spectacular grandeur of the 23 flying monsters flying through the sky stood out even when more than 100 dragons were filling the sky. Chapter, 281. The Promised Land was not far away, so the Skull Unit and the Black Orc Squadron descended from Tiamat, the giant red dragon, and moved together with the southern forces. With Skull on his back, Bucephalus raised his head and looked at the sky. Salami, who was his everlasting opponent and bad friend, was not in the sky. Actually, Salami was on standby inside Tiamat to help Yong Ho out during the most crucial moment of the battle. Bucephalus did not know the outline of the operation of the upcoming battle properly. His dear boss, Skull, explained something to him, saying Skull Skull, as always, but Bucephalus couldn't understand it at all. But he didn't care because his duty was always the same. He was supposed to carry his boss on his back and run around the battlefield with vehemence. Bucephalus made a loud noise to express greetings to Salami. Of course, he didn't get any reply from Salami, but he didn't care. He was convinced that his message was clearly conveyed to his boss, Salami. Salami moved his crouched body slightly, making a little groaning. He could not be seen from inside the hangar of the giant red dragon Tiamat, but he knew from his experience that Tiamat was now heading for the battlefield. The start of the real fighting was imminent. Salami curled up a little more. He saved his stamina, thinking of Bucephalus who must be marching on the ground. He couldn't show his shabby status at the moment to Bucephalus. 
you will arrive at the first gathering place in 30 minutes. The northern forces are gathering. It looks like both the northern and southern forces are entering the promised land at about the same time. The southern forces were the enemy of the northern forces, but strangely enough, they never communicated with each other about when and where they would fight. But they were drawn to each other. Adjusting the speed of their movement, they marched to the promised land. The northern troops at the first gathering place were close to 200,000, which was almost twice the total of the southern forces. There were three reasons why the southern forces responded to their northern counterparts' demands for fighting. First, they would ravage the territory of the Queen of Fury if they were not stopped. Second, the southern forces could not afford to drag their feet long because of the celestial world. Third, the southern forces believed they could beat their northern counterparts this time. You are lying if you can say you are not scared about this fighting, right? Lucia said to Yongho's subordinate spirits gathered at the bridge. But Gus Ion said sarcastically, I am not scared at all. I'm not either. Of course, I'm not. Kaiwan and Elagos shouted in the negative respectively. Scathack and Ophelia smiled gently at the same time. With Gus Ion making a hearty laugh, Catalina, who was looking around nervously, tapped her chest, after erecting her ears and tail. I'm not scared at all, either. While everyone laughed and showed confidence, Yong Ho, who was sitting in the captain's seat, turned his gaze slightly to the side. He naturally made eye contact with Citri. Instead of saying something, Citri simply smiled with her eyes then put her hand on Yong Ho's shoulder. It was her small move, but he felt heightened a lot. They were nearing the promised land now. It was time for the real fighting. The Queen of Fury once again held the horn in her hand. Unlike the other subordinate spirits, she stayed on the ground, not joining Yong Ho's expedition army. Since she was the head of the eight clans despite Yong Ho's subordinate spirit, she thought of standing at the forefront of her forces, as always. But this time, she couldn't just take the lead to fight. In this battle, she had to carry out a mission that only she could do in her capacity as the head of the eight clans. The tribesmen of the eight clans stopped marching and lined up. It was the first time that the Queen of Fury saw so many of her eight clans gathered in one place. Everyone looked at the Queen. Over seventy thousand eyes of the tribesmen in the sky and on the ground were fixed on her. The Queen took a deep breath. She was thrilled with lots of mixed feelings. When they looked at her, their eyes were full of mixed feelings of fear, courage, respect, and affection. The southern army was silent. With their mouths shut, they just waited for the queen to give an order. In no time, they were letting in and out a breath like one. It was the breathing of a huge army as one. Kurtamukha squared her shoulders and raised the flag in her arm. Gardamundi also raised a royal banner next to it, symbolizing the queen of fury. Finally, the queen opened her lips. She shouted in a thunderous voice, which nobody imagined could come from her small and slender figure with everybody tight-lipped. Fighters of the eight clans. Warriors in arms. Feeling thrilled at her thunderous shouting, they strongly responded to her by raising their weapons simultaneously. The queen kept shouting, Descendants of the Dragon Lord. All demon warriors in the south. The Dragon Legion watched the Queen of Fury. The spirits belonging to the Mammon family and the dungeon market shone their eyes. When her large army cheered and shouted with joy, the queen didn't agonize to impress her soldiers with eloquent speech. As always, she just spoke her mind honestly, the enemy is over there. Let's defeat them all together to save the demon world. Let's save our lives. Her goal was to defeat the northern army and close the celestial door. In other words, she wanted to save everyone who lived in the demon world. There was a thunderous applause from the southern forces again. The Queen of Fury turned then stared at the northern army located in a place that was not far away. She had a horn in her mouth and blew out loud without hesitation. Everyone heard the sound of her blowing the horn. Now, the battle began finally between the southern and northern forces. The arrows shot from both sides filled the sky. Magic bullets fired from the wild monsters burned the sky in a beautiful curve. With all of that attack going on, the southern army rushed to their northern counterparts. The northern forces also charged at them. 
Biryabaka, the head of the Garura clan, saw tens of thousands of monsters rushing toward them. Dragon Lord Ankablosa ordered the Dragon Legion to just wait even though the monsters were rushing toward them. The distance between the southern and northern forces gradually narrowed. In a few seconds they were going to collide, and at that moment, hundreds of them would be killed. Bucephalus also rushed. Skull, which was on Bucephalus's back, lifted Baphomet's sickle. At that moment, Citri, standing on the deck of the giant red dragon Tiamat and looking down at the battlefield, began to move. She lifted the wand that she had made on the same day when the dungeon market was born in the demon world. It was Citri that made the dungeon market, but she could not dominate it alone. The demon world was too vast for her to manage alone, and she needed time to heal the poison of the celestial world. While she had been asleep for dozens of years or several hundred years, she needed somebody who had to run the dungeon market on her behalf. So, Citri set up the system of five directors. In return for downgrading her status as one of them, Citri could maintain the welfare policies that Mammon had introduced. Over time, her status became gradually equal to that of the other four directors of the dungeon market. Because of this, Citri had prepared one secret weapon from the time she created the dungeon market. Although she became complacent over the course of one thousand years, she had been thoroughly betrayed by the other directors a thousand years ago. Her secret weapon was the master key of the dungeon market. She had kept it from the other directors until now and put it in total secrecy. Citri injected mana into the cane. As the owner of the dungeon market, she ordered all those who had gone through the dungeon market until now. Stop. Her short order soon became a reality. The mana unleashed from the master key filled the entire battlefield. The various subordinate spirits that Abrasax took out of the warehouse in the north obeyed her order. Even though the southern forces were nearing them, they just would not move. They literally stopped on the spot. About half of the beasts flying in the sky stopped flapping their wings. They also stopped using their superpower that helped maintain their existence in the sky. Left to gravity naturally, they just crashed to the ground. The subordinate spirits of the King of Pride, the King of Envy, the King of Lust, and the King of Gluttony also faithfully obeyed Citri's order. Most of them experienced going through the dungeon market before. The crest of the dungeon market still remaining under the crests of the four kings blocked their movement. Citri knew that the moment she used the master key of the dungeon market, the whole demon world would know it, so she could not use it twice. It was a massive power that she could never use twice once she activated it. The entire northern army got frozen on the spot. There were still some of them moving, but they had no choice but to stop because the rest of them didn't move. But the southern army did not stop marching. They stared into the eyes of those northern forces who could not move properly but who were conscious. Those at the forefront of the northern army were terrified. The reality that they could not move even their fingers when their enemies were right in front of them created a tremendous fear. They could not even think of their death because they were totally overwhelmed by fear. Standing at the forefront of the southern army, Skull swung Baphomet's sickle violently. Rykam and the Black Orc squadron struck the helpless northern army with their own weapons. The vanguard unit of the southern forces struck the northern army right in front of them. Without slowing down their vehement strike, the southern forces destroyed, trampled upon, and smashed the northern army. The bodies of those at the forefront of the northern forces were shattered to pieces and scattered in all directions. Nonetheless, the northern forces could not move. The increasing bodies of their fellow soldiers drove their tense hearts to extremes. The blood and flesh of their dead fellow soldiers covered their faces, followed by the southern forces' relentless attack with spears and swords. Chapter, 282 Bifrons, who was in charge of the entire northern army, instinctively realized what happened. That was why he clenched his teeth. He knew why his enemy didn't use this power in the last battle. At the same time, his old friend whispered into Bifron's ear. The northern forces were being killed at a terrifying rate. If the current massacre were not stopped, the entire northern forces could be annihilated in a matter of time. Bifrons clenched his teeth. It was only then that he realized who he had betrayed. Citri, before she was the Queen of Sloth, she was one of the five directors of the dungeon market. 
She was the very woman who created the dungeon market in the demon world. Abrasax shouted in anger. He desperately struggled to get out of the current impasse, but the northern forces who got frozen on the spot would not move. Even if there was someone who flew over their heads, none of them signaled danger or tried to attack. Even if Citri had not activated the master key, the northern forces would not have captured her. It was none other than Samuel, the fastest wing of the dungeon market, who crossed the space. She flew at a speed that was even difficult for one's eyes to catch and rushed to Abrasax. With the master key, Citri naturally found out the exact location of Abrasax, who wielded the power of the dungeon market. Abrasax also saw Samuel. Erecting seven horns on his head, he unleashed the strongest mana of the dungeon market. But Samuel was not scared. She brought out the power of her master, Yong Ho, as well as the power of greed, gluttony, and fury through Brigada. She destroyed Abrasax's mana by wielding much stronger power than she had as a director of the dungeon market. Right at this moment, she wanted to take revenge on him on behalf of his subordinate spirits, including Carol. Bifrons laughed bitterly. Yong Ho's twelve subordinate spirits appeared before him. The two red demons who had been fired like bullets from the giant red dragon Tiamat rushed to Bifrons like a beast as soon as they landed on the ground. They were Elagos and Ophelia, the two beasts under the command of the King of Greed. Moreover, Tigrius stood behind them. Faced with the three subordinate spirits with six horns, Bifrons raised his cane instead of giving up. Since he knew instinctively his final moment was imminent, he enjoyed this moment. He unleashed mana violently. Sometimes, people felt the passage of time differently, depending on their feelings. Only a few seconds in the eyes of others seemed like such a long time to Citri. Citri's master key was by no means an absolute power. There were only twenty seconds left for Citri to halt the entire northern army. The highly advanced the subordinate spirits and the strongly they were under the influence of the king of pride or the king of lust, the faster they would be freed from the influence of the master key. It was impossible to annihilate over 200,000 northern troops within 20 seconds. Because of that, Citri didn't depend on the master key alone. The king of pride, who had an overwhelming army, did not appear himself directly in the last battle. Even now, he didn't reveal himself openly when he had more troops. His action was taken for granted. The King of Pride considered everything other than himself as a tool. He would be satisfied with the outcome if he could wear out the King of Greed and the Queen of Fury in return for sacrificing tens of thousands of northern troops. So, Citri had to exactly find out the location of the King of Pride. By finding him, she had to change the nature of this battle from one between the two large forces to one between the kings. Citri knew that the freezing of the northern forces would last only twenty seconds. But do Bifrons and Abrasax know that? Can the King of Pride and the King of Lust detect it? Faced with an unimaginable situation at the moment, the King of Pride had to act. He had to expose himself in order to overcome this difficult situation. Citri gulped in a tense moment. She stared at the battlefield, feeling one second was like eternity and she recognized something at some point. Her heart was pounding. Now the king's mana exploded. Everything screamed at the explosive outburst of mana. The explosion was seen beyond the northern army. Right there, the king of pride unleashed his power. Erecting as many as eight horns, he radiated the sins of pride and envy. The black giant, the power of the sin of envy, was formed over the head of the northern army in the center. The king of lust could no longer hide his position, either. The king revealed his position by erecting the godly energy of lust. He was in the left wing of the northern forces. This was the right moment. Those who had been waiting for this moment for a massive attack began to move at once. Dragon Lord Ankablosa and twenty-two ancient dragons opened their mouths immediately. Instead of aiming at the monsters who had stopped on the ground, they let out dragon breath toward the ground. Twenty-three rays of light became a huge one and crossed the northern forces. Regardless of those northern forces who could move or not, Ankablosa's army killed them all. Ankablosa was still far from the King of Pride. Besides, the dragon breath swept through the northern army who were located between them, so when she reached the King of Pride, her power was greatly weakened. 
The black giant of envy wielded the light of pride to smash the dragon breath at once. But Ankyblosa was satisfied with that because her primary purpose was to open the way for the smooth marching of the southern forces. Roaring loudly, Salami spread his wings of flame. Yong Ho, Catalina, and Gusayan that were on his back gripped Salami's back handle. Then, Salami got close to the dragon breath in full swing at the moment. Sparks from the breath lit the atmosphere. Salami stopped running when the black giant of envy smashed the dragon breath. With the black giant of envy only dozens of meters away, Salami soared vertically at Yong Ho's order. Now there was really little time left before the freezing of the northern forces stopped. The black giant of envy saw Salami surging into the sky. The king of lust also turned his eyes at Salami's strange movement. But the king had no choice but to look ahead immediately. The king of lust. The queen of fury, who traversed the northern armies, shouted at the king in anger. The king of lust, who had the power of temptation, could not fight his ally. So, the best option would be for him to attack her in the middle of the southern forces. The main role of the queen of fury was blocking the king of lust. She was the only one among the southern forces who could fully overcome the king of lust's power of temptation. Kaiwan wielded her whip sword to get rid of those northern forces around the queen of fury. Kaiwan's role this time was to assist the queen. Kaiwan kept the proper distance from the two kings and again swung her whip sword. Instead of looking straight at the king of lust, Kaiwan looked at the sky where Yongho took off a moment ago. The leadership of the southern forces initially had no intention of making this fight a battle between the two large armies, for there were too many northern forces for them to confront successfully. But they knew they could win this battle by defeating only the king of pride who commanded the northern army. What was important was not the annihilation of the northern army, but the destruction of the king of pride. It was difficult for the queen of fury to confront the king of lust alone. It was also hard for Yong Ho to fight the king of pride alone. The king's mana was more powerful than Yong Ho's. So, Yong Ho had to devise a way to make up for his lacing mana, and support the numerically inferior southern forces. When Salami soared high enough, Yong Ho raised Mammon's godly energy, the magic field. Then he issued an order, emitting twelve lights that symbolized his subordinate spirits. Come to me. Labyrinth of Greed. He was referring to something he found in a secret room on the thirteenth floor, the deepest place of the labyrinth of greed. He could do it because he became the true master of the labyrinth of greed. Magnadon, who beat the earth, said clearly that he had moved the labyrinth of greed and that he hid it right under the ground floor of the house of Mammon. If so, what about the opposite? Would it be possible to move the labyrinth of greed back to its place again? Lucia responded. The unimaginable grand magic, which was completed over the course of a thousand years, a great miracle, had come true. A huge dungeon jumped between space and time. It was a huge dungeon with thirteen floors. It was hundreds of meters high, and its width was also beyond imagination. A huge weird lump of strange rocks was summoned in the middle of the northern forces, which smashed those around the stormy swirling rocks. The Labyrinth of Greed The King of Pride screamed loudly, to which the King of Lust had no choice but to turn his eyes. The Queen of Fury was charging at him right before his eyes, but he could not suppress his impulse. The Dungeon of Mammon, the King of Greed. It was the very dungeon he believed had been completely destroyed one thousand and several hundred years ago by the three kings of pride, envy, and lust. Salami shrieked loudly over the labyrinth of greed. Yong Ho felt the same sense of security like when he was located deep in the labyrinth of greed. He once again ordered Lucia. Labyrinth of Greed. Assist your master. When the master became strong, the dungeon also became strong. When the dungeon became strong, its master became strong as well. The power of the dungeon was the power of its master. Therefore, the master could bring up his strongest power when he was in the dungeon. An aura of great power arose from the labyrinth of greed. Yong Ho empowered the entire southern army as well as the Mammon family spirits within that aura. It was as if the entire battlefield became the labyrinth of greed. The dungeon breathed with the dungeon spirits. They delivered the strongest power to the master of the dungeon. Yong Ho jumped off the back of Salami. 
He spread his black magical wings widely, Catalina's power, then encircled his body with the power he received from the labyrinth of greed. Grasping Amon, who became united with the godly energy of greed, Yongho stared at the black giant of envy standing in front of him, and the king of pride inside it. Chapter 283 The king of pride shouted at Yongho violently. The moment the king faced Yongho, he knew it immediately. He didn't even need to check his heartbeat. He saw a vision of Mammon right before his eyes. He even felt the three sins of greed, gluttony, and fury, which Mammon had obtained one thousand years ago. And that fact evaporated the king's reason and drove him into irresistible anger. The king of pride. Yongho wasn't scared at all. He brought out all the power of the king of pride, who possessed the most powerful mana in the history of the demon world with himself pitted against the king's own royal family. Yongho immediately activated all his power at once. The sins of greed, gluttony, and fury instantly became one in his soul. The king of pride erected eight horns of light over his head. Yongho also erected eight horns of light. The king of pride spread six wide wings of light while Yongho spread the wings of black mana. The hugely destructive power of the two kings' mana collided head-on. It seemed as if the whole earth would be split because of the big collision of the two powerful kings. Indeed, the ferocious clash between the two mighty kings was beyond description. The fighting on the ground had become a mess. Those who were near the place where the two kings' mana collided with each other were crushed as if they were caught between huge walls, regardless of whether they were the northern or southern forces. Not only small humanoid monsters such as goblins and imps but also even medium-sized monsters such as ogres and trolls could not avoid the fate of being crushed to death. Even the giant beasts in the air fell to the ground, hit hard by the two kings' mana. Demon God It was indeed like God's power. They could not help but look at the two kings' fierce fighting. Even those dungeon spirits who got frozen by the master key of the dungeon market rolled their eyes. Hundreds of thousands of the northern and southern troops' eyes looked at the sky at the same time. They were just absorbed into watching their battle breathlessly as if they forgot how to even breathe. With everybody on the ground overwhelmed by the fighting in the air, the Queen of Fury had a horn in her mouth. Instead of attacking the King of Lust, she blew the horn as hard as he could. Her horn was like the sound of awakening the southern forces. The Queen of Fury was aware that Citri had only ten or more seconds left to freeze the northern forces. To ensure the survival and return of even one more southern soldier, she had to defeat the northern forces right now. It was a cruel and selfish idea, but she was the head of the eight clans. The huge silence was broken by her blowing the horn loudly. It was the heads of the eight clans who came to their senses first. Tear them off. Biryabaka, the head of the Garura clan, issued an order. The armed warriors who had been trained to protect their oppressed and abused race for many years responded immediately. Without wasting even one second, they attacked the northern forces around them. It was just a few seconds, but during that short span of time, lots of changes took place throughout the battlefield. The Dragon Corps, including Dragon Lord Ankablosa, no longer looked at the King of Pride. Each of them prepared the best possible attack on their own. They were ready to wipe out the flying monsters and beasts of the northern army positioned in the sky. Lucia was located in the Labyrinth of Greed, not Tiamat, the giant red dragon, and unleashed the power of the greatest dungeon freely in its deepest room. As a result, a larger aura injected power into the entire southern army. Citri counted the remaining time until the freezing was lifted. For now, she had only several seconds. Yongho and the King of Pride were staring at each other. The Queen of Fury and the King of Lust already started exchanging attacks with each other. Ankablosa filled her mouth with dragon breath, and several ancient dragons of the Dragon Legion were fully ready to use the secret weapon of demon magic. Samuel's fatal blow broke the magic field of Abrasax while Elagos and Ophelia destroyed Bifron's magic at once. The moment Citri finished counting down the time, dragon breath filled the whole sky. A lightning storm, a rain of fire from the sky, and an earthquake that shook the earth swept through the northern army. The northern forces were killed as soon as the dragon soldiers used the demon magic at once. Even though the master key didn't work anymore, 
the northern forces could not come up with a quick counterattack because it took time for them to recognize that their freezing was lifted. But the moment they realized it, they were faced with the permanent freezing without even screaming when the southern forces didn't miss the golden chance to attack them. Yong Ho and the King of Pride no longer stared at each other. He rushed, and the king swung his hands wide inside the black giant of envy. The light of pride from the black giant's both hands blocked him. The green flames of Amun collided with the light. Their fighting was no longer going on in a physical realm. It was only the difference in what form their mana was released. The sin of gluttony devoured the light of pride. The remnant light was burned by the sin of greed. Yong Ho, who strengthened himself with the sin of fury, threw himself at the black giant of envy. By wielding Amun violently, he tore apart the black giant, a lump of terrible emotions. King of Pride. Abrasax shouted at him. Right after he screamed, however, he had to look back. He couldn't afford to look back at the King of Pride at the moment. The fastest wing, Samuel, was the fastest among the five directors of the dungeon market. It was impossible for Abrasax to avoid her attack while looking at the King of Pride. All he could do was to simply pour out enormous mana to fill all directions with a magical field. Orobaza's absence at the moment was so painful to him. Among the three betrayers of the dungeon market, Oroba was the only one who could effectively defeat Samuel. Damn it! It was useless even if he tried to crush her with the overwhelming mana itself. Samuel, who became the subordinate spirit of the King of Greed, was so different from her days as one of the five directors. His mana that didn't target her exactly strayed from her mana. Abrasax now felt impatient. Born with enormous mana from birth, he did not know how to fight other than crushing his opponent with his mana. Bifrons would have tied up Samuel's feet by combining various magic, but Abrasax couldn't. For the first time, he found himself on the defensive, and he was so embarrassed by the deadly attack by a woman who he always thought was inferior to him. As a result, he could not even use half of his power. The number of horns in battle is not absolute. That was what Gusion said before. Samuel agreed. Once again, she disappeared from Abrasax's sight and aimed at his back. Now Bifrons felt his final moment was coming. His old friend devised several survival options for him, but he came to the same conclusion at the end of the day. He activated four kinds of magic by fidgeting with his four hands, but the situation did not improve. Tigrius, the wizard of the Mammon family, cancelled out his magics by triggering different magic with both hands, and the two beasts of the Mammon family crushed or endured Bifron's magics by mounting a reckless attack. Eligos and Ophelia's attack was so strong and fast that Bifron's could not take the time to prepare another magic. The magics he improvised at the moment could not counter the simultaneous attack by the three subordinate spirits of the Mammon family. The subordinate spirits of the King of Lust could not go to help Bifrons. All they could do was to protect the forces of the King of Gluttony from the onslaught of the southern army. Moreover, the subordinate spirits of the Mammon family were much more than expected. Richard, the silent warrior, broke his long silence. He roared loudly and smashed the forces of the King of Lust. He was second only to Gus Ion, who was said to be the strongest fighter among Mammon's twelve spirits. Accordingly, there was nobody among the King of Lust's forces who could confront Richard. It was like a tiger moving around in a flock of sheep. Each time he swung his black club, those soldiers around him were shattered to pieces. Scathack showed off her infinite vitality. She wasn't content with treating the wounded soldiers of the southern army. She broke into the northern forces to prove why she was called the Immortal Witch. There were no attacks that inflicted a fatal injury to her who had transcendental regenerative power. Scathack, who dealt with the power of life, attacked the northern army in her own way. Whenever the blue wave struck them, the northern soldiers who received excessive vitality from her saw their bodies bursting out. Some of them lose their lives because dozens of arms sprouted from the wounded areas. The Skull unit was already a battlefield nightmare to the northern forces. Skull, the incarnation of death, was not satisfied with sprinkling death everywhere. The dead stood up and followed the skulls advancing ferociously. The more the northern forces were killed, the more they followed the skull unit. Bucephalus let out a green breath. 
not content with rushing forward, he destroyed those who stood in his way. He brilliantly carried out his mission, befitting his image as the king of nightmare. Both life and death were the enemies of the northern forces. They fell into extreme confusion and fear now. Some of them couldn't move even now, as if they felt they were frozen. The king of pride didn't care about the northern army from the beginning. The king of lust could not take care of them. Abrasax and Bifrons couldn't waste even a second, only focusing on surviving. The southern forces were united and strong while the northern forces were in disarray without any central leadership. The nature of the battle quickly transformed from an intense fighting into a war of slaughter. I belong to Yong Ho. I belong to Yong Ho. Shouting loudly, Kai Wan swung her whip sword in all directions. While slaughtering the northern forces with the storm of her sword, she tried to see elsewhere other than the King of Lust. Chapter 284 The power of temptation of the King of Lust was indeed very strong. Kai Wan could understand why no one except for the Queen of Fury with the same sins and godly energies could confront the King of Lust. It was difficult for him to endure the power of greed through Brigada. Even the power of passion Kai Wan inherited from Magna Don did not help much. Kai Wan wanted to help the King of Lust. She wanted to kiss the top of his feet. She wanted to be held in the King's arms she wanted to listen to whatever the King told her to do. She was willing to bark if the King wanted her to. She felt happy when she bowed to the King and obeyed him. Bullshit. Yong Ho is mine. Kai Wan fought off all those delusions by thinking of Yong Ho whenever she was seduced by the King of Lust. She was the one chosen by Yuscha among the subordinate spirits of the House of Mammon as the one who could best resist the King's temptation. Catalina couldn't resist the King of Lust since the blood of a succubus was flowing in half of her body. It was none other than Kai Wan who had the most affection for Yong Ho among the remaining subordinate spirits. Ah! It's my determination as his official wife. Kai Wan shouted again desperately then empowered her whip sword. She distorted the space itself, so no northern forces could approach the King of Lust and Queen of Fury. The Queen of Fury heard Kai Wan shouting desperately. She wanted to refute or deny it, but she couldn't afford it. Maybe she didn't even think about it. Are you going to hit me? No, because it hurts. Don't do it. Just love me. The power of temptation of the King of Lust was so strong. Sins and godly energies neutralized the power of other sins but didn't offset them. The King of Lust had lived for at least one thousand years. Given how long the King possessed the power of sin, the Queen of Fury was no match for the King. The Queen was far inferior to the King in terms of the ability to understand and use the sins and godly energies. The Queen of Fury put up with it by clenching her teeth. She thought of hundreds of thousands of tribesmen of her eight clans who committed suicide, succumbing to the temptation of the King of Lust. Finally, the Queen brought out the sin of fury more intensely with anger and remembered Yong Ho's love while relying on the mana of greed through the Brigada Ring. Quat. The Queen of Fury gave a cry. At that moment, the godly energy of lust in the shape of a long sword broke the Queen's powerful thruster weapon. It did not stop there, leaving a sharp sword wound on the white and soft skin of the queen. The Queen of Fury was often called a war fanatic because she had experienced so many battles. She had been the hope of the eight clans since she was born, so she went through rigorous martial arts training since childhood to become the best warrior of her people. But she was not a match for the King of Lust. In short, the King of Lust was a sword demon. He was already called the best swordsman in the demon world a thousand years ago. Although the Queen of Fury was a famed war veteran, she could not confront the king alone. Let's try to gain as much time as possible. That's all I have to focus on right now. I have to trust Yong Ho, my love. The Queen of Fury relied on the sin of fury, which made its owner stronger as she became more furious. Although she was inferior to the king in terms of mana and skills, she outpowered the king in terms of her Herculean power and defensive power. The Queen of Fury blocked the attack by the king with her body literally. The role of the Queen of Fury was to gain time for Yong Ho. If Yong Ho defeated the King of Pride, it meant the victory of the entire southern army. 
Of course, the best scenario would be for the Queen of Fury to defeat the King of Lust then help Yong Ho fight the King of Pride, but that was more than she could chew. The Queen of Fury clenched her teeth and swung her fists endlessly. Thanks to the way she fought in battle, marked by her relentless attack without stopping, the Queen could make up for her inferior strength, compared with the King of Lust. Just like the Queen was struggling to put up with the difficult situation, the King could not overpower her as easily as he thought. The godly energy of fury, which looked like a beast's teeth, bit off the air. The King of Lust managed to avoid the attack by jumping off the ground. Then, after narrowing the distance with the Queen, the King approached her from the side and swung the godly energy of Lust violently. The King's swift attack while jumping down from the sky was beautiful. The Queen hurriedly twisted her body and avoided the godly energy of Lust. But the long sword passed barely over her shoulders and chest, leaving a long scar on her white skin once again. The Queen of Fury and the King of Lust looked at each other. The Queen pulled her fist, and the King withdrew his sword surprisingly quickly. However, their actions were far from their attack against each other. As if they promised to do so, they stepped back at the same time. Both of them looked up at the sky, with their hearts pounding hard. There were cracks all over the sky. The celestial door was opened. Even after a thousand years, nobody could find out exactly where the celestial hole was opened. In some cases, the celestial hole was opened in an unexpected place, and in other cases, it opened and disappeared in the land where no one lived. However, it did not mean that the celestial beings could not fully control where to open the celestial hole. The more widely the celestial door was opened, the more aggressively they opened the celestial hole, just like they chose a city or an army garrison instead of a land with nobody or nothing. You know and Yuscha, who belonged to the non-combat series among Mammon's twelve spirits, stood on the deck of the giant red dragon Tiamat and looked down at the sky. Yuscha's cards were listed in the air automatically, indicating the number and size of the celestial holes. There were already five holes in the celestial world that were already open and opening at this moment. It was different from the last battle. It was not a situation where the southern and northern forces could withdraw their forces. They had to fight the celestial world in a situation where the two forces were entangled. They were already ready for it when they witnessed the appearance of a couple of supersized godly men. After taking back the stack of cards, Yuscha snapped her fingers to leap into the room where the core of the giant red dragon Tiamat was located. The best they could do was to lend whatever power they had to the labyrinth of greed through Tiamat. Yuno know remembered her memory one thousand years ago. Just thinking about it made her shudder. She was breathing more and more roughly. It will be different this time. It will be different. Yuscha said that, and Yuno know nodded. The celestial door was not fully open yet. Yuno, know, who counted the stars, prayed for Mammon, the king of greed. Together with Yuscha, she delivered all of her mana to the labyrinth of greed. A super large godly man stuck his head out of the hole. His black eyes were even more terrifying because his whole body was covered with white light. There were five celestial holes, and the super large godly men stuck their heads out of the four of them. Celestial beings wrapped in grey light were coming out of the one remaining hole toward the earth as if water was pouring out. The northern forces were in extreme confusion. One of the generals in charge of them could not even swear, overwhelmed by fear. He was just thinking of stopping the fight and running away from the battlefield. The southern army was also agitated because they witnessed what the super-large godly men had done in the last battle. Skull, who was smashing the northern forces at the forefront of the southern army, quickly turned his head. He made up his mind, watching the super-large godly man who came out of the hole. After entrusting the skull unit to the death knights, he jumped off the ground. Bucephalus carrying skull on his back soared into the air and rushed toward the super-sized godly man. The celestial power emanating from the super-sized godly man was rushing toward skull like a storm. But Skull cut off the power of the celestial world by wielding Baphomet's sickle with the wicked energy of purple light. Then he tore it apart with the powerful mana and opened the way. Skull was determined to defeat one godly man from the celestial world. Watching him from a distance, Biryabaka, the head of the Garura clan, came to his senses. He hastily issued a new order. Surround yourselves with mana. 
prepare for celestial power. Unlike the disorderly northern forces, the southern forces were in good shape and fully prepared for the fight. Although they witnessed the celestial doors, they were not overwhelmed with fear. The power of the celestial world is coming. Be prepared for its shock. Shouting like that, Lucia sprinkled the power of the labyrinth of greed over the heads of the southern army. The aura that empowered the southern forces now became a barrier to the celestial power. Some of the northern forces right under the hole were killed at once without even giving a cry. Help me. Help me. Some of the northern forces abandoned their weapons and jumped into the southern army. Most of them were killed by the southern forces wheedling their swords, but some of them survived. The southern army remained cool-hearted even at this moment. Because of this, they could not completely turn away the northern forces stricken with fear and shock. Even though they were fighting against each other, they tried to keep the gentleman's agreement in an urgent and dangerous situation like this. Leave the northern forces alone. Just prepare for the godly men. Just keep your position. Biryabaka issued another order. The battle between the godly men wrapped in white light and the southern army finally began. Gusayan cursed at them. While looking for a chance to help Yong Ho, who was in the thick of fighting the king of pride, he turned his head. Two godly men appeared from a hole in the sky. They weren't as huge as those from the other four holes. But they were even more dangerous. They were none other than the godly generals. Chapter 285 Ankablosa roared. She let out dragon breath toward one of the godly generals who appeared above the southern army's head. The dragons around her also fired wide area mana toward the godly men in succession. Although they mocked the magics of the demon world thanks to the power of the celestial world, they could not block it when the magics were overlapped. The dragon court secured their own territory in the sky. The monsters nosedived to the ground. It was really a terrifying spectacle to watch dozens of monsters plunging to the ground with their bodies entangled with dozens of godly men. The battlefield, which was a mess because of the clash between the northern and southern forces, fell into even greater chaos and their mana collided with each other in the center of all this chaos. Yong Ho and the King of Pride did not hide their murderous intentions toward each other. Basically, mana on both sides was too powerful. Whenever Amun's godly energy collided with that of the King of Pride, heaven and earth shook. There were huge craters deep down in the ground while there wasn't a single cloud left in the sky. The King of Greed. King of Greed. King of Greed. Laughing loudly, the King of Pride wielded the godly energy of pride against Yong Ho. Whenever he wielded the godly energy of pride in the shape of a huge sword of light, a tremendous amount of mana moved with it. The movement of their mana itself was much more threatening than the King's sword attack itself. Since the King's sword attack was not simple, Yong Ho had no choice but to face it with mana. The godly energies of Amun and the King of Pride collided again, but Yong Ho clenched his teeth. His arm holding Amun's godly energy was so painful as to be torn off, but he endured it with all his might. The King of Pride laughed again. He suffered a lot of damage every time he exchanged attacks with Yong Ho, but he couldn't hide his gladness. Yong Ho had more sins than the king, but he was inferior to the king in terms of the total amount of mana and physical strength. The more intensely they fought, the more pronounced this kind of difference between the two was. I'm the demon world itself. I'm the demon world itself. The king of pride shouted violently at Yong Ho. He had lived for thousands of years. His body, which he had completed over the past 1000 years, was the crystal of the demon world. The king of pride decided that he would not lose to Yong Ho with the blood of the alien world. In his mind, the strongest one in the demon world was pride, not greed. Amun screamed. Yong Ho vomited blood. The tight balance of power between the two was finally broken. Although Yong Ho managed to block the King of Pride's sword attack, he could not stop the mana the king unleashed right after that. When the King of Pride added a new power to the godly energy of pride that was pressing down Amun's spear, Yong Ho fell helplessly. He plunged to the ground at a tremendous speed. You're done. The King of Pride cursed at him blatantly. The sin of envy, which became stronger in proportion to the intensity of its owner's feelings, pursued him. 
The black smoke wrapped around the King of Pride quickly took shape as a black giant, who then swung his huge fist toward Yong Ho, who fell to the ground. Kwa Kang. Heaven and earth were shaken. At the same time, Yong He screamed then he vomited blood. Yong Ho's mana blocked his fist but failed to push it out. It was still being held down by his power. At that moment, the green flames arose to burn the dark feelings of envy. The sin of gluttony ate up the mana of pride ferociously. However, that was not enough. It was too difficult to reverse the dynamics that had once tilted in favor of the king of pride. Yong Ho. Kaiwan screamed. As his subordinate spirit, she immediately recognized the danger her master was in. But there was nothing she could do. Although she raced toward Yong Ho and the King of Pride, she was still far away from them. Besides, the king's mana in the surrounding area blocked her approach. The Queen of Fury also wanted to help Yong Ho. But the King of Lust did not allow it. The king decided to hold the queen rather than overpowering her. Catalina turned boldly in spite of the possible attack by the godly general behind her back. But her two alter egos of dark mana blocked his attack. She regarded her body as a single sword. She collected black mana in order to penetrate the King of Pride's mana. Yong Ho's other subordinate spirits also realized their master was in danger. However, there were very few of them who could leave their location, unlike Catalina and Kai Wan. Skull left a trace of death on the godly man's huge neck. Then he passed by the killed godly man to run toward the place where Yong Ho was. Eligos and Ophelia stabbed Bifron's chest for the seventh time then turned their heads to Yong Ho immediately. Gusseon screamed. Richard roared. Scathack shouted desperately. Citri stepped forward while the three were screaming. Yong Ho felt his heart was beating. It was the moment when he was on the verge of death, but he knew it. The Queen of Fury and the King of Lust also knew it. The Queen was gasping for breath while the King of Lust felt pain and urgency at the same time. The King of Pride, who was showing intense hatred toward Yong Ho, turned his head. Actually, he had to because he suddenly felt his heart was pounding. The Queen of Sloth. Citri, who stood by Mammon to the end and watched his last moment. The King of Pride. Citri's soul was poisoned by the power of the celestial world. She had been keeping the power of sloth for over a thousand years, but she was the weakest in terms of fighting. So, it was reckless for her to challenge the King of Pride with eight horns. Nonetheless, she acted. The King of Pride felt threatened by the Queen of Sloth. She jumped over space and stepped on the air. She approached him from the side. The invisible barrier of corrosion that originated from the power of sloth pushed out the king's mana and opened a way. As the distance between them narrowed, the strength of the invisible barrier of corrosion increased more. Citri. Kaiwan slowed down before she knew it. For the first time, Catalina realized that she was the reincarnation of Elun. She noticed one fact when she looked at Citri from behind. The dark energy of envy enveloped Citri before being dismantled and disappeared. Normally, Citri could never have done it. But the King of Pride understood it. That was why he concentrated his power to disrupt Citri's attack instead of Yong Ho. The invisible barrier of corrosion opened the way to the King of Pride by breaking his mana. Through the magic of pride. The power of sin was the power of the soul. Citri burned her own soul. She was completely different from when she confronted the three directors who betrayed her. She wanted to survive back then, but not now. She would die where she was standing. She planned to bite the king's neck by exhaling the power of sloth as much as possible. The king of pride was already like a demon god. Even if Citri burned all her soul, she could never destroy him. But she could deal a fatal blow to him so that Yong Ho could stand up again and confront him. She believed that Yong Ho could overpower the weakened king and destroy him at the end of the day. She knew she was content with her role like that. By doing so, she could save the demon world. Citri. Yong Ho shouted from the ground, trying to stop her. But she didn't listen. She took another step forward. Now, she recalled Mammon, throwing herself toward the king of pride who was about to use all his might to disrupt her attack. 
smiling at Yong Ho for the last time, she brought out as much power of sloth as possible. There arose a beautiful and enormous flame caused by her sacrificing herself. The flame didn't flare up, but it faded away instead. The King of Pride was not responsible for it, nor was Citri. Yong Ho's shouting stopped it. He could not tolerate her sacrifice. His will and shouting finally awakened Yong Ho again. The resonance of the seven deadly sins gathered in one place awakened him from his long sleep. He could never sit idle, watching her sacrificing herself before his eyes. I won't allow for it because you are mine, and your soul is mine. The moment the invisible barrier of corrosion was removed, Citri bounced off, pushed out by the king's mana. Catalina caught her in the air. The two looked at her, aghast. Tears came down Citri's eyes. The King of Pride shuddered. He felt scared before he knew it. He barely spoke. It's a lie. The Queen of Fury was thrilled. The King of Lust couldn't even breathe properly. Gus Ion shouted loudly while Yong Ho's twelve subordinate spirits also screamed. My King. Yong Ho and Mammon, the unified King of Greed, responded to their shouting. The day when Mammon, the King of Greed, disappeared from the demon world. On that day, a thousand and hundreds of years ago, Mammon closed the door of the celestial world and died, totally emaciated. The King of Pride thought so, and Mammon's twelve spirits also thought likewise. But the King of Greed, never died that way. Yong Ho felt and understood it. You know, counting the stars, told him that he was not the reincarnation of Mammon, but that Mammon was always with him. She wasn't talking about Mammon's legacy. What Yuno saw was more essential. Mammon, who killed numerous godly men, finally shut the celestial door. Although he was exposed to tremendous celestial power, he was still the greatest king of the demon world. Citri, the queen of sloth who stood by him to the end, met Mammon. He made the following request to her who was weeping. Kill me with your power. Mammon in her arms was like a bomb. His body contained a large amount of celestial power beyond imagination. He could not control it with his mana anymore. The moment Mammon breathed his last breath, the power of the celestial world would grow explosively, which would inflict another irreparable damage to the demon world. So, Mammon asked her to erase him from the demon world along with the power of the celestial world by using her invisible barrier of corrosion. Mammon would shortly face his last moment, and he was destined to die anyway. Nonetheless, his request was so cruel to her. Citri hugged him with trembling hands. Then, she activated the invisible barrier of corrosion to accept his request and ended his life. At that moment, her soul was poisoned by the celestial power, and she had an indelible wound deep down. The reason why he could meet Amun as soon as he started exploring the dungeon. The voice he heard while he was peeking into Skathaka's memories. His memory of Mammon in the human world. Why had not there been a successor born for the past one thousand years since Mammon's death? What happened to the sin of greed during those years? And why did Citri not get the power of greed, gluttony, and fury? Yong Ho could understand all of them now. Mammon did something for the last time before he died in Citri's arms he could do it because Citri's power of the invisible barrier of corrosion neutralized the celestial power. The seven deadly sins were the fragments of the demon god soul. Mammon, the king of greed, did not let go of the sin of greed. He owned it by himself, which became the sin of greed itself over one thousand years. Yong Ho felt Mammon. He was greed, which was with himself. It already became united with him. He stepped forward. He jumped over space and stood next to Citri and Catalina. Holding the crying Citri in his arms, he unleashed the godly energy of greed. The power of the godly energy of greed was possessiveness. The king of pride raised his head. He couldn't understand what was happening before his eyes, but he acted instinctively. He swung the mana of pride to stop the king of greed and gathered the light of pride and the black energy of envy to attack him. But it was too late. Yong Ho hugged Citri so hard as to almost crush her. He possessed her to accept her body and soul. Devouring the celestial power that poisoned her, he declared the contract on making Citri his thirteenth subordinate spirit. The demon god's heart within him began to pound. 
the seventh claw broke into Yong Ho's chest. The four sins of greed, gluttony, fury, and sloth became one in Yong Ho's soul. All eight horns of light that sprouted above Yong Ho's head disappeared. It was impossible to measure his power by the number of horns. The light of pride and the black smoke of envy scattered, and the celestial power evaporated. Everyone on the battlefield forgot to fight. Even the celestial beings were forced to stop and look. The king of greed, rather, the demon god of greed. Yong Ho grabbed Amun and fired up the flames of greed. He looked down at the king of pride. Chapter, 286 Coincidence and inevitability met, giving birth to the present situation. Mammon, who became united with greed over the course of a thousand years, could no longer be called a human being. However, Yong Ho felt Mammon's will. He was now with Yong Ho himself. It was a battlefield where hundreds of thousands of people gathered together, but there was no sound of them even swallowing. It was as if the whole world stopped. Four sins gathered in one place. Mammon's godly energy that united the powers of different sins. The heart of the demon god that guided the power of the owner's soul to a higher place. The king of pride opened his mouth. But he couldn't speak properly. Although he had the mana as powerful as that of God, he never thought of wielding it. He just got frozen with the shock that he met a much more powerful being than him. Yong Ho looked down at the king and lifted Mammon's godly energy, guided by Mammon's whispering. He broke the huge silence by shouting at the king. Own it, labyrinth of greed. Lucia responded to his shouting. The labyrinth of greed took root in the earth. It didn't just emit an aura, but it owned the surrounding area. It turned the entire battlefield into the labyrinth of greed. The surface of the ground rose and became a wall. The protective walls did not differentiate between the southern and northern forces. They were all inhabitants of the demon world. In other words, they were the people of the demon god. The celestial power that crushed the entire battlefield was pushed back. The demonic beings who were groaning in pain and fear felt calm in the dungeon. Yong Ho's power grew even stronger. As the demon king became stronger, the dungeon also became stronger. The beings of the celestial world rushed to the beings of the demon world, screaming silently. But they were different from before. The demonic beings located inside the dungeon were no longer helplessly destroyed by the power of the celestial world. A fierce battle broke out in both heaven and earth. Bifron smiled. With his heart destroyed by the mighty attacks of Elagos and Ophelia, he could not continue living. It was impossible for him to even say a few words. But he was satisfied. Although he made the wrong choice, and it was impossible for him to see clearly what was happening before his eyes, he knew that the demon world would become one. He also knew his longing would come true. Instead of giving a fatal blow to Bifrons, Elagos ran toward Yongho. Ophelia also ran next to Elagos. Tigrius also did not look back. Abrasax denied reality. He had seven horns. He was called the strongest mana of the dungeon market. But why was he so powerless now? Samuel did not answer. She withdrew the sword that pierced his back and heart. She turned around and looked at her master. She spread her fastest wings wide and soared into the sky. Richard smashed the godly general's head. He opened his mouth amid the scattering light. Instead of shouting, he made articulate words for the first time. My king, my king. Yuscha and Yuno cried in the labyrinth of greed. Skathak smiled after laughing. Gusion burst into laughter loudly. The king of lust sat down helplessly. He barely breathed. He then shed a stream of tears. It wasn't just because he accumulated regrets for more than a thousand years. With a tearful voice, he cried, Belial. The king of pride. The king of lust, disguised as a woman, had been loving the king for several thousands of years. Ah! The king of pride screamed. By shouting like that, the king gathered mana once more. Then he radiated the light of pride, which was the power of his presence, and the dark energy of envy, which was a lump of terrible emotions. It was a thousand years. 
the king of pride recreated his body in the best shape as much as he could over the past one thousand years, so he was far superior to mammon of the past. But why was he defeated? Don't look down on me like that. The king of pride shouted. His mana was really powerful, so much so that he could be called the demon god. But his opponent was a tough challenger. Yong Ho unleashed his remaining fury. He swung Amun violently, arousing the green flames of greed. Yong Ho's mana devoured the king's mana. The green flames, which contained not only greed but also the power of gluttony, burned the light of pride and the dark energy of envy. The power of sloth cancelled out the aftermath of the collision, and the power of fury empowered Yong Ho. Yong Ho pierced through the green flames. He swung Amun violently once again to strike the king strongly, but the king hurriedly lifted the godly energy of pride and stopped his attack. Their eyes met while they were wielding their swords and spears. Now, the situation was unfolding differently from before. The king of pride could not withstand Yong Ho's power as well as the demon king's power anymore. The king vomited blood. Once again, their spears and swords clashed in the air. Yong Ho discovered how the king of pride acquired the mana as it was now. He witnessed countless souls howling inside the king's soul. The king of pride spread its six wings wide. But it was useless. Each time Yong Ho swung Amun, his wide wings were broken one by one. Obviously, the king's mana was so powerful as to shake heaven and earth, Yong Ho's power was stronger. The king of pride screamed. Confronting his despair, jealousy, and anger, Yong Ho injected strength into Mammon's godly energy. Then he condensed all the power of his twelve subordinate spirits as well as those in the dungeon. My master. Amun responded. Yong Ho felt everyone in the endlessly growing power. Demon God. He was the only master of the demon world. He was the man who ruled the dungeon named the demon world. Amun broke the godly energy of pride. And Amun's green flames burned everything that stood in the way. His final blow pierced the king's heart. The king of pride saw Yong Ho. He opened his lips and said something he couldn't even think of before. The moment he was facing his last moment, he could think of only one name that occupied his mind. Asmodeus. It was the name of the king of lust who had loved him alone for several thousand years. Amun's green flames burned the king of pride. Yong Ho reached out and grabbed the king's essence pride and envy, the two sins. The sin of greed was empowered at the moment and owned it all. Six out of the seven deadly sins had gathered together. The king of lust no longer resisted. He put everything down and left himself to the natural attraction. The seven deadly sins were originally one. So, the sin of lust wanted to be united with other sins. The sin of lust now belonged to the king of greed. The king of lust, disguised as a woman, fell on the floor and cried. He was the only one in the world who would cry for the king of pride. The celestial beings attacking the southern and northern forces stopped attacking and headed for the sky. They did so to preserve their power, but they were instinctively scared of the incredible power of the demon god. Not only the celestial men but also the godly generals headed to the sky, and new celestial holes began to open high in the sky. Yong Ho stood at the highest place in the labyrinth of greed. Although he defeated the king of pride, he had to conquer the celestial door. Today's fight was not over yet. The red sky was turning blue, which was evidence that the celestial door was opening. The vortex of mana created by the clash between Yong Ho and the king of pride prompted the celestial door to open. Yong Ho recognized it through Mammon's memory. It was a coincidence that Mammon left his offspring in the human world. Maybe even that was guided by his fate, but he didn't think so. Mammon visited the human world again shortly before the final battle with the celestial world. He did so to prepare for the possible collapse of the demon world just in case he could not block the attack of the celestial world. Mammon looked for his descendants in the human world and gave them the heart of the demon god. If one day a qualified person was born, he would own the heart of the demon god. More than a thousand years have passed. Finally, a new king of greed appeared, and he obtained the heart of the demon god and Mammon's godly energy. By collecting all the seven deadly sins, he rose to the level of the true demon god. 
And now, the celestial door was opened in front of him. The celestial world was the worst alien world to the demon world. The existence itself was the opposite of the demon world, so it constantly longed for the demon world. Even Mammon did not know clearly about the celestial world. However, when he looked into the celestial world through its door, he was convinced that he should not be merely content with shutting down the door itself. This time, he had to cut off the connection between the celestial world and the demon world by using his power as the demon king. The twelve subordinate spirits of the past and present gathered by Yong Ho's side. Although the celestial door was opening in the sky, none of them expressed fear. Salami landed next to Yong Ho. He flinched a bit at the overwhelming presence of Yong Ho, who became the demon god, but soon, he wagged his tail as always. Yong Ho looked at the sky. He saw the stairs he had seen in his memory many times. It was another evidence that the celestial power was getting stronger again. Skulko, Skull said. Yong Ho turned at his calling and smiled before he knew it. Above the entrance to the first floor of the labyrinth of greed, Yuria, Baduk, and the dungeon meerkat stood, gasping for breath. Behind him were standing not only Rykam and Burgrim but also the goblin rangers. Also, behind them was Triant, who was waddling up the stairs. Yuria did not know what kind of fighting took place today. She didn't know who Yong Ho was going to fight from now on. But she guessed that his fighting was different this time. The place Yong Ho was going to head for now was a really dangerous place. Maybe he would never come back. Yuria held back the urge to burst into crying before she knew it. She looked up at him then laughed reluctantly while fiddling with the chicken voucher in her hand. She bowed to him and said, Bye. Baduk and the meerkat also bowed. Rykam and Burgrim also bowed to him while the goblin rangers and Triant, who arrived late, did the same. Lucia was seated next to Yuria. She, the soul of the dungeon as well as Yong Ho's alter ego, nodded to him instead of speaking long. Watching them, Yong Ho laughed. He stroked Lucia's hair and sat down before Yuria at her eye level. He said, holding her hand tightly, I will be back. Let's eat chicken together when I come back. Yuria nodded. Eventually, she shed tears. He wiped her tears off and stood up again. Lucia smiled like a grown-up. Bye. My master, king of the demon world. Yong Ho turned. He looked up at the stairs leading to the celestial door. Then, this time, twelve subordinate spirits spoke one by one. I, Indirian's daughter, Ophelia, will be with you, master of the great Mammon family. I, the butler, am the last bastion of the dungeon. But this time, I will be the bastion of my master. Ophelia and Eligos stood by Yango's side. Gusion and Skathak said one after another. I will never let you go alone this time. I told you to fight with your subordinate spirits, right? At that moment, the godly men and godly generals were coming out in droves from the whole of the celestial world. As they were standing in the place closest to the sky, they could feel the threat directly. However, the twelve subordinate spirits did not stop. Samuel and Tigrius quietly stood by Yong Ho, and Richard stood behind Gus Ion. I will protect you by sacrificing my life. Catalina flapped her ears and tail. She was always an escort knight guarding him at hand. Because I am his official wife, let me forgive you for using me as the shield against the attack. Then Kaiwan hugged Yong Ho's arm. Because you are my master as well as the king of the eight clans, I'll be with you. Besides, I have to hold a wedding ceremony with you after the fight. Drydera Shutra, the queen of fury, blushed and spoke a little timidly. Skull laughed and stood at the forefront. Yong Ho finally looked at one person next to him. My beloved customer. I trust you. Citri smiled at him and felt greed that existed within his body. He also smiled at her. Without any further delay, he stepped forward. The stairs leading to the celestial world. It was the path where Mammon, the king of greed, climbed alone and saved the demon world. From heaven and earth, everyone in the demon world looked up at him. The celestial beings looked down from the sky that turned blue. My master. I will stay with you until the end. Amun, the magic spear of the red lotus. 
He had always been Yong Ho's strong support. Yong Ho opened up the power of the demon god. Heaven and earth shook with his overwhelming mana, which evaporated the celestial energy that was filling the sky. Yong Ho climbed the first staircase by jumping through space. Then he ordered his subordinate spirits, let's move. That was the word that Mammon could not say back then. Following the king of greed, they climbed the stairs to the celestial world. Chapter 287 The war between the north and the south, which involved the whole demon world, finally ended. The war lasted only one month, but its aftereffects were devastating. When the war between the celestial world and the demon world, followed by the war of the northern and southern forces, was finally over, the changes that the demon world experienced were far greater than all the changes over the last thousand years. Samo looked at the collapsed dungeon. Just a few months ago, there were numerous people going in and out of the dungeon. The special auction house of the dungeon market. It was broken and ruined. On its walls and floors were the traces of the day when the special auction house collapsed. Samuel clenched her teeth when she found the darkened bloodstains all over the walls. Among the changes caused by the war of the northern and southern forces, the collapse of the dungeon market was most talked about by the busybodies everywhere. Dungeon market completely collapsed. It wasn't because three of the five directors there were gone. Although they were greatly destroyed, the distribution channels of Dungeon Market were still connected throughout the Demon World, and its various production facilities were also in good shape. In fact, since the Dungeon Market monopolized the entire demonic world, there was no competitor to replace it in the event of a crisis. Nonetheless, the Dungeon Market collapsed. The Demon World no longer believed the Dungeon Market. But I'm going to build it again. Samuel thought of Ciri's words, slightly lifting her wings. Citri, the founder of the Dungeon Market, shared all the remaining properties of the Dungeon Market with Samuel. Citri asked Samuel to create a new Dungeon Market. Even if the inhabitants of the Demon World do not trust the Dungeon Market, they still needed it in the Demon World. Master, the time is up. When she heard the voice from behind her back, Samuel turned around. It was the voice of Incubus Henry, Samuel's new butler. He was the younger cousin of Caro, who was killed while defending her dungeon, even though he was overwhelmingly inferior to the enemy in military strength. I'm sorry. I think I have been delayed too long. Samuel was the owner of the new dungeon market, but she had only one master. I should not be late. Let's hurry. Today was a special day. Just like Caro, Henry escorted Samuel politely. The fastest wing, Samuel, who was one of Yong Ho's twelve subordinate spirits, ascended on a flying wagon heading for the labyrinth of greed. The age of the six kings had come to an end. People in the northern area, who lost their king, fell into great chaos, but only for a brief period. The situation in the northern area soon went back to normal. The unclaimed land in the northern area. It was a place where dozens of house masters ruled their respective dungeons and competed with each other. However, it was different from the southern land that had been divided over the past 1,000 years because Yong Ho existed in the current demon world. He was the one and only greatest king in all the history of the demon world. The masters of the northern area sent their envoys to the south competitively to curry favor with him. Today was a very special day for the entire demon world. The territory of the king of lust, like the territories of the king of pride and the king of envy, became an unclaimed land because of its division. The vassals of the king of lust kept his dungeon, waiting for the king's return, but the king did not appear before them. The king of lust was alive. Even now, when both the war of the north and the south, as well as another great war, was over, the soul of the dungeon of the king of lust was alive. This meant that the dungeon owner, the king of lust, was alive. Asmodeus, the king of lust. Sword Demon, the king who had lived longer than anyone else in the demon world and cherished the sin of lust. The king of lust had been with lust for so long. It was no exaggeration to say that the king was already the sin of lust. Because of this, even after the war ended, the king still existed like before. In fact, he was similar to the Queen of Fury or the Queen of Sloth who shared the power of sin with Yong Ho after they were made his subordinate spirits. Yango did not kill the king of lust. Following Mammon's last will, 
he freed the king. The king of lust wandered in the wilderness. While wandering aimlessly, the king stopped on a small hill in the north. It was the place where the king first encountered the king of pride a long time ago. A rough wind blew. The king's snow-white hair was twined around her chest and shoulders. The king of lust did not resent Yongho. This time, the king didn't have any deep regrets either. She just shed tears for the king of pride. Belial. That was the name of the king of pride that Asmodeus, the king of lust, remembered. The king of lust did not rush. She waited a little more, facing the blowing wind. She remembered her love for the king of pride. The war between the celestial world and the demon world lasted three days and three nights. For this reason, there were some who called the war the three days war. The biggest feature of the war was that all those in the demon world became united as one. The survivors of the southern and northern forces, who had once gathered together to fight against each, joined hands under one flag and fought the celestial world. Although they fought only three days, they all became the greatest king's subordinate spirits during the battle. The war made the whole demon world united as one with the king of greed as the central leader. The labyrinth of greed, which was the great battleground, no longer existed in the center of the demon world because it returned to the place where it was originally supposed to be. Dragons were lazy individualists even now as they used to be. On the day when the war between the celestial world and the demon world ended, the dragon legion was disbanded. As a matter of fact, they could be established because of the absolute charisma of the king of violence. Now that even the king of violence's last will was gone, there was no reason to maintain the dragon army anymore. Dragon Lord Ankablosa returned to a free blue dragon. While she was goofing off in her own hideout rare, she woke up at the urging of dark elves who were her subordinate spirits. What the heck? The promised day has not come yet. What she complained about was that she had not yet slept for a month when the war was over in less than a month. According to her original schedule, she was supposed to wake up two months later than now, on the day when the King of Greed would get married to the Queen of Fury. The Dark Elves trembled and expressed fear at their master's annoying voice. Ankablosa suppressed her anger and asked again with a slightly softened voice, if you hadn't been crazy, you wouldn't have woken me up for no reason. What happened while I was sleeping? The Dark Elves nodded. Then they delivered urgent news to Ankablosa, who turned into an Afsaras with long dark blue hair. We must hurry to return even by ourselves. Tigrius of Harmony, one of Yongho's twelve subordinate spirits, spoke, gently touching Salami's back. The reason why Salami, Yongho's private car, was carrying Tigrius on his back, was simple. Yongho ordered Salami to give him a ride because he could not take a break even after the war was over, who had to lead the northern expeditionary force. When the war was over, the territories of the King of Pride, the King of Envy, and the King of Gluttony became no king's land. The territories of the King of Pride and the King of Envy were located far too far from the land of greed in the south. However, it was not the territory of the King of Gluttony, so Yongho organized a northern expedition with Tigrius as the head. Another pillar of the northern expedition force, Skull, responded with a hearty laugh. The Skull unit, which made great achievements in the war with the celestial world, was advancing at the forefront of the northern expedition force under the feet of Bucephalus running through the sky with Salami. Originally, the northern expeditionary force should have already arrived at the Labyrinth of Greed, but due to unexpected troubles, they didn't arrive on time. If they led the northern expedition force as they were now, they would not be able to participate in the event. Well I understand that you also agree. Then, let's leave the command to Wycross until you return. Skull laughed again this time, and Tigrius cast a spell while feeling a bit anxious. He conveyed the message that he would leave the return of his expeditionary force to Vampire Lord Wycross, who was in charge of the Northern Expedition Force in the center. All done. Now, then let's go. Skull nodded and put the spur on Bucephalus. Bucephalus ran at full speed, leaving behind green flames, while Salami, which started belatedly, was upset with Skull. Even though Tigrius didn't convey any message, Skull spread the wings of the flames and sped up. Tigrius's hair and beard were quickly messed up because he had no time to cast the windshield magic. But instead of expressing anger, Tigrius laughed like Skull. 
grabbing the handle on the back of Salami, he enjoyed the blowing wind. He had to hurry. Today was the day of the wedding of Yong Ho, their beloved and respected owner. Chapter, 288 Wow! My son is a king! Yong Ho's father shouted in excitement. He was the descendant of Mammon as well as the father of Yong Ho, the king of greed. Dressed in a stylish formal dress, he, who was wearing an apron, looked around the wedding hall in excitement. Headed by dungeon garrison leader Rikam, the Black Orc squadron dressed in sparkling armor were standing around the hall. Although they were standing there as the guards, Yong Ho's father thought of the thinly sliced green onions wrapped in fried chicken while looking at them proudly. Each of them was brightening the atmosphere of the wedding hall. Even now, when he closed his eyes, he remembered the day when he met his third daughter-in-law. He was so shocked back then. Turning up the corner of his mouth slightly, Yong Ho's father showed satisfaction once again. Although he spent the happiest days of his life while staying in the labyrinth of greed during the last few days, he was happiest when he liked to fry chickens like this, standing in the wedding hall. It wasn't that Yong Ho made his father fry chickens on his wedding day because he was a bad son. Actually, Yong Ho's father volunteered to fry chickens. Yong Ho's father could not believe that chicken was the special menu of those at the labyrinth of greed, praised as the best food in the demon world that demons wanted to eat. He was the happiest today after he opened his chicken shop in the human world 30 years ago. The wedding hall was busy with guests from all over the place. Among them were those who didn't look like demon people at all, such as winged harpy, the big triant, and the crawling slime, etc. Give me some fried chicken. Whining. Whining. Yong Ho's father lowered his head when the dungeon trio shouted at the same time. He saw Yuria smiling brightly over the white tablecloth. She looked so lovely when she showed him a couple of crumpled chicken vouchers. Okay. Here you go. I don't need anything like this voucher today. Returning the chicken voucher that got hand stained, he served them a generous amount of freshly fried chicken. Smiling brightly, Yuria said, Thank you. Baduk and the baby dungeon meerkat ran around with joy. Yong Ho's father straightened himself after stroking Yuria's head. Looking at the waiting rooms of the bride and the groom, he laughed heartily again. Phew! Although this is a joint ceremony with Catalina, that's fine with me because I'm his official wife, said Kai Wan, wearing her shoes made of silver dragon leather. She was wearing a silver dragon leather suit looking like a leotard as if to show everybody she was Kai Wan. Kai Wan in Scorpio, the Queen of Sword. Because of the suit, she felt like she was wearing a combat suit, not a wedding dress. Catalina, who Kai Wan always called a dumb and innocent lady, pouted her lips when Kai Wan cast a jealous glance. Unlike Kai Wan, Catalina was wearing a white robe, revealing her womanly beauty. It was a beautiful dress made by Yuno in person. Kai Wan, who saw Catalina's tail drooping, smiled and gently hugged her softly. Then, she rubbed her cheek against Catalina's face even at the risk of ruining her makeup. You don't mind it because I love you so much, Catalina, right? After all, Catalina burst into laughter, too. Flapping her ears and tail, she nodded. Catalina in Libra was in charge of escorting the King of Greed, but she was lovely, as always. Watching the two women, the Queen of Fury, Dhritarashutra, frowned. Although she put on the formal dress befitting the head of her eight clans, she was not wearing a wedding dress like them. I feel like I'm very much inferior to them. Dhritara Shutra in Virgo is in love with Yong Ho. She was supposed to hold a wedding ceremony with him two months later. Unlike Kai Wan and Catalina's joint wedding ceremony, she was having a separate wedding ceremony with him. Definitely, it would be a wedding involving the marriage of the Queen of Fury as the head of her eight clans and Yong Ho, as the master of the House of Mammon. Naturally, their wedding would be different from the current wedding in terms of scale. Tens of thousands of guests would watch their wedding ceremony in the most spectacular event of the demon world. Nonetheless, the Queen of Fury felt she was losing. She didn't expect at all that the two asked to have the wedding ceremony ahead of her. Why does she think she is losing when she is going to have such a great wedding ceremony soon? Don't you think so? Kai Wan said with a sarcastic laugh. Moreover, even Catalina, who the Queen of Fury trusted, chimed in, flapping her ears and tail. 
It seems like our master has been outdone. Gardamundi whispered to Kurtamukha. Gardamundi. Gardamundi turned away from Kurtamukha, as always, while the King of Fury trembled, watching Kai Wan sticking her tongue out. She clenched her teeth, then turned to Kurtamukha. Dang it, I can't stand it, Kurtamukha, it sounds crazy, but can you ask them to send me a wedding dress? Please be patient, Kurtamukha said, embarrassed. Then Gardamundi snapped sharply, just break in his room on the wedding night. Kurtamukha got enraged again, but Gardamundi turned away her eyes again. While Kai Wan and the Queen of Fury exchanged fierce glances, Catalina looked toward the wall, flapping her tail, where there was the groom's waiting room. The bride's waiting room is noisy, said Yong Ho, dressed in dark red robes, with a rather tense expression. Unlike his confident attitude he showed after dismantling the celestial door, he looked a bit diffident now, waiting for the opening of the wedding ceremony. Instead of answering, Citri took a step closer to him and said, adjusting his clothes, My beloved master is so blessed. Hmm, I can't deny it. Yong Ho and Citri looked at each other and smiled. She opened her lips again, unable to speak out her mind before she knew it. My beloved customer, would you please stay still for a moment? He nodded. She quietly hugged him and buried her head on his chest for a moment. Mammon. She didn't say it loudly. She just felt Mammon who became greed itself. At the last moment when he defeated numerous godly men and generals and stood before the celestial door, Yong Ho heard Mammon's voice. Together with Mammon, he destroyed the celestial door with the power of the great demon god. He cut off the connection between the celestial world and the demon world completely. And that was it. Citri never heard Mammon's voice again. What she heard last from him was that he would not allow her to commit suicide. Yong Ho also couldn't feel the presence of Mammon's will anymore. He just felt that Mammon was with him, or Mammon was already united with himself. Hesitating for a moment, Yong Ho hugged her. The two shared their warmth for a long time. Thank you, Citri said, raising her head. He replied, slightly blushing in embarrassment, you're welcome. You can ask me a favor any time. Oh my god, you won't take back what you have just said, right? Citri suddenly spoke provocatively, and he blinked. Citri. Master, you've got only ten minutes before the wedding ceremony. At that moment, he heard Assistant Butler June serving him a gentle reminder as if she was checking the wedding time. As the Goblin Ranger's only female member, she, like the Butler Elegos, was essential in the labyrinth of greed. Thanks for the reminder. Yong Ho replied, and Citri suddenly withdrew her hands. She made a mischievous smile at him. Yong Ho's wedding began. Yong Ho stood on the podium while Catalina and Kai Wan stood on both sides. Catalina flapped her tail without hiding her excited feelings while Kai Wan was shy unlike her confident attitude in the bride's waiting room. Brother Eli, when will we get married? Asked Ophelia, who was watching them with a warm smile. While he was moved to tears for a moment, Elagos responded, blinking his eyes, Uh. Are you pretending not to know what I'm saying? Ophelia grinned at him, nudging him in the ribs gently. He cleared his throat, flinching at her unexpected question for a moment. Looking back at Yong Ho, Elagos shed tears of joy again. I'm glad Kai Wan wasn't dumped by him, said Eucrasian, feeling great relief, in the presence of the former masters of the House of Mammon. All of them smiled at Kai Wan when she was shy, not knowing what to do at the moment. It looks like they feel like this when they marry off their children, said Gus Ion, shaking his head a bit, standing in the middle of the spirits of the arena. Opening her eyes wide, Scathack said, Oh my goodness. Is our master your child? Scathack asked gently. Yuno and Yuscha looked up at Yong Ho on the podium, just like Gus Ion did. At that moment, there was a small voice heard from the flames of the red lotus next to them. I also agree with Gus Ion just for today, said Amon, the magic spear of the red lotus, who had always been with Yong Ho until now. Isn't our master being anguished highly now? Amon just laughed at Gyuzhin's question. Oh, he has just started it. You know said. As she said, Yong Ho on the podium kissed Catalina and Kai Wan. Burgrim put the rings on the two women, which he made elaborately. 
those participants watching them broke out into exclamation with joy. Baduk was absorbed into enjoying fried chicken, and the baby dungeon meerkat, enjoying chicken, raised her head upright and watched the wedding of the greatest king of the demon world. Flapping her wings, Lucia looked to the side. Instead of putting the crispy fried chicken in her mouth, she lightly touched Yuria's shoulder, who was looking at Yong Ho, Catalina and Kai Wan, blushing. They didn't need to talk to each other about it. Lucia looked askance at her while Yuria nodded enthusiastically. Demon God of Greed, Yong Ho Chion. Master of the Great Mammon Family. The one who had saved the demon world, just like Mammon in the past. Yong Ho hugged Catalina suddenly. He then kissed Kaiwan and held Drydera Shutra in his arms, who came running to him when she couldn't stand it. He was the most greedy man in the demon world, after all. He didn't give up anything he laid his hand on. Citri looked at him and smiled brightly, shaking off her thousand years of agony.